in the establishment of ANTA three years ago. The agreement has enabled the considerable injection of Commonwealth funds, the so-called growth funds, into the vocational educational training sector. And this sector, of course, over the previous 10 years, which was completely under the control of the states, had uh, languished with lack of growth. And uh, what has happened in recent years has, I think, really re-established or started to re-establish a proper balance between uh, the, the higher education sector and the vocational, educational and training sector. Evidence uh, that the ANTA concept is a step forward uh, did come out right across the hearings and uh, there was no one in any of the evidence that suggested that we undo this arrangement and go back to the pre-ANTA situation. However, the committee recognises that while uh, there has been uh, progress in the first uh, three years of ANTA's operations, there has been revealed uh, a number of problems uh, with the way in which uh, ANTA is going about its business that does need uh, fine-tuning and modification. And to this end, the committee has made 20 recommendations for the improvement of the operation of the ANTA agreement. The most uh, important of these concerns the use of growth funds, the successful measurement of outcomes, the development of a national strategy and the role of industry. With regard to growth funds provided by the Commonwealth, the committee was very concerned to find that very little of the 20 per cent of funds that have been distributed or supposed to be distributed on the basis of performances required by the agreement was actually taking place much more than the 80 per cent of the funds intended for growth were being distributed by ANTA on a population basis. And uh, one of the unfavourable outcomes of this was it was disadvantaging the smaller states. Accordingly, the committee has recommended that the full 20 per cent of VET funds be distributed as originally intended by the agreement on the basis of performance in relation to that agreement's objectives. Further, in recognition of the difficulties that the smaller states and territories are likely to have, the committee recommends that the formula used in the allocation of growth funds be sufficiently flexible to take into account uh, the particular characteristics of individual states and territories, particularly with respect to their size and population distribution and as well to encourage ANTA's national emphasis in the use of funds, the committee recommends that the growth funds currently available, uh, that uh, ANTA increase the proportion that is allocated to cooperative arrangements uh, between the states, either in curriculum development or rationalisation of training courses. At the heart of the evidence taken in the hearings was the vexed issue of the measurement of outcomes in comparing uh, performance of state and territory systems in delivering vocational, educational and training. It's very important to know that states are maintaining effort when Commonwealth funding has been increased. However, the very crude state of the outcome measures means that no meaningful conclusion can be reached at this stage. Accordingly, the committee has recommended the Commonwealth Parliament should extend beyond 1995 its recent relinquished power to intervene in cases where state and territories have failed to meet the obligations uh, under the agreement, and that ANTA set up a unit from within its existing staff for the express purpose of developing suitable outcome measures. And this is uh, still, I believe, one of the great problems for resolution, because in this report, as in an early report on accountability of Commonwealth money, uh, in state uh, Commonwealth education agreements, which the committee report, uh, tabled earlier this year, uh, we did discover that it was very difficult to establish evidence one way or the other because of the way in which uh, the various states, and indeed we discovered the way in which the Commonwealth government uh, collects statistics, and then trying to get any meaningful information out of those statistics is very difficult because of the way they are collected. 
and that's relating to inputs into education. There is also the question, and this is the crucial question, of outputs. And that's really what you want to know. Is the money you're spending being effectively spent? Are you getting the outcomes that uh, you're trying to achieve? And right across the whole system, there's hardly been any work done on this, and that is why uh, we have made this uh, recommendation. Now, Senator Carr has been going on in many of these hearings about trying to prove uh, whether uh, effort has been maintained or not. And uh, quite frankly, and as someone who has some expertise in the use of statistics in education, you just can't draw the conclusions that, that uh, Senator Carr is drawing because of the inexact nature of the, the measurement system. Uh, in educational research, the conclusions he's come to based on the, uh, the data and the way the data is collected would be considered totally invalid. And this was pointed out uh, very forcefully in the, uh, in the hearings by uh, Terry Moran, who's the head of ANTA, and I'd invite people to have a look at Terry Moran's evidence on this matter. He's, I think, it put paid to what Senator Carr had been saying well and truly. But we do recognise as a committee that it is, there is a need to develop some, such measures, particularly outcome measures, and uh, hence our recommendation six on ANTA setting up a unit to uh, bring this outcome about. With regard to the national strategy in vocational, educational and training, the committee believes there is much room for improvement in the process of consultation, particularly at the state and territory level, in the development of state training profiles. For this reason, the committee has recommended that ANTA devise improved mechanisms for the provision of advice to the state training authorities from various parts of industry, in particular small business, from education and training providers and uh, from individuals. We did discover that uh, the whole arrangements in ANTA were too narrowly focused, that they really didn't take into account or work properly enough with the uh, small business groups, and they also did not really work, uh, work properly enough uh, with a broader range of educational provision that could be uh, deemed uh, not strictly vocational, but being in its very nature supportive uh, of vocational training. And we felt that particularly uh, with its funding of TAFE systems, with its funding of adult and community education, it could take a much broader view in what it included in its definition uh, of vocational. The other main recommendations uh, responds also to the way in which the uh, ANTA board is set up. And I understand what they were trying to do. They weren't trying to get representatives from every group in the community to give this broad, comprehensive uh, umbrella. But uh, the feeling after receiving the evidence was that they have actually gone a bit too far the other way, and the work of the board would be uh, very much enhanced if they had uh, three groups uh, represented in particular. One, that they did have an expert in vocational educational training as part of the board, and they don't have that at the moment, that uh, representatives from the small business sector should really be part of the board as well because uh, of the, the huge number of small businesses that we have uh, in, the, in this country. And the other sector that we felt was uh, neglected uh, by uh, the board structure was uh, rural and regional Australia, and hence we have uh, recommended accordingly. So I commend the uh, report to the, uh, to, to the Senate. We feel, as I indicated at the start, that the anti ANTA agreement has made considerable progress. It has put funding into uh, this sector in a way that was very much needed. But at this point, ANTA needs a little bit of fine tuning in its representation and, uh, and in its focus of effort. And uh, the, the Commonwealth Government, which has indeed relinquished uh, a power that it had for three years in uh, stepping in and guiding uh, what happens in this agreement, uh, we actually believe should uh, take up that power again, because we don't feel that ANTA is quite there. But if it acts on the recommendations, 
that we have made in this report. We, find, we will find Order. that vocational education and training in this country will be very well served. The question is, the Senate take note of the report. Those in favour say aye. Those against say no. Senator Carr. Mr Acting Deputy President, this is a timely report. It is a report that indicates uh, there, there is opportunity within the Senate uh, committee system to do good work. Now, this is not a view that I express uh, on every occasion, but I think in this uh, area this does demonstrate that this, there is important uh, questions can be addressed, and uh, I think this uh, particular inquiry differs from that uh, disgraceful performance we saw with Bond and a number of others we have seen. And once again, I would uh, thank uh, the professionalism and the hard work of the committee secretariat in providing uh, such uh, terrific assistance. Now, of course, uh, this comes at a timely uh, part of the proceedings in regard to discussions between the States and the Commonwealth. The uh, current uh, ANTA agreement is ending its term and we're entering into transitional arrangements which we'll see through the COAG process as new arrangements put in place. The Taylor Review is due to report to the Minister and will provide, I think, a very important uh, policy base. This uh, report that the committee has brought down uh, will, of course, also provide a good policy base for discussion within government and, I hope, within the community at large. Our concerns, however, and I say this is a also unusual insofar as the Labor senators and the Democrats, uh, through Senator Bell, come together to produce a minority report so that the majority report, in fact, consists nothing about the Liberals, who have a natural majority on this committee, and that has to be understood. What, of course, uh, what of course uh, has to happen, of course, is that you, uh, the Liberals, of course, had the opportunity to go much further than what they've done here, and they chose to reject those initiatives through the uh, process. And the simple reason is this: you've got an inherent, you've got an inherent, unfortunate, inherent, uh, vested interest in protecting a few lousy state governments who are obsessed, absolutely obsessed, with the destruction of the education system in this country. And that is enormous tragedy, an enormous tragedy, when we look at what's of course occurring in this country in terms of education. And so while there have been many issues addressed in the, in the Liberal report in terms of the confused roles of ANTA and in terms of the uh, industry-led nature of it and in terms of the uh, failure to coordinate between the different sectors and in terms of the difference uh, exists uh, within uh, the, the, uh, the main purpose of ETA, which of course has now really become not much more than uh, a mechanism for the distribution of increasing levels of Commonwealth funding. And of course, in terms of uh, that, the Commonwealth is now contributing 35 per cent of the total debt system in this country. A massive shift, a massive shift has occurred. The problem with the majority report uh, in terms of this committee is that it doesn't go far enough. It identifies a problem and, like the Liberal Party in so many ways, hasn't got any solution, can't come up with the goods. It's all very well to point the finger. The real question in politics is to say, what are we going to do about it? And, of course, the real problem for the Liberal Party is they don't know what to do about it. And that really is at the, the nub of this. So, in fact, what the Liberals have done is, unfortunately, is produce an anemic and pale and undistinguished report in that regard. And, of course, their main uh, problem is that it's uh, questions of sins of omission. And what we're saying, what the Labor and Democrat senators are saying, mm -hmm. is that there is a need to eliminate the unwieldy system of dual Commonwealth state accountability mechanism, which allow the, the educational vandals in this country, like Jeff Kennett in Victoria, to smash a what was once a very proud public system, and in such a way as to fundamentally undermine commitments that they have made through agreements, and in such a way as to demonstrate that uh, they can't really be trusted with the public dollar when it comes to education. And the real problem is that it's Commonwealth dollars that they're now using as a substitute for an appalling uh, effort that they are, of course, pursuing in Victoria. What we're suggesting is that there needs to be a much more effective measure to ensure that the Commonwealth will is demonstrated in the VET system in this country. And to that end, we're proposing that the Commonwealth ought to resume control for the VET system. Now, failing that, 
what we recommend is that uh, if the states can't come to the party in such an arrangement, those, those sort of administrative arrangements can't be placed, uh, put in place, that the Commonwealth Minister should uh, resume the powers to intervene more effectively, and of course that would mean legislative change to the Australian National Training Authority Act of 1992. Now, what we're saying also is that the, the focus of ANDA has also got to change. And while it is a much, much better system than we've ever had, the focus has to change so that the educational component of education and training is given much greater emphasis. That the narrow industry model is not appropriate. In itself, it is not appropriate. There has to be proper consideration of much broader questions which go to the heart of a truly educated nation. And what we've got, unfortunately, in recent times is undue emphasis on the training notions. And, we, and I see it, in some ways, as harking back to a 19th century notion of education, which saw workers as nothing more than hands and did not seek the broader education of our population. So in that regard, we uh, maintain that there is a need for substantial changes there and that the Commonwealth ought to be directly represented on the board of ANTA and that there should be direct educational expertise on the board of ANTA. And in that capacity, there needs to be a much greater improvement in the, the management of ANTA, both in terms of its focus to ensure the states maintain effort and in terms of its uh, philosophy, in terms of making sure that there is a broader approach and in terms of its governance, both education educational and administrative changes need to be made to ensure there is protection for, for those principles. Now, in terms of the I think, working conditions of teachers, employees in the Fed system, I think considerable attention has to be paid. And the whole basis of the competitive uh, tendering arrangements in uh, TAFE have led to serious, serious undermining of the quality provision of education in this uh, country. And so we're also suggesting there needs to be improvements there. But might I just turn briefly to some of the remarks that Senator Tierney made about my beloved state of Victoria and the notorious uh, Kennett government. Now, it was said that I had got uh, some of these issues wrong, that somehow or another imports weren't necessarily related to, to outputs. What a silly notion. What a silly notion. What, of course, that means is that the Liberals are pre prepared to essentially cover up for that, ec that economic and educational vandalism in Victoria, which has seen $43 million taken out of the, out of the, the VET system in that state under the state government's own figures. And that, of course, if it wasn't for the ANTA arrangements, cuts to the VET uh, system would have been much greater. That the Commonwealth's intervention has, of course, sought to protect the people of Victoria. And I think, to some measure, it has been successful. However, what is abundantly clear and what is acknowledged by all now is that Victoria has failed to maintain its effort in financial terms and has breached the agreement in financial terms and that has reduced its expenditure in 1995 by 6.96 million and by 6.84 million respectively and that it is expected in terms of uh, uh, recurrent expenditure in 1995 to be breached that uh, commitment by 9.31 million. Now, it's all very well to suggest that uh, things are honky-dory in terms of the maintenance of effort. They clearly are not. And in fact, as far as I'm concerned, the provisions about the maintenance of effort are essentially a joke, because they become defined and redefined in such a way as to become meaningless. And so this is a, and, un, and I've noticed that the Minister for Employment, Education and Training has expressed on many, many occasions grave reservations about the commitment by the states, particularly Victoria and South Australia, to, to the whole question of their maintenance of effort and their commitment to a national scheme. And of course, that's really what it's all boiled down to, that the states are prepared to enter into agreements if they think they're going to get more money. The old story about never get between a state premier and a bucket of money, a very dangerous course of action. What that also means, however, is that the Commonwealth has got to acknowledge what the states are prepared to say, but then to force it through legislatively to ensure that commitments are on it, that if we have a genuine national system of education and training in this country, genuine protection for the public dollar, genuine protection for the rights and obligations that citizens have to be involved in education 
And in my, as far as I'm concerned, fundamental social justice issues are protected through strong measures taken by the Commonwealth to ensure that the states honour their word who do not sign up on agreements they have no intention of keeping. And unfortunately, it's a sorry state that that has occurred again and again and again in this area. So when we go into the next phase, I trust Order. that the Commonwealth Senator is able Carr, to— your time has expired. Senator Bell. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. This inquiry is an important inquiry. It's important for uh, the industry. Uh, it's important for those who are involved in training in Australia, those who are involved in education in Australia, and the wider community. It is a pity that the report had to arrive uh, in two forms, uh, a ma majority report and a minority report which consisted of one which was endorsed by myself and the Labor members. I had difficulty, of course, because uh, many parts of the, uh, uh, the committee's majority report rang true and were worthy of my support. And in fact, I do support uh, some of the recommendations. But uh, at the end of the day, uh, the, uh, the majority of uh, the recommendations which were arrived at by myself and the Labor Party, uh, the Labor members, uh, are the ones that uh, expressed most closely uh, the, uh, the, the uh, feeling that I had after participating in the inquiry. This is a difficult area to participate in because, uh, as uh, those who are interested in this area would know, it is rife with acronyms. There is much jargon. And uh, this is perpetrated, I think, by a clique of uh, information guardians, and it's a bit hard to penetrate that <laughs> to get into the issues at all. Uh, so much so that the, uh, the report has had to include an Appendix 1 of acronyms, which occupies a page and a half, and that makes interesting readings for, uh, for anybody who's involved in this area. Uh, I um, uh, was uncertain about uh, whether I could support recommendation 1 of the, uh, uh, the uh, majority report, and so I, uh, I, uh, I direct people's attention to that uh, as, as indicative of the problems that we have here. But I am, in, however, able to uh, fully support uh, recommendation number four, and I think uh, uh, those who are listening would, would understand why. Uh, this, of course, as a Tasmanian senator, expresses some of the difficulty uh, that we, uh, we experience in these areas. And the recommendation that uh, the committee made at that stage was that a formula, the formula used in the allocation of growth funds be sufficiently flexible to take into account the particular characteristics of individual states and territories, especially with respect to size and distribution of population. Such a formula might include provision for special loadings. And I don't think I need to explain that any further, but it, as um, member states of the Commonwealth, that's why we're member states of a Commonwealth, to make sure that uh, uh, the particular individual uh, skills, abilities, traditions that we bring are also uh, uh, recognised and we are supported where uh, the size of our population works as a disadvantage and an inability. I might interpolate here that uh, I was part of a, um, a state government department at one stage where we, we didn't have the threshold of numbers able to encourage the, uh, the training, and it was training, of um, building quantity surveyors in Tasmania. And so we had to come to a special arrangement with the Victorian Institute. It was in, at that time the RMIT. And uh, we had to uh, uh, make that arrangement so that we could have in our state uh, the skills necessary. But we weren't able to provide it uh, in any of the Tasmanian um, uh, technical institutions at the time. And these are the sorts of things that, uh, of course, are brought about by, uh, by population limitations. I support also the, uh, uh, the recommendation five, which recommends that the ANTA establish clearly the mechanisms by which state and territory training authorities take account of the projections determined by NetForce. There, that's uh, important to refer to Appendix 1 to find out what that means. And DEET's area consultative committees in establishing state training profiles, because otherwise some of those projections could be interpreted as being overstated and it's important to understand the mechanisms by which they are determined. Also, uh, in a similar way, uh, Recommendation 7 uh, asks that, uh, that, uh, that ANTRA establish a reliable system of statistics. And of course, some of the debate so far that we've heard in this chamber this morning has been about which statistics are valid and uh, how they ought to be taken into account. Uh, 
we all find difficulty when trying to interpret those statistics. The, uh, the, the other recommendation worthy of note in that area of the report is number 17, which was that schools explicitly contribute to the state training pro profiles and be given wider access to anti-growth funds. It's important also to note the, uh, uh, the uh, minority report, which I supported uh, making recommendations, and I draw uh, attention to recommendation 7, which I won't read, uh, senators can read that, and 8, but I want to emphasise recommendation 9 because I have had uh, uh, some communication with um, ANTA personnel outside the uh, proceedings of the committee but also within the, uh, the inquiry itself which really uh, asked a central question uh, what the rationale was behind some of the funding allocations that are made by ANTA. For example, uh, funding that was allocated to develop a child care traineeship in New South Wales when one already existed in Tasmania, which had accreditation. And uh, so in uh, recommendation nine, um, we, uh, we recommended that uh, uh, the National Vocational Education and Training System Agreement be amended to, uh, to require states and territories to legislate the principles of the national framework for the recognition of training so that providers, enterprises and students are entitled to insist on national recognition of any accreditation that they obtain, and national recognition of registration and declaration decisions by any state, so that there would be some consistency and transferability. Um, a lot of what we found in the inquiry was that uh, duplication was inhibiting um, progress and development. It was also inhibiting initiatives. And uh, of course, in an organisation or in an area which encompasses such a large uh, part of our, uh, our endeavours, uh, of course there will be some duplication in some um, uh, petty uh, cross-sectional interests being unable to reach a national agreement. But uh, we felt that, uh, and I think the evidence uh, was, was quite clear, that this was, uh, this was uh, happening on far too many occasions and that there needed to be better coordination to resolve that. This inquiry revealed other fundamental problems and they included a lack of representation of small business uh, and a lack of relevance of much of what industry-based training uh, was doing to small business. Uh, it also revealed a persistence of the notion that training is all that Australian workers need and uh, Senator Carr was right to draw attention to that. Uh, the the, uh, the uh, relevance of education, generic skills and also attitudinal aspects are very important as is, uh, because it is education upon which we, uh, we base uh, the development of our ability to learn because uh, when that is, uh, is enhanced then training becomes so much easier. And I felt at times that there were those who were participating in this and making decisions in these areas who didn't actually understand the distinction between training and education and because of that we have uh, had decisions made which, uh, which overemphasise the uh, mechanistic um, style, of, uh, style of developing people's skills rather than uh, enhancing people's capacity to learn and so developing their educational skills. Now that was revealed I think in the inquiry and for that reason it was important that the inquiry uh, be conducted and that uh, we take note of uh, what was revealed by the inquiry. The, uh, the politics around it of course was uh, in some ways to be expected. Uh, I think uh, we have to take some of that with a grain of salt, but I think also we have to notice that, uh, that it is an area which engenders much passion in the politics and uh, there's nothing wrong with that, provided that at the end of the day we produce a document and some recommendations which are worthy of, uh, of, of note. And uh, I think we have done that. I think that it can only, the, uh, the inquiry can only be vindicated by the reading of the entire report, including the minority report. Senator Carver. I'd move that debate on this matter be adjourned. The question is the motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. I call Senator Carr. I present the report of the Environment, Recreation, Communications and the Arts Legislation Committee on the examination of end reports of Telstra Corporation in Australia Post Corporation 1994-95, together with submissions and hands uh, transcripts of evidence and move that the report be printed. The question is that the motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Carr? 
I move that the Senate take note of the report. Uh, Mr Acting Deputy President, given the enormous workload today, I would like to say just a very few short words on this matter. These uh, assets, these public assets, are of huge public value, of enormous value. And what strikes me as particularly important in the parliamentary process is the capacity of parliament to examine these public uh, corporations and to provide an opportunity for representatives, the parliamentary representatives, to question officials from these uh, corporations in a way that makes them publicly accountable. And it's one of the fundamental distinguishing features between a public asset, a public business enterprise and a private one. The enormous private power that goes to the private uh, corporations in the telecommunications area of course, uh, means that there isn't the capacity to involve the parliamentary process in that. So this is a very important matter for the Senate to be able to maintain. And that's for those reasons, and amongst the many others in terms of the contribution of the Telstra and Australia Post to the country's communications, the technological advance that it takes, the enormous employment, the huge contribution it makes to the public purse, the enormous investment uh, it involves in terms of the strategic place within the economy. But for all of those reasons, plus the question of public accountability, it strikes me as an absolute abomination to talk of privatising these enterprises. And in the coming election, I will welcome the opportunity to pursue that question with all the vehemence that we can muster. It is just an extraordinary notion for political parties to suggest that we can cover all our financial and economic problems by saying we'll flog off Telstra. We'll fill whatever financial gap we've got by flogging off Telstra. And it's going to be a pathetic effort when the Liberals go into the election and say we'll flog off Telstra without a thought how they're going to get it through the Senate without a thought to the consequences, the political and social consequences of such an appalling act. Senator Calvert. Yeah, look, I wasn't going to say, say much on this, but I, I'd just like to, I'd like to uh, um, say on one thing I'm very pleased to hear the chairman uh, making the point about being able to, uh, to examine the uh, annual reports of Telstra and Australia Post. Uh, we did have some problems with that. Uh, and we had to examine their annual reports rather than go through the normal process of, uh, 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 that you would under the estimates uh, itself. But I was rather puzzled to hear his attack on the, on, on the, on the opposition about the selling of Telstra. Uh, Senator Carr was rather silent this week when I, when I had the passage of the, com the sale of the Commonwealth Bank Bill. And, uh, and uh, you know, I, I don't think you can, on one hand, uh, uh, the government selling Commonwealth Bank and uh, Qantas and and uh, AID, AIDC and, and the ANL, and then turn around and say, well, it's wrong to sell something else. Uh, What's the rationale? I, I just, yeah, exactly. What is the rationale? But um, as, far as, as far as this report from the uh, Environment, Recreation, Communication and the Arts Legislation Committee, um, I just make the point that uh, certain questions I asked of Tilstra uh, hopefully will be answered this week. Um, I'd also make the point that every time did I go to estimates to ask a certain line of questions of Telstra, uh, and they, they know I'm going to ask these questions because it's concerning a particular matter I've been pursuing for four years. Uh, they always put up a different cast of actors or, or uh, representatives so that when I ask these questions they can deny all, all, all knowledge and say, well, take them on notice and we'll get back to you. And this happens every time, and it's happened time after time after time. Um, but nevertheless, uh, I'll seek leave to continue my remarks. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Senator Denman. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. On behalf of Senator West, I present the report of the Community Affairs Legislation Committee on the Tobacco Advertising Prohibition, Broadcasting and Tobacco Advertising Legislation Amendment Bill 1994, and move that the report be printed. The question is that the motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Denman. No, that's all. I uh, call Senator Colson. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. I present the 1994-95 Annual Report of the Standing Committee on Regulation and Ordinances and move that the report be printed. But, Mr Deputy President, due to the exceptional demands 
on the printing unit at this time, I'm tabling this report as an A4 camera ready document. Printed copies are expected to be available within the week. The question is that the motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Colston. Mr Acting Deputy President, I move that the Senate take note of the report. Um, and is there an adjournment? Just take note of the report. I'll put the motion. Well, I'll move it to better matter. Does it need to be adjourned? No? no. Uh, then I put the motion. Um, those, of, uh, those who support the motion say aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Minchin. Uh, thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. <clears throat> In accordance with subparagraph 4C of the resolution of the Senate of 17 March 1994 relating to the registration of senators' interests, I table a copy of notifications by senators of alterations of their interests since the previous tabling on 21 June 1995. Um, I have uh, here uh, an indication that Senator Campbell may wish to present a report. Is anyone able to do that on his behalf? It's uh, with regard to the Land Fund Committee. If uh, there's no one rising, Senator Troth, maybe you're able to help us with. Member of that committee. Uh, Senator Troth? I understood it was to be presented under agenda item number nine. Well, we'll leave it until then. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Senator McMullen. Of assistance and to confirm Senator Troth's understanding, uh, Senator Campbell approached me. I understood he was going to deal with it under this item, but it, uh, and if I keep talking for 30 seconds, he might. Uh, but he did say, as Senator Troth said, he could deal with it under this or under uh, number nine. And if I can indicate Campbell. to the incoming uh, representative on the government front bench, we have agreed to an incorporation of a statement on behalf of Senator Ellison with regard to this matter. Senator Campbell, would you like to catch your breath and take the call? I'll, um, I'll just about catch my breath while I'm on my feet. Thank you, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. Um, I present the uh, report of the Select Committee on Certain Land Fund Matters, excuse me, together with the transcript of evidence and submissions received by the committee, and move that the report be printed. The question is that, that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Senator Campbell. Mr. President, uh, sorry, Madam Acting Deputy President, I seek leave to move a motion in relation to the report. Is leave granted? There being no objections, leave is granted. Senator Campbell. Madam Acting Deputy President, I move that the Senate take note of the report. Do you wish to speak? And uh, yes, I will speak very briefly, since we seem to um, have got through the first part of uh, tabling of committee reports. I won't um, delay the chamber too much. Um, at the end of my speech, I will, as Senator McMullen indicated, seek leave to incorporate a speech from Senator Ellison. Initially, this was to be tabled as an order of the Senate under item 9 today, and uh, we had been advised there wouldn't be much time to talk then. Uh, so Senator Ellison has provided me with a copy uh, of a speech um, and has been agreed by the um, Minister, Senator McMullen, that that speech would be incorporated in the Hansard. Um, so I'll do that at the end. Madam Acting Deputy President, just briefly, the report um, of the Senate Select Committee on uh, certain land fund matters um, was, of course, a, uh, covered some issues that were uh, fairly controversial. The Senate um, at this time last year and, of course, uh, early this year, uh, debated at some great length, in fact I think it was the second or third longest debate in the history of, of the Senate, um, the establishment of a land fund. Certain senators, uh, particularly the uh, West Australian Greens, the coalition senators and uh, on some issues Senator Harradine, had a range of concerns about the establishment of the land fund and in particular one of those concerns was the establishment of what's come to be known as a parallel program. And that is a system that allows a transition between the existing ATSIC uh, land acquisition and management program and the newly formed Indigenous Land Corporation program. That um, uh, structure uh, was um, 
it was told to the Senate by the government and reported by the Prime Minister in his second reading speech as a structure that would allow um, a transition between the existing land acquisition and management programs for the benefit of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and the scheme established for the land fund. There were concerns raised about that parallel program um, from various uh, places, uh, not the least of which was from the Northern Territory Government and the, and the Chief Minister of that time, Marshal Perrin. When uh, the ILC was finally established with the, uh, the passing of the so-called Land Fund Bill in this place earlier this year, ATSIC uh, held a board meeting and at that board meeting made a decision to appropriate or apportion um, a, a significant majority, in fact in excess of 85 per cent of all of their land acquisition monies into the Northern Territory for the next two years. Um, that is something like $20 million out of a total of $24 million to be made available for purchases in the Northern Territory, virtually to the total exclusion of uh, Aboriginal people and Torres Strait Islanders across the rest of Australia. And, uh, Senator Chamaret from the WA Greens and myself and a number of other senators uh, raised concerns about this, um, as did indeed some of the, uh, the, the government uh, ministers. In fact, there was a, a debate in this place on that, um, and both, I think, Senator Gareth Evans and Senator Collins expressed surprise at the decision and some concern. Uh, we then, or the Senate, sought on the motion of Senator Chamaret to find out some of the facts. Uh, pertaining to the decision made by ATSIC. Um, we had certain documents tabled uh, under an order of the Senate, um, and subsequent to that, or about the same time, a number of other Aboriginal organisations, specifically the New South Wales uh, Land Council uh, and uh, the FARA, F -A -I -R -A organisation and the Tasmanian Aboriginal Centre, challenged the decision of ATSIC on administrative grounds in the federal court and, of course, subsequent to that, the federal court found that ATSIC had erred um, at law, overturned the decision, uh, and, of course, the situation now is that ATSIC is reconsidering it. Um, the Senate chose to establish uh, uh, the select committee, uh, whose report I now table, um, to investigate the decision-making processes leading up to that. And I don't want to canvas too much the, uh, the content of the report. Uh, it is the subject of a minority report which has been signed by um, uh, Senator Kerno, Senator Childs and uh, also Labor Senator uh, Chris Evans, who is on leave at the moment, has associated himself with that report. But the majority report uh, makes an, a number of conclusions. Uh, firstly, um, just for the record, I might uh, say that the, um, the committee found that uh, the actions of ATSIC had been inappropriate that uh, they had led to uh, discrimination against um, Aboriginals and other parts of, the, of Australia, uh, and it made a number of recommendations. And it recommend, re recommended, firstly, that uh, in dealing with Aboriginal land matters that there should actually be someone in the federal government who has responsibility for this area. At the moment, uh, and particularly in the case of the native title legislation and the establishment of the, of the land fund, there were no less than five ministers, including the Prime Minister, who at some stage took some sort of responsibility for these decisions, and clearly no one had any, minister, any specific ministerial responsibility for that. So we made that as, as one of the key recommendations. We've also said that there needs to be an improvement in the public transparency and accountability of these ATSIC board decisions. One of the great concerns this committee found was that uh, virtually uh, all of the, uh, sorry, many of the Aboriginal organisations, individuals and communities uh, found it very, very hard to find out exactly what the board had decided. And I must say to the Senate that uh, the committee found on a number of occasions during the inquiry uh, the same problem. We would be given evidence by uh, ATSIC officers uh, and indeed on some occasions by the uh, chairperson of ATSIC, Ms O'Donoghue, to, um, to lead us to one uh, point of view, only to find out that written evidence such as minutes of board meetings uh, may indeed contradict the evidence that was given to the committee. And we, of course, had to go through a tedious process of trying to reconcile uh, various bits of evidence that, on the face of them, seemed to have some fundamental conflicts involved in them. Um, the committee did also find that, in the, on this matter of transparency and accountability, uh, that some of the records of the various board meetings, 
uh, tapes of the, board, of, the, of the crucial ATSIC board meeting, uh, handwritten notes of a uh, consultation meeting with the Prime Minister held in June uh, 1994 had been lost, which we, uh, we found very regrettable. Um, and indeed, uh, we had evidence before the committee that said that some of the board, uh, the minutes of the crucial ATSIC board meeting, were actually incorrect. Um, we also had evidence that um, um, advice given by ATSIC to the Indigenous Land Corporation on crucial issues such as the uh, percentage uh, of, of money available for acquisition of land in the Northern Territory was actually uh, grossly misleading, and we had to spend a lot of time trying to find out. Um, why uh, such misleading advice had been given to the ILC on such a crucial issue. The final recommendation, which I think is an important one, uh, is that the Auditor-General conduct a performance audit of the ATSIC land acquisition and maintenance program. Now, the minority report, which I've had a, only a very brief opportunity to read, um, says that this is sort of part of an ATSIC bashing exercise. Can I say to the Senate, can I say to ATSIC, um, that it, it couldn't be further from the truth. You've now had the LAMP program operating for five years. You have, you're now in a transitionary stage between that program and a situation within uh, 18 months or so where the ILC will be operating all acquisition and management programs for Aboriginal people. And you can clearly see from the process that this committee has looked into that there are a number of issues that are of serious concern and may need some structural reform. It is, I put it to the Senate, and the committee has supported this by way of recommendation, a important time to find out just whether the LAMP, the Land Acquisition and Management Program administered by ATSIC, is performing, is meeting the needs of Aboriginal people and Torres Strait Islanders in a fair and equitable way, and uh, whether or not in this stage where ILC, the ILC is just beginning to uh, get itself established, whether or not the Auditor General, in a performance audit, uh, can uh, make some recommendations that would indeed help uh, the ILC in, its, uh, in this transitionary phase. So we th see it as a constructive recommendation, certainly not uh, a destructive one. Can I, in conclusion, uh, in the short time remaining to me, uh, put on the record uh, my thanks to my other committee members, the Deputy Chairman, Senator Shamaret, uh, my coalition colleagues, Senator Troth and Senator Ellison, and, and uh, of course my, the Labor and Democrat senators on the committee. Most importantly, I'd like to record the thanks on behalf of all of committee members to Sue Morton, the committee secretary. Sue has, uh, has uh, done a, an incredible effort on this committee. She is under enormous stress because she's also working on a number of other reports for other committees I'm on, so I understand that stress. But Sue, and particularly uh, the research assistant Darlene Johnson, who's just returned to Canada a couple of weeks ago, put in a fantastic effort Order, on, uh, on uh, helping us on this report. I commend the report to the You're Senate. You're seeking leave to incorporate? I was, and I will now seek leave to, uh, formally to incorporate the speech of Senator Ellison. Is leave matter. granted? There being no objections, leave is granted. Senator Chamaret? Thank you, um, Madam Acting Deputy President. I just rise to very briefly uh, comment on the report, as there does appear to be some time left uh, to do that. And uh, all I want to say is that I too want to acknowledge the hard work put in, put in by the Secretariat that uh, assisted us in the compilation of the report. I still haven't um, seen the uh, minority report, but I wanted to express my regret uh, that the committee uh, was unable to work towards a unanimous report finding. Um, I have been able to glance, I've just received it in my hand, to the findings of the minority report. And uh, I too want to comment on the, uh, the view that's been expressed um, uh, that it's, an, it's been an ATSIC bashing exercise. I believe that it's very undesirable that a legitimate concern that should have been able to be dealt with in an objective way was politicised. Um, I appreciate that people uh, who don't share my views in relation to this matter may feel that I am... Uh, that's exactly right. And In fact, I will read the finding of the minority report which supports uh, the interjection of Senator Sherry. Uh, the finding number two was that one, ATSIC failed to follow an adequate decision-making process in coming to its decision, as found by the Federal Court decision of 30 August 1995. I think that actually could have been a unanimous finding. Um, 
And secondly, uh, and this wouldn't have been uh, unanimous, it, otherwise the process was consistent with that observed in other democratically elected bodies dealing with political issues. And even that might have had majority support because uh, there's no doubt that we have seen a degeneration of, uh, of uh, parliamentary decision-making process and, and other decisions that are made uh, in, in very political ways. But the, um, having said that ATSIC failed to follow an adequate decision-making process, the minority report goes on to conclude that uh, they concur with the evidence of chairperson of ATSIC, Ms Lois O'Donoghue, in saying, my view, of course, is that this is an ATSIC bashing exercise and the sooner we get this behind us, I mean, how many more times do we have to answer the same questions before it is really dead? We have had a court decision. We are getting on with the job. We are not going to appeal it. Even though we are dissatisfied with it, we are getting on with the job. We will be taking into account the priorities that will come back to us, and I think we should be allowed to get on and do that. The job is hard enough. And the implication there is that we're trying to undermine ATSIC by trying to look at the errors that may have been present in them coming to a decision that we believe wasn't done in, a, in an adequate way. And I think it, it would be as paternalistic uh, as any accusation that's ever been made to say that we turn a blind eye when processes have been followed that have left people out of a decision-making process who had a very legitimate right to be included in it. And, uh, and so I, I just wanted to uh, add my comments to that of the chairman in saying that it would have been much better if it could have been dealt with in a more objective way. Um, the fact that it, it has been uh, done in a way with a majority and a minority report is less than desirable, but it does reflect the difference of view in the committee. And I think the, the facts are there. They're laid out in the report, and people are able to come to their own conclusions on the matter. The question is that the Senate take note of the report. Those that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Senator Burns. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, on behalf of Senator McKean, I present the 25th report of the Standing Committee on Publications and move that the report be adopted. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Any further committee reports? If not, we shall move to messages. It's going to take me some time. The President has received a message from the House of Representatives forwarding the National Food Authority Amendment Bill 1995 for concurrence. Minister. Thank you. Um, uh, I move that this bill may proceed without formalities and be now read a, third, a first time. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Blow. For an act to amend the National Food Authority Act 1991 and for related purposes. Senator Sherry. I move that this bill be now read a second time, and I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated in Hansard. Is leave granted? There being no objections, leave is granted. In accordance with the order agreed on the 29th of November 1994, further consideration of the second reading of this bill is now adjourned to the first sitting day of 1996. Further messages. Thank you. The President has received messages from the House of Representatives as follows. One, agreeing to the Broadcasting Services Amendment Bill 1994-95 without amendment. Two, acquainting the Senate of a resolution authorising the presentation of joint committee reports to the Speaker when the House of Representatives is not sitting agreeing to the amendments made by the Senate in the Social Security Legislation Amendment, Carer, Pension and Other Measures Bill 1995, and the Social Security and Veterans Affairs Legislation Amendment Bill 1995, and four, returning the Customs Tariff Legislation Amendment Bill 1995 and the Excise Tariff Amendment Bill No. 2, 1995, and acquainting the Senate that the House has made the requested amendments. Minister. Thank you. I move that the custom Tariff Legislation Amendment Bill of 1995 and the Excise Tariff Amendment Bill No. 2 of 1995 be read a third time. The question is that, that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Clark. Customs Tariff Legislation Amendment Bill 1995, Excise Tariff Amendment Bill No. 2 1995. Clark. Business of the Senate. Notice of Motion No. 2, standing in the name of Senator Lees for the disallowance of certain guidelines. Senator Lees. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. We uh, have uh, had ongoing discussions, and indeed the reason for delaying this one day was to continue discussions with the minister 
regarding how this could uh, actually be done. And, uh, I note that she isn't with us at the moment, so I'll talk for a few moments in the hope that she will be able to join us. Because uh, the government, uh, the minister, has asked that rather than uh, proceed the way we had planned, and that is to take out F 18.5c, that we in fact take out 18.5c2. And uh, I need to get some assurances from her before I proceed as to what the government then plans to do. Uh, and that will determine whether or not I continue with the motion as, uh, as I had originally intended, which will revive the previous clause, 75C of the original um, uh, regulations, or whether indeed we reach this compromise agreement with the government. Because uh, the basic problem is that we have each received conflicting legal advice as to how to proceed, and uh, if it can speed the process up, we're only too happy to. Uh, move along uh, the, the particular course that the, minister, that the minister has suggested. But there are a couple of assurances that I need from the minister before we determine which way we are about to go. Firstly, um, we need uh, to have it recorded on the record that what the government wants us to do is not going to cause further problems and that the government isn't going to come back and say, hang on a minute, you really can't disallow. We've suddenly found this other rule. You really can't disallow such an, uh, a small amount of a regulation, a, a subclause, and uh, this, is also, this is going to cause ongoing political, or, or, sorry, or ongoing legal difficulties. So the first assurance we need from the minister is that uh, we don't sort of have any um, swifty here. That we really are looking at an alternative that uh, is workable. And secondly, we need an assurance from the minister that uh, she will introduce a new regulation which ensures that whatever the decision of the Senate here today, that that will be reflected in that new regulation which will take effect from April 1, 1996. In other words, that uh, because what we are actually now only disallowing, and I will read it out so there is no um, uncertainty, that from 1 April 1996, centres will apply the client's childcare assistance percentage to 50 per cent of the rebateable fee to calculate the childcare assistance entitlement. That, in other words, we want to undertaking that you will then replace that. So uh, there is an ongoing, uh, very clear uh, instruction for centres. Minister. Um, <laughs> Madam Acting Deputy President, Senator Lees. Um, I, I just want to be clear from perhaps your ruling, Madam Chair, that um, you are not, not yet going to the substantive debate. Right. Um, it, it, what, what I wanted to say, Madam Deputy Chair, I think probably Senator Lees, I heard a bit, and I didn't hear the next bit, and I did hear the end bit. Um, uh, I'm presuming that, Senator Lees, you made your comments by, as a statement by leave. In retrospect, was leave granted? Well, I was going to seek, then have to seek leave to continue with the substantive debate. I don't mind which way it's done, whichever suits the chair. Well, was leave granted for Senator Lees to make her previous comments? Retrospective no objections. Granted. Leave was granted. Minister, you would like I leave to make. I presume I should seek leave. Thank you too, uh, Madam. Is leave granted? No objections. Leave is granted. Um, we're in the curious position of um, finding, um, as much as we can tell, two um, legal advices in conflict here. Now, the government has got a clear way to go, and that is that we act on the advice from um, the uh, attorney's office and our, our legal advisers, so we don't have the option of um, considering other opinions, although the legal people might. But it's quite clear um, that there is confusion in this area, and um, uh, I have to say, as I said to you, Senator Lees, last night, through you, Madam Chair, the Deputy President, I'm sorry, that I grew up understanding that it was not possible to amend regulations and deleting sections, certainly in Labor Party quarters, would uh, qualify as an amendment. So I'm not quite sure how we are able to do what we are doing. But we are advised on the best counsel that we can do this. And so Senator Lee's concern is that should she have the numbers in or uh, her motion have the numbers, that is that we do not move to a 50 per cent childcare assistance after uh, the 1st of April 1996 that um, the government would be responsible for making sure that a regulation came that made sure that the intention of the Senate uh, was covered. Well, Senator Lees, I'd like to give you that assurance absolutely. I sincerely hope I don't have to do anything about it on the grounds that you might get rolled in the next few minutes, but I think it is um, 
following a lot of discussions, um, and certainly uh, an agreed matter, that uh, I would certainly give you that assurance, and that is as of April the 1st, 1996, um, if there were a need to maintain the 100% childcare uh, assistance for the holiday period, that uh, I could assure you that would be given. Senator Lees, you are now speaking to your substantive motion. Yes, do I need leave to do that? No. Or can I proceed? You just move it. Thank you. I therefore move uh, the uh, motion before us with one amendment, and that is that instead of looking at uh, paragraph 5C of guidelines, we are now looking at 5C part 2 of the guidelines, and I move uh, that, that uh, they actually be removed from, uh, from that instrument. Is leave, can I just see if leave is granted for the motion to be amended? There is no objections. Leave is granted. Senator Lees, you may proceed. Right. Well, I will now seek to convince the Senate uh, to ensure that we do have the numbers in order to uh, remove uh, what we see as the one regressive nasty, if you like, in this particular uh, uh, set of guidelines before us. By disallowing the subclause containing the measure, what we are seeking to achieve is to have the status quo remain. And, uh, the minister has agreed that this uh, indeed is, uh, is where, we have it, where we're heading and that she has agreed to an undertaking to ensure that the correct wording is reinserted. As I said in the budget, the government announced this regressive measure, which cuts by 16 million next year the total amount of childcare assistance or fee relief paid out by the government. And it is targeted, and this is our problem, at the people who can least afford it, at the lowest income families. The lower your income, the harder you will be hit by this move. It's one of the most regressive measures anyone could possibly dream up, hitting hardest indeed those people that the government and the coalition like to refer to as the battlers. Now, the measure that's hidden away in this particular subclause, which were, uh, and these uh, regulations were tabled in this place on the 16th of October. What it does is it just changes from the 1st of April next year the amounts by which fee relief or childcare assistance is paid by the government to parents for allowable holiday absences. Now, these allowable absences are for up to five weeks, and what the government is effectively saying is that while you're on holidays and your childcare place is on hold, they will pay only half the amount of childcare assistance or fee relief you're entitled to. Now, superficially, that argument is certainly attractive. It isn't. Uh, that is, it's not fair for a family to have to pay full fees while their place is on hold, while the family is on holidays, and that centres do need some sort of incentive to fill places while its usual occupants are temporarily away. The government is suggesting that only half the fees should be charged, and it is acting unilaterally to cut its contribution to the fee for holiday periods by half. Now, we have no, no problem in agreeing that a holding fee could perhaps be lower than a normal fee. We have no problem in saying to services, how about trying to arrange your fee structure so that you do charge lower fees for holiday absences and slightly more for the rest of the year, and some centres are indeed able to do that. But as in particular we talk to centres in lower income areas, this is simply not a realistic possibility. And the reality is, uh, as far as this measure is concerned, that it is not simply an encouragement to achieve that. It's not about greater fairness or lower fees. It's about government savings and, inevitably, for those centres who can't accommodate this measure, higher fees for parents. The government aims to save $16 million a year by the measure, by cutting its childcare assistance outlays. The money will not come from wealthy parents, but from parents who are eligible for childcare assistance, parents who, by definition, are less well off. And I just want to go through, through some ex specific examples so that people listening do understand how this actually works. Fees are set by centres to cover a series of fixed costs. All costs over the year are taken into account. Those costs are divided across by the number uh, of places on offer over the year, including the times when some families may be taking holidays, because there's no way of knowing who will be taking how long and when. It is not a particularly mysterious process. Some parents can then get fee relief or assistance from the government to help pay whatever the fee is that that, that centre determines. Now, the government is saying we only want to pay half of the fee relief, half of what the family is normally, normally entitled to for holiday absences. So what is going to happen then? The shortfall in what that centre has budgeted for is going to have to be made up. For those weeks a family is on holiday, the centre will only get half the amount of childcare assistance they budgeted for. 
they may be able to absorb it. And in some centres where there are very few low-income families, in other words, they rely on relatively little childcare, uh, fee relief, they may indeed be able to do that. But it's community-based centres who base fees on cost of recovery that we are particularly concerned about, and in particular those, those centres in lower income areas where there's a very, very high percentage of parents on fee relief and indeed full fee relief. Now, centres' fees are generally at around break-even, particularly those in the community centres. They set a rate which private centres must compete with. There may be some room for a few private centres in areas where there is a long waiting list to, to absorb some of these costs. But the evidence that has been placed before us is that there are indeed very few centres that will be fully able to, to absorb them, and the majority of centres will be struggling. So inevitably, the cost will be passed on to the parents. The parents will pay for the government's savings of $16 million, and the impact will be greatest, as I said before, in those areas who have the most children el eligible for childcare assistance. So to look practically at how these fees will be passed on. Let's look at a couple of examples. Using working families who need full-time care. Assume that the centre has a fee of $140 a week, an average fee. First, let's look at a family on $62,000 a year annual income. They receive no fee relief. They can go on holidays whenever they like and have no increase in their normal fee. This doesn't affect them whatsoever. Secondly, let's look at a family on $35,000 a year. They get about 60 per cent of the maximum possible fee relief. That is, of the $140 a week that they owe, they would normally receive from the government assistance of around about $67, leaving the family to cover about $72, $73 gap per week. This family goes on holidays for three weeks. The government says, we're only paying half your assistance, half that that we normally do. That is $33.75 instead of $67.50 for each of those weeks. The centre says, you have to make up the money. Not only do you owe the normal $72.50 for the week, but an extra $33.75, which the government has declined to subsidise your fee by. So for the three weeks that you're on holidays, that's an extra outlay of $101.25 that the family will have to find. One possibility is that the fee could be spread over the entire year, which some centres have said is another way that they're looking at doing it. If it is, uh, say, spread over 50 weeks, arriving at the higher average fee so the whole bill doesn't come at once, that would increase the family's fees by $2 a week every week. So a $101 bill up front or about $2 a week increase for a family on $35,000. Now, let's look at the family that earns $25,000 a year. On that income, the family is on full fee relief. That is, it receives from the government the maximum childcare assistance of $112.50 per week to cover the majority of the centre's fees, leaving the family with a gap cover of about $27.50 per week. This family goes on holidays for three week, weeks, and the government says we're only paying half your assistance that we normally do. That is, we're only paying $56.25 instead of $112.50 for each of those weeks. And the centre says, sorry, but we have to still charge you. Where is the money? Not only do you owe the normal $27.50 for the week, but you also owe an extra $56.25, which the government has declined to subsidise your fee by. So over three weeks, that's an extra $168.75 the family will have to find. That is, $168 for a family which earns about $450 a week. And I really do argue with the government that that is a substantial amount of money. To suggest that it is an inconsequential, that we're really only talking about small amounts of money, is not correct when we actually look at the level of income that families have to um, manage on. If we spread this over the entire year, we'd be looking at an e uh, increasing the family's fee by about $3.40 per week every week. So, as far as this particular measure is concerned, the poorer you are, the harder you are hit. On 62,000, there's no impact. On 35, $101 a year. On $25,000 a year, $168 a year, and that's with three weeks' holidays. Now, have more children, and the bill becomes more complicated. For example, if you're on maximum fee relief, that is, an income of around 25,000, and have two children in care. Then, what, when you take holidays, your bill under this measure will increase, like something like $103 a week for each week you're on holidays. That is, for three weeks' holiday, $309, or spread over a week, $6.20 a week. Now, if someone is writing a dictionary and wants a definition 
uh, of, uh, of the word regressive, I don't think we could really find a better way than describing it uh, by looking at this particular measure. It certainly would be a perfect definition of regressive. You can put this through as many different scenarios as you like, but it's $16 million out of the pockets of those who can least afford it. Centres in affluent areas across our cities and in our affluent rural areas where very few children get fee relief will be virtually unaffected by this measure. It's those centres that are in, for example, the western suburbs uh, of Sydney, the northern and southern suburbs of my home city that are going to be worst affected. We say to you, Minister, find somewhere else to make your savings. And that uh, is uh, also before pointing out what a financial and administrative nightmare this uh, could well be for centres. As I said at the start, by disallowing uh, sub this particular subclause, that is 185C2, uh, we will see the status quo remain and we will leave the government to look elsewhere for these savings. Sen Minister. Um, thank you, um, Madam Acting Deputy President. Well, perspective is all, and I find this um, <coughs> um, argument by um, uh, Senator Lees uh, a really uh, a very interesting argument. Uh, it is actually contrary to a lot of the facts, uh, Senator Lees, and it's certainly, I'm sorry, Madam Acting Deputy President, through you, and it's certainly um, contrary to a lot of practice. And I'd like to take senators through what is the, um, uh, the situation and why the government's intention to do this is um, uh, one of the matters that we um, um, put through in the budget. Um, the savings for government are $37 million over four years, so it is um, no small sum. Secondly, the Australian Law Reform Commission, when it did a comparison of childcare, a thorough examination of it about a year ago, highlighted the fact of an inequity between family daycare, where they have always only had 50 per cent childcare assistance for holidays, and long daycare centre, where they have been eligible for 100 per cent, and as a matter of uh, fairness and equity between the two sectors, that they um, uh, made the point that um, we should take note of this um, enormous discrepancy. That is another, I think, very persuasive reason for why we should be moving to um, 50 per cent childcare assistance for holidays across all sectors. You could well ask why families who have got comparable sorts of fees in family daycare uh, have uh, a 50 per cent childcare assistance for vacation care absences, but people in long day care centres do not. The next important point to say is that the charging practices of centres are the charging practices of centres, and they are not a government responsibility. Well, sometimes I have to say, Senator Lees, I'm enormously tempted to think about the benefits I could introduce into childcare if I was setting fees, but we don't have that power, and I must say, I think on the whole, we don't want it. But we certainly do have to deal with the confusion in the community when childcare assistance, which is to assist with the fees and to offset them, if you like, to provide fee relief. Uh, is a, go a, a government responsibility, but the fee practices, the setting of fees, the fees that centres charge, is entirely the uh, centre's responsibility. You gave some examples, Senator Lees, of uh, how centres can decide to take into account their costs and um, spread them over a year, taking into account the needs of people for holidays and so on, and others who um, set a fee for when a child is there and just keep charging it right on through the holidays. We have to also know that centres have been a bit slow to uh, modify their charging practices and have been initiated in their, um, changing their practices by um, government um, uh, changes in childcare assistance, which isn't perhaps um, the very best way of dealing with things. But um, a little while ago you will remember that um, many of the centres were discovered uh, to be charging um, full fees and getting full childcare assistance for children who only attended two days a week. Now that practice, um, the industry as well as the government agreed had to stop, and it has stopped, and it has made a difference to centres. It could be that no, no more children are going to the centres, but their charging practices have changed. And um, I think if, if um, our, our um, childcare assistance contribution can assist centres in thinking about their fee setting um, 
processes, then I think that is a very good thing. But the first important point is that this is a budget measure with savings of 37 million over four years. Secondly, it's a matter of equity, alerted um, or alluded to by the, um, or not alluded to, drawn to our attention by the Law Reform Commission about an inequity between family daycare, where there is a 50 per cent um, childcare assistance for holidays, and not so in long daycare. The other thing I'd have to say, Senator Lees, is that um, we have given, um, under allowable absences, up to five weeks holidays, but we also have that buffer of 12 days for unseen circumstances. Now, they won't change. They will still enjoy 100% uh, childcare assistance, as will uh, absences due to sickness. And it's fairly true that for a large number of people using childcare, they can anticipate when they'll be taking holidays. And the centres have the opportunity to provide those places for other parents who are desperate uh, for uh, access to childcare. In particular, we have the need and demand for vacation care. There are many, many families who may be able to get before and after school hour care during the school term but don't have access to vacation care. The, the long day care centres could indeed um, use those places for um, uh, vacation care and it is, it's designed for the children. It would be a splendid setup. They get the child care assistance for it. It would encourage the centres if you like, to market themselves to a slightly wider community would allow them to have the income into their centre to keep it viable, and it would meet the needs, very significant needs, particularly for vacation care of the safe, secure sort that families want. We also have figures of um, uh, something like 153,000 children who um, uh, uh, we are uh, on the, the evidence we have would be very pleased to have a, occasional care, casual care, that is people who don't want regular occasional care but certainly uh, are looking for and would be on a list as, yes, please, happy to, to use a ca a casual occasional care if that becomes available. Again, we are asking centres to introduce that kind of flexibility because the vacation care is five weeks usually as a chunk. They can see that opportunity coming and they could certainly let some of the families who are desperate for child care in a casual or not an ongoing way to fill in those places. So we would be asking centres to appreciate um, the, the opportunities they have for extending the families who could use their childcare, and I'd highlight in particular vacation care. But a couple of other facts that need to be put into your equation, Senator Lees, um, and it's a matter of, um, I don't wish to be uh, hair splitting, but the majority or the maximum childcare assistance is about $96. The figure of 112.50 is, is really what the, the fee is set at, and families then have to pay the $16.50. So I think you'd find the maximum assistance is 96. It doesn't make too much difference to the equation you gave at all, but I just draw that to your attention. But in fact, not all centres choose to force parents to pay full fees for holiday absences. Both private and community-based centres in Tasmania, uh, across those both private and community, the majority only charge 50 per cent holiday fees for holidays. In Queensland, the majority of community-based centres charge 50 per cent holding fees for holidays, so that even now they have set their charges at half rate for holidays. And I'm very pleased that they do it, and I certainly want to encourage it, because the, case you, the cases you illustrate, Senator Lees, are really outrageous. I have no truck at all for parents having to pay more for childcare when they're not there than when they're using it. That is absolutely daft, but I don't believe it's solved by leaving the 100 per cent childcare assistance there. It is solved by asking the childcare centres to drop their fees to correspond with the reduced childcare assistance. I, I would also take issue with you by saying families who pay full fees and get no childcare assistance are not affected because their fee remains the same. I can assure you that's not what those parents write to me. Why should I continue to pay $140 a week when my child is not using the centre? Now, parents do understand that there may be a case for some kind of fee to contribute to the cost and to make sure that place is there for them when they come back after five weeks. But why should they pay the same amount of childcare when they're not using the centre? It is daft, absolutely daft, and I have all the sympathy in the world for people who find they pay more for childcare when they're not using it. That is really crazy. It's not a question of sheeting that home to the government. It is a question of sheeting that home to the charging practices of centres. And it is very important to know that um, 
uh, in Queensland, as I just remind you, Senator, both private and community-based centres in Tasmania, the majority only charge 50 per cent holding fees for holidays right now. And in Queensland, the majority of community-based centres charge 50 per cent holding fees. So already a lot of centres have um, recognised that it's daft to be charging the same rate when parents are not using childcare. Uh, can I just say that these are, I think, enlightened charging practices, but they are not consistent across the whole sector, and I'd certainly like to see the rest of the, the childcare, both community-based and long-day care, to um, take note of what's already happening in some parts and move to doing it themselves. <laughs> the uh, situation in family day care is quite different. The provision of 50 per cent entitlement to childcare assistance for holiday absences is the standard practice in family day care. As I have already said, the Australian Law Reform Commission, in its 1994 review, drew this to our attention. It is important to note that in family day care, only 5 per cent of schemes charge the full fees for holiday absences. And I certainly <laughs> think it is about time I knew which ones. 95 per cent of schemes charge half the full fee or less for holiday absences. And I think that is absolutely appropriate and absolutely something we should be encouraging. And if a recognisable 50 per cent childcare assistance to be consistent across the sectors will encourage that kind of rational charging practice uh, across the whole of the long day care, I'd have to support it. People who are paying more for childcare when they're not using it have a very large right to complain bitterly, but I think it's important that they don't sheath that responsibility home to government. <coughs> It's certainly the family daycare scheme 50 per cent reduction is very good evidence that if you have a 50 per cent childcare assistance for holidays, then you do get a remarkable 50 per cent reduction of fees for the holiday period. So I've pointed out that there is an opportunity for people, families looking for vacation care, and a lot of the people taking holidays from childcare will be taking a four or five week block as they're allowed to. Um, that often fits with um, uh, if you've got other children in school, you want the holidays to correspond to, to school holidays. Those holidays can be anticipated by the centre. They can offer those places to others looking for vacation care because they don't have the same opportunity for holidays. It certainly um, uh, will require perhaps um, a different bit of effort on the childcare centres, but it's the sort of thing that will families will appreciate enormously, and it will help them uh, during the period when they might be looking at a drop in income because of a slightly reduced holding fee. I think that um, um, I'm not persuaded by your argument, um, Senator Lees. You can make the case as you do on the figures, and those figures are in large part right, but they depend on the charging practices. The government dropping its childcare assistance is not promoting regressivity, it's promoting <coughs> fair charging practices by centres. And as I say, I, I don't think whether you have got full fee relief or none at all, you're encouraged by a process that makes you pay uh, more when you're um, away from the childcare than when you're in it, or maintain very expensive fees um, that uh, people who get no childcare assistance uh, would have to pay. I also find it difficult to um, uh, reconcile Senator Lee's argument that um, we should maintain 100 per cent childcare assistance for um, centres where people are on holidays, taking their allowable absence for holidays, and yet um, see a significant campaign to oppose the 12 hours legislation that would allow more opportunity for more families wanting particularly occasional care. Um, but, of course, if those places currently used by occasional care uh, were um, uh, modified, then, of course, many more working families would have access to childcare too. But I think in all ways, uh, while I understand exactly the sentiment behind Senator Lee's proposal um, in moving this um, uh, amendment, this changed regulation. This disallowance motion. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, I am I'm not at all persuaded by the argument because the regressivity disappears very significantly if the fees match the childcare assistance instead of the childcare assistance being maintained at a high level to um, just keep those fees up. To do that will not uh, bring in a question of equity. It certainly won't produce any savings, 
and it certainly will not encourage those centres to rethink their charging practices or their recruiting practices. We know there are families that would love vacation care. We know there are families that would enjoy the occasional and casual care that those places would provide. We know most holidays come in blocks of, of three or four or five weeks, and we know that they can be anticipated and planned for as parents plan for them so they can notify the child care centres. I think there is an excellent case to um, uh, oppose this disallowance motion to make sure that the child care assistance is fair across the sectors and to encourage the practice of reducing the fees during holidays, as is already happening in significant parts of the, long, of the, the um, uh, child care industry, apart from family day care. I'd urge people to um, oppose this disallowance motion. Senator Troth. Acting Deputy President. Uh, I will admit that the coalition have a certain unease about this measure, as with the other budget measures that were proposed for the childcare industry as of um, last May, because we certainly have heard from the childcare industry that there has been a lack of consultation about these measures, and I would like to place on record that the coalition have criticised these measures in the Senate. However, um, the coalition will be opposing the disallowance of, of this motion um, or the disallowance of this measure, and I would like to briefly run through the, the, the reasons that we, um, we are doing that. Um, I do not agree with Senator Crowley, firstly, that cost is the most important issue here. Um, cost, to be honest, should never be an issue when looking at the, at the childcare field. The care of children and um, and the ultimate welfare of the family should be the most important issue. The coalition considers that in comparison with the 12-hour issue, which was another budget measure and which we have debated here at length in the Senate, that um, that issue has far more impact on families over the whole year as regards their access to childcare. I agree with Senator Crowley, amazingly enough, Senator Crowley, that vacation care um, under, under the existing government measure would then be available for others, and so would occasional care in the, in the sense of casual care. And you would like to think that that is something that would be available for all parents throughout Australia if and when they desire it. Uh, I take your point about the in existing inequity between long daycare centres and family daycare centres, and in the in the interests of looking at, I would hope, one day a much more integrated approach between every sector of the childcare industry, and I'm talking here not just about family daycare and long daycare, but also preschool centres, um, we would like to think that some of these inequities could be ironed out. As I said, we would like to distinguish it um, from the 12-hour rule, because, which is um, being looked at at the moment, because that is another issue. I do believe that centres may be able to absorb this extra cost, and, um, and that if spread over the year and parents can plan for it, um, that there may be not as much financial impact as Senator Lees has indicated. Uh, I think that sums up the reasons um, why, Madam Acting Deputy Chairman, um, the Coalition will be opposing the disallowance of this motion. Thank you, Senator Troth. Senator to close the debate? You can speak in reply. You don't need leave. All right, I can speak in reply. If I can just answer a couple of things that the Minister said. With regard to the Law Reform Commission's report, they talked about aligning payments, uh, and which we, obviously you can do that either way. I take your point that family day care can adapt far more easily to holidays. To begin with, they have far fewer children, and it's often very convenient indeed for them to close down uh, or to, to make other arrangements during those periods of time, indeed in some cases uh, combining various family day care groups. I take, wish to take up Senator Tro's point that what we really need in the childcare area is full integrated planning of all the services, those available at local government level, state government level and federal government level. And the fact that we indeed have this disallowance issue before us today is, I think, indicative of the government's method of planning, which is picking out particular measures that they hope will save money at budget time and not looking at the overall planning in this particular industry. Uh, I would argue, Minister, it's far more difficult for centres who have got 30 or 40 or more children 
to simply uh, make other arrangements during holidays unless they are in a particular environment, and as you've already said, some are able to offer half fees. I think if we looked at the suburbs and locations of some of those centres, we would see that they're far more affluent than the centres that I am concerned about in the particular areas in, uh, in suburbs where they simply may not be able to attract in significant numbers of children for vocational or holiday care. And indeed, here again I take Senator Tro's point, with the 12-hour issue still rumbling around, uh, or indeed perhaps take it a step further than she did, how would the 12-hour rule impact on this? Because if we're looking at children at, at holiday time, mum's now got three home from school plus a younger one, if the 12-hour rule is in place, she may indeed not be able to take up the offer of the, or the possibility of vocational care for that one uh, for anything more than 12 hours of a week. And so that won't help really help the childcare centres uh, in their dilemma of how they are going to make up the money. So the Democrats stand by our motion because we believe that this is one of the most regressive moves the government could have made or, or found in, <laughs> to find money. And as for centres, you, you seem to be suggesting, Minister, that uh, uh, centres won't have any encouragement to, uh, to find uh, other children or to advertise. You, you yourself have really undone that argument by giving examples of those centres that are already doing that. I would argue that many centres are trying to fill these places, and if they do, then they are able to offer uh, the long-term parents reduced amounts of money. Those parents then obviously will claim uh, less fee relief. But we are, and I stress again, very concerned about those centres in working class areas, those centres that are not in affluent suburbs where parents can simply absorb a few more dollars a week uh, on, their, on their childcare bill. So I'm very disappointed to note that uh, we won't have the numbers in the chamber to uh, pass this disallowance. The question is that the disallowance motion moved by Senator Lees be agreed to. Those that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. I think the noes have it. The noes have it. Yes, Minister. Can I just make clear that um, I would like to uh, uh, assure the Senate that I will now um, guarantee that, that the regulations we have actually cover all situations. So I just promise to do that for Senator Lee should, should her disallowance have succeeded. I must make sure that, um, that what we have got in place will now be in place and centres are clearly clear, uh, uh, understand that and will be able to act with that way. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Clark. Senate Order of the Day, Select Committee on Aircraft Noise, report to be presented. Senator Perra. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I present the report of the Senate of the Select Committee on Aircraft Noise in Sydney, together with the submissions received by the committee and the transcript of evidence, and move that the report be printed. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Senator Perra. Madam Acting Deputy President, due to the high demands that have been placed on the printing unit at present, this report is being tabled in A4 format and will not be available in printed form until late tonight. In the interim, limited copies of the executive summaries of the report are available on request from the committee secretariat. Madam Acting Deputy President, I seek leave to move a motion in relation to the report. Is leave granted? There being no objections, leave is granted. Senator Perra. Madam Acting Deputy President, I, uh, I move that the Senate take note of the report. Do you wish to speak? Yes. Please continue. Madam Acting Deputy President, the opening of the third runway at Sydney Airport and the closure of the east-west runway has shattered the lives of thousands of Sydney residents. The Senate established this committee on 8 March 1995 to investigate the noise burden generated by the government's Sydney Airport policy and to explore possible solutions to the problem. The committee received more than 5,200 submissions and held 14 days of public hearings between July and November. From the beginning, the EIS process was marked by ambiguity and confusion. The federal government decided to build the third runway in 1989, subject to the satisfactory completion of normal EIS processes. However, this decision was communicated to the Federal Airports Corporation as a decision to construct the runway, subject to it meeting stringent guidelines to be established through an EIS. In other words, the Federal Airports Corporation believed the EIS was intended to minimise the environmental impact. The decision to build the runway had already been taken by the government. The committee has made a number of recommendations concerning the environmental impact assessment process. In future, the government should clearly establish if it is conducting an EIS to decide whether a project should go ahead or conducting an EIS to work out the best way of managing the impact of a project. 
Many parts of the EIS were prepared at a, to a very high standard. However, some of its key predictions were wrong, and at least one of them was demonstrated to be wrong at the time. The environmental impact statement predicted that prevailing winds would mean the aircraft would only take off to the north 13 per cent of the time. The actual figure over the past 10 years has been more than double the EIS prediction. This raises serious doubts about many of the noise impact forecasts in the statement. Aircraft noise is measured by the Australian Noise Exposure Forecast, or ANEF, system. The committee has concluded that the ANEF system has serious limitations. It may be adequate for land use planning purposes, but is not adequate for assessing the effects of, noise, effects of changes in noise exposure. We have therefore recommended that the National Acoustics Laboratories thoroughly redraft the ANEF system in the light of the problems that have emerged. On operational measures, the government has implemented a number of operational measures in an effort to minimise the impact of the noise generated by the airport. The committee has concluded that these measures have only marginally been effective. The Australian International Pilots have described them as band-aid fixes. The Sydney airport noise is a problem that requires more than band-aids or Dettol. The committee believes the noise generated by the airport should be spread equitably. This goal can only be achieved if Air Services Australia can use all three runways at the airport, and that means reopening of the east-west runway. The government has repeatedly rejected using the east-west runway more extensively on safety grounds. Independent advice to the committee suggests that the dependent use of intersecting runways is not only a safe operation but a common one. The American consultancy Flight Transportation Associates told the committee, and I quote, Incidents and accidents have occurred at airports with single runways, parallel runways and cross-intersecting runways. No one configuration has been declared to present a higher level of risk than the other. No one configuration has been identified as presenting an unacceptable level of risk. The government's claims about safety implications for using intersecting runways are a recent innovation. Neither the draft in the EIS nor the EIS supplement mention safety as a reason for not using the east-west runway in conjunction with parallel runways, nor was safety a concern during the Cabinet's evaluation of the proposal. The government has argued that the increasing use of the east-west runway would reduce capacity. The average movement rate on the parallel runway system is 58 movements per hour. This is comparable to the average movement rate that was achieved before the third runway was opened. Air, Air Services Australia believes it will eventually be able to achieve 80 movements per hour. The committee considered a range of alternate runway configurations and concluded that the increasing use of the East West runway need not reduce airport capacity. The committee has therefore recommended the development of a new airspace management plan for Sydney Airport. The new airspace management plan should examine the best means of obtaining using all three runways at the airport to balance safety, capacity and the equitable distribution of noise. The committee does not believe SIMOPS needs to be introduced at Sydney Airport for capacity reasons. As regards remedial measures, the government is curr currently implementing an acquisition and insulation scheme in the suburbs to the north of Sydney Airport. Our most important recommendation in this area relates to the scope of the insulation scheme. At the moment, it is restricted to the 4,200 homes within the 30 ANEF. The committee agrees with the final noise management plan that was prepared for the government last year. That plan recommended that the insulation scheme should be extended to the 25 ANEF contour. As regards a second airport, the government has portrayed the development of Sydney West Airport as an immediate solution to the Sydney airport noise problem, but the airport will only handle a small number of passengers and aircraft at first. There is still an urgent need to address the airport's infrastructure requirements, particularly the development of an airport rail link. The government is currently revising the environmental impact statement for Sydney West Airport. The process must be open and transparent to maintain public confidence. It is essential that the government and its consultants do not make the same mistakes that were made in the Sydney environmental impact statement. In conclusion, Madam Acting Deputy President, the existing mode of operations at Sydney Airport can only be described as an environmental and social tragedy. 
The noise problems generated by the airport under the current mode of operations will not go away. It is the view of the majority of the committee that it can only get worse. In conclusion, I would like to thank all members of the committee for the dignified way in which the proceedings were conducted. I'd also like, on behalf of the committee, to express our thanks to the committee's secretary, James Warmanhoven, and the staff, who did a magnificent job in sifting through the thousands of submissions and compiling the final report. Senator Forshaw. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. The uh, Labor members of the committee, uh, Senator Neal, Senator Charles, and myself, have uh, presented a uh, minority report. Should I, can I say at the outset that uh, we are somewhat disappointed at the outcome of this inquiry? Disappointed because it could have been a much more worthwhile inquiry. However, it was politicised from the start. It was politicised by the opposition even before the first hearings commenced. Senator Parra, the chairman of the committee, moved a notice of motion in the Senate on the 23rd of February, in which he called for the reopening of the east-west runway, where he called for the reintroduction of cross-runway operations at Kingsford Smith Airport. The Senate Select Committee was set up on the 8th of March 1995. So from the outset, there was a predetermined view by the opposition which became a campaign by the opposition, both the members of the committee and, in particular, of course, the uh, leader of the opposition, Mr Howard. It became a campaign with a single objective, to have the east-west runway reopened to cross-runway operations. And in that context, a lot of other issues that could have been addressed in more detail, such as Sydney West Airport, uh, were not, in our view, dealt with as ade adequately as they could. And therefore, we believe particularly that the majority report leaves a lot to be desired in terms of endeavouring to cover the issues, but secondly, is in, some, in a number of uh, key respects uh, wrong. If I could deal firstly with the east-west runway issue. As I said, this became the single core celebre of the opposition. The Leader of the Opposition, Mr Howard, appeared before the inquiry on the 25th of July. And as the member for Bannalong, he said that day he called for the reopening of the runway. And then from there on in, he campaigned at every opportunity on that issue. He nobbled his own inquiry, or the inquiry and his own opposition senators. The fact that it was a political inquiry was very disappointing because there were over 5,000 submissions from interested and affected residents as well as industry, councils, medical practitioners, unions, community groups, schools, churches, government departments, academics and many, many others who came along, gave their evidence, put forward proposals and believed that something more positive might come out of it. But because it was directed back always to this single issue of the east-west runway, I think one can feel disappointment with the outcome. But I do also say that the information that was compiled and presented to the committee will continue to be valuable in the future. In the minority report, we detail the long history of support given by the opposition to the building of the third runway. And we do that because what we saw during this committee inquiry was an attempt by the opposition to run as far away from the issue as they could, to endeavour to absolve themselves of any responsibility with respect to the construction of the third runway at Sydney Airport and the resulting problems of aircraft noise. The history, as we've detailed, notes that time and time again opposition spokesperson urged the government to build the third runway. And the reasons that they used in urging the runway to be built, they used the issues of congestion at Sydney Airport. They used the, in, the issue of safety at Sydney Airport. They put safety fairly and squarely on the agenda. 
and they also recognised that in the decision to build the runway, safety would be improved and the number of residents affected by aircraft noise would be drastically reduced by half by the concurrent downgrading of the east-west runway. They cannot deny that. It was there from the outset. It was a preeminent uh, uh, factor in the uh, EIS deliberations that the east-west runway would be downgraded. But they now try to rewrite history and do so only in a uh, uh, desperate attempt to garner support from people who may be affected by aircraft noise. To them, it is a pre-election issue. It is a pre-election stunt. Senator Parra says that independent expert advice was given on safety, and he quotes Flight Transportation Associates. That organisation, a US firm of consultants, did not give evidence to the committee at all. Rather, a letter, a submission, was presented to the committee on their behalf. They at no stage were cross-examined, nor was there any opportunity for the committee to test their proposals in detail. But against that, we had expert evidence from the Bureau of Air Safety Investigation, from the Civil Aviation Safety Authority, from the Air Services Australia, from the airlines, from the air traffic controllers, all saying that parallel runways were safer. But nevertheless, the opposition tried to distort the evidence of those groups by saying that they were arguing that cross runways were unsafe. They never said that. What they said that was parallel runways were safer. And the evidence is clear that the reintroduction of the east west runway, as proposed, would either reduce capacity, thus creating pressure to uh, introduce takeoffs to the north from the third runway, or it would reduce safety, or it would increase noise for residents to the north, or indeed a combination of those. And we have come to the conclusion that we cannot support the reopening of the east-west runway on the various uh, grounds and uh, uh, reasons that were put forward. Because at the end of the day, the expert advice was there that the system we have is safer and more efficient, and government should not ignore the advice of such agencies. Can I also quickly turn to the EIS process? We agree that it left a lot to be desired. In fact, it could be described in many ways, particularly with regard to community consultation, as abysmal. And we are quite clear in our view that the Federal Airports Corporation and other agencies failed in their duty to provide the community with correct advice. And indeed, it is clear that many were misled into thinking that their situation would be improved. But as we know, it got worse. And we have made some very strong recommendations as part of what we call a public interest package to ensure that that does not occur again. Order, and Senator Forshaw. It being 12.45 p.m., the Senate will proceed to non-controversial bills pursuant to order. Clark. Government business order of the day, number seven, telecommunications interception amendment bill, 1994. Second reading, adjourned debate. Senator Van Stone. Sorry, thank you, uh, Madam, Madam Acting Deputy President. Um, the Telecommunications Interception Amendment Bill of 1994 has been sadly left at the bottom of the list. Uh, uh, I had thought uh, by the government not uh, not keen enough to pass the bill, and I believe uh, that the bill will be of significant advantage to the um, New South Wales Royal Commission into Police Corruption. I uh, indicated at some stage last week, I believe it was Wednesday, uh, to the Democrats that I had intended moving a notice of motion in the chamber uh, to indicate that we believed it was inappropriate for the bill to be left any longer at the bottom of the pile. Um, the Democrats indicated they'd had some troubles with the 
uh, not with the substance of the bill, but because they wanted to uh, satisfy themselves uh, with respect to the guidelines that would be made under the bill. I understand they have now had the opportunity to see at least the draft of those guidelines and believe that, uh, by and large, their concerns are going to be uh, catered for and, on that basis, uh, notified the government that they were then happy to have this bill dealt with in a non-controversial way uh, during the Thursday lunchtimes. Uh, there would be plenty of opportunity, if I wanted, Madam Acting Deputy President, to I go on at length about this. Uh, suffice it to say that this bill, I think, will be of advantage to the uh, Commission. The Minister might like to give a nod if he thinks that's right. Is it? Do you think that's right, Minister? Absolutely. A wonderful bill. The yes. Thank you. Um, but since it is a non-controversial bill, and I'm the one that's complained that it's taken too long to get it up to the top of the list, and I had thought it was the government's fault. I thought it was the government's indol indolence and slack attitude to. Uh, police corruption that was allowing them to leave it at the bottom. I now understand that is a function of the Democrats, who, with the threat of a notion of a motion to notice of motion to expose their lax attitude to this, uh, decided to um, come to the party. And uh, I think I'll leave it at that and say the coalition supports the bill. I presume there are no other speakers apart from the minister. In the bill to the Senate. The question is that motion be agreed. To, uh, the question is that the bill be now read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Clerk. A bill for an act to amend the telecommunications interception bill and for other purposes. We're in committee. We've got an amendment for the chair. What is it? It's the wish of the committee that the bill be taken as a whole. Yeah. There be no objection. It is so ordered. The question is the bill standards printed. Those of the opinions say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The question is the bill be reported. Those of the opinions say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Thank you. The temporary chairman of committee, Senator Watson, reports that the committee has considered the Telecommunications Interception Amendment Bill 1994 and has agreed to it without amendments. Motion adopted. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Third time. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Clerk. A bill for an act to amend the Telecommunications Interception Act 1979 and the Telecommunications yes. Act 1991 and for related purposes. The sort of day number eight, Law and Justice Legislation Amendment Bill number three, 1994, in committee. The committee is considering the bill, particularly the amendment moved by Senator Margetts. Any... President, I will be very brief, but I am asked to do this, uh, put this on the record. On the 6th of March 1995, Senator Margetts proposed an amendment to the Sex Discrimination Act 1984 to enable married students to be eligible for qualifying for the high independent rate of off-study payments by virtue of marriage. The amendment proposed would operate to exempt this practice from those provisions of the Sex Discrimination Act 1984, which, makes it, which make it unlawful to discriminate on the basis of marital status. On March 24, on March 24, 1995, the Human Rights and Equal Opportunity Commission granted a temporary administrative exemption from the marital status provision of the Sex Discrimination Act for the provision of benefits under the Ausstudy scheme until 30 December 1996. The Greens' amendment is therefore unnecessary. The Commission is presently coordinating a review into discriminatory provisions of the Social Security Act 1991. This review is required by S4A of the Sex Discrimination Act. This factor was taken into account by the Commission when it granted the Ausstudy exemption. The Commission also noted that because of the linkages between Social Security benefits and Ausstudy benefits, it would be sensible to examine and amend the two sets of benefits in conjunction. The Department of Employment, Education and Training, which administers Ausstudy, has established a working group to consider Ausstudy benefits. The establishment of the working group has been delayed pending progress of the Social Security review. The Department has advised that the working group will be established in early 1996 to consider criteria for independent status which are now non-discriminatory in terms of the Sex Discrimination Act, but which reflect the community views on who should receive benefits. And I commend the legislation. So the question is, the amendment moved by Senator Margetts 
be agreed to. Those of the opinion say aye. Um, I think, I think this will have to be postponed. That wasn't explained to me as, uh, as the manner in which this was going to be conducted. Uh, well, perhaps I wasn't listening carefully what you said, but I can say it again. But there was n I was told the Greens amendments had been withdrawn. Well, that's right. Well, then why are we agreeing to the amendment? amendments? Are therefore, never for a set of reasons that are unnecessary. But they haven't been withdrawn. Oh, so oh I somebody, see. Somebody's so we're going to withdraw them. No, that's. Well, are we allowed to do that without them here? Well, I don't know if they're just lapsed, aren't they? They're not here. Yeah, OK. All right. OK. Yep. Well, the, I, I suggest that perhaps the, if, if the Greens are happy for the amendment to be withdrawn, we just negative the amendments. OK. So I put the Greens amendment. Those with that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the noes have it. The question is the bill be reported. Those that opinion say aye. Just perhaps, um, Senator Vanstone. Mr. Chairman, the minister might clarify for me that all the uh, all the government amendments that were meant to be made have been made. Yep. They were done last time. Withdrawals, etc. You know, all been done. I'd advise that the okay. amendments were agreed to. All the government amendments were agreed to, Senator Vanstone. The question is: the bill as amended be agreed to. Those of the opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The question is: the bill be reported. Those of the opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The temporary chairman of committee, Senator Watson, reports that the committee has considered the Law and Justice Legislation Amendment Bill No. 3, 1994, and agreed to it with two amendments. The Minister, Senator Sharp. The, the question is that the motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no, the ayes have it. Senator Sharp. The bill be now read a third time. The question is the motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no, the ayes have it. The clerk. A bill for an act to amend various acts relating to law and justice and for related purposes. Government Business Order of the Day No. 5, Industrial Relations and Other Legislation Amendment Bill 1995, Second Reading, Adjourned Debate. Senator Crane, I think. Uh, Senator Watson. I think it was agreed that perhaps we might, might do superannuation, if, if, if you're happy. Um, I ask the Minister, Senator Schott, well, to— The list I've got is in that order, so I presume that's the case. And the list I've just been given— This is correct, is it? That, well, I, I yes. know that we do well, all the legislation. No, there's no need to move. I'll just ask the clerk to, to, to announce the superannuation Government bill. Business Order of the Day number 9, Superannuation Industry Supervision Legislation Amendment Bill 1995, Second Reading Adjourned Debate. Senator Watson. Thank you, President. This bill before the uh, Senate will introduce amendments to five existing bills dealing with one, prudential controls over superannuation, two, the resolution of superannuation complaints issues, taxation, general insurance and life assurance. Now, following the passage of this legislation, the Superannuation Complaints Tribunal will now be in a position to hear disability cases. The original date, of course, was the 1st of November 1995. I think honourable senators will be aware of the long debates that we had in relation to the tribunal's uh, capacity to hear medical issues. Now, the, uh, following these amendments, the tribunal will also be able to handle complaints about the sale of life company uh, superannuation products. The amended bill also provides mechanisms to overcome the High Court's what is known brandy ruling which involved judicial decision. The amendment now also uh, binds uh, insurers so that life companies can no longer opt out of their obligations in terms of disability and disablement type issues. There are important provisions for auditors who will now have to certify that a fund complies with the prudential rules for superannuation funds set out in the Act and regulations and not merely provide financial orders. It was uh, disappointing that a number of auditors decided to uh, uh, seg uh, uh, segment 
uh, audit responsibilities into categories of financial audit, compliance audit and prudential audit and charge a fee uh, for each. It was always intended that the uh, audit of financial statements, which of course the auditors are uh, a fairly exclusive group because not every auditor is able to audit a superannuation fund, but they no just did not have to provide a financial audit, but within that audit there had to be compliance uh, requirements. So that is now required under this bill. It's made it quite clear. And auditors will also have to report suspected breaches of the law to the ISC and effectively become whistleblowers. Some of the prudential amendments to the ISC uh, give the ISC power to quickly apply to the court for the appointment of a receiver to protect members, as well as providing broader inquiry powers to the ISC. These are important prudential issues. There is also the closing of a loophole regarding the payment of surplus to, uh, to uh, uh, employer spon uh, sponsors' fund or funds. And I'd also like to draw the Senate's attention to the white paper in relation to uh, issue within the UK uh, in relation to how they deal with, with surplus, because I think we have something to learn from that particular approach. There are also a number of temporary decisions, which are known as modification orders, made by the ISC. Which will, which will now rightly be transferred into CIS legislation before they lapse. And I just quote one of them. Excluded funds not to be classified as public offer funds, otherwise, of course, they would need a $5 million uh, capital. Now, the broadening of the powers of the legislation give the tribunal the opportunity to consider complaints about the conduct of the sale of life office uh, intermediaries in relation to superannuation products. And this includes agent misrepresentation. There is also a further widening of the powers to the ISC, and these extend to the conduct of independent financial planners. And this is a major uh, departure from corporation law, which makes security dealers rather than product providers responsible for investment uh, advice. So, in summary, the bill has four purposes to expand the jurisdiction of the Superannuation Complaints Tribunal, and I've only dealt with a, a, a few of the aspects of the uh, widening of that power, the transfer of certain modification orders with, uh, into statutory form, and, uh, second, uh, and uh, the requirement of superannuation entities to cover compliance, uh, audit requirements to cover compliance, plus a number, a number of, fourthly, a number of miscellaneous amendments. Now, under the heading of miscellaneous amendments is the creation of a deputy uh, chairperson and two part-time members of the Superannuation Complaints Tribunal, and these are estimated to cost $270,000. Uh, so coming on board, we will see specialist staff, for example, a medical practitioner, and this is a desirable move, seeing that the tribunal will now deal with medical issues. Uh, the Senate Select Committee on Superannuation, I remind the Senate, is in the final throes of producing a report, which will be, um, uh, I think, number 18, which will examine the first 12 months of the Superannuation Complaints Tribunal. Now, the tri tribunal was set up to improve the efficiency of superannuation and to provide a low-cost, informal and expeditious means of resolving disputes. The, uh, the tribunal, however, was never intended to be a final point of appeal, Order. since the agreed Order. parties always have resort to the law, which means access through the ordinary court mechanisms. However, what is not generally understood by many about the tribunal's powers is that providing the trustees have followed the process, due processes and applied the laws accurately and fairly, uh, and providing the trustees give written decisions uh, reasons for their decision, the tribunal must actually affirm the trustees' decision. And I remind honourable senators that this is actually in the original CIS legislation, but I think it does need to be repeated. And of course, this uh, provision does tend to refute a lot of wild claims that were made somewhat earlier that the tribunal would be uh, inundated uh, with work uh, that it was unable to handle. Now, I'd like to say that I think it's unfortunate that uh, superannuation and retirement incomes does appear to be high on the political agenda for the forthcoming election. 
For example, the Prime Minister's comments about certain investment managers being lemons, I think this was unfortunate, it doesn't create confidence within the industry. The appointment, for example, of an additional minister uh, uh, in relation to superannuation, uh, the slant of the educational campaign involving the money tree, when I think those monies should have been much better directed. Uh, and all these sort of things lead that in a situation of a highly emotional atmosphere of an election, pledges can be given that are not necessarily in the lo lo best long terms of superannuation or their members, and I appeal to both parties uh, to keep their cool and try and keep uh, retirement incomes and superannuation uh, of a, uh, on a bipartisan basis, if possible, in the interest of long-term superannuation and not uh, use it as a vehicle to attract votes and to win elections. The uh, main criticism that people have with superannuation, and we've got to be honest at these times, is that the government does has used superannuation to collect a lot of additional taxation revenue. It involves over a billion and a half dollars. The, uh, the speed and frequency of the change, of course, have left a lot of people bewildered, even those with expertise within the industry. And also there is a need to, uh, for certain consolidation. However, there are gaps to be filled, and I think it's useful to use this occasion to dwell on a number of the gaps that I think uh, the government still has to attend to in relation to superannuation. Firstly, I draw the Senate's attention to the report number 17 of the uh, uh, superannuation Select Committee for reading, and this dealt with people who had broken uh, workforce patterns. I believe today we are also expecting too much of superannuation in attempting to solve the problems which are outside the jurisdiction of superannuation. Um, therefore, there does need, I believe, to be a tax concessional savings vehicle outside superannuation, which will provide a greater degree of flexibility to enable drawdowns for particular needs such as future education, housing, finance, sickness. Now, the trustee nature of superannuation, I think, is an important measure, where apart from the fall of smaller funds, the requirement of 50 per cent representation from the employer and the employee does represent some of the best features of industrial democracy. Trustees now have come to the realisation that really they must take off their their particular hats they wear coming from the employer or the employee side and apply their minds to promote the best interests of the fund members in the long term. So that's the, f so that's the first issue. The second issue is that uh, a recent regulation and a valuable one has been the requirement that information and financial statements should include a five-year compound average rates of investment returns. Uh, t together with the uh, yearly rate of return over the same period of the fund. Now, in addition to that, I think it is necessary to add a new regulation which will require that comparison with what is known as an industry average, because we don't want people to get locked into poorly performing funds, and this does mean we've got to tr uh, have a look at further transfer protocols, uh, uh, further extension of capital gains and other mechanisms to allow am amalgamation for poorly performing funds or funds that have got into difficulties. The third issue that I think needs to be addressed is that uh, it concerns a practice within the industry which is very bad, and I refer to what is known as short selling. I th believe this should, if it is not, and I think it is an illegal activity, uh, should, be, should be closely looked at, because there are one or two players who are indulging this practice. But uh, I think there is the exception where short selling is permitted, and that is in the area of what is known as a technical term, put options. And I'd ask that this is something that the ISC should address promptly. Fourthly, there is a difficulty, I believe, and this comes back to a problem with the, within the accounting profession, and that's what is known as standard AAS 25, whereby superannuation funds are required to report to allocate interest on a current market uh, basis. And I think this measure can adopt uh, funds adopting appropriate uh, long-term strategies, for example, investment in uh, infrastructure, products and bonds. The, um, also, there is a duplicate 
I think the fifth area, fourth area, is that there is a duplication and confusion in the regulatory regimes that they stand at the moment. For example, the regulation of superannuation funds where members' benefits are provided and defined by a life insurance policy. This is a particular area that does need attention. For example, currently trustees of such funds must abide by two sets of rules for the purpose of disclosure to their prospective members and standard employer sponsors. Now, a standard uh, employer sponsor is an employer uh, which has elected to provide superannuation benefits for its employees under a contractual arrangement with the superannuation fund trustee. Now, these two separate rules are one, the CIS regulations plus circulars that are determined by the Deputy Commissioner of Superannuation, and secondly, circulars which are issued by the Deputy Commissioner, life insurance. This latter case, there are two further requirements depending on whether the policies are single or regular based premium. The difference under the circulars issued by life companies lies in the way in which the effects of the changes have to be disclosed to their members. For example, with regular premium policies which have an initial expenses which cause a policy to have little or no value in the early years of existence, are required to provide a number of tables which show that one can what one can expect to get back through the, through the life of the policy if particular assumptions are borne out. What is required is there should be sufficient disclosure for a member to understand that the impact of costs on the member's benefit, but uh, if one's benefit is likely to be in the short as compared with the long term, it's important that it seems that such a requirement should provide uh, those benefit illustrations and should apply to the one contributions uh, as, as to whether it is a single premium or a, a, of a regular premium nature. I think this further, uh, there is further confusion in the life industry in that although the life insurance uh, circulars are directed at life insurance for the purpose of providing added disclosure protection to prospective policy owners, CIS has per per perceived provisions which will require the trustee to provide members with sufficient information to be able to understand the impact of the, charge, of the ch charges uh, on their particular benefits. Now, CIS seems to have decided that besides CIS, the provisions of the LIC also need to apply to trustees which administer funds comprised of life insurance policies. The next gap that I think needs to be filled has been raised as a result of the demise of the Excelsior Money superannuation plan. And this has raised further problems in relation to superannuation. Firstly, it's necessary, I believe, to ensure that Tax Bill No. 2 is passed before we rise, otherwise there will be a problem regarding the reassessment of deductibility amounts of uh, the pre-1 July 1994 allocated pensions. There's also potential capital gains consequences of transfers that are made a as a consequence of the asset securities passing to another fund. Uh, whether through redemption or specie transfer. There is a difficulty, of course, with the involuntary transfer of a superannuation benefit being an allocated pension or a, or a pre-retirement accumulation from one superannuation fund to another under the success under the uh, uh, fund provisions of CIS being a trustee to trustee. Sorry. The way to overcome the problem, I believe, inherent in some of these, is to provide amendments to the legislation which enable the transfer to be on a trustee-to-trustee -trustee basis rather than withdrawal and re-entry. I think this is an important measure in looking at the long term. There is a further, this is an important measure, particularly where we have funds which will fail, which will go into difficulties and where monies have to be transferred uh, from one fund to another, uh, and uh, I suggest we alter it in such a way to make it on a trustee-to-trustee -trustee basis. The, uh, the, the next feature that I, I wish to draw to the attention uh, uh, of, the, of the Senate, and that this is a gap that I think has to be filled, is that when a superannuation fund is first set up, the regulations provide that it must become a regulated fund within seven days and that there are no exceptions. Now, this is just absolutely too tight. So what really is required, Mr uh, Deputy President, is for a situation where that period is 30 days for the trustees to apply to have 
a regulated fund, and also there does need to be a discretion available to the Insurance and Superannuation Commission to allow for exceptional cases and situations. Um, finally, I would like to congratulate uh, my colleague from the other house, David Conley, who is currently Shadow Minister for Superannuation and Retirement Incomes, on his successful lower house uh, amendment uh, that was uh, passed, in other words, it was accepted by the government and is now part, therefore part of the bill in the Senate today. And, uh, I congratulate him on, uh, on his initiative and on his success in getting that through. I think on four occasions uh, me similar measures have been put in both houses, twice in the House of Representatives and twice in the, the, the Senate. And the, the issue that I'm referring to, of course, is the uh, removal of the 65-year uh, uh, compulsory retiring age. And finally, I'd like to mention that since uh, my colleagues from the other house, David Conley, will not be recontesting the next election arising from certain pre-selection uh, decisions, I'd like to therefore take this opportunity to thank David for his friendship, a friendship going back to the days when I was a raw recruit and first joined the Joint Committee of Public Accounts in 1978, which he chaired with great distinction. David, of course, over the years has made a very distinguished contribution to superannuation, um, uh, but particularly I think it has been most noticeable uh, where in recent years he has been the coalition spokesman on superannuation. I wish him well in his future, in his, in his future, uh, in his future career uh, and wish him good health and best wishes to him and his family and thank him for his contribution to the parliament. I thank the Senate. Senator Woodley. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. I rise to support uh, this legislation, uh, particularly in relation to uh, the issue of disability claims that I've had a great uh, interest in, and uh, I guess in some ways the, uh, the whole initiative for this legislation arose uh, because of a disallowance to the, uh, the uh, Superannuation Complaints Tribunal, which I moved quite some long, long time ago, and which prompted, I think, a very, a very uh, good response uh, from the government. Uh, just in relation to that, I perhaps would uh, like to reiterate a, an interjection I made during Senator Watson's speech, uh, because I, I do want to underline that it was multi-party support rather than bipartisan support which, uh, which I think brought this legislation about. And uh, I think that's, uh, it's very good when uh, we do get multi-party support uh, for uh, legislation like this. Um, I'd also like to thank the government, uh, particularly the government staff and, uh, who are here today, and uh, the Honourable Paul Elliott, the parliamentary secretary, because of the way in which I believe they responded so, so well, even if it took quite a long time. Uh, we did have some complaints about the time, but certainly not complaints about the availability and the helpfulness which was provided to us, certainly to me in regard to, uh, to these amendments. Um, what I would like to put on the record is, uh, however, is that although we, we certainly support and don't want to hold up this legislation in any way, uh, we were made aware of just a few problems even with, uh, with this legislation, and I guess there is no legislation that uh, could ever be passed that wouldn't have some uh, points about it that you'd want to raise, but these points were were raised with us uh, by a coalition of groups, and perhaps I could mention them: the Consumers Federation of Australia, the Consumer Credit Legal Service New South Wales Incorporated, the Consumer Credit Legal Service Victoria, Morris Blackburn and Company, and the Superannuation Consumer Coalition. And uh, while they too. Uh, don't want any delay in the legislation because they certainly see the benefit of it. They're just wanting to signal a few problems which, which could occur uh, as unforeseen, I guess, circumstance, uh, unforeseen consequences of legislation. So it would be worth putting these on the record 
And I suppose my appeal to the government would be that they would uh, take these on board, and I'm sure over the coming months, uh, that as we, as we monitor the performance of the tribunal in relation to these amendments, that uh, we, could, we could keep our eye on, uh, on, on the issues that are raised, and uh, there could be a, a, a subsequent response from the government if they do prove to be problems. Now, let me just uh, give you some of the issues which have been raised. A major concern is with the restriction on access to the Superannuation Complaints Tribunal for people with disability claims in relation to some issues. And they are that these people are usually particularly disadvantaged and having to cope with the stress, with the stresses of a change in the quality of life, uh, for a change in their quality of life. Under the draft section 14.6b, the tribunal will be unable to hear a complaint unless the claim was lodged with the trustee within a year of the person ceasing employment. Now, there are some problems uh, with this restriction. Uh, in some cases, the medical condition may not completely manifest itself within the one-year period, or the doctor may not make an assessment that the person is totally and permanently disabled within that one-year period. These people will have the time limit elapsed before they are actually able to claim. There is also, on the other side of that, the potential for members to clog the system by making claims within the one-year period when they may not yet be di diagnosed in order to preserve their entitlement to subsequently proceed to the superannuation tribunal. So I'm sure the government uh, can take that on board and, uh, and monitor that. Another issue is that there is a low level of community awareness among fund members of their entitlement to claim TPD benefits under superannuation schemes. The, superannu the Superannuation Industry Supervision Act 1993 does not require trustees to give notice to fund members of their entitlement to TPD claims on leaving the fund. So it's possible that the current amendments could actually create an incentive for trustees, and I'm not suggesting they would do this, but one never knows, that there could be an incentive for trustees not to make members aware of their potential entitlements. And that's just what I was going to refer to, uh, Senator Watson. Thank you. Uh, that's a good comment. At the very least, if the one-year period is to remain, there should be a government commitment to educating individuals to their entitlements, which is exactly what Senator Watson is saying, and uh, I think that was a very good interjection. And there should be a proviso enabling a claim to be taken to the tribunal where the failure to lodge the claim was due to the actions of the trustees. Now, I don't want to infer that trustees might do this, but unfortunately I've had at least one um, example of a constituent of mine who I uh, acted on behalf of where the trustees were obstructionist in terms of this person uh, pursuing their claim. It was settled in the end, but uh, the trustees could have been a lot more helpful, so we're signalling that. Then uh, the restriction could limit access to, low cost, to a low-cost forum, therefore, for a group who have, have a pronounced need for it. Access to justice is an ideal to be lauded and promoted. I understand that there are a large number of clients who could now be forced to litigate their claims in the courts at greater expense and cost to all parties if some of the uh, things that I've signalled eventuate. Another, uh, another issue is a concern with respect to the question of the interpretation of sections 14 and the proposed section 14A of the Superannuation Resolution of Complaints Act 1993. It is unclear yet how these two sections will interact. There, there is a possibility that the tribunal will interpret these sections in such a way that some complaints currently before the tribunal 
in respect of the sale of life insurance products under section 14 will be excluded because they do not fall within the new regime for the handling of complaints for the sales of life office products which will only which will only apply from the date of royal assent i appreciate that the intention of the legislation is not to exclude these complaints <coughs> excuse me that the intention of the legislation is not to exclude these complaints but should the tribunal take such a restrictive interpretation these people will be left in a parlous position now um, there is no uh, there is no uh, intention of course and uh, i certainly would resist any thought that uh, that any of these issues should be raised in a way which would obstruct the passage of this legislation but uh, my appeal to the government would be that they in their monitoring of the legislation might take those issues on board and uh, then enable us later on if there are problems if the problems which i've which i've outlined do arise that we can come back again and see if we can uh, we can correct them because my intention certainly would be that the tribunal would be uh, 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 would operate effectively especially on the part of those who do not have the resources uh, to go into expensive litig litigation in order to get justice and uh, i believe that what we are doing here in these amendments is to uh, is to ensure that people will have access access to a low-cost independent tribunal where all other avenues uh, fail uh, to access to to such a tribunal in order to progress uh, their own uh, their own um, um, seeking after justice sometimes words fail one <laughs> seeking after justice so uh, I, I certainly commend uh, those questions to the government uh, that have been raised and I, with me and I've no doubt with, uh, with other people. I'm sure you all got the same letter. And uh, if we can leave it at that, then uh, I'm, I'm very happy to, uh, to, to uh, indicate that the Democrats uh, heartily support this legislation. Parliamentary Secretary. Uh, thank you. Um, Senator Sherry. In uh, concluding the debate for the government, uh, I'd like to thank um, uh, Senators uh, Watson and Woodley for their contributions. Um, uh, they did uh, touch on a number of issues relating to superannuation that are not directly dealt with by, by this legislation, but I believe they raised a number of issues that uh, are uh, pertinent. Um, I don't know whether it's just my luck or not. I seem to end up with dealing with superannuation legislation in this place. Of course. Um, having been chair of the select committee prior to Senator Watson. And I must say, thank, yeah, yes, uh, thank you very much. And I must say a very good committee, an excellent example of a select committee doing a job uh, in a, I think, relatively bipartisan, certainly as bipartisan as you can ever get in this place, um, in dealing with the issues and dealing with them appropriately. I mean, we can't say the same for some other select committees, but that's another issue. Um, mm. I, do want to, uh, I do want to acknowledge the role of um, the member in the other place, Mr Connolly, um, and in doing so, I know it's the Christmas New Year period coming on as fast. I want to enter into the goodwill spirit and thank the opposition. Thank the opposition because, for the first time in 13 years, the opposition have accepted this government's superannuation policy, and I want to thank them for that. Um, uh, for 13 years, the opposition have been arguing against our superannuation initiatives, bagging us, criticising us saying they would cause unemployment and a whole barrage of other criticisms. But at last, after 13 years, they have adopted our policies. They are going to leave them in place if they are elected to government. Um, there are a couple of, I think, couple of question marks um, on, a, on a couple of issues, but at last they have accepted the broad parameters of our approach. and We welcome that. I, this is the first opportunity I have had in this place to put that on record. We welcome the opposition adopting this government's policies on superannuation. Why? Well, some people will charge it's just political expediency and they want to narrow the differences at the next election. Um, 
I think um, it, it's, a, it's an interesting sign of a couple of things. I think firstly, um, I think it highlights um, uh, the lack of imagination and vision in opposition policy development, with the exception of you, Senator Watson, and Mr Connolly. I will acknowledge that both of you, over the years, have played a uh, very realistic and practical approach when it comes to debating our policy. can't say the same for some other members of the opposition, but I'll acknowledge your roles and put that on the record. Um, but it does highlight, I think, the fact that when the opposition wants to adopt policies, who do they look for to adopt them from? The government. And that's a very welcome position. And I note that they're doing that in numerous other areas. Numerous other areas. But uh, as I said, I want, to end, I want to end this debate and end the year on a harmonious note. I mean, it's the time of Christmas goodwill. And, and what better way could we note the goodwill but the, uh, the uh, bipartisan position we now have on superannuation? The question is that the uh, second reading of the bill be um, agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Clark? A bill for an act relating to superannuation for related purposes. Is it the wish of the committee that the bill be taken as a whole? There being no objection, it's so ordered. The question is that the bill stand as printed. Those of that opinion say aye. Senator Watson. Seeing it is the Christmas season, I don't want to indicate a note of disharmony. But after 13 years, uh, once uh, certain contracts and arrangements are well entrenched, uh, part of the reason for the uh, oppositions moving towards uh, towards acceptance of not freezing the superannuation guarantee charge is that certain contracts have been made uh, uh, and uh, what we do, do not want is frequent changes in superannuation because that has been a major concern of people, the frequency of change and the nature of those changes. But uh, one of the reasons could well have been, uh, Senator, the uh, difficulty in unscrambling the eggs over, over such a long period of time. I thank you for your comments and I wish the bill speedy passage. Well, the question is the bill stand as printed. Those of that opinion say aye. Again, say no. I think the ayes have it. The question is that this bill be reported. Those of that opinion say aye. Again, say no. I think the ayes have it. The temporary chairman of the committee, Senator Calvert, reports that the committee has considered the superannuation industry supervision legislation amendment bill 1995 and agreed to it without amendments. Parliamentary Secretary. I'll move the report of the committee be adopted. The question is that the motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye to the contrary. No. The ayes have it. Parliamentary Secretary. I'll move the bill be read a third time. The question is that the motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye to the contrary. No. The ayes have it. Clark. A bill for an act relating to superannuation for related purposes. Senator Sherry. What's next? Of oh, the exempt, exemption of the bill. I seek leave to move a motion to exempt the National Food Authority Amendment Bill 1995 from the cut-off motion. The question is that that motion be agreed to. Oh, sorry, is leave granted for the for the exemption. There being no objection, leave is granted. And I call Senator Oh Senator Sherry again? Yes, sir. Senator Sherry. I move that the order of the Senate agreed to on the twenty ninth of November nineteen ninety four relating to the consideration of bills not apply to the National Food Authority Amendment Bill nineteen ninety five. The question is that the motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Sherry. I move that intervening business be postponed until after consideration of the government business order of the day relating to the National Food Authority Amendment Bill 1995. The question is that the motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. The clerk. Government business order of the day. National Food Authority Amendment Bill 1995. Second reading adjourned to bed. Senator Heron. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. The coalition supports the National Food order. Authority. Order. Order. The 
The Coalition Senator supports Heron. the National Food Authority Amendment Bill. It uh, provides some of the enabling machinery to implement a, a food standards harmonisation treaty with New Zealand. And the Coalition wishes every success to the Australian-New Zealand Food Standard Harmonisation Treaty, which will be signed uh, next week. The trans-Tasman trade in food products is above the billion dollars mark and therefore of great value. Uh, the bill in uh, bringing this about, in fact, is probably of more benefit to New Zealand than it is to Australia. But uh, in the other chamber, both the Shadow Minister for Health and Human Services and the Shadow Minister for Consumer Affairs, Mr Warren Truss, uh, pointed out some of the uh, problems that uh, are related to the bill, although welcoming it, uh, of course, uh, coming before the Parliament before the legislation was signed uh, as a treaty, which, uh, as you well know, is not a, a frequent occurrence in this, uh, in this Parliament. The trans-Tasman uh, uh, food trade, as I mentioned, is, uh, uh, is beneficial to both sides. Uh, this legislation has been rushed through Parliament quickly, so that there's not been a lot of consideration uh, given in the, in the chambers themselves. And consumer groups have expressed some concern about a number of aspects. The, uh, one, for example, is the fact that the representatives are effectively appointed by two governments means that if government and industry have a representative from New Zealand, then there is a risk that the consumer's voice may be somewhat reduced. They are concerned that the harmonisation process could lead to lower Australian standards in some areas. And they are also concerned that among, among the nine food code objectives outlined in the treaty, to be signed, quality is not listed as a stated objective. There are also transitional arrangements uh, which cause concern in that food which does not meet the Australian standards but which does meet the New Zealand standards will be able to, sold, be, able to be sold in this country during the transitional arrangements. And further concern relates to regulations on cadmium and heavy metals uh, which were canvassed by Mr Truss in the other uh, chamber. I, I think, um, in concluding, uh, we need to be reassured uh, by the Minister that these concerns are being addressed, and uh, I would ask him to do so in his, uh, in his remarks. Senator Lees. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Initially, uh, when we first looked through this uh, legislation for the, indeed, the reasons Senator Heron has outlined, we were not prepared to see it pass through this place as a non-controversial bill. And we sought a number of assurances and a considerable amount of uh, additional material uh, from the minister in the other place. Our particular concerns uh, were around the fact that the bill deletes the words, providing it does not lower the Australian standard from the objectives of the National Food Authority. And uh, those objectives are what it must uh, consider when setting food standards. However, after as I said, considerable correspondence, and in particular I'd like to quote in a moment from uh, a letter from the Dr Andrew Theophanis, uh, that uh, we would indeed let this legislation pass through this place as non-controversial uh, at this point in time, although I must ask also for further assurances from the minister, in particular relating to uh, the disallowable instruments that I understand will come before us. But if I can just quote from the letter of assurance that we received when the minister says the Australian standard will not be lowered to an international standard and the quality of food will not drop. If there is any adverse impact on any of these higher ranked objectives, in particular the authority is required to put the promotion of trade and commerce in the food industry, including is issues such as Australia's clean and green reputation for foods, ahead of harmonisation with international standards. This ensures that Australian standards will not be lowered for the sake of harmonisation with international standards. And uh, if I could just ask the minister here in this place to uh, perhaps reiterate uh, that uh, we will indeed be seeing before us disallowable instruments if uh, any standards uh, set by the authority are changed, so that they, we will have an opportunity to discuss and debate them in this place so that there can be full and proper scrutiny to ensure that the Australian public does in fact benefit from these new arrangements with New Zealand. The Parliamentary Secretary, Senator Sherry. Um, thank you. Um, well, that last issue, uh, I'll have to seek further advice and give you an assurance on it uh, if I'm able, but um, um, 
we weren't aware that an assurance was required here and now on that matter, but we'll certainly attempt to get you uh, the information and assurance on that issue. Um, I'd like to thank uh, uh, Senator Lees and Senator Heron for their uh, constructive um, con contribution. I'm just getting to that for their constructive uh, contributions in this debate. There were some other outstanding issues that uh, required clarification, and I'm happy uh, to indicate, provide assurances along these lines. Uh, the Treaty to Harmonise Food Standards with New Zealand specifically exempts the specification of maximum residue limits for agricultural and veterinary chemicals in food, also known as MRLs. It also exempts from the transitional period the specification of maximum permitted concentrations for metals and contaminants, or MPCs, for cadmium. When the Trans-Tasman Mutual Recognition Arrangement between Australia and New Zealand comes into force, Australia is able to seek a temporary or permanent exemption from the arrangement on environmental grounds or on the grounds that there is a risk to public health or safety. Um, Mr. Acting Mr Acting Deputy President, the Parliamentary Secretary responsible for the National Food Authority, Dr Andrew Theophanis, hereby gives an assurance on behalf of the government that if standards for MPCs and MRLs are not harmonised by the time the Trans-Tasman Mutual Recognition Arrangements come into force, then a further exemption will be sought to exclude MRLs and MPCs. Uh, again, I thank uh, senators for their cooperation on all sides of the chamber in support of this important legislation. The question is that the bill be read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Clark. A bill for an act to amend the National Food Authority Act 1991 and for related purposes. Is it the wish of the committee that the bill be taken as a whole? There being no objection, it's so ordered. The question is that this bill will stand as printed. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Again, say no. I think the ayes have it. The question is that this bill be reported. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Again, say no. I think the ayes have it. The temporary chairman of committees, Senator Calvert, reports that the committee has considered the National Food Authority Amendment Bill 1995 and agreed to it without amendments. Parliamentary Secretary, Senator Sherry. I'll move the report of the committee be adopted. The question is that the motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Sherry. I'll move that the uh, bill be read a third time. The question is that the motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. The clerk. A bill for an act to amend the National Food Authority Act 1991 and for related purposes. Government Business Order of the Day, Industrial Relations and Other Legislation Amendment Bill 1995, second reading, adjourned debate. Senator Crane. Thank you, um, <laughs> yeah. Thank you um, Mr Acting Deputy President. Uh, in dealing with this legislation uh, before us, I just wish to recap going back to 1993 when the Industrial Reform Act uh, was before us. And there is no doubt that it was one of the most controversial pieces of legislation uh, to ever be brought in here. And I can remember well when we were debating it that this gallery was full of people who were absolutely disenchanted with what the government was uh, bringing before them, particularly with regard to the provisions that we are now dealing with. And that was the unfair uh, dismissal provisions. And they, were, they were described not by myself but various commentators and people involved uh, in the industry as being totally unfair, inequitable, unbalanced and would cre create a bureaucratic nightmare. And, uh, in a moment or two I shall deal with that bureaucratic nightmare and put on the record uh, some of the outcomes that have occurred in terms of uh, that particular legislation. But in doing so, Mr Acting Deputy President, I also wish to give notice now that uh, at the end of my speech I will be moving a uh, second reading amendment, which is about to be distributed, I understand, around the chamber. But it will say, whilst not opposing the provisions of the bill, and whilst recognising that this bill provides some improvement to the unfair dismissal provisions of the Industrial Relations Act, the Senate is of the opinion that even as amended, the unfair dismissal provisions of the Industrial Relations Act 
remain a disincentive to job creation, that they impose a very heavy burden on business, particularly on small business, and that they are enacted without proper and prior consultation. Senator now, Crane, it's appropriate, if you wish, to uh, move that amendment right now. All right. Well, I shall so move. And uh, obviously, we'll deal with it at the end of the second reading speeches. Thank you, Mr. Acting Deputy President. I particularly refer at this stage to the last words in that amendment, that they were enacted without proper and prior consultation. If we remember back to the Senate inquiry back in 1993, one of the most consistent themes that we got from, I believe, every submission we received, even from uh, some of the union uh, submissions, that there was a lack of consultation in terms of the putting that legislation uh, together. Now, once again, and ourselves dealing with this side of it, and our discussions with uh, ACI, uh, the National Farmers Federation, MTIA, and a number of other uh, employer organisations, uh, we've had exactly the same uh, concerns put to us. We've also had those concerns put to us by the state governments, because this uh, legislation has a very, very big impact on the operations of the state industrial systems. And it would appear that even though it was promised that there was virtually no consultation, certainly no meaningful consultation uh, with the states in terms of the problems that have been created by the unfair dismissal uh, provisions. And uh, just to recap, I was going to mention the, uh, the bureaucratic nightmare that has been caused uh, with regard to the unfair uh, dismissal provisions. And uh, I did ask some questions and estimates uh, last year in terms of this. And uh, at that particular time, the 29th of, uh, I should say this year, the 29th of May, 95, uh, there had been, following that legislation, some 9,921 applications with regard to unfair uh, dismissal uh, dismissals brought forward. That now exceeds uh, 10,000, and there is a significant backlog in the terms of handling those particular applications. It was not something uh, that occurred previously under the previous system, and they were dealt with much more fairly, much more swiftly, and much more consistently. And while the, uh, on our side of the chamber we are not, certainly not opposed to having uh, provisions so that people who have um, genuine concerns about what occurred with their dismissal or their ending of their particular job, we do believe that these, um, this legislation needs further amendment in terms of the unfair dismissal provisions. And uh, it's worth noting in terms of uh, this, there is much debate in terms of industrial systems and what is uh, uh, the best system in this country. But one thing is for certain, it doesn't seem to matter, I don't believe it will matter uh, in terms of the type of system you have as to, whether, to those who will uh, claim that they've been unfairly dismissed uh, to those who actually do treat somebody unfairly in the workplace. And whatever system you have, it will be necessary to have a proper, fair and uh, easy accessible, cheap, quick way of uh, dealing with these particular matters. But to have this sort of log jam uh, in our industrial system now, I think really reflects just how poorly and how badly those amendments uh, or that legislation has worked. And it was a point that we uh, raised over and over again on behalf of a number of people at that uh, particular time. Now, Mr um, Deputy President, in dealing with uh, some aspects of it now, the key aspects of uh, this particular uh, legislation will now commence in the Industrial Relations Commission rather than the Industrial Relations Court of Australia. Now, we think that that really basically is only just a a change to the starting point of where it will happen. We don't believe that it's going to help significantly in terms of dealing uh, with the fundamental problems with the um, application, although there will be more emphasis on conciliation uh, in terms of dealing uh, with them. <coughs> One improvement in terms of this uh, particular legislation, which I'm quite prepared to recognise, uh, as far as I'm concerned, that uh, the legislation will now be looking um, at all circumstances involved in the case, whereas previously it did not. 
issues surrounding this legislation uh, in terms of, and I've just uh, mentioned uh, some of them briefly, but I will re-emphasise now in terms of dealing with this and putting them in a uh, logical sequence. And the first one is that uh, <coughs> the, at the 19th of May, 95 Labor Ministers' Council meeting in Hobart, the Federal Minister, that's Mr. Brereton, uh, indicated that no amendments to the Federal Act would be considered for at least 12 months or until after the <coughs> federal election. Now, these amendments have brought in, been brought in hurriedly. That consultation did not take place. Now, while I'm not criticising Mr. Burton for bringing in what he's done, I do say that he should have met that commitment that con consultation uh, would have taken place uh, with the states as far as it was concerned. Uh, <coughs> Mr uh, Acting Deputy President, there are some other amendments uh, which I'd like to briefly now uh, touch on from uh, the Democrats, and that cause, uh, concerns uh, costs and, uh, uh, as far as the court. And I understand uh, the Commission now. Um, I did make representation in terms of those uh, amendment or that amendment to uh, Senator Bell to include both the court and the Commission, and he acknowledges that um, the Democrats will do that. We will be uh, supporting uh, those amendments, but the other ones which. Uh, are being put forward, and I understand handled by Ms. Uh, Senator Spindler, with regard to the um, National Labor Consultative Council, we will not be uh, supporting those amendments, and I shall uh, make some comments with regard to those in a moment or two. <coughs> now, Mr. Acting Deputy uh, President, in terms of dealing with this legislation now, I thought it would be useful if I ran over a few of the key points of where the coalition sits in terms of industrial relations, particularly in view of the fact that uh, there will be an election next year. And the particular points that I want to uh, emphasise is, one, we believe in the principle of freedom of choice, and we believe in that across the full spectrum uh, of what it means, uh, in terms of freedom of association, in terms of wanting to belong, and that means whether you want to belong to a union or whether you don't want to belong to a union, whether you you have the choice of the type of industrial system you work under, whether it be a workplace agreement, uh, whether it be a certified agreement, or whether it be an enterprise flexibility agreement, or whether it be under the award. And that will be uh, a centre plank of our policy position, as already been outlined uh, by uh, Mr Reith and Mr Howard. And I think it's very important in modernising and uh, moving at the pace that the rest of the world is doing in uh, modernising the workplace, that that freedom of choice be an essential characteristic of it. The next point that we want to uh, I raise, and that is the principle that all Australians be treated equally before the law, and the principle in terms of being treated be equally before the law, that in fact they must behave equally before the law. And one cannot help but note in today's newspaper with regard to the unfortunate occurrences up at Weeper and the millions and millions of dollars that have been lost through that industrial dispute, we still see threats that there could be further industrial uh, action by the, uh, I think it was the Metal uh, Trades Union that was there. And we've seen even, though the decision was made by the um, Arbitration Commission, the Australian Industrial Relations Commission last week, with regard to uh, the resolving of the particular concerns there before that tribunal, it wasn't until yesterday that in fact the decision was made for those uh, striking workers at Weeper to go back. Now, in our view, that is not good enough, and that must be dealt with so as that people do behave within the law. The decision was made, the instruction was given, in fact it was given on a number of times during the dispute to go back to uh, work, and it was not taken any notice of. And you can't have a legal situation where one side of the equation obeys the law and the other side just thumbs their nose at it uh, as they choose. And uh, that's what's um, been happening. The, co the Coalition will maintain the current award system overseen by the Australian Industrial Relations Commission. The Coalition will support the jurisdiction of the Australian Industrial Relations Commission to deliver safety net wage increases for the lowest paid. The Coalition will retain the certified agreement system, but reform it to enable CAs, CAs to more accurately reflect the circumstances of individual enterprises. 
The government system of enterprise flexibility agreements, we believe, and we said at the time of the legislation, has failed. It has not had the penetration that is really necessary for a modernised uh, workplace, and uh, we will change that and bring in place workplace agreements. These workplace agreements will allow absolutely clearly and succinctly for either individual workplace agreements or collective workplace agreements, whatever the employees in a particular workplace might choose to do. Workplace agreements must pass the notice advantage test against fair and reasonable community standards, which will ensure adequate protection, especially for the low paid. These conditions, although this is not a total list, uh, there will be further announcements uh, in due course, these conditions will include the relevant applicable classification award hourly rate, four weeks paid annual leave, two weeks paid sick leave, 12 months parental leave, family leave in accordance with the AIRC uh, decision, equal pay for equal work of equal value, uh, jury service. We will, we will uh, when, we when we get back. You just, you just quieten down a little bit and just or, listen. You know, you, you, you remind me of a puppy dog when or, puppy or dogs da, were made. You know, or da, they forgot Crane, to give you a tail and they Senator forgot to give Crane, you some brains. Senator Crane, you might like to dress the chair, please. I am addressing, I am addressing the chair. Through well, you, you're, Madam Deputy uh, Chair. Excuse me. I, I, M Madam Deputy Senator Chair, Sherry might I was provoked by quiet. Senator Sherry, so you address him and then I'll listen I to you. I have just asked Senator Sherry to... Thank you. Deceased. I would ask you to we will be reintroducing sections 45D and 45E of the Trade Practices Act. They will be reinstated. I think one of the fundamental failures of what occurred last week, uh, in terms of over the last few weeks, that there was no mechanism by those third and fourth and fifth parties who were innocently affected and held up. Held up. There was no way in which they could take um, action to recover their damages. As I said earlier, the unfair dismissal provisions will be amended to ensure a fair go all around. Compulsory unionism will be abolished. Workers will have the right to be in a union, the right to choose which union they want to be in, and the right not to be in a union. The coalition will permit the dismalgamation of unions where that is the desire of the unionists themselves. And I emphasise what I said at the start of my comments here in terms of that freedom of choice. And that is a fundamental part of our policy position. The coalition will make it an offence to attempt to force an independent contractor to join a union or to discriminate against a contractor on the grounds of union membership or non-membership. The other point that I want to cover in terms of these remarks, and it's coming back to the amendment of the National Labor Consultative uh, Council, and I said that I would make some comments on that. Now, we believe that the National uh, Labor Consultative Council does need reforming, but we don't agree with the way that the Democrats have suggested that it should be reformed, or Senator Spindler, I believe, who said it should be reformed <coughs> that way in view of the fact that he's handling this particular aspect. When we look at the amendment from uh, Senator Spindler, or what we've seen, and we haven't seen the final amendment, what he is moving is very, very similar, although not quite the same, to what was moved here back in 1993, um, I think it was, when the IR Reform Act was before us. Our concerns with regard to these changes that are being suggested is one there, have not be, there has not been consultation with the uh, various members of the NLCC at this particular time, nor has there been consultation with a number of other organisations, uh, employer organisations and some organisations um, outside of um, <coughs> the ACTU. There's been no consultation with them as to how uh, a reformed National Labor Consultative Council should work. Nor has there been any discussion or consultation with any of the states in terms of how this particular works. And we believe that there's a, um, at least it should be examined as to, as to whether or not there is a role uh, when we look at what exists in the various states uh, for a state representative on uh, this particular consultative council. And of course there's the other sector which is totally ignored uh, by the National Labor Consultative Council, and that's the non-union sector. We now see that somewhere in the order of 75 per cent, or close to 75 per cent, 
of the workforce in Australia is not represented uh, by the union movement, and we believe that it should at least be examined to find whether there is a mechanism that can be put in place to give that portion of the workforce an opportunity to have representation and put their views as to what they think and what they require in terms of dealing with the industrial relations uh, matters that are required before them. For those reasons, uh, through you, Madam Acting Deputy President, I um, say that we will not support the, uh, those amendments, but we do give notice that in government we will be looking at this, getting the parties together and examining the whole role and, in fact, upgrading, I believe, the role as a consultative council. Because there is no doubt that while the Consultative Council did have some activity, or forceful or useful activity, in previous or under previous ministers, since uh, Mr Brereton has been the minister, it has been an almost totally non-active uh, Consultative uh, Council. So, in conclusion of my uh, comments, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President, uh, I repeat what I said at the start. We will not be opposing these amendments. We do not believe they go far enough. We do not believe that there is fairness between the parties as far as the unfair dismissal provisions uh, are concerned, and that um, we will, when in government, uh, address the particular further concerns that are required to be dealt with as far as this legislation. I wind up my comments. Uh, Madam Deputy President, saying that we have seen over the last uh, three or four months a real dose of the destruction that can occur when a, an industrial system goes wrong. We've seen what can happen when the balance between the parties um, gets out of kilter. We've seen unnecessary damage to the Australian economy in that particular time. We've seen, led by the ACTU, I believe for political reasons, secretly and quietly endorsed by the government, uh, we've seen action taken that was not necessary. And I make the point, once again, as I did before, that had the minister, Mr Burton, or the Prime Minister, or any other minister, for that matter, taken action under section 99 Two of the Industrial Relations Act, the matter could have been brought before the Arbitration Commission much, much sooner. The strike could have been avoided, and we need have not have seen uh, the millions and millions of dollars uh, lost as far as that legislation is concerned. Australia's industrial relations system now is lagging behind the rest of the world. We are not meeting the productivity requirements that are required to be competitive out in the uh, workplace, and we certainly, on our side of politics, have committed ourselves to do something about it and to address those particular issues as we go into the next uh, election. I think we'll just uh, pause for a minute. Questions without notice. Senator Alston. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, my question is to the Leader of the Government. Order. Are you with us? Order. 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 Senator, Senator Faulkner. Senator Alston. 
Well, no, nonetheless, we're grateful that Senator Evans has called in today. So, could I ask him a question? According to the World Bank, Australia fell from 19th in the world in 1992 to 22nd in 1993 in terms of international per capita income. Now the Business Council expects we will slide even further. Why is Australia, one of the, the world's most resource-rich countries, continuing to slide down the international league table? Is it because, as the McKinsey study shows, Australia's relatively low productivity is costing the country around $30 billion a year in lost opportunities, cut prices and increased wages, or is it simply that after 13 years of labour this is as good as it gets? The Leader of the Government of the Senate, Senator Evans. Well, that's a pretty extraordinary question to ask, Mr President, in a week in which we've just had an announcement of 1.6 per cent growth uh, for this quarter, which indicates that we're absolutely on track to sustain a very substantial and importantly positive rate of growth uh, for the period ahead, just as we have for the last 17 quarters, which is, of course, uh, an Australian record since these uh, statistics uh, were kept. The Australian economy is in remarkably good shape in terms of all the basic fundamentals, and you know what those fundamentals are. The, uh, and I'll be happy to repeat them. The uh, crucial uh, further statistic that's emerged uh, this week is, of course, the um, balance of payments figures, external debt, uh, the external payments uh, account, the October figures this morning demonstrating uh, absolutely again on track in terms of the, uh, the current account deficit, uh, recording its sixth consecutive monthly decrease in trend terms and reaching its lowest level since uh, February 1994 in such uh, trend terms. Absolutely in line with the government's uh, budget forecast, despite all the scepticism and neurosis and angst that you were hurling at us for months on end. Uh, the parrots are not talking about current account deficit, it seems, anymore. The caravan has moved on because we, because we basically, of course, uh, have a structural environment in terms of our capacity to go on generating uh, exports that will keep that uh, merchandise account uh, positive to uh, make this not a problem of any significant magnitude at all. If you look at all the other elements of our economic environment in terms of the productivity performance, in terms of the investment growth, in terms of the export growth, in terms of the capacity at the same time as we're growing in all these respects to sustain a wage uh, environment, including the social wage, which makes us the envy of the other developed economies where there are fundamental disparities uh, which exist uh, between economies like North America, where you've got uh, a low uh, high wage environment but uh, high levels of efficiency in many ways in the economy, but a very poor uh, social justice set of indicators running alongside that compared with the dilemma faced, on the other hand, by developed countries in Europe, where everything's doing fine in social justice terms and social equity terms, but you've got fundamental inefficiencies evident in that side of the economy. Australia has got it right. We've got the balance right in all those respects. I haven't seen the particular figures to which uh, Senator Alston uh, is referring. It's inevitable, given the explosive growth of so many uh, economies in the East Asian uh, region, that uh, there would be some change in relativities in terms of income per head figures. That's been a fact of life uh, throughout the course of this century. None of these things are ever static. But Australia, in terms of the fundamental strength of the economy, the sustainability of the growth that we have in the economy, the way in which uh, interest rates and inflation and all those other key indicators of a capacity to sustain growth on an ongoing basis in an employment reducing way, the way all those figures are coming together, gives us absolutely nothing whatsoever to be ashamed about in terms of international comparisons and in fact a very great, in fact, a very great deal to be proud of. Supplementary, Senator Olsen. Thank you, Mr. President. Well, I, I note your shamelessness. You're uh, quite keen on reading editorials, so I ask you why is the Financial Review not correct when it says today the harsh reality is that once the one off bounce back in rural output and the unsustainable lift in stock levels are removed, the result is a domestic economy as flat as the proverbial pancake? And why isn't Max Walsh correct when he simply analyses quite factually? that domestic demand growth in the economy fell away during the September quarter, personal consumption expenditure grew at less than half the rate in September than in June, private business expenditure on equipment actually fell in September compared with an increase in the June quarter. Why won't you come clean and face the facts that this country is going backwards, our standard of living is declining, 
Our productivity Order. levels are at record lows, and the place has run out of steam. Now, why won't Order. you face up to those facts rather than simply resorting to silly and irrelevant rhetoric? The Minister, Senator Evans. There's nothing silly and irrelevant about the basic strengths of the Australian economy as I've described them. There's nothing silly or irrelevant about the fact that we just have achieved a 1.6 per cent quarter of growth following a 1 per cent growth in the June quarter before that, a growth largely due to net exports as well as an increase in stocks, a growth uh, that's obviously significantly attributable to the bounce back of the farm factor of the farm sector, but which has a lot of inherent strength about it. The fundamentals of the Australian economy are as rock solid and sound as they have ever been. If someone in the editorial department of the Fin Review wants to uh, be a churl about uh, finding something to complain about in order to uh, accommodate the neuroses of its basic domestic constituency, not to mention the one opposite, well, so be it. But we, uh, we are confident about the strength of the economy. We are confident, as we have to be, as any Australian would be, about an economy that has been growing for 17 consecutive quarters and an Australian expired. record. Senator Cooney. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, my uh, question is to the Minister for Trade. Indeed, it might be the last question to the uh, present Minister of Trade that's asked from this side of the chamber in any event. And, uh, in doing this, I'd like to, uh, like to pay tribute to the way he's answered the questions over his uh, time here. It's been, there have been eloquent answers. They have been uh, put with well-turned phrases. They have been responsive, Order. succinct, clear of any remarks that may uh, upset honourable senators. Indeed, typical of the uh, quick, smart, responsive answers that are given by our ministers on this side. Uh, I, I hope the question is a short one. Senator. It's a very short question. In fact, it's one that's elegant. That it's very well put by the, uh, the minister himself. What do uh, recent data, such as today's balance of payments figures, indicate about the direction of Australia's trade performance? The, the, the minister, order. The minister for trade, Senator McMullen. I thank Senator. Order. I thank Senator Cooney for his characteristically eloquent question, uh, uh, Mr. Uh, President, and. Uh, I hope nobody is under the misleading Order. impression that I am heartbroken about the fact that this might be my last, that this will be my last Senate question time. So, the uh, hmm? yeah, you want to bet? Uh, uh, to uh, to put the current Order. situation in context, uh, uh, it's interesting to uh, note by uh, Order. Order. Senator so McMullen, would you take a seat and we'll just wait for a bit of silence? It just is hopeless trying to talk against that. Order. Senator McMullen. Order. Senator McMullen giving notice to this chamber that even if the parliament sits next year, he'll prefer to stay overseas like Senator Evans? <laughs> There's no point of order, Senator McMullen. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Uh, a good point, is, but no point of order. It is very. Uh, it's actually interesting to put in uh, the current uh, export situation in a bit of a, a historic context, because uh, by some accounts, uh, last Tuesday, Tuesday of this week, saw an important anniversary in Australia's economic history. The uh, historians suggest that on the 28th of November, 1795, was the, the first day of any commercial export from Australia. Uh, from the Hawkesbury region of New South Wales to India, and there's the first recorded export in our post-European settlement. So we're talking about 200 years of Australia as an exporting nation, uh, and we spent a lot of that 200 years missing a lot of good opportunities and surviving on the basis, uh, surviving on the basis of extraordinary, extraordinary resource potential, not and uh, failure to develop all the other opportunities particularly over the period from the 50s to the 80s, when our sloth allowed a lot of good opportunities to go unremarked. But in the past decade, we have seen a fundamental and qualitative change in our trade performance. And Let's have a look at some of the key figures in this last week which indicate the direction and the strength of the changes taking place. And this supports entirely the point that Senator Evans has just made. For the first time in our history, last Tuesday's figures suggest show we have achieved a quarterly surplus in our trade in services. First time in our history, quarterly surplus in the trade in services, which is where the world's economic growth, trade growth, is most concentrated. 
Yesterday, we saw the release of the national accounts that showed net exports contributed 1.3 per cent to GDP growth. And while people are saying somehow oh, that's a problem, that's exactly the sort of growth Australia needs, growth generated by net exports. And today's balance of payments confirmed the significant improvement in our current account outlook that's causing so much anxiety to our colleagues across the way who wish things would continue to get worse. They continue to pray for disaster and get disappointed when they find any success. These indicators suggest that Australia may well have stepped onto a higher economic growth path based on improved export performance, particularly compared with our record in the two decades up to the 1980s. For example, over the last decade, merchandise exports have recorded average trend growth of 8.7 per cent a year, and manufactured exports have grown even more quickly by 15 per cent a year, elaborately transformed manufacturers by 17 per cent, services by 9. So we are seeing that there is every indication that this higher growth path can be sustained into the next century. We've already broken the Australian record for sustained economic growth. The important thing to note is that our trade strategy and performance suggests we can sustain that economic growth into the next decade with all the consequential benefits for jobs and living standards which follow from that. <coughs> Sup supplementary, Senator Kearney. Thanks, Scott. He's coming again. Now, let, we're, be gracious, be gracious. What is the government doing in trade policy to lock in these gains and build on them? The Minister, Senator McMullen. Mr Chairman, in a minute there's not, uh, one can't be very comprehensive about that, but of course there are three tiers of trade strategy to deal with those issues. Firstly, at the uh, global level through the World Trade Organisation, uh, to which Australia will be adding by the conference we're holding in Brisbane in February to uh, build momentum for further reform at the multilateral level. There's regional policy. Uh, most noticeably, but not only, APEC. Uh, and on the bilateral uh, front, early next year I'll be releasing the annual trade and investment development paper, and at that time I also propose to outline a strategy to uh, take advantage of the trade opportunities in our most prospective markets, together with an outlook for Australian exports to the year 2000. So, with that integrated uh, multilateral, regional and trade strategy, I think it builds on what I, the indications I mentioned before to confirm reasonable ground for optimism that exports will continue to pump into growth right through until the end of the century. Senator Knowles. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Uh, my question is to the Leader of the Government and the Senate, Senator Evans. According to Professor Bob Gregory of the Australian National University and long-term member of the Reserve Bank Board, the average income in the poorest of Australian households has fallen by almost $8,000 in real terms and increased in real terms by nearly $13,000 in the highest earning households. Why, after 13 years of labour, has income fallen in 70 per cent of the households and only risen in 30 per cent? Why, after 13 years of labour, have over 750,000 households been added to the battler category Order. and with over one million battler households anticipated Order. by the year 2000? And why, after 13 years of labour, do we have more poor than ever before, Order, with right? over 767,000 unemployed, nearly two million people uh, of our people living in poverty, with almost 600,000 of these people in poverty being children? After 13 years of labour, why can't the, the Australian Senators people presume that labour has lost its way? The Leader of the Government of the Senate, Senator Evans. Mr President, from an opposition whose leader can't quite remember the commitment to maintaining pensions at 25 per cent of average weekly earnings, who has to stumble and fumble his way through any question he's ever asked on something that goes to the real capacity to survive effectively of people at the lower end of the income spectrum in this country, for an opposition who is as utterly indifferent as you are to these sort of issues, to make assertions of the kind that you have, and to question the income distribution that's been achieved under us in this country, demonstrates uh, not only extreme ignorance as to what has been uh, achieved over the last decade or more, uh, but also represents extreme dose of cheek uh, from you, given the events, as I say, of the last few days. The whole point about uh, income distribution within Australia is that it can only be understood in the context of the social wage, which is the means by which the government provides health and education and housing and childcare benefits to all Australians. And the increases and the improvements in that social wage, in benefits delivered in other ways than through the wage packet, has had a dramatic impact, a dramatic impact in redistributing income to those most in need. 
The uh, recent uh, research from NatSim has found that the social wage has increased. And listen to this, Senator Knowles. The social wage has increased Order. from $969 in 82-83 to $1,677 in 94-95. And it is the case that low- and middle-income families benefit very substantially from the non-cash component of the social wage. For example, an average middle-income family receives benefits now valued at $225 per week. That's on top of the 146 per cent increase in social security payments that has been achieved between 83 and 95. For example, additional family payments for children from 13 to 15 have increased by 146 per cent. Rent assistance has increased by between 78 and 137 per cent. The age pension, about which you are so ignorant and indifferent on your side, has increased by between 13 and 14 per cent. Real household disposable income has increased by 41.5 per cent during the period between March uh, 83, March quarter 83, and June quarter 95. Again, the um, research by the National Centre for Social and Economic Modelling shows that during the 1980s, the richest 10 per cent of the population got poorer, relatively speaking, and those with low and middle incomes, in fact, got richer. It's a matter of understanding the relevant components that go into the equation. Preliminary results uh, from the University of Melbourne study support that. They show that once the impact of governmental intervention in the form of cash income support, taxes, the way the tax system operates, and non-cash social wage benefits, once all that is taken into account, the small increase in the dispersion of private incomes that has been evidenced since 81-82 and to which you're referring is in fact reversed. It's reversed in its practical impact. In fact, the distribution of income is more equal in 93-94, the last figures for which the uh, University of Melbourne study is applicable, than it was in 81-82. The facts are these, Mr President, that the government intervention, our government's intervention, through the cash transfer system, through the tax system and through the social wage generally, has increased the living standards of Australians across all incomes and contributed to increased equality in this country. Okay, Mr. Supplementary, Senator Knowles. Mr. President, I have never heard a greater clarification of how out of touch this government really is. My supplementary will repeat some of those allegations, some of those facts, not allegations, facts, facts. Order. Why, if, it, if everything is so good as you have just said it is under your government, why has income fallen in 70% of households around Australia? Why are there 750,000 households added to the battler category? Why are there 767,000 people unemployed and living in poverty? And why are there 600,000 children living in poverty if it's all so good that you've just said? Your time's up. You've let people down. Why don't you shift on and have an election? <coughs> the Minister, Senator. Yeah, Senator Niles won't, won't be Order. told, but let me tell her. The Household Expenditure Survey, which she's basing her figures, only provides information based on gross income. It does not pick up the redistributive effect of the tax system or the non-cash benefits of the social wage. It only captures and surveys like it, including the OECD one, which I think you were referring to earlier on before, the Luxembourg income study, the international one. These studies don't show the total picture in terms of the real income distribution, the real, the real total picture Order. as it exists when you take into account the tax system, when you take into account cash transfers, when you take into account all the other benefits of the social wage. You scratch anyone out there in the community who is receiving those benefits and you'll get the answer Order. that you don't want to have. And that answer is that this is a more equal society than it was when we came into office. It's a society and a country with a very proud record of social justice and distributive equality. Our record has been absolutely first class across all the those fronts. You're time just a bunch of shonks and will forever remain the minister's so. Minister's time has expired. Senator Jones. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. My question is directed to Senator Evans, the Minister for Foreign Affairs. Minister, no doubt you will be aware of the keen interest which members of the Australian Parliament and the Senate in particular take in developments in Burma and in the struggle for democracy which is currently going on there. Could the Minister give the Government's view on the latest reports that the political situation in Myanmar is deteriorating and that there is a risk that backward steps may be taken? The Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Evans. Mr President, there is a mounting concern which I share. Order. 
about current political developments in Burma, Myanmar, where the SLORC's refusal to enter into any kind of meaningful dialogue with Dora Aung Suu Kyi since her release is causing increased tension. I am particularly concerned, as senators more sensitive than Senator Alston over there would also be, no doubt, by press reports that uh, special army guards have been placed outside the houses of several National League for Democracy (NLD) leaders, and that there is widespread speculation that some rearrests may be imminent. Such a course, if it were to occur, would be a very serious development and a clear demonstration, if we haven't had this already, that the release of Dora Aung San Suu Kyi and the whole national convention process were not motivated by a genuine desire on the part of the SLORC to bring about democratic change in Burma. The most obvious formal vehicle for that process of reconciliation and democratic change would obviously be the national convention. But the lack of confidence in the convention by the NLD is such that following the opening, opening session of the resumed convention a couple of days ago, on the 28th of November, the NLD has decided to withdraw its delegates. As I've said on many occasions, the Australian government has reservations about the composition and process of the convention. We've encouraged the government of Myanmar or Burma to open up membership of the convention to make it more representative both of the will of the people at large and also specifically the ethnic composition of the country and also to permit within the convention more open discussion and debate of the issues that are vitally important to the country's political future. If this were done, the credibility of the process would manifestly improve and the chances of the convention's conclusions being accepted by the people of Myanmar as well as better, being better recognised overseas would be significantly increased. So we urge once again the SLORC and all the political parties to proceed with caution <coughs> excuse me, to address their differences through dialogue in a spirit of na national reconciliation. Both the SLORC and the NLD remain on record as acknowledging the importance of national reconciliation. The important thing is to actually deliver it. <coughs> Can I say finally that the um, Australian government continues to urge all parties to proceed peacefully and to avoid any possibility of a repeat of the mass civil disturbances and violence, extreme and outrageous violence, that marred uh, Burma in 1988-89. It's obvious that confrontation and violence are not going to resolve the current political problems in the country. Dialogue undertaken in a spirit of genuine reconciliation should be able to achieve the stated aim of both the government and the NLD, which is to establish a stable and peaceful multi-party democratic system of government. This is manifestly the desire of the people of Burma. It's also the desire of the whole international community. We all want to see that troubled country finally achieve the peace and prosperity that was promised in the years immediately after independence, but which has been so long denied. Senator Hill. Uh, Mr President, my question is to Senator Evans also. Uh, and it concerns a meeting of the ACT branch of the Public Service Union today where uh, unionists are complaining of the redistribution of income in the public service from the, wealthy, from the, the lower income earners to higher income earners. It points out that since this Labor government assumed office in 83, wages for lower and middle grades in the APS have fallen between 1 and 15 per cent, while real incomes for the highest grades have risen between 11 and 33 per cent. That is, all low and middle income earners in the public service have suffered big declines, whilst the highest earners have enjoyed big successes. Why is this so? Why haven't you protected your own low and middle income employees? And is it this neglect of your own employees, typical of your attitudes and policies, which have created such a gap between high and low income earners right across the country? The Leader of the Government of the Senate, Senator well, Evans. Mr President, I don't follow with the attention I obviously should the processes of the ACT branch of the PSU, and I'm not familiar with any current discontents that uh, may have been articulated by them today or at any other time. But I'd be very interested, uh, as others behind me are saying, to hear what your side of politics is saying about uh, that particular process within the public service, which has been one of uh, steady improvement in conditions, as you'd expect over that period. It has been accompanied by certainly some increases in remuneration at the higher levels of the public service, increases in remuneration which we haven't heard you to challenge at any stage of that process because you've argued them to be, as we have acknowledged, necessary to maintain competitiveness at the higher managerial levels within the service with salaries and remuneration that's on offer outside. The important thing is for those who are at the lower ends of the spectrum within the public service, that they not fall behind the rest of the community uh, or not fall behind in real terms, in terms of standard of living uh, slippages, 
Um, and that's, of course, something we've been able to achieve for the public service in exactly the same way that we've been able to achieve it for the community as a whole, through cash transfer payments, through the operation of the tax system and through all those other elements of the social wage that you simply refuse to acknowledge are currently very much part of the real equality of distribution of income and distribution of access to resources uh, that exists in this uh, country at the moment. The public service employees are in that sense no different from the community as a whole and their remuneration would need necessarily to be looked at uh, against exactly the background of those additional considerations that's the case for lower income earners absolutely everywhere else. And uh, if Senator Hill has any different view as to how this uh, particular remuneration system ought to work for the public service, now's the time for him to be telling us about it, along with telling us every other aspect of your policy approach, uh, which at the moment you remain silent about. If you're not prepared to do so, you shouldn't be challenging what is a manifestly equitable and just uh, system of income delivery that we've been able to achieve. Supplementary, what I'm Senator asking, Hill. Uh, supplementary, what I'm asking the minister is after 13 years of Labor how he justifies his administration leading to lower real wages for average earners and lower in the public service. If I read from this, uh, the background material of the union, I quote, the government's accords with the union have only served to redistribute income from the workers to management. Workers have increased their productivity since 1983. However, they've been rewarded with lower real wages. How do you justify an administration that has rewarded workers in your employment with lower real wages? The Minister, Senator Evans. In public sector employment, as everywhere else in the community, such small increase in the dispersion of private incomes, as has been evident over the last decade and is frankly acknowledged in all the research, is absolutely reversed when you take into account the operation of the tax system, the operation of various forms of cash income support and the non-cash social wage benefits and health education and all the rest that we have been delivering. That's the way it works. Every single Order. safety net increase that I can recall being put before you has been the subject of either challenge or opposition. Absolutely no understanding of the way in which this system operates and how these benefits actually work to the advantage of the lower page has ever been evident in any of your thinking, any of your performance, any of your behaviour, and it's not evident now in any of the promises that you're making to the Australian community. You're not making any promises. You don't understand the way the system operates. Minister, the op way the system expired. operates has been fundamentally fair and just for all Australian wage earners. Senator Bell. Thank you, Mr President. My question is directed to the Minister for Trade, Senator McMullen, perhaps for his last answer. Minister, you'd be aware of the concern in Japan about redback spiders, which uh, may have travelled in woodchip ships. Minister, in view of our obligations under GATT and the imbalance of our trade in pests, and recognising that woodchip ships have provided Australia with such things as the Northern Pacific Sea Star, dinoflagellates and several species of seaweed, is the export of the uh, redback a deliberate step by the government to fulfil our GATT obligations? If so, what are we sending in the next wood chip ship? Uh, a couple of uh, phone and web spiders, perhaps, and a few uh, Ross River mosquitoes, and perhaps a, uh, a uh, root rot nematode? Or, uh, will these be seen as uh, oh, primary exports, or are you going to go into a bit of downstream processing? <laughs> the Minister for Trade, Senator McMullen. Order. Order. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Uh, we, are, we may call for tenders for any suggestions to what we might send. If you'd like to nominate certain uh, candidates who are running against you in the election for inclusion, uh, we'd be quite prepared to give that serious consideration. Uh, but it's a very, it's a short list, so you'll have to get in very quickly, uh, Senator. Uh, the, uh, I have the, the only serious point I want to make in response to that profound and important question is I don't, I don't wish to acknowledge in any way that the source of any possible uh, red-backed spider infestation in the Japan is from Australia. It's very important that we don't. There's serious probability that it came from uh, other sources of timber because we are not the biggest timber product supplier to uh, Japan and we are not the only timber product supplier from Japan who uh, has a red back spider. So the, I don't actually seriously want to acknowledge that point because it may do us some damage, although it's important to us 
it's important to make clear Order, that uh, there's no current indication that the uh, alarmist publicity uh, uh, in Japan has had any impact on our trade uh, performance in the Osaka region. So, uh, but in addition to that, uh, for all the more substantial matters about uh, policy on the forests, I'd suggest you either listen to the statement the Prime Minister is making now or give, it, or give it its serious and worthwhile attention at its conclusion and to the forest product statement that will be made tomorrow. Senator Campbell. President, my question is directed to the Minister representing the Minister for Employment um, when he stopped. <laughs> Sorry, it's okay. Um, I'm sure it was important. The teen unemployment rate, Minister, as you know, is currently 29 uh, per cent, even higher than it was at the start of the Working Nation um, programs. How worse off we are is actually illustrated by the fact that after the annual influx of school leavers onto the jobs market in December last year, that's 1994, the rate was uh, but 27.7 per cent. Every December in the last decade, under your government's policies, the teen jobless rate has actually jumped an average of 4 per cent at the end of the school year. What fairy tale will you peddle to the 40,000 school leavers looking for work but unable to find a job who are destined to become officially unemployed in, uh, at the end of this month? The Minister representing the Minister for Employment, uh, Senator Mr. Mr President, uh, first of all, I want to just again state uh, the, the true facts about these definition of uh, youth unemployment. I've said this before in the parliament that uh, the, the full-time teenage unemployment rate is 29 per cent, but that does not mean that 29 per cent of Australian teenagers are unemployed. That's, that's because only 25 per cent of teenagers were available for full-time work in October. Uh, that's the last month we got the figures. 55 per cent were in school, 13 per cent were in full-time post-school education. What we should focus on is the 95,600 teenagers looking for full-time work, which is 7.5 per cent of the total teenage population. It's worth noting, of course, Mr President, that uh, Labor has reduced this number from when John Howard was uh, Treasurer, when he had 158, no, no, when the population was a lot smaller, he had 158,000 teenagers in 1983 were out of, uh, didn't have a job, which amounted to over 12 per cent of the total teenagers. So, so again, Mr. President, I've said this before on behalf of the government. This consistent idea that 20, that 29% uh, of teenagers are out oh, of no. work is it is it is uh, it is to imply that all of those teenagers are seeking work is not true. However, now, S Senator Senator C Senator Campbell, uh, Senator Campbell, order. Oh, no. uh, Senator Campbell asked this question. I suppose he anticipates this may be the last question time uh, before the election. Uh, so he wants to try and have a hypothetical question about what the unemployment rate will be next year, what the number of, what the number of young people coming into the labour market will be late this year, early next year, at the end of the school year. Well, all I can say to you, uh, Senator Campbell, is I'm not going to speculate hypothetically what those figures would be, but I would say if it wasn't for the Working Nation uh, initiatives uh, going back to May last year, there would be a lot more unemployed uh, young people, there would be a lot more unemployed young people, and I'd also have to say is it's all very well for you to criticise us, and that's a political point you wish to make, but for goodness sake, please tell us what you would do specifically other than reduce youth wages to $3 an hour. <coughs> Supplementary, Senator Campbell. Mr. President, my question uh, was about um, what you would actually do for the 40,000 people. I don't think anyone around here is particularly interested in having a pedantic argument about how you define an ABS statistic. Most, most people, Minister and, and Senator Crowley, who seeks to interject, are very concerned about a crisis situation in youth unemployment, concerned that the Working Nation statement that did come in May last year has actually seen an increase in teen unemployment, no matter how you define it. But the reality is you've got 40,000 school leavers who are likely uh, de destined to go onto the unemployment list. The Coalition has already released a whole raft of detail about what it's going to do in economic policy, community employment programs and a whole range of other policies. So, so you might as well give up on that one. 
You happen to be in government Order. now, Minister. You happen to be in government now. You've been in power for 13 years, and you've got the biggest youth unemployment crisis in this country's history. What we want to know is what do you propose the to Senators do about it? You tried to the nation; it failed. What are you going to tell these 40,000 young kids? The Minister, Senator Shot. Mr. President, uh, in, these first, in the question that the first question Senator Campbell asked, he talked about fairy tales. Well, after listening to his supplementary. The only fair tale I can think of is a grim fairy tale, and it's the grim policies of the opposition, because you've got, you have offered none. You've said in your supplementary you've released a whole host of policies. I wish you would table them. We've got documents that have been leaked. All they talk about is attacking the government. They do not give one specific recommendation of how you would reduce youth unemployment in this country. The last one we can remember you talking about was three and a half years ago when you mentioned that you would have the youth wage at $3 an hour. Now, we, you've told us some that, that may not be the case. Now, all I can say to you, Senator, Order. you said we would like to see your policies in detail released because all you have ever done is criticised Working Nation, which has substantially reduced youth unemployment, long term youth unemployment in Australia. Substantially Order. reduced the minister's over the last time couple of years, and you have offered nothing the minister's in its place. Time has expired. Senator Margetts. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. My question is directed to the minister representing the Prime Minister, uh, Senator, the Honourable Senator Evans. I refer to the minister to a letter from the Premier of South Australia to Order. the Prime Minister, dated February 28, 1995, which states that the South Australian government quote, does not accept the Commonwealth's decision to store the waste at Woomera rangeland until certain assurances are given. The letter goes on to explain that these assurances are in relation to the federal government agreeing to discontinue the consideration of Lake Eyre for World Heritage listing. Did the federal government make any assurances that it would not proceed with the World Heritage listing of the Lake Eyre region to ensure that the South Australian government would become a temporary or permanent radioactive waste site or repository? If so, why was such an agreement made, given the current process to select a site for a permanent national repository? If not, can the minister assure the Senate that the World Heritage listing of the Lake Eyre will not be sacrificed in the name of an expedient solution to the radioactive waste storage problem? The Honourable Minister, Senator Evans. I thank the Honourable D. Margetts for her question. The government has not given any assurances that it will not proceed with the World Heritage Assessment process, nor does the government recognise any link between this issue and the issue of temporary storage of radioactive waste at Woomera Rangehead. My colleague, uh, extremely honourable Senator John uh, Faulkner, has made clear what the government's position is on the Lake Eyre assessment process. That is that no decision will be made on whether to proceed with the nomination until all relevant assessments have been completed. These include the natural values assessment, cultural values assessments and, if world heritage values are identified, a socio-economic impact study. As to the latter, the government is committed to seeing a full socio-economic impact study if a possible listing completed before any nomination goes forward, although I don't think it's appropriate to commence such a study before the assessment reports have ascertained whether world heritage values exist. Senator Collins and Senator Faulkner have commissioned the Australian Bureau of Agriculture and Resource Economics to prepare a socio-economic profile of the study area. When the Commonwealth Government has considered fully the results of these various assessments, the natural and cultural assessments of world heritage values of the uh, South Australian section of the Lake Eyre Basin, it may then enter into negotiations with the South Australian Government in terms of the intergovernmental agreement on the environment in regard to a possible world heritage nomination. So that's the process that is underway, and once again, I don't think there's any foundation for the honourable senator's fears. Supplementary, Senator Margetts. Um, I thank the, minute, the very honourable minister, but I, I wondered. Uh, originally, the South Australian government were reluctant to receive radioactive waste at St Mary's. They did. They did agree, I guess, reluctantly. What, um, what finally changed their mind, minister? The minister, Senator Evans. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know, frankly. You'll have to ask them. Um, I'll take that question on notice. Yeah, well, they're a pretty scrappy sort of a government over there at the moment. Things have changed, of course, in recent times. But um, I'll see what further information I can get in, part, in response to that part of your question. Senator Chi. Uh, my question is to the Leader of the Government of the Senate. 
Earlier this week, you told the Senate Mr Graham Campbell's anti-immigrant comments were disgusting. However, your colleague Mr Eric Fitzgibbon said Tuesday's caucus meeting had a majority in favour of Mr Campbell, and if the Prime Minister had put the matter to the vote, it would have been, quote, quite embarrassing, unquote, for Mr Keating. Furthermore, caucus chairman Mr Jim Snow said of Mr Campbell, quote, he's got a lot of support in the Labor Party. He's got a lot of support in the community. A broad-based Labor Party ought to be able to accommodate people like Graham. What is going on in the Labor Party? Is it not the case that rather than finding Mr Campbell's comments disgusting, the majority of your Labor colleagues are happy to tolerate anything, condone anything, no matter how offensive, just to hold on to the seat of Kalgoorlie? The Leader of the Government of the Senate, Senator Where are you your Well, it's rather <coughs> pathetic to see uh, poor old Senator O'Chee trying to make a silk purse out of a sow's ear of an assault on this particular issue. It's obvious that uh, Mr Campbell's remarks have no sympathy whatsoever with the overwhelming majority of his caucus colleagues and of party members Order. and, I believe, of people in the Australian community. How Mr Campbell is to be dealt with as a result of the positions that he's taken on this and other matters is a matter not for the caucus but for the party, the national executive of the party, which will be meeting tonight. I'm not going to preempt that process because it is proper that uh, procedures and processes be, uh, be followed that will produce a, a just result and just outcome. But uh, I think you can reasonably assume that the values that we have been articulating, that we have made preeminently our own in public life in this country, are not going to be allowed to be prejudiced or threatened uh, by positions being taken by people like uh, Mr Campbell. Those views are absolutely at odds with the view that we have of the character Order. of Australian society. Mr Fitzgibbon is departing our ranks uh, in this forthcoming uh, election, and Mr Fitzgibbon speaks for himself on this particular matter, as does Mr Order. Snow there are or too many interjections on both view. sides. Senator I'm Shire. not going to further canvass matters, Kemp. which are properly matters for the Senator party Kemp. machinery. Uh, but I don't think uh, I don't think you'll be disappointed about the well. You will be disappointed, I suspect, about the outcome that this matter will have, because uh, it may not give you the further information that you think you'd like to have going into an election campaign. In, in, sorry, uh, ammunition, which is utterly uh, inappropriate for you to be uh, flowing around, given the track record of your particular party. And, and uh, well. I wasn't going to be tasteless enough to uh, remind Senator O'Chee of the performance of his current leader in 1988, but that's the last time a serious figure in Australian politics seriously sought to play the race card. The fact that a fringe figure might seek to play such a card says something about the fringe figure concern, but it says nothing about the mainstream Labor Party. A lot was said about the mainstream Liberal Party in those events of 1988, and you ought to be ashamed of yourself. Supplementary, Senator Mr. O'Chee. President, uh, earlier on this week, Senator Evans told me on Monday that there was nobody in the parliamentary Labor Party who shared Mr. Campbell's views on these matters. Now he says that they're shared by Mr. Snow and Mr. Fitzgibbon, the chairman of the caucus. How many others in the caucus share Order. these disgraceful, bigoted views? Order. And is Mr. Campbell's position in the parliamentary Labor Party endorsed and backed by Mr. Kim Beasley? The Minister, Senator Evans. Mr Snow's views, I know personally, are absolutely rock solid on issues of race and immigration. He's, as conce he's concerned about a potential electoral backlash from a certain stream of opinion within his own electorate. He's expressed that view. That may well be the position that's been taken by Mr Fitzgibbon. They speak for themselves, but I didn't take them. I don't think any of my colleagues took them to be expressing views themselves, which were those views of Campbell. They were expressing the views that uh, they were views that you know, they were taking the view that the party was a broad enough church to accommodate uh, some pretty bizarre and wild and woolly uh, wild and woolly opinions. It's absolutely defamatory of those two people to suggest that they in any way shared Mr Campbell's views, as it's equally defamatory to suggest of the uh, deputy leader of the party that he would have any uh, willingness to give comfort to such views. <coughs> Senator Murphy. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to Senator Cook, Minister for Industry, Science and Technology. Uh, is the minister aware of claims by a South Australian small businessman of political interference in decisions of the CSIRO? And can the minister inform the Senate of the validity of these claims? 
The Minister for Industry, Science and Technology, Senator Thank Cook. Thank you, uh, Mr President. Yes, uh, I am aware of claims by a South Australian small businessman about uh, political interference in the decisions of the CSIRO, and I have here a statutory declaration sworn by Mr David Paul Battersby uh, to that effect, which I now table. Uh, Mr uh, President, the David ba Mr David Battersby runs a small advertising company in Adelaide. The statutory declaration relates to events last year after he had reached agreement with the CSIRO to erect advertising billboards on the CSIRO's property at O'Halloran's Hill in the Adelaide uh, southern suburbs. The CSIRO has confirmed Mr Batterby's claim that shortly before the contracts were finalised, Ms Chris Gallus, the member for Hindmarsh, contacted the CSIRO, complaining that a number of other advertising companies had not been informed of the arrangement. According to the CSIRO, and in their normally understated terms, they said the strong impression given was that Ms Gallus would actively canvass against the proposals. Mr Battersby found out about this intervention indirectly. He found out through a large Adelaide advertising company and, as a consequence, he then rang Ms Gallus. In his statutory declaration, Mr Battersby states, and I quote, she, meaning in this case Mr President, Ms Gallus, told me that the project was dead and would not go ahead, stating that she had previously been on some CSIRO review board and had a lot of powerful friends at CSIRO who had ensured her assured her uh, our contract would be terminated. In the statutory declaration, he goes on referring to Ms Gallus, saying this, these words to him, and I quote, whilst I don't like to see anyone go bankrupt, from where I sit, I just sent you under, you're playing in the big league now, unquote. Well, Mr President, uh, it is interesting to ask the question, why has Ms Gallus uh, got an interest in ending this project? She told the CSIRO that it was to give other companies a chance to bid for the contract to erect hoardings. But when the matter was raised in the parliament last year, she told the House of Representatives that it, that it was, and I quote, on the basis of my well-known interest in the environment, unquote. Not only did she, she not mention the issues of the other companies in the parliament, she said, and I quote again, neither I nor anyone else could have had anything of a commercial nature to gain in this matter, unquote. Mr President, the two explanations are not consistent. If indeed the environment was her concern, as she told the parliament, then there could be no way that she could entertain anyone putting up a billboard in that location. But in fact, she told the CSIRO her concern was of the commercial aspects of the contract that had led her to, get into, led her to, to become involved. Now, I think uh, what we have to consider against this background, Mr President, is that during the 1993 election, Ms Gallus had a number of large billboards around her electorate, some in choice locations which were provided by two of Adelaide's large billboard advertising firms, and these same firms are also recorded in the Liberal Party's 1992-3 declaration of expenditure as having made donations to the Liberal Party. O'Halloran's Hill is, by the way, in the seat of Kingston, which does not even adjoin Hindmarsh, and Ms Gallus was the shadow minister for Aboriginal Affairs at the Order. time. Mr President, the situation that I have now reported uh, before me in, in a statutory declaration by an Adelaide small businessman is that Ms Gallus brought pressure to bear on the CSRO to terminate a commercial contract, and this then misrepresented her motives in a uh, statement in the House of Representatives. Now that there is a statutory declaration before me, as Minister for Science and uh, responsible for the CSIRO at ministerial level, I, I uh, will investigate this matter time has to the full. <coughs> Senator, Senator Woodley. Mr President, my, uh, <coughs> my question is addressed to Senator Faulkner. Oh. Uh, he seemed a little disturbed before that he wasn't getting a question, so this may restore his confidence. Is the minister aware of the report by Traffic Oceana that significant amounts of traditional Chinese medicine sold in Australia contain ingredients from threatened species such as tiger, bear, rhino and leopards? Does the minister support the commercial trade in products derived from endangered wildlife? Given that there has been evidence for some time of the use of threatened species in medicine sold in Australia, why has the Commonwealth Government allowed this trade to continue unabated? 
And what is the federal government doing to halt this trade which is causing an ongoing, ongoing threat to many threatened species? The Minister for Environment, Senator Faulkner. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. President. Uh, I am aware of uh, the, the many uh, views that have been expressed uh, to government uh, on this issue, and I am uh, aware, as uh, I hear regularly from the peak conservation organisations, uh, including representative. In well, maybe, maybe you might be right, uh, Senator Alston. I think, and I suspect all those communications, Senator Alston, are going to be congratulatory ones. Uh, uh, the, uh, I can say, uh, I can say to uh, Senator Woodley that uh, I can say to Senator Woodley that uh, that uh, that includes, of course, uh, representatives of uh, Traffic Oceana. I also might say uh, to uh, Senator Woodley that uh, we have debated at great length uh, the issues that uh, you have raised in your questions recently uh, in this uh, chamber, as no doubt uh, you are aware, when I outlined, I think in very great detail, the very responsible uh, attitude that this government has taken uh, to uh, such trade in, uh, in uh, these products. Now, Senator, uh, I really do think that the, the government's record in this area uh, is uh, beyond uh, criticism. I do believe, I do believe that, uh, that uh, nearly all in the conservation movement and more broadly in the community have accepted uh, that this government has uh, really, has really ensured that uh, its responsibilities under the CITES uh, Convention uh, have been dealt with uh, seriously and responsibly. We have ensured that, uh, that the legislative framework that we have in place in Australia does reflect those uh, responsibilities. And I can assure you uh, in the future, Senator, that we are going to apply ourselves uh, with as much rigour as uh, we have uh, over recent years, when uh, ever matters of importance uh, are raised uh, in relation to uh, trade uh, in endangered uh, species, I, I do think that the record of the government is uh, is beyond criticism. Australia is perceived in relation to this issue as being a leader in the international community, and uh, and I think that is accepted far more broadly than just uh, senators uh, or members uh, on this side of the House. Our record's outstanding, Senator. It's acknowledged by nearly all, and I'd be very disappointed, Senator, if you weren't one of those that acknowledged the efforts that I've made as minister and this government has made in relation to this important issue. Supplementary, Senator Woodley. I do acknowledge your efforts. Whether they are adequate is the question, uh, Minister. I'd like, to, uh, I'd like to ask a, f a further question in terms of uh, trade in endangered species and ask whether the federal government recently moved to relax restrictions on the export of skins from saltwater crocodiles, which I believe is still an endangered species here in Australia, and if so, why? Minister, Senator Faulkner. Look, Senator, this particular issue has been one that I've, uh, I've taken very seriously. It's been raised at the Australian and New Zealand Environment and Conservation Council meeting. There has been a proposition for the Northern Territory uh, that, uh, that uh, we, uh, we take a different approach in relation to rogue crocodiles, uh, particularly, and uh, with a, a very, uh, a very uh, a stringent uh, set of conditions that uh, I have applied, I have uh, enabled that uh, trade to take place. It does not, of course, uh, affect many uh, individual uh, specimens at all, and I am happy, if it would be of interest to you, uh, Senator, to provide you a copy of, uh, of uh, the conditions that uh, I have placed on uh, the Northern Territory uh, in relation to this particular uh, matter, and I can assure you that uh, the moves that I made after very careful consideration and advice from the Australian Nature Conservation Agency is an Ministers, approach that has been time has uh, accepted and endorsed by conservation organisations in this country. Senator Ellison. 
Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to Senator Gareth Evans, the Leader of the Government in the Senate. And, uh, I ask Senator e Evans, will the Government unequivocally rule out using any money appropriated by the Parliament in 1995 for the payment of costs awarded against Dr Lawrence and the legal costs for Dr Lawrence's court challenges to the Marks Royal Commission? The Leader of the Government of the Senate, uh, Senator Evans. Well, Mr. President, the Minister of Finance has already addressed that question in Parliament yesterday, and I think given you a straightforward answer on it. Supplementary, Senator Ellison. Thank you, Mr. President. I draw, the, uh, I, I draw Senator Gareth Evans' uh, attention to the AAP uh, article of, of yesterday's date, which says it is understood the government is considering whether it could pay Order. for much of the challenge costs out of the change left over from the appropriation bill to be approved. And I asked, the, uh, I asked uh, Senator Evans what he, say, what he says about that. The Minister, Senator Evans. Well, I haven't said anything about that, and I don't propose to say anything now. I mean, the 243. Oh, the 200, no, the two, uh, no, the $243,000 in round figures that is attributable to Dr Lawrence's costs, her lawyers, before the various courts that are involved in those collateral challenges has been withdrawn from that appropriation as a result of your amendment in the House of Representatives. And uh, we're not proposing to, as I've said and Mr Beasley has made clear, we're not proposing to further pursue uh, ways of paying that particular amount until after Parliament has had a chance to further uh, consider that issue. The 243000 that's, uh, that's attributable to uh, Dr Lawrence's uh, cost of her own lawyers in those collateral proceedings. I've made that clear. Mr Beasley's made that clear. If Laura Tingle or someone else in the AAP or somewhere was suggesting something different, well, they've got the bull by the wrong horn. Senator Childs. Mr President, my question is directed to the Minister for Sport, Senator Faulkner. Can the Minister confirm to the Senate that last night he signed a sporting cooperation agreement with his South African counterpart, Mr Steve Sweaty? What is the significance of this agreement with South Africa? How does the Minister expect that sporting contact with South Africa will strengthen in coming years, and how will these sporting contacts foster a firmer relationship between the two countries? The Minister for Sport, Senator Faulkner. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. President. Uh, and I can uh, inform the Senate that the uh, uh, Australian government is currently hosting a visit by the South African Sports Minister, Steve Schwetti. It, uh, it's a fam familiarisation visit, but it's covering matters such as uh, our sports development programs, uh, elite training uh, facilities and possibilities, and preparation for the Atlanta and, uh, Olympic, uh, Games, uh, and Sydney Olympic Games. Mr President, uh, I'm also uh, pleased that I was able to sign a memorandum of understanding yesterday on sporting cooperation between South Africa and Australia. Uh, we have several of these types of agreement, particularly uh, with uh, Asian countries, uh, and they're designed, uh, from our perspective, to uh, enhance Australia's sporting profile and build on our host status for the 2000 Olympics. Uh, in the case uh, of South Africa, our, uh, our agreement, of course, is designed to facilitate uh, their re-entry into world sport in a way that uh, enhances multiracial participation in sport at both the grassroots and the elite levels. Uh, I think it's, uh, it's natural for South Africa to turn to Australia for assistance in this regard. There, uh, there are a range of circumstances, not the least uh, of which is, uh, is uh, the fact that, uh, that uh, we have a, a, a Southern Hemisphere location, which really do uh, strengthen our relationship. But more importantly, I think we share some very uh, strong uh, common traditions in sports such as rugby union and uh, cricket. And, uh, and I've got no doubt we're going to have a, a strengthening relationship uh, in sport over the coming years with South Africa, particularly in the lead up to the 2000 Olympics. At the uh, signing ceremony with Mr Shwetty, uh, he informed me, in fact, that this agreement was the first government-to-government -government agreement, the first bilateral agreement that the Australian government has signed with the new South African government of national unity. And, uh, it's also the first international agreement that South Africa has entered into in the field of sport. And I think that both of those mark uh, very significant uh, events indeed. 
I think the uh, agreement will uh, allow both countries to work uh, on, on fostering the very close uh, uh, ties that have been developed since uh, democratic elections were held in South Africa uh, in 1994. Uh, the Australian Sports Commission has uh, worked closely with uh, Mr Shweti's uh, ministry uh, and the National Sports Council of South Africa in re-establishing South Africa sport in the post-apartheid era. Uh, senators uh, may also uh, be aware of uh, the very uh, positive role that's been played by Australian teams when they visited South Africa. Particularly our rugby union and our, our cricket teams have taken a very active role in visiting the black townships and, uh, and involving themselves in clinics and training sessions. And, uh, Mr Shweti assured me that uh, that has resulted in really an enduring uh, affection for uh, Australians and Australian sport uh, as a result. Uh, thanks uh, to the uh, generous assistance in this case of uh, AusAid, the Sports Commission has got an officer on secondment in South Africa who is in assisting in the development of the Protea uh, sport program. That's really an adaption of the Aussie sports uh, program in Australia. It's, uh, it's a highly successful uh, uh, participation program being introduced in the townships uh, of South Africa. I can assure the Senate that Australian uh, sport uh, and Australian sporting in South Africa is are extraordinarily strong. Senator Teague. Yeah. Senator Teague? Oh, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Senator, Senator, Senator Teague. Evans. My question is directed to the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Evans. I refer to the treaty between Bosnia, Croatia and Serbia, initialed at Dayton, Ohio, earlier this month, which offers the best prospect for an implemented peace to emerge in all these horrendous years of warfare. What is the Australian government doing to strengthen the prospects of the treaty's implementation? In particular, I ask about UN sanctions and the conditional terms of the treaty for suspension of sanctions. Can Australia suspend sanctions temporarily or conditionally? If not, what is the timing and nature of Australia's action on this matter during the coming month? Also, insofar as the lifting of sanctions for one party to the treaty is conditional on alleged war criminals being actually handed over for trial by the International War Crimes Tribunal, what does the Australian government intend to do if sanctions need to be reimposed? Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator, T uh, well, Senator uh, Evans. Mr President, my, my recollection is that there is a submission on my desk at the moment addressing the question of sanctions, which I haven't yet got to, so I'm not quite sure what it says, but I think uh, we're in a position to uh, respond now, at least partially, to uh, a sanctions lifting exercise, but I'll need to take that part of the question on notice and uh, give Senator Teague a, a better answer. I'm happy to do that as soon as possible, probably later today. Um, as to, more generally, as the question of Australian participation in the implementation of a settlement, while we've uh, monitored developments in the conflict very closely and while individual Australians have obviously made a contribution, including with a number of humanitarian operations on the ground, Australia hasn't had a direct role in the peace process. We believed all along that the regional powers in cooperation with the United Nations and especially with some help from the United States were the best place to pursue a settlement. We don't rule out making an appropriate post-settlement contribution in line with our approach until now, in which we've um, spoken out strongly against human rights violations, both bilaterally and in forums such as the General Assembly and the uh, Committee on Human Rights. We've supported the international community's peace efforts. We've provided humanitarian assistance in the region—7.7 .7 million, in fact, to the former Yugoslavia since the outbreak of the conflict and uh, provided resettlement opportunities in Australia, to date some 14,000 persons, with provisions being made for an additional 7,600 this year. We've also actively supported the operations of the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia. We've conscientiously applied UN sanctions to the extent that they've continued to be applicable, and we'll, we'll go on doing all those things. We haven't proposed, however, nor has there been any official approach about us playing a more direct and substantial role in either the peace implementation force or in the post-settlement reconstruction effort. And with that, uh, Mr. President. Oh, supplementary, okay. Senator T. <laughs> Order. Order. La last question. Last question to uh, Senator Evans ever in the Senate. No, ever anywhere. Order. He'll be asking Order, the Senator next T. Year. He'll be asking the Mr. next year. Mr. President. Um, before the minister is uh, asking questions himself uh, in a few months' time, um, 
I, I come back to that part of my question, which related to war criminals, Order. and I put to the minister that this is the first international treaty which directly addresses the seriousness of war criminals being brought to trial, and that element of the treaty uh, does see sanctions being reimposed on any party if the war criminals, uh, alleged war criminals, are not handed over for, to face trial before the International War Crimes Tribunal. Uh, is the minister uh, sure that we will be able to pay our part uh, as Australia in making sure that that important part of the, of the treaty is implemented? The Minister, Senator Revens. I mean, you don't appreciate the sentimentality of this moment. I mean, I'm obviously deeply moved by it, but let me just say this. We, um, we obviously believe that those indicted for war crimes in the former Yugoslavia, as elsewhere, must be brought to justice, and those who deserve to be indicted, of whom there are many because of the shocking circumstances we're all familiar with, deserve to be brought to justice. We will continue to play our part in ensuring that happens, including through observing any sanctions uh, conditionality strictures of the kind that you've mentioned. We were, in fact, one of the very first countries to take domestic legislative action to enable us to provide relevant assistance to the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia. Slavia, and you can absolutely expect us to maintain that record in the future. And with that, uh, Mr. President, perhaps for the very last time, I ask that uh, further questions be placed on notice. <laughs> Senator Schott. President, uh, on the 22nd of November 1995, Senator McGibbon asked me two questions about the performance specifications in the Coast Watch, co Coast Watch contract and also asked me to release the contract for public scrutiny. To say at the time of the Senate, I wish to incorporate the answer of which a copy has already been given to Senator McGibbon. The Senate should note that I table several documents which are material to the answer and which will also be incorporated. <coughs> Is leave granted to incorporate? Leave is granted. Senator, Senator Faulkner. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Uh, I uh, provide uh, this information in relation to the question that Senator Lees asked uh, of me yesterday about whether the government has hired a consultant to uh, convince the Australian people that uh, the soon-to-be-announced decision on uh, the deferred forest areas will be a good decision. And, uh, and, uh, I make uh, the following uh, statement in relation to uh, that particular question. Uh, information relating to uh, this forest decision is being coordinated by the Forest Task Force in the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet. The Forest Task Force is made up from officials from the Department uh, of Prime Minister and Cabinet, the Department of Environment, Sport and Territories, the Australian Nature Conservation Agency, the uh, Australian Heritage Commission, the Department of Primary Industries and Energy, the Bureau of Resource Sciences and the Australian Bureau of Agricultural and Resource Economics. The task force, Mr. President, has not hired uh, the services of a public relations consultant to assist in the public presentation of the forest decision. Order. Uh, yesterday at question time, there was some debate about whether a statement by Senator Cook uh, directed to another senator. Sorry, you. A couple of further oh, sorry. answers. No, you, you do I think it I'll might be it. appropriate if we do this. Very brief statement. Uh, yesterday, Senator, Senator Shamarit asked me a question without notice about ATSIC. Since she's not in the chamber, perhaps I can seek leave to incorporate the answer in hand, sir. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Mr President, on 6 June 1995, I gave a preliminary answer to a question without notice from Senator Wheelwright relating to a number of allegations made in the Parliament on 5 June by Mr Ken Aldred, MP, concerning pedophile activities by officers of the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. I am now in a position to advise him and the Senate as to the outcomes of the police investigations that have subsequently taken place. Mr President, this is quite a long uh, response, and I again seek leave to incorporate that in hand, sir, if that's the wish of the Senate. Granted. Leave, leave is granted. I thank the Senate. <laughs> Yesterday at question time, there was some debate about whether a statement by Senator Cook directed to another senator was uh, unparliamentary. I took the comment to be, and I quote, uh, what you are saying is false. Uh, on examining the Hansard transcript, I find that the expression used was, you know what you are saying is false. This is clearly unparliamentary since it involves an implication that a senator is deliberately making false statements, and I apologise for this uh, uh, error of interpretation. It did, however, have no bearing on the statement that I made last week on the misuse of proper names 
to circumvent uh, Standing Order 193. Senator Vanstone. You, uh, probably take note of your statement. It might be the Is you're moving to take note of my yes. statement. We'll see well, you're I've moving to make, take note of my statement. Uh, Mr. President, I uh, am grateful for your response, but I just invite you to consider a number of things uh, that, are, that I think are very important for people to understand uh, if they are to have confidence that what is said on one side is treated equally uh, when it's said on another side. Now, I understand from what you've just said that you understood what uh, the minister had said to be. Uh, a simple statement, what you're saying is false. And I could readily accept that. With all the din and clatter that goes on in this place, it would be easy to not hear the uh, first two words of his statement, uh, you know. So it would be easy to hear it as what you're saying is false rather than what he did say, which is you know what you're saying is false. That would be the case, Mr President, if the point of order hadn't been raised with you, uh, which I did, and quite specifically said to you uh, yet you have allowed the minister to say, you know what you're saying is false. I went on and pointed out that was a clear imputation uh, against all of this side because it was a clear inference that, that the people on this side knew what they were saying was false. Now We then had some uh, interchange because I think you were suggesting I hadn't understood what you'd said uh, the week before in relation to another matter. And uh, I indicated that, that that wasn't what I was saying. And I actually put it to you. What would you say? I said on a separate point of order. I rise on a further point of order, accepting what you ruled in the first time. What would you say, Mr. President, if I said to you, you know what you're saying is false? In other words, accepting that there might be some misunderstanding of what was said, but then trying on a point of order to get clarification on what I thought had actually been said, and we now know actually had been said. And your response to me then, when the second time it was put to you that the question was, can you say you know what you're saying is false, that was that you would treat it with disdain. And when I asked you, would you ignore it, you repeated uh, your point and said, I would treat it with the disdain that it deserves. And it was only when the matter was taken up again later in the afternoon we find that Senator Evans even couldn't manage to avoid what was staring people in the face, and that is if you say you know what you're saying is false, it's tantamount to calling someone a liar. And he put to you this way, if the remark, as it turns up in hindsight, actually is you know what you said is false, we might have to look at it, etc. Et and uh, at that point you said, as I've said, I'm happy to have a look at it. I certainly concede the point that you raised. Now, Mr President, if you can explain to me why, when I raised it with you twice, including the preamble to the statement, you know what you're saying is false, why do you treat it with disdain when I raise it and with some respect when the leader on the other side raises it? Senator Evans. Do I need leave or are we taking note? I'll seek. It's, uh, you, she moved to take note. So She's so moved to take just, note. You can speak. Look, it's a fact of life in politics that some of us are graceless some of the time. But Senator Vanston, frankly, is graceless far too much of the time and has been again on this occasion. You, Mr President, got up, had a proper look at the Hansard, checked your recollection and the record as to what happened, and came in and made a perfectly graceful acknowledgement of error yesterday and the way in which you'd initially responded to the matters put to you. That error was based clearly on a mishearing of the original thing, and I suspect that mishearing carried through into the subsequent exchanges that took place with Senator Vanston. You've acknowledged the force of the basic point that's in issue here, that if you make a, a statement that someone on the other side knows something he or she is saying is false, that is manifestly unparliamentary. That's the matter in issue. That's the matter that you clarified perfectly well by Order, a statement please. today. And any further attempt to pursue this by Senator Vanston is simply graceless, Senator. And I think you, Mr President, should not trouble yourself with further responding on the matter accordingly. Senator Cook. I believe, in view of your ruling, I withdraw my statement of yesterday. <laughs> Thank you. In brief, in brief response to explain, I think the confusion was caused by the fact that you'd order that Senator Vanstone, you did relate the matter to the statement that I had made last week, and that was the point that I took up. I concede that I was incorrect in not responding favourably to the point that you raised earlier. The person who made it clear was not, in fact, Senator Evans, but Senator Bohm, in a very clear 
distinction between the two statements, and I thought he explained it very fully, and that was when I was prepared to concede. And Senator Evans then, uh, then uh, supported that. Are there any motions to take note of answers? Oh, sorry. The, the question is the motion be agreed to. Those that opinion say aye. <coughs> Those against, no. I think the ayes have it. Senator Hill. Uh, Mr. President, uh, I move the Senate take note of the answer of Senator Evans to Senator Noel, uh, and I also want to comment on Senator Evans' answer to, to my question. Because both, uh, both matters really, I think, uh, um, relate to uh, aspects of the record of this government which I think will go down in, in history as demonstrating not only its incompetence but the way in which it's let the Australian people down. The two, uh, the two issues are really the ongoing mass unemployment and underemployment that we have in this country, for which uh, many Australians uh, will remember the, the role of this, uh, this government. Over 600,000 Australians are still out of work. Uh, and secondly, the legacy for so many who have been in work that, in fact, their real wages under Labor uh, have fallen. Uh, and in this instance, in this instance today, although the Labor Party laughs about it, this instance today, what I was referring to were the lower income levels within the public service, the employees of the government itself, it, those within direct responsibility of the government. And we now know, in fact, that the incomes of so many, in real terms, under Labor administration have fallen. And uh, I, I wouldn't be proud of that if I was a Labor member of this place. I would be embarrassed by it. And I have no doubt, I have no doubt that the Australian people, when they face up to the choices at the next election, when they look at the record of this government, both on unemployment and on falling real wages, they will have only but one choice, and that's to, uh, to vote you out. Look at the figures of unemployment. Sadly, sadly, we've been through the cycle. We've had our five minutes of sunshine. Uh, we, we take us back to the last election, a min million unemployed. We had our five minutes of sunshine, some economic growth for a little while, economic growth that would have been sufficient to really eat into unemployment, and unfortunately the figures have now turned around again. Unemployment is on the rise. It bottomed out at 8.3 per cent. It's now risen steadily to 8.5 per cent. As I said, over 600,000 Australians still out of work. But what about the unemployment rate for young people? Three times that the rate for adults. And unfortunately, that's on the rise again as well. Bottomed out at 27.1 per cent in February, since then risen to 28.1 per cent. 92,000 Australian adolescents out of work. 92,000 young people in this country who are wanting work and unable to obtain work under the policies of the Australian, uh, Australian Labor Party. And of course, if we look in the regions, the position is, uh, is much worse. It, for adults, unemployment rates up around 13, 14 per cent. For young people, unemployment rates up around 30 and 40 per cent. No doubt, no doubt why, why so many within the regions of Australia are angry about the record of this government. But for those who have been fortunate enough to be able to maintain employment during this uh, period, they, they're, uh, they're, uh, they've got little to be grateful for to this government as well. And I really do think it's fascinating, because if you ever would have thought that this government would, would respond positively to one sector of the community, it would have been to its own public servants. And these, this document that I referred to out of the Public Service Union which refers to the redistribution of uh, salaries within the public service under Labor from the workers to management is really quite, uh, quite enlightening, Madam Deputy President. When you look at the lower levels of salary within the public service, right from the bottom levels up to nearly $30,000, $28,750 from an AS01 up to an AS06, we see falls in real income of between 9.6 per cent and 14.8 per cent since 1983. So up to, up to nearly 15 per cent fall in real income during the period of this Labor government. The middle income range is the public service, 29,000 to 35,000, still falls, but smaller, between 5 and 1.2 per cent. 
But for the better off in the public service, Labor's record is to have given them rises in real terms of between 11 and 33 per cent. So it's the same picture whether you're in the public service or the private sector under this government. The record has been for Australian workers, lower income workers, their wages have dropped so much for the unions, so much for the accord. The record of Labor is their wages have dropped, but for the better off, the well paid, their rate wages have risen. That's what you ought to be so embarrassed about, because the record of Labor has been the richer Order, but Senator, richer, your time and the has poorer expired. but poorer, and Senator it's something McKenna. about which you should— Thank you, uh, Deputy President. I'm very pleased that Senator Hill did indeed ask uh, Senator Evans this question and enable Senator Evans to put some good news on the record of this parliament. Senators, honourable senators would be aware that we have actually have currently got two Senator Evanses in this chamber, one of whom has not been uh, with us in the past few days. I have it on very good authority that Senator Christ Christopher Evans is actually sleeping at the moment after going through uh, tra traumatic experiences which uh, uh, he uh, and others who are parents would uh, know what they are. I've got the uh, pleasure of announcing to the Senate that this morning at 1.45 Western Standard Time, Senator Evans's wife Miriam gave birth to Declan at the, uh, the weight of eight pounds, five ounces. Uh, Declan is very well, Miriam is very well, and there is some hope that Christopher Evans will uh, survive the experience as well. I'm sure all senators will join uh, me and uh, indeed yourself, uh, Deputy President, wishing all of the Evans family all the very best for the future. Question is: The Senate take note of the answer. Those of that opinion say aye. The same. Same answer. matter. Yes. Senator Knowles. Thank you very much. I mean, <laughs> no, I can't quite understand the relativity of what Senator McKeon just said to the to the horrendous answer that Senator Evans gave to both uh, myself and to Senator Hill and related questions. Because, I mean, Senator Gareth Evans, the one who is temporarily here, and, uh, but the point that was being made, uh, Madam Deputy President, uh, during question time is the plight of the battlers in Australia, the way in which their real incomes have gone down under 13 years of this government. I mean, to think that average incomes in the poorest households in Australia have dropped under 13 years of this government by nearly $8,000 is nothing short of appalling. And to think they don't even blush about it, they just make more and more excuses about it. And, and, and yes, that's quite right, Senator Hill. They actually feel quite good about it. They're quite relaxed about it. They're equally relaxed that the, to know that the income of 70 per cent of Australian households has fallen. Now, to think that this is a, 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 a political party who supposedly prides itself on looking after the battlers, they couldn't have done a worse job if they'd tried. To let 70 per cent of household incomes drop over 13 years is just appalling and a disgrace, and let them go to the people and let the people decide. To think that after 13 years as well, they've put 750,000 households into the battler category. Now, the best estimates that you can get, the very best estimates you can get, is that there will be uh, over one million battler households by the year 2000. That is only five years away, four years away, and here they are, quite happy to come in here and have the leader of the government in the Senate saying that that is quite satisfactory and there is nothing wrong with it. To think that this is a political party whose Prime Minister only a handful of years ago said that no child would ever live in poverty. And what's happened? Instead of keeping to that promise and breaking that promise, they've left 600,000 children in poverty. 600,000 children in poverty and 760,000 people are out of work. And of course the 767,000 people is a fictitious figure as well. Because what this mob have done is they've simply taken them off the unemployment queues, put them into all of these other programs where they don't show up on the unemployment queues. And the fact of the matter is that most of those people who are out there sadly still aren't getting jobs. They're doing these training courses or whatever. We're not saying for one moment that they shouldn't be trained, but they should get a job at the end of it. And what you've failed to deliver is the job at the end of it. What you've also managed to, to uh, achieve is the fact that 
Um, as an article in the Financial Review said recently, the pain is really showing in the, those low-income households, because where, they, where are they getting their money from? The reality is that they're getting their money from uh, uh, their savings. They're using their savings. They're using their capital in every way, shape, and form. They're borrowing money from, from their parents, from their brothers and sisters, from relatives, from anyone they can possibly borrow from. They're hocking themselves to their eyeballs. They're having garage sales. They're selling off their assets because you and the Labor Party, Senator uh, uh, Murphy, <laughs> thank you, Senator Murphy, have let these very people down. And you should be ashamed of yourselves to go out of the, the last election saying that you were not going to increase taxes when you have clearly increased taxes right across the board and you have left these people worse off than ever before. And anyone who is running any of these garage sales, pawn shops or whatever, they know the people who are bringing their household goods in day in, day out. Why? To pay the bills, to pay to put bread on the table. And you say that you're proud of your achievements. You should be utterly ashamed of that achievement to say that you have 70 per cent of Australian households worse off than they were when you came to office 13 years ago. Senator Jacinta Collins. On the same matter, Madam Deputy President, I'm glad that uh, Senator Hill and Senator Knowles have referred to the issue of falling real wages and falling incomes, because I now have the opportunity to put those issues into context. And the context is that you shouldn't take those declining factors solely on their own. The factor that uh, is conveniently overlooked by both Senator Knowles and Senator Hill is the increases in the social wage that have occurred under this government. The importance of the social wage factors in any discussion on income distribution has been raised on several occasions, and I'm surprised that it is still continually overlooked by senators from the other side, such as Senator Knowles and Senator Hill. It was only earlier this week that uh, Senator Crowley, in question time, referred to uh, perhaps a more contextual and relevant analysis of where Australia stands in terms of how it looks after the Aussie battler. Research by Dr Peter Whitford in his paper Family Benefits and Taxes Support for Children in a Comparative Perspective, which was published in uh, the June issue of the Social Security Journal and reported on by uh, Ross Giddens in Saturday's Sydney Morning Herald, shows a much fairer comparison of where Australia stands with respect to the position of the Aussie battler. Ross Gittins says, as with forms of income, Oh, sorry, I make that point, as with forms of income, to make fair comparisons between countries, you have to take account of all forms of assistance, not just some of them, as have been conveniently referred to uh, by members of the opposition when the figures suit them. By international standards, our system treats low-income families very well, but high-income families aren't treated well at all. And though our system isn't particularly generous in its treatment of middle-income families, its performance is above international standards on average. In Australia's case, the gap between two incomes couples' net incomes is 1.8 times compared with the gap of three times for their gross incomes. So the effect of our family assistance system has been to reduce the dispersion of their incomes by 40%. And our system does more to direct assistance to low-income families than any other, any other system examined. Ross Gittins comments that we could make our system more generous to high-income families, but only by making it less generous to low-income families. Ross Gittins says, it doesn't sound like the right way to go to me. It doesn't sound like the right way to go to me either, but it appears that the sorts of assistance that the opposition would like to put forward would be factored more towards higher income families. Let me conclude my comments in this debate by putting to Senator Knowles and Senator Hill the comments by Bob Santa Maria that I raised uh, answering Senator Abetz's issues in relation to my submissions to the Lions Forum, because I think they accurately reflect what I think is the policy position which uh, has been put by the Lions Forum with respect to families and seems to be the only indication of opposition policy that we can find. 
Bob Santa Maria pointed out the contradictions between economic rationalism, with its stress on individuals maximising his interests, and pro-family rhetoric. Santa Maria said, I resent it when people talk about giving the family priority and then pursue economic policies that cut the family's throat. The inconsistencies with opposition policies are quite obvious, even to conservative commentators like Bob Santa Maria. And uh, I think it's fairly hypocritical to hear the comments that are raised to, uh, to the answers of Senator Evans in question time and uh, rely on the more relevant statistics that I've put before the Senate just now. Senator Newman. Mr. President, of the same matter. I wish to join in the uh, uh, debate on this issue because last night I read an article in the Australian Medicine magazine which documented how six million Australians are either entitled to or dependent upon a health care card, and that does not include a dependence of the Department of Veterans Affairs. If ever there was a statistic that was telling about the low income and living standards of Australian households, surely that statistic tells a terrible tale, because it means that one third of all Australians have, are living in families with incomes so low that they have to be supported with a health care card, with this welfare measure. Is that, is that a measure of Australian living standards that this Labor government is proud of? Senator Murphy. A different matter, Madam Deputy President. A different matter. I'm oh, sorry. Uh, the question is that the Senate take note of that answer. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Senator Minchin. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I wish to take note of Senator um, Evans' answer to uh, Senator Ralston's question about the state of the economy. Um, Senator Evans was breathtaking in his arrogance and, frankly, ignorance about the economy in his answer today. He described the economy as in great shape. He said that the fundamentals of the Australian economy are as rock solid as they've ever been. It was the most extraordinary answer. Now, one of the things that struck me is that it, it really doesn't matter what the state of the Australian economy is, the government will always say it's in terrific shape or that what's happening is on course and according to forecasts, etc. Um, when we went into recession in 19 90 thereabouts, the, the, the government said, well, that's terrific, we've got to have this recession, this is exactly what the Australian economy needs, this is to be expected, this is what we want. Then when the uh, economy recovered and we had a, a brief period of growth of 6 per cent, which everyone knew was completely unsustainable under this government's policies, the government said, this is fantastic, isn't this great, we've got the best growth in the world. Now the growth, as is evidenced by the national accounts yesterday, is back down to half of that just over 3 per cent. Well, that's terrific as well. I mean, it really doesn't matter what the state of the economy is. You think it's fantastic. I mean, you absolutely have no credibility when you come to comment on the economy. And Senator Evans, in particular, who many regard as having no knowledge of economics, is equally without any credibility at all. The government, in the form of the, uh, the minister in here representing the prime minister, is completely blind to the economic realities facing 18 million Australians. The economy is not in great shape. It is in very bad shape, as revealed yesterday by the national accounts. And the worst part about it is the callous disregard which the government clearly has for the three quarters of a million Australians who remain unemployed under your policies, to the 8.7 per cent of the workforce who cannot get a job under your policies. The fact that that unemployment rate is actually increasing. Uh, I gave uh, evidence yesterday about the National Institute of Labor Studies findings, which show that the government has no hope of achieving its 5 per cent unemployment target by the year 2000. The best they think we can achieve by the year 2000 is about 7.5 per cent, and even that will require a growth rate of over 3.5 per cent, which you are not achieving on the basis of the national accounts, which Senator Evans show are in terrific shape. They give a growth rate of 3.3 per cent, which mean that unemployment will continue to rise. More Australians will be out of work. Many economists have commented on the basis of those figures that unemployment will be over 9 per cent by the early part of next year. I mean, the economic realities are thus. We have massive foreign debt. Uh, as um, we have heard from, uh, about Bob Santa Maria, well, the News Weekly, which of course he is responsible for, says about um, the state of the economy as follows. Australians net foreign liabilities, which include both the foreign debt and foreign equity in Australian companies are now the third highest in the world. Out of all the economies in the world, we have the third worst position of all when it comes to net foreign liabilities. 
Last year we had the highest peacetime deficit on the balance of current account at $24,000 million. Next year we are promised by the Federal Treasurer that the balance on current account will amount to $27 billion, another record. The economy is in dreadful shape on that basis. We have chronic budget deficits. The government cannot produce a budget surplus. The surplus it boasted about, which was always a false surplus, not, won't even become a surplus on the basis of its uh, false accounting. We, inflation is starting to rise again. We have chronically low savings rates. No wonder Rupert Murdoch described the economy as a complete disgrace. No wonder The Economist said that Australia is an emerging economy which is the next Mexico and which combines a third world economy with a first world Order standard Senator, of living. Your time has expired. Same matter or another one? The question is the Senate take note of the answer. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Senator Murphy. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I move to take note of the answer from Senator Cook to my question with regards to uh, the polit political interference uh, of a CSRO decision as relate to a small businessman in South Australia. Uh, Madam Deputy President, uh, this uh, is a very serious matter, and it is clearly the case that a member of the other House, Mrs Gallus, did interfere and cause uh, the CSIRO to terminate an agreement they had with a small businessman who was entering into the advertising field and could well have caused him to go bankrupt. Mrs Gallus does acknowledge and admits that she sought to interfere in uh, the contract proceeding, which was to, elect, uh, to erect billboards on uh, O'Halloran's Hill in uh, South Australia. And, uh, she gave her reason as being one of environmental concern. That is clearly not the case. Clearly not the case. Mrs. Gallus would not have even known that Mr. David Battersby and the CSIRO were proposing to erect billboards on O'Halloran's Hill. The only people, Madam Deputy President, that knew were people in the advertising area. Contracts had been let for advertising on at least two of the billboards. A company had, had been employed to market those billboards. And discussions that have been had and discussions, Madam Deputy President, that I have been able to verify will confirm that Mrs Gallus acted on behalf of one of those companies and sought to have the contract terminated for, on the basis that a complaint on behalf of those companies and sought to not allow Mr Battersby and his company to enter into the advertising area. That put Mr Battersby and his wife and two children and the small company that they have confronted with a debt of over $70,000, a debt that could well have bankrupted them and forced them to sell their home. And I think that uh, we have a responsibility and the opposition who continually claim to uh, be the repositories of uh, all propriety and integrity uh, should not allow this matter to just go unnoticed uh, and try and, uh, in terms of Mrs Gallus's claim, that she contacted somehow something came across her desk. And I would just like to uh, read uh, parts of uh, Mr Battersby's uh, statutory declaration where he says uh, that I decided to ring uh, Chris Gallus, or Mrs Chris Gallus, uh, and see what her objections were. She stated that she was acting on environmental grounds and that I didn't have council approval. I asked Mrs Gallus whose behalf she was acting as on as no council application had been submitted and as no site works were visible, because they hadn't commenced. Only persons involved in the advertising industry would know about the development. She replied, something had come across her desk. During the course of our conversation, she twice asked me how much rent I was paying CSIRO. Both times I told her that was private and confidential. She then told me the project was dead and would not go ahead, stating she had previously been on some CSIRO review board and had a lot of powerful friends at CSIRO who had assured her our contract would be terminated. Now I think it's, it's very important to understand the sequence of events here. because. A Mr uh, Patchell of the CSIRO contacted uh, Mr Battersby um, and told him that he had had calls from Mrs Gallus and that Mrs Gallus had, uh, was applying political pressure for uh, the uh, arrangement not to proceed. Indeed, uh, Mr Patchell uh, said that during the discussion uh, the question of CSIRO sites 
uh, was canvassed. Sorry. Um, that uh, when sorry when Mr. Patchell spoke to Mr. Battersby, he said that provided that all, everything was in order, not to worry. However, <coughs> he was then contacted again and told that the contract, the agreement, had been terminated. Now, Madam Deputy President, from my uh, Mr. Acting Deputy President, I intend to pursue this matter. I intend to ask the Attorney General to conduct an investigation of Mrs. Gallus's actions in this particular issue, because it is not acceptable that such an event has taken place, and as I understand it, has caused the CSIRO to pay a settlement to Mr. Battersby. But more importantly, Mr. Battersby could have earned a significant amount of income from these advertising operations. And if that's the case, if that's a position a member of the opposition wants to take uh, with regards to small business people or people trying to create small business, then it is just not acceptable. And I will continue to pursue this matter as long as it takes to actually get the truth. Senator Noel. On the, oh, on the same, same matter? The same matter. Yes, thank Senator you. Um, thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. I find it absolutely amazing that this government can actually spend all the time and resources in providing all of the information that they have to try and shaft a member of the opposition and a shadow minister, while they cannot possibly bother to spend the time and resources in excess of the 30-day limit to give me an adequate answer to a question about one of their own, one of their own being Mrs Joan Kerner. I asked the Minister for Employment, Education and Training on the 28th of September, and I've got a I've got some sort of an answer today. Um, where and when have meetings involving the chairperson of the uh, Employment Services Regulatory Authority, Mrs. Joan Kerner, been held? And do you know the answer was that it was all a bit too hard, uh, that they couldn't justify the extensive use of resources that would be needed to, com uh, to be committed to provide the sort of detailed information being sought. In other words, we're not going to tell you about all of these things about what, where Mrs Kern has been going and what she's been doing, order, and yet Mr. you've been Deputy able to do it about order, Mrs Gallus. Point of order, Mrs Gallus. Point of order. Uh, Mr Murphy. Deputy President, I rise to the point of order that uh, what Senator Knowles is raising is not relevant to the question or the answer of the question, and, and I, I, I make that point, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President, on the basis that I have been ruled out of order previously uh, for attempting to do the same thing. There's no point of order, Senator Murphy. The, the, the matter is quite relevant to the issue that's been raised in, in terms of the way in which the government is responding to, uh, to uh, similar situations. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. The, the point of the matter is that I asked for, about the meetings that Mrs Kerner was attending at taxpayers' expense, and I can't get the answers. I asked, for example, about the uh, uh, Employment Services Regulatory Authority, as in her capacity as chairman, what was her cost of the air travel? What allowances were paid? What was the cost of car transportation in each location? What were the other associated costs? How long were the meetings for? And do you know that the answers that I get, or <laughs> pretend to get, the travel only paid to September. Here we are. Tomorrow is the 1st of December, and yet they can, sh they can shaft Mrs Gallus all they like with all the resources. They give me the travel allowance until the end of September. They give me the car transport costs until the end of August, and here we are, the 1st of December, as I say, tomorrow. They cannot tell me what, uh, in answer to the question, what were the, uh, D, what were the other associated costs? They don't know. E was the question, how long were the meetings for? They don't know. And if uh, what was the purpose of the meeting, they don't know. And the same applied to her position uh, in some other capacity for uh, the federal government and any of its other agencies. And the fact of the matter is that this person, Mrs. Kerner, is going around Australia at taxpayers' expense, swanning around in a com car, travelling first class. And what happened on the day of uh, the? Uh, 13th of September 1995, we have here that there was an ESRA board consultation held, guess where? Perth. What was Mrs Kerner doing that day? She was in the Royal Commission with Dr Lawrence. 
Dr Lawrence was in the Royal Commission all that day. Now, have ever we seen the footage come and go about Mrs Kerner holding her hand and collecting the flowers? Who paid the fare? Good question, Senator Boehm. The taxpayer paid a fare. The taxpayer paid a fare. The taxpayer paid her accommodation and the taxpayer paid for a com car to swan around after uh, Dr Lawrence. And here is this minister who can't answer the questions about that, and yet you're prepared to put all the resources in the world to try and get Mrs Gallus. Why don't you do your parliamentary work properly instead of just running a smutty campaign? Order. It being 3, 3.45, I put the question that uh, the Senate take note of the answer. Those that opinion say aye. Those against no. I think the ayes have it. Senator, Co Senator Colston. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Pursuant to notice given at the last day of sitting on behalf of the Regulation and Ordinance C Committee, I now withdraw the business of the Senate notice of motion number one standing in my name for today. Mr Acting Deputy President, as usual, I seek leave to incorporate the Committee's correspondence, co correspondence in Hansard. I have already indicated that the Committee's end of sitting statement sorry, I have already indicated in the committee's end of sitting statement that the committee will present a report on its scrutiny of these regulations. Is leave granted? Being no objection, leave is granted. Are there any government responses to committee? Oh, sorry, Senator Margots. Thank you, Mr. Acting Deputy President. I seek leave to table documents relating to the alleged unsafe acts aboard the BHPP FPSO Griffin Venture. Uh, documents which comprise an extract from a BHP internal report on the issue and st six statutory declarations from the crew members on board the vessel at the time of the incident and I'll be also seeking leave to move a notice of motion in relation to those documents. Is seeking leave, I understand, to give notice of the motion? Yes. No. Is leave granted? Well, for the documents first. Being no objection, leave is granted. Are you seeking leave to give notice of a motion? Is leave granted? Being no objection, leave is granted. Senator Margots. I thank the Senate. Um, I give notice that on the next day of sitting I shall move that the Senate, one, calls on the Minister for Resources and the Minister for Transport to establish an independent judicial inquiry uh, into the alleged unsafe acts aboard the BHPP FPSO Griffin Venture on the 29th of May 1994 on the following grounds. A. The report of the Joint State Federal Investigation dated 9 October 1995 acknowledges that if the purge pipe were assembled, as described by Mr Vischer, sparks could have been produced and that, to quote, to assemble the pipe without the transition pieces would be an act of willful negligence. B. The six statutory declarations tabled with this motion confirm Mr Vischer's claims that the purge pipes were incorrectly assembled and therefore could have produced the sparks necessary for an explosion. C. The statutory declarations demonstrate that BHP Petroleum have willfully misled the three joint state federal investigations that have been conducted. And the Senate too strongly recommends that the independent judicial inquiry be assisted by a professional engineer with expertise in the petroleum industry who is acceptable to Mr Vischer, the federal and state authorities involved in the previous investigation and BHP Petroleum, and that the inquiry be established as a matter of urgency in order that this important issue can be finally resolved. Are there any government responses to committee reports? Minister. Mr Acting Deputy President, uh, I present the Government's response to the report of the Joint Committee on National Capital and External Territories on delivering the goods, and I seek leave to incorporate the document in Hansard and to move a motion in relation to the document. Is leave granted? Being no objection, leave is granted. Minister? I move that the Senate take note of the document. The question is the motion be agreed to. Senator Reid. Deputy President, I wish to make some comments on the statement which the Minister has just tabled as a response by the government to the Joint Committee report entitled Delivering the Goods, which was an inquiry the committee conducted under the terms of reference 
that we should look at the effectiveness and cost of current arrangements for the freighting of food, general supplies, building materials and other community needs into the territories of Christmas Island, Cocos Keeling Islands and Norfolk Islands et, and other matters. And I wish to confine my remarks this afternoon to the response in relation to the recommendations for Norfolk Island. Um, I must say I was extremely disappointed with the response, and I shall point out why in a moment, but I was pleased at least that the government agreed with the recommendation that the area known as Kingston, a very important part historically of Norfolk Island, be excluded from consideration as a potential site for any new harbour or freight handling infrastructure on Norfolk Island. But we made one recommendation uh, in relation to ships that I believe should have been supported, and that was that the committee recommended that the Commonwealth make available a grant equivalent to the ship's capital grant for the purchase of an Australian-built vessel smaller than would otherwise qualify for the ship's capital grant on condition that any proposed vessel would be used principally on the Norfolk Island trade for at least the first two years following commissioning. And we did that because we found in our inquiry that it was not reasonable or practical to build a large harbour. I haven't time this afternoon to go through all of the things that we did look at. Um, but this proposal <coughs> related to putting out to tender this ship for the purpose of providing for Norfolk Island, knowing that at the present time there are doubt about the ships that are presently servicing it. The government says that there still are union purchase ships available and it's not a matter to worry about. So. And then the response is that they disagree with this proposal, which would be the cheapest option of all of doing something practical for the island. This recommendation, the government says, was predicated on the assumption that union purchase vessels would soon not be available to service Norfolk Island. As these vessels will continue to visit the island for the foreseeable future, there is not the same degree of urgency to provide a replacement service. Rather, there is still time to consider all options in adequate detail. Fairyland, Mr Acting Deputy President. There has been a problem since the beginning of the century in properly servicing Norfolk Island, and this was an opportunity to do something about it, to do something practical about it at a cost that was reasonable for the number of people involved. I cannot believe that this has happened again. And I want to refer to some parts of the report which set out some of the history. Can I make a quotation? It's in paragraph 5.6 of the report. Norfolk Island has suffered severely in the past through the defective opportunities which nature has supplied for the safe and speedy access from ships to shore. It is certain that unless some substantial improvements can be effected, the probabilities of the expansion of trade in the future will be seriously lessened. Trade and tourism, I add to that, of course. Now, you might think that's a statement made recently. Not so. That was in a report to this parliament in 1914, identifying the lack of harbour facilities as a factor which had inhibited enterprise and trade on Norfolk Island. There was a Royal Commission conducted in 1975 and 1976 by Mr Justice Nimmo in relation to the constitutional relationship, which resulted, of course, in a measure of self-government being granted to Norfolk Island in 1979. There were a number of things he reported on, air services, the state of the airport, the constitution, etc. But he did say, one of the recommendations, it was recommended that the construction of a small boat harbour facility be investigated. And quoting from his report, he said, the physical difficulties which would be encountered in constructing a worthwhile harbour at Norfolk Island would be enormous, and the cost of undertaking such construction would be prohibitive, both in absolute terms and also when weighed against the benefits received, etc. And he goes on in the same paragraph, uh, however, one should take care to distinguish between such a seaport on the one hand and a small boat harbour on the other. How many reports do we have to have 
1979, as I said, a measure of self-government was given to Norfolk Island and responsibilities handed to the Norfolk Island government without doing anything about the infrastructure which enables them to get access of goods, passengers and others to the island. And I believe it is our responsibility to do something about that, not in terms of a grand harbour. We did not recommend that. We made a recommendation which would give some assistance to enable a firm to acquire a ship which could do this task, the cheapest possible option. Um, there was general agreement, as was reported in paragraph 5.37, that infrastructure for unloading passengers and freight by sea on Norfolk Island was primitive and in poor repair, which in turn prevented Norfolk Island from obtaining modern shipping services. It was apparent the Norfolk Island government could not afford to fund the substantial new port infrastructure. The Chief Minister said, and he's quoted in our report, on the question of freight handling facilities, it is fair to say that we have been hampered for lack of funds. Yet another report comes to this, this parliament yet again. The government has failed to recognise its responsibilities to do anything and puts it off. Since 1914, the first report, and here today we get this response from the government says, rather, there is time to consider all options in adequate detail. How many more decades have to pass before something is done to rectify this situation? I could scarcely believe it when I read that. There are a couple of the recommendations which the government, or one, number 22, they say agree to in principle, um, and they disagree with the other recommendation, which we believe was significant to enable things to happen more freely with uh, Norfolk Island, and that was to get rid of the export clearance numbers um, that operate at present. The government has rejected this proposal as well, and I think that's a pity and unimaginative. Um, we also recommended things in relation to the Australia Post Corporation's um, in increase in prices of parcels to Norfolk Island. Parcels by post to Norfolk Island are part of the lifeblood of the place, and again, the government disagreed with that. It seems to me that the government either doesn't quite know what happens on Norfolk Island, what life is like there, or they, or they don't care. But I'm extremely disappointed that even if they hadn't agreed to the precise recommendations that we have made, that they haven't even seemed to have recognised that there are things that need to be done uh, at Norfolk Island and in relation to its survival of getting goods and services there. We heard evidence of occasions when things uh, they virtually ran out of perishable things. It's certainly important to its future that it be able to get um, tourists to the place in greater numbers that are is present. They suffered enormously during the pilot strike, and that has not really been compensated for. The air services are not as good as they could be, uh, and I think generally those who read this report will be very disappointed with the government's response and its failure to recognise that the time has come to do something about access to Norfolk Island rather, putting it, rather than putting it off again. It won't be that long before it's 2014. I would hope that it won't be 100 years between the first report to this parliament about the needs of the island and some adequate response. Senator Macdonald. Mr Acting uh, Deputy President, uh, I want to as well uh, comment on a couple of the uh, res government responses to the recommendations made uh, uh, by the committee um, in its um, report uh, delivering the goods. Uh, Mr Acting uh, Deputy President, um, I, I first of all just want to uh, briefly refer to recommendations 3, 4 five, and 5, which relate to uh, uh, shipping uh, into uh, all of the external territories, Norfolk, uh, Christmas and Caicos, but uh, particularly in relation to Christmas and Caicos. And it is, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President, essential that the government uh, is not blinkered or limited by its uh, very close uh, connections with the union movement in relation to shipping uh, uh, to the uh, Christmas and Caicos Islands. It is uh, essential that uh, a service is a shipping service is provided to Christmas and uh, Caicos uh, that does serve both islands, 
and uh, does serve them uh, both effectively at the least possible cost. Now, the committee took uh, evidence from a number of uh, interested parties who uh, all indicated that they could provide a good service, and an efficient service, a cost-effective service to both Crispus uh, and Cocos, provided the government didn't stand in their way. And uh, that was uh, one of the reasons why the committee uh, recommended that um, the uh, uh, tenders be called and expressions of interest sought uh, in relation to providing a service uh, without uh, cabotage uh, on applying to the uh, service, because uh, really uh, the evidence given to us by uh, almost uh, all of the uh, people interested in this aspect suggested that the existence of cabotage was the, um, was the uh, factor that was prohibiting the uh, government, uh, prohibiting uh, operators from providing a cost-effective uh, service to, uh, to uh, Christmas and Cocos Islands. It's essential, Mr Acting Deputy President, that uh, both islands be served. I understand that the government is uh, currently encouraging an mm -hmm. operator from Darwin, uh, of Minister. all places, uh, to, uh, uh, that here, to the Indian Ocean Territories, but only doing Christmas and not doing Cocos Islands, and that will leave Cocos without a regular uh, and reliable uh, form of, uh, of freight uh, into uh, the island. So I do, uh, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President, express my regret that the government has not been prepared uh, to uh, pick that up. The government does say, uh, in its uh, response to Recommendation 3, um, uh, whilst acknowledging in its response to Recommendation 2 that there is uh, strong community support to include the scenario where Christmas Island is exempt from cabotage, but in its response to Recommendation 3, then, it goes on to the say that the federal government has reaffirmed its commitment to supporting existing uh, cabotage arrangements, and I think that's unfortunate. The uh, government does, however, go on to say that uh, uh, they support the single voyage uh, permit uh, system, which uh, uh, does exist, and uh, also uh, points out that arrangements under the Act uh, do uh, 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 presently exist for the issue of coasting trade licences and single uh, uh, voyage uh, permits, as, as I've mentioned, and they say that that provides sufficient flexibility to accommodate uh, current options. Now, I just want to emphasise that. Uh, because I would uh, suggest uh, that it would be most inappropriate if the government, uh, having supported uh, the issue of uh, uh, trade licences and uh, uh, single voyage permits, uh, then at some stage get uh, pressured by the unions to re-look at those things because the, the unions uh, are not getting what they uh, want out of it. Uh, but I am disappointed that the government uh, didn't take a more um, uh, proactive uh, approach to the uh, question of uh, cabotage. Uh, Mr Acting uh, Deputy President, uh, in that regard, I, I finally say that the essential thing is that the people of Cocos and Crispus Highlands do have a reliable, efficient and uh, relatively inexpensive uh, uh, means of getting uh, their freight uh, to the island. I refer uh, now, leaving the shipping matter, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President, to the responses to uh, Recommendation 12, where the committee uh, recommended that the uh, Cocos Islands Cooperative Society be reconstituted under Australian law. And I'm pleased to see that the uh, government has agreed with that. Uh, it's only sensible, and uh, I think that the, the sooner the, uh, the cooperative is brought under Australian law and can be uh, dealt with and audited. Uh, and uh, monitored under Australian law rather than Singapore law, which it, under which it presently exists, then the better will be the co people of Cocos Island and uh, the people who have to rely on uh, uh, the services that the cooperative uh, provides uh, at Cocos. I see uh, the government has also agreed with uh, co the uh, committee's recommendation number 13 um, regarding an inquiry into the legal status, ownership and economic power of the co-op uh, and its links with the Cocos Keeling uh, Shire Council. Now, I've expressed concern that the members of the board of the co-ops are almost identical uh, with the members of the uh, Cocos Shire Council. Now, I, I can't uh, claim to be an expert under West Australian local government law under which uh, the Shire now operates, uh, but certainly under Queensland that <coughs> had a fairly substantial conflict of interest uh, concern uh, in it. 
and um, it, it really uh, is the case, uh, without putting too strong a point on it, that the Cocos Island Cooperative uh, is really the principal commercial act activity uh, or com principal commercial organisation uh, on the island, uh, and it's also uh, one and the same almost as the council. And it does mean that people wanting to set up in competition, people with a different view of how to run commercial life on uh, at Cocos Island uh, really find it very, very difficult. So I am pleased to see that the government uh, is prepared to look at that a bit uh, closer. Uh, Mr Acting Deputy President, uh, uh, the thing that impacted upon most committee uh, members when you uh, landed Cocos is uh, uh, that is a, it is a magnificently pretty little uh, atoll or series of atolls. Uh, and, uh, but the other thing to hit us is the uh, number of coconut trees uh, on the island. There is a recommendation that we should do something to see if we can do something with uh, the coconuts and get some coconut oil extraction. The government has disagreed with the specific recommendation uh, made, but I, I suppose it's gone halfway by saying that they will investigate uh, the use of or, or the extraction of coconut oil as a commercial activity to give some employment and uh, wealth creation prospects to the people of uh, uh, Cocos Island. Um, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President, in re Recommendation 19, the committee referred to the purchase of an amphibious landing vessel um, and uh, the ownership of that. A again, both um, particularly in relation to Cocos but also in Christmas, so I think uh, the government uh, has to be very careful that if it has the interests of the inhabitants at heart, it has to make sure that there is no uh, <laughs> conflict of interest uh, between the stevedores, um, uh, the people uh, who load and unload and distribute goods, um, and uh, and those, uh, and to make sure that uh, they do uh, uh, act always in a way that is in the best interests of the uh, people of uh, those islands. And there is uh, a suggestion that uh, because the stevedores uh, are in many instances uh, representatives of the uh, co-op, and uh, uh, that there is uh, preference given uh, to uh, in pricing and uh, in uh, uh, timing uh, to uh, freight which belongs to the uh, cooperative uh, to the detriment of uh, other persons' uh, uh, freight. So I think it's important that any uh, new landing vessels, the ownership and the uh, capacity to work that uh, should be uh, very carefully uh, uh, considered. Uh, Mr Acting Deputy President, um, the uh, Committee uh, and uh, Senator Reid also referred to this in recommendation 26. The committee recommended that the requirement for export clearance numbers for supplies sent from mainland Australia to the external territories be abolished without any change to their duty free uh, status. The, the government, uh, in its response, has disagreed with this uh, uh, recommendation, uh, claiming that uh, the, the cost of doing this is not really their fault. But overwhelmingly, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President, the evidence given to the committee uh, was that these uh, export clearance numbers really didn't seem to serve a purpose that couldn't be achieved in some other way, but they did uh, uh, add very considerably uh, to the cost of uh, freighting uh, goods uh, to uh, not only uh, Norfolk Island that Senator Reid, I think, uh, spoke to, but also the Indian Ocean uh, territories uh, as well. So I'm disappointed. Uh, that in uh, that regard uh, the government was not prepared to uh, pick up the recommendations of the committee. Uh, in other uh, comments, I uh, generally support those made by uh, Senator Reid uh, in relation to uh, uh, many of the uh, other responses to the recommendations of the committee. Senator Ellison. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, this response is timely, as uh, I had intended to ask Senator Collins a question today if he'd been here in relation to this very matter, and uh, I was going to refer them. Uh, Senator Collins, to the recent controversy regarding the shipping service to the Cocos and Christmas Islands. And in this regard, I would have referred him to an article in The Australian dated the 25th and 26th of November 1995, which was entitled Union Plot to Sink Cocos Shipping. Uh, in that article, uh, the Minister for Transport in Western Australia accused the federal government of lobbying for Darwin to service the islands and said the Maritime Union had been doing the government's dirty work. Uh, Mr Acting Deputy President, the questions I was going to put to the Minister uh, were, could the, uh, the Minister confirm or deny whether any Keating Government Ministers had been involved in lobbying for Darwin to service Christmas and Cocos Islands? And furthermore, 
was the minister aware of the preference of the people of both islands that the current dedicated island service, that is Cocos Traders, remain operating from the traditional port of Fremantle in Western Australia? I might add that any transfer of the shipping service from Perth to Darwin would result in a, uh, a loss in the region of $55 million to Western Australia. I further was going to ask, has the government done any comparison of the adequacy of the services and the benefits to the community offered by the two competing services operating from Darwin and Perth respectively? It is my belief that the cost it would be oh, sorry that it would be more cost effective to operate from Fremantle than uh, from Darwin as the for a start the cost of goods uh, would not have the problem of freight that the goods in Darwin would experience um, and uh, I also would have asked the the minister uh, to investigate and act upon claims by the Western Australian Transport Minister Eric Charlton that the, motor, that the maritime union uh, was being used industrially to close the shipping service currently oper operating between Western Australia and the islands. Mr Acting Deputy President, the, uh, Cocos, tra the Cocos traders have operated between Fremantle and, uh, and the Cocos and Christmas Islands since uh, the state shipping service ceased earlier this year. It has been operating very well and I believe in the interests of the people on both islands. Uh, unfortunately, it looks as though the, uh, co that, that Cocos, Island, uh, Cocos traders will not be given a permit for the uh, a single voyage permit for the month of December and I believe that uh, the federal government has been involved in, in lobbying for uh, the Darwin service. Now, um, I, I just refer to uh, a draft uh, set of minutes uh, from the Christmas Island Chamber of Commerce dealing with a meeting held on the 9th of October 1995 where the chairman indicated that a meeting had held, been held with Mr Warren Snowden, a government member from the Northern Territory, on the 12th of uh, September 1995. Uh, there were others in attendance and uh, at this meeting the chamber had raised the shipping issue. Uh, it was reported that Mr Snowden had stated that from information he had received uh, we, we could forget utilising a Clooney's Ross vessel as it would not leave the port of Fremantle and he would be surprised if it was worked by Christmas Island stevedores. Now, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President, that points to a federal government involvement in treating preferentially uh, a competing service. And I note that in the, uh, the article in The Australian that, was mentioned, that I mentioned, uh, Mr Snowden said, what we're about is trying to provide competition in the marketplace and a cost-effective service to Christmas and Cocos Islands. Well, I asked the government to do just that, and I asked the government also to have regard to the wishes of the people on both Cocos and Christmas Islands and give uh, the uh, Cocos uh, Island traders a fair go in their submission to carry on conducting this service. I also question whether the, uh, uh, the competing service will offer a regular service to Cocos Islands or whether, in fact, it will be more a regular service to, the, uh, to Christmas Island alone. And uh, I think that's a very important point. It was raised in the uh, committee's report delivering the goods. Freight and shipping is vital to these two islands, and the government has a responsibility to look after the interests of the people on both those okay. islands. President, uh, I seek leave. Uh, oh, oh. Sorry, I thought that you were speaking on the same matter. The question is that the motion moved by the minister be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against, no. I think the ayes have it. The minister? One minute, I hope. <laughs> Mr uh, Acting Deputy President, I present the government's response to a report of the Joint Committee on the Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade in Australia, the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund. And I seek leave to incorporate the document in hand and to move a motion in relation to the document. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. I move that the Senate take note of the document. Senator Harradine. Um, Mr Acting Deputy President, um, uh, I've only just received this response uh, and indeed uh, um, uh, there is not much time and I, Senator Boswell is seeking leave for his motion so I won't be long. Uh, it's noticed uh, that in the government's response uh, uh, to the Joint Committee on Foreign Affairs, uh, Defence and Trades uh, uh, report on the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund uh, that uh, it acknowledges that um, uh, there have been uh, 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 criticisms of the uh, certain projects and programs and uh, 
it, it did indicate uh, that uh, some projects and programs have indeed been uh, less than they might have been. Uh, the uh, report, uh, uh, the response goes on. However, it's also important to note that the outcomes of programs assisted by the fund and bank depend not only on the terms of assistance agreed by the organisations with government, but on the effectiveness of the implementation by those governments. The organisations are important to Australia for their support of sustainable economic growth and outlooking economic policies globally and within Australia, uh, within Asia and the Pacific. It then goes on on page two, uh, 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 follows on in the same page, that's page two, um, that, um, uh, about the significant proportion of Australia's total aid expenditure going to the World Bank and uh, points out that in 1994-95 this was 11 per cent. Now, um, the, um, uh, it, it uh, notes that uh, the government has agreed to contribute $30 million uh, since the committee reported uh, over an extended period beginning 1997-98 to subsidise the provision of funds for structural adjustment programs to the poorest countries on highly concessional terms by the IMF through the Enhanced Structural Adjustment Facility. Now, I want to address that, Mr Acting Deputy President, because I think it's very, very important uh, that uh, we do, because uh, the Joint Committee did observe uh, that uh, a number of um, submittees to it uh, were concerned that, in fact, um, uh, these structural adjustment programs were having a deleterious, uh, many of the structural adjustment programs were having a deleterious on the po uh, effect on the poorest of the poor. And uh, this is uh, one thing that, it ha that has concerned me, uh, quite frankly, about structural adjustment programs. Uh, it is not, not only the, uh, uh, the um, uh, sort of uh, absolutist uh, economic rationalist approach that sometimes is taken by these organisations or some people in the organisations, uh, but, but it's uh, also uh, uh, the, the fact that uh, uh, the burden of uh, 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 the cost burden and the taxation burden is unduly weighted on the poorest of the poor, either uh, indirectly through increased costs of commodities, of basic commodities of that, food, clothing, shelter and so on, uh, or in regard to the taxation system itself. Now I raise this because the structural adjustment programs uh, and policies that are developed by the, uh, by the um, uh, World Bank uh, are also adopted by the Asian uh, Development Bank. And uh, honourable senators will recall that we have uh, paid um, uh, $69 million uh, to the structural adjustment program, ADB uh, program for Papua New Guinea. The question is, what will those structural adjustment um, uh, policies, how, uh, what will be the outcome of those structural adjustment policies? And in respect of taxation, in direct, uh, in in respect of direct taxation, uh, this can only be imposed on, uh, uh, on um, uh, land, labour and capital. Uh, the uh, structure adjustment programs appear to be unwilling uh, to target capital. I suppose in, in one way that's, uh, that's probably understanding because uh, capital is a moving target. Uh, people who are who, who, who do have the capital, of course, can go offshore. Um, uh, but uh, more attention should be given to that. Uh, Labor, uh, yes, they'll tax, uh, but mainly pay as you earn, and, and uh, that is one of the reasons that you do have a drop in number of these situations for the, uh, of, of earnings, particularly amongst the pay as you earn uh, workers. Uh, those who are able to um, so manipulate their affairs, uh, uh, or their, their, the results of their labour, as it were, are, are again a moving target. Um, so in those two aspects, uh, the, 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 there is only one other to be considered, and that is land. Now in my view, uh, the structural adjustment programs don't properly deal effectively with uh, taxation on land. 
and um, I was speaking to, recently to a uh, person who was uh, very much uh, involved in, 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 these, uh, uh, in, in, in the area of international banking, uh, who happens to live in, in Manila. And when I raised it uh, with that uh, particular person, he, uh, he said, well, yes, uh, uh, I do live in a uh, fairly upmarket suburb of, of Manila, um, and uh, we pay a, a pittance uh, for, uh, for land there uh, in, in taxation, a pittance. And of course, uh, many of the politicians also uh, in that particular country uh, live in this particular area. Um, but I, I do believe that that is, one, uh, that is an area that is very, very much neglected because in um, developing countries, as indeed uh, in developed countries, uh, it is the people uh, with the money, leaving just aside the farmers for a minute, uh, Senator Bosworth, before you jump in, uh, but uh, it is the people with the money that have got the land and particularly got the uh, uh, high-valued uh, um, uh, land in the metropolitan areas. Um, indirect taxes, of course, are uh, more... Um, I mean, it's n that, uh, they don't present a, a moving target. I mean, they can be imposed, but they impose unequally on the poor. And uh, one of uh, my concerns uh, also is that uh, uh, many of the... Um, uh, people in these international organisations tend to blame the victim, tend to blame the victim and say, oh, there's too many of them, too many of them. Put the money into uh, anti-HCG or RU486 in developing uh, those sort of uh, uh, border fashion drugs uh, and uh, that'll settle the problem. Uh, and, uh, of course, it's the third world women uh, that uh, are suffering under these particular programs. Uh, they say, uh, they suggest that these programs are, are run, this research is done by WHO. Uh, you might, might hear that in a debate uh, coming up. Uh, but in fact it's done by the HRP program, Human Reproduction Program, which is funded largely by the World Bank, the UNDP and United Nations Population Fund. The executive agency is the WHO, but the funding and the focus is that of the World Bank and of the population controllers. I believe we should uh, be more concerned about looking at whether or not the structural adjustment programs are assisting uh, the poor out of their, uh, out of their tragic uh, poverty in developing countries. I seek leave to continue my remarks. Senator. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Uh, Senator Boswell. Uh, thank you, Mr. Acting Deputy President. Uh, I draw your attention to a notice of motion that I moved this morning, and with the agreement of the government whip, uh, I was to bring that notice of motion uh, forward after question time. I now seek leave to amend that original notice of motion. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. <clears throat> I move that the Senate calls on the Minister for Communication and the Arts to establish an independent inquiry into the behaviour of Telstra in respect of the resultant cost to COT members of the extensive, prolonged and excessively legalistic arbitration process. The question is that the Minister. If I could. Uh, oh. You're seeking to amend it first, aren't you? That's, that's what's before you? Yes. Then I want to make the question is that that motion moved by Senator Boswell be agreed to? The Minister wants to speak to the motion, yes. Just by leave, if I could, um, I indicated to Senator Boswell the government leave never, is granted. never leave accepts is granted. a resolution that calls upon a government to do something. Uh, we will therefore oppose uh, your motion, but recognising... Uh, that I can count, we won't seek to divide on it, Senator Boswell. The question is that the motion moved by Senator Boswell be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Presentation of other documents. Pursuant to the resolution of the Senate, 
of the 13th of February 1991, I present the following government documents which were presented to the Acting Deputy President, Senator Colston, after the Senate adjourned last night. Department of Human Services and Health, Commonwealth Disability Strategy, First Progress Report, Royal Australian Air Force Veterans Residences Trust Annual Report 1994-95. In accordance with the terms of the resolution, the publication of the documents was authorised. Mr. Acting uh, Deputy President, I, I would seek leave to move to take note of the documents. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Mr. Acting Deputy President, the, I refer particularly to the Commonwealth Disability Strategy First Progress Report 1995. Um, you will recall that the Commonwealth Disability Consultative Council was asked to report on the implementation of the Commonwealth Disability Strategy, uh, which resulted from the uh, pa passage of the Disability Discrimination Act 1992. And my sole reason for standing is to draw attention to the report. Uh, it was to report on the progress uh, that the Commonwealth has taken in implementation of the Act in its own instrumentalities. And uh, this resulted as a uh, because of the opposition, particularly Senator Patterson's uh, attention to the detail uh, at the time when the Act came in, we discovered during estimates that with all the fanfare that went on in relation to this Act, and we certainly support the Act, but with all the fanfare, the major deficiency was the employment of disabled people within the Commonwealth Government's own departments. And uh, this has, uh, out of that, uh, came the appointment of this consultative council. And in this report, the first year, admittedly it's only been, it's a 10-year program and it's only one year that um, this is reporting on, the first year, I think it's important to bring to the Senate's attention the categories uh, of the overall results as reported in this first progress report. And they are significant progress made 14 per cent, 14 per cent. Some progress made 35 per cent, no progress reported 38 per cent, no response to item 13 per cent. So it's a sort of damning with faint praise. And I quote from the report, it itself, report itself, the employment of people with a disability in the Australian public service is steadily improving. Well, considering the base that it came from, it has to improve. And, uh, Further on, the report states, very few departments provided useful information on the consultation process in the disability field, and most did not report progress in this area. So I purely uh, or I merely want to uh, report that to the Senate and uh, acquaint them of the very slow progress that is occurring in this regard. The question is that the motion moved by Senator Heron be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against, no. I think the ayes have it. In accordance with the provisions of the Audit Act 1901, I present the following report of the Auditor General. Report number 13 of 1995-96, Financial Statements Audit, results of the 1994-95 Financial Statement Audits of the Commonwealth Entities. Yeah. Senator Boehm. Uh, I seek leave to move a motion in respect of the report. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Mr. Acting President, uh, this uh, audit uh, office ordered the results of the 1994-95 financial statement orders of Commonwealth entities it covers, uh, as the title indicates, uh, the whole range of Commonwealth reporting. It's useful uh, because uh, you get a, a view of a trend, uh, and fortunately, it's an improving trend in financial accounting by Commonwealth entities. Uh, for example, this report indicates that inadequate accounts and records resulted in audit qualifications in only three Commonwealth entities. Nonetheless, more than 1,500 recommendations were made to management uh, crossing a, uh, across a fair range of, uh, uh, of uh, matters. Uh, and the report notes that the incidence of qualified audit reports issued has continued to decline uh, and in 94-95 represents only about 4 per cent 
of all audit reports issued. Nonetheless, there are some matters uh, that uh, concern me, and uh, uh, I, uh, in, in particular, uh, I looked at a summary of risk assessments uh, in this uh, document, and I must say uh, uh, the comfortable feeling I got when reading the summary of the report about how things were improving uh, disappeared a little. Uh, for example, in the Department of Defence, it, it, it's evident, uh, and I quote, uh, the department has developed fraud control measures which require modifications to meet current organisational requirements. Well, if they uh, need modification, uh, I hope the government is going to do something about them, because uh, the uh, Auditor General, uh, in the detailed part of this report, indicates that the department has advised that the existing fraud control plan is of limited relevance because of continuing organisational and structural change. Uh, significant matters reported to the Department for prompt attention, that's by the Audit Office, included management and accounting for assets, inventories and employee entitlements, and recording of guarantees and undertakings. Now, this is of some substance because the Department has in-service inventories uh, valued in excess of $3.6 billion, uh, all of which, by the way, are recorded on manual uh, manual systems. The uh, other uh, department that concerned me, and I can only deal briefly with each department, was the Department of Human Services and Health, uh, where it was reported that the department was in the process of finalising a comprehensive uh, risk assessment. Well, uh, after all this time, one wonders why it's only in the process of doing it and why, in fact, it hasn't uh, actually done it. Uh, this is, uh, the, the risk of fraud uh, is enormous and uh, one would hope uh, that this auditor's report will encourage uh, the department to proceed apace with this. I want to deal with the, the Department of Human Services and Health in another audit report shortly so I won't uh, uh, go on about it here now. The Australian Customs Service, and here uh, the Auditor General says risk management activities while critical to its achievement of revenue collection goals, have not had a clear strategic and corporate focus, despite the contributions made within the agency. Now, this is a serious matter because the Australian Customs Service has uh, an annual activity base estimated at $24 billion. Uh, the Auditor General notes that the current version of the fraud control plan was devised in 1993 and is due for review, uh, but even under that plan there was no assessment made of the risks to revenue of the export of goods out of Australia, and I quote, diversion into home consumption or substitution of transshipped or under bond goods reported to ACS as being intended for export could potentially have a significant revenue loss effect. The Audit Office considers that ACS has not properly assessed the risks that the export of goods in these categories poses to the revenue. And uh, in areas of uh, revenue foregone, the Auditor General concludes that in relation to passenger, uh, passenger motor vehicle manufacturing and textile clothing and footwear concessions, risk management processes were in need of review. Uh, another matter of concern within uh, the Customs Service was that the uh, Audit Office noted improvements in password controls uh, into, into the uh, computer system. However, weaknesses were still apparent in respect of control over utility programs which have the capability of overriding or bypass system security features. Uh, in addition, utility programs were not being properly controlled across a number of systems. ACS advised of remedial procedures which were designed to overcome the security concerns noted. I mean, we all know about the significance and the consequences of uh, breaking into, uh, into computer, uh, allegedly secure uh, computer systems. And uh, it's a major concern to find that the Australian Customs Service, where, as I said, something like $24 billion of money uh, of revenue is, uh, is involved, uh, that these systems are capable, apparently, uh, of, uh, of significant improvement before uh, they can be seen to be 
uh, as safe as they should be. Now, uh, uh, these procedures, the Auditor General says, will ensure that access to powerful utility programs will only be provided under supervision in emergency situations. Uh, another uh, of the uh, bodies uh, that I must say I was concerned at the, uh, about when I read this uh, summary was uh, uh, ATSIC, the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders Commission. Uh, where uh, it seemed to me the Auditor General was uh, dropping the ball a bit, unusually, because all he said here was that the Commission indicated a strong awareness of the need to manage risks. I mean, that looks like weasel words for saying they don't have a system. And uh, I would have uh, hoped that, uh, that uh, perhaps a stronger position might have been taken, particularly when you look at the text of the report and find that in 1994-95, uh, ATSIC's uh, operating expenses were $951 million, uh, operating revenue was $37 million, and the Commonwealth forked out $940 million. It's a lot of bickies. But uh, look at uh, how badly some of it seems to be uh, administered, uh, according to the Auditor General. Because, uh, for example, under the Community Development Employment Project, CDEP, the Auditor General says this, reviews undertaken at regional offices identified a high number of instances where supporting documentation for new participants could not be located. This lack of supporting documentation raised doubts as to whether all payments made by the Commission in relation to CDEP were in respect of eligible participants. Well, that seems to be absolutely essential, you should know, if the people you're paying money to are the people you're supposed to be paying money to. And uh, I must say I'd have thought that uh, uh, perhaps uh, that seemed a very soft way at the beginning of this report uh, uh, in which the Auditor General dealt with this, uh, this matter. On the question of, uh, of grant acquittals, he says this, for ATSIC once again, although some improvement was noted in relation to the acquittal of 1993-94 grants, excessive delays in the provisions of adequate acquittal documentation by many grantee organisation remains a problem. The Commission has engaged a consultant to investigate the acquittal process and a report of the results of this investigation is expected shortly. I might say I've asked several questions and Senate estimates about this matter of acquittal uh, and uh, I'm still awaiting uh, appropriate responses. So uh, these, these matters are matters of some concern. Uh, I uh, notice also uh, on a different uh, department, the Australian Taxation Office, now there, I must say, I would have expected uh, uh, everything to be Simon Pure. But, uh, and, and there's no doubt, the Auditor General says risk management strategies were soundly based and aligned with corporate objectives. But then it went on to say this, accountability for risk management practices and reporting on taxation revenue will require ongoing review. Now, once again, that seems to me like the sorts of uh, words you use when the system isn't good enough. Uh, that's if you're being very friendly and don't want to say that the system isn't good enough. But I commend the Auditor General for the report. Uh, uh, it is most useful material and once again continues uh, the Auditor General's office's uh, outstanding record of providing the Parliament with the information which it should have. And I seek leave to continue my remarks. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. In accordance with the provisions of the Audit Act 1901, I present the following report of the Auditor General, Report No. 14 of 1995-96, Performance Audit, the Sale of CSL, Commonwealth Blood Product Funding and Regulation. Senator Boehm. I seek leave, I, uh, seek leave to move a motion in respect uh, is of leave this. Is uh, leave granted? Leave is granted. Uh, thank you, Mr. Acting Deputy President. This uh, is uh, uh, an interesting report, audit report as well, and it's uh, a shame that uh, former Senator John Coulter isn't here uh, to deal with it because he had great concerns about some matters relating to the, Com the Commonwealth uh, uh, Serums Laboratory uh, and uh, the, uh, the sale. I'm particularly concerned about some elements of it, and I want to deal here with, uh, with them. But uh, in particular, I suppose I should, uh, or in general, I should mention first of all the, uh, the sorts of problems the Auditor General mentions. Uh, he says, for example, that insufficient information was available to the Audit Office to determine whether the issues of indemnities to uh, CSL 
by the Commonwealth Government outweigh the financial and supply risks that the Commonwealth would have been exposed to if other options had been pursued. He says there was no quantitative assessment of the potential liabilities of the Commonwealth for product indemnities provided to CSL pre or post sale. He said the Department of uh, Human Services and Health did not provide a documented briefing to the then minister before committing itself to uh, the uh, PFA uh, arrangement, that's the plasma fractionation agreement, uh, and that public reporting of the outcome of the CSL sale was provided in press releases and commentary in annual reports of the Department of Finance and the Department of, uh, uh, of Human Services and Health. Now, I agree with the Auditor General when he says that for improved accountability reasons, the Audit Office considers that the outcomes of major asset sales should be timely and comprehensively reported, one would hope, to the Parliament, including the financial outcomes and full details of any ongoing Commonwealth commitments. I say here, here to all that, and I know the government hasn't been too good at actually bringing its asset sales to completion. It keeps on balancing uh, uh, its budget or making huge alleged contributions to its budget at budget time from asset sales, but they really seem to actually turn up. Here's one that did actually turn up, and you find, in fact, they've made a bit of a mess of it, because there is a most extraordinary situation here that I would like to, to deal with. Uh, in, uh, in this matter, CSL was indemnified by the Commonwealth against claims by persons who become HIV positive or contract an AIDS-related condition or hepatitis through the use of a CSL plasma or diagnostic product sourced from Australian blood or plasma and manufactured during the or plasma and manufactured during the terms of the PFA and the DPA indemnities provided to CSL raise accountability issues says the auditor general given the potential risk of future calls on commonwealth budgets the audit office was advised that Cabinet did not specifically consider, nor was it formally advised of, the nature and scale of indemnities provided to CSL under the agreement signed in December 1993. Now, uh, uh, I, uh, I note that the Auditor General does say that the uh, Department of, uh, of uh, Human Services and Health did, it, did make Cabinet aware of the indemnity issues when it took the decision to sell CSL uh, and comments provided by the Department of Finance uh, and the Treasury and in recommendations and findings of the consultant uh, to the Department of Human Services and Health contained in an attachment to the cab Cabinet Memorandum did raise the matter of the provision of Commonwealth indemnities. But the Audit Office considers it would have been much more judicious to have fully briefed the Minister on the specific details of the agreements. Now, uh, the, uh, uh, the Department of uh, Human Services and Health advised the Auditor's Office that Hansard statements, and this was given in justification, Hansard statements by the then Minister for Health, Senator Richardson, and the Parliamentary Secretary of the Minister for Health, uh, Dr Theophanis, indicate that the Executive Government was aware of the indemnities issue, aware of the indemnities issue, not the specifics of the indemnities. In Dr Theophanes's case, he expressly supported the provision of indemnities by reading into the Hansard of the 27th of October 1993 the terms of a letter to CSL from the department's, uh, Departmental Deputy Secretary. Senator Richard also raised the issue of indemnities in correspondence with Mr Peter Costello, MP, concerning the Commonwealth's position on the provision of an indemnity to CSL on CJD-related claims. Now, that, of course, is... Uh, is a major problem. That's one that, uh, that uh, former Senator Coulter uh, uh, was raising uh, in this place. And, and the, order, the uh, department went on, the events referred to above occurred well before the execution of the plas plasma fractionation and diagnostics agreement. But the order generally expresses this further concern because it noted a number of unique features concerning the indemnities which highlight the need for appropriate accountability processes. First, the size of CSL's exposure to legal claims is unknown. We have this huge contingent liability in the budget. Well, it may be huge. Who knows? 
The department uh, notes the financial statement state in relation to contingent liabilities that the department was involved in 201 cases covering a wide range of litigation, including cases related to the supply, relating to the supply by CSL of blood, pro blood products which were allegedly contaminated by the HIV AIDS virus and relating to Kreuzenfeld Jakob disease, uh, CJD. The department was unable to put a value on the quantum of damages arising from these cases. Now, the audit office found that Human Services and Health Department did not commission any actuarial studies to quantify the potential liability of the Commonwealth for product indemnities, indemnities either pre or post sale. Uh, I mean, surely there are, there are a lot of problems. I acknowledge that, and the department uh, did mention that, for example, the nature of the claims involves medical conditions which may not show up for a prolonged period and may involve future generations. In any event, uh, so far, the department uh, has, uh, or the government has agreed that there should be a settlement of all Australian HIV AIDS claims, uh, and, and that's been made for reasons of public policy, although CSL has not been found negligent in any of the actions which have proceeded to court. However, what's the cost of all this? Well, the cost of the Commonwealth for HIV-AIDS claims between 89.90 and 94.95 amounted to $28.6 million. The Commonwealth agreed to contribute to these costs, the Order General says, provided it was consulted and agreed to the settlement or defence of each claim and that each claim was individually assessed for its legal validity. There have been no reports of the transmission of AIDS-related conditions through blood products since the introduction of viral inactivation steps in 1984, uh, but claims, it says, in respect of hepatitis are possible. Now, the Audit Office considers, uh, by way of conclusion in this matter, that the Commonwealth could have been better protected through the utilisation of economic in incentives on CSL to adopt quality and safety measures above the mandatory standards as the CSL will bear the full costs. If the status quo position is maintained, the Commonwealth may potentially bear the costs of litigation arising from any shortcomings in current processes. Now, where the Finance Department says, oh, no, it's in uh, CSL's best interest not to let that happen. But I must say I found uh, this Order General's report into the sale of CSL and this question of indemnities to be a very important one and certainly should provide a lesson to uh, other uh, bodies, uh, other Commonwealth bodies uh, that are being sold off, and certainly uh, when uh, the coalition is in government, we'll be uh, examining very closely the implications of this report uh, when we come to implement uh, an asset sales program which is to be run competently and effectively, and as indicated, rather than the chaotic style uh, employed by this government. The question is that the motion moved by Senator Boehm be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against, no. I think the ayes have it. In accordance with the usual practice, I table a list of parliamentary committee reports to which the government has not responded within the prescribed period. This list has been circulated to honourable senators. With the concurrence of the Senate, the list will be incorporated in Hansard. I present the report of the Australian Parliamentary Delegation to the European Institutions and Spain, which took place during, during between the 22nd of September and the 14th of October 1995. Senator Sherry. Uh, thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Um, I uh, table the statement made earlier today in the House of Representatives by the Prime Minister on the future of our forests and seek leave to incorporate the statement in Hansard. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Um, I move to, to take note of the, uh, the uh, uh, statement and also seek leave for uh, debate for uh, half an hour. I understand there is an agreed uh, schedule of time for people to speak, uh, an informal agreement on this matter. Well, this, uh, Senator this, half, this half an hour, is, is that going to be take out, taken out of the total of uh, tabling of documents time? I understand it's not. No.
has finished in any case. Senator Kemp. Uh, thank you, Mr Acting Deputy, Deputy President. Uh, we uh, had today the uh, tabling in the House of Reps a statement uh, by the Prime Minister on the forests. Uh, it's been very difficult to actually get a, a, a time fix on when this government is going to make its final statement. And, uh, senators in this chamber will notice how um, the deadlines have constantly slipped. Uh, earlier in the week, we were told the statement was going to be uh, made on Friday, and of course, then we had uh, uh, an early uh, statement by the Prime Minister today. The previous week, we were being told the statement was on Monday, and so what happens is we can see in this uh, area, like so many other areas of government policy, uh, considerable uh, policy confusion. I think that well, I have got, uh, and, and why don't you listen for a change? It was it was it was quite interesting. Well, what we had, of course, was what purported to be your policy that was uh, brought down today, and uh, what we got was another vacuous statement from the prime minister. And as uh, Mr. Howard uh, pointed out uh, in the other place, I thought so uh, effectively, is that uh, in so many areas the difficult decisions. In, for in, the, in the forest area uh, have been, as we always see with the Labor Party, flicked past the election. <laughs> flicked past the election. And how nice it was to hear Mr, Ke Mr. Keating complaining about the volume of wood chip uh, exports from this country. And uh, Mr. Keating uh, expressed in his speech great concern about the, uh, the volume of uh, wood chip exports. But the, re the, the reality is that Mr. Keating. Uh, is the champion wood chip exporter. And if you pull out the figures, you find that no government uh, in Australian history uh, has, uh, has uh, uh, um, her policies have uh, effectively created uh, and allowed uh, such an extensive volume of wood chip exports. And uh, most Australians, of course, would far rather uh, see uh, more of these wood chip exports uh, processed uh, on, on their own shores and value added here in Australia. And uh, it was uh, intriguing that some 13 years down the track, 13 years that this government uh, has uh, held the levers in office, uh, you would have thought after 13 years we would have had a clear uh, forest policy, a, a policy which gave Australians the confidence that there was a world class uh, reserve system being protected and gave uh, the forest industry the confidence that uh, they had a uh, sustainable timber uh, uh, resource available to them to ensure security oh, of supplies. God. But we, we, we had neither. So 13 years in government, still grappling around uh, to uh, create a policy which uh, most Australians uh, can have confidence that their high conservation value forests have been protected and the timber industry can have uh, confidence that uh, they, they will have uh, continuing um, s uh, supplies. So, 13 years on, and we, 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 di we didn't get it today from the Prime Minister. Mr Acting Deputy uh, President, uh, I've counted up, uh, and it seems to me uh, that uh, since last December we have had seven statements on the forest industry, seven statements uh, from the Prime Minister and his ministers on the forest industry. And I think all of us were hoping that uh, maybe we were moving to a position where there would be uh, greater certainty, where uh, people uh, would have confidence that uh, at last some progress uh, was being made. And I think that's why Mr Keating's statement today was so disappointing, um, so vacuous, uh, so full of, of uh, general comments. Uh, but uh, when we get down to uh, looking at the specifics, uh, even there, there is some doubt. Mr. Keating, uh, in his uh, in his statement, said that the uh, volume of wood chips uh, would be cut this year. Well, uh, I checked with the, with uh, the um, forest industry, and uh, their advice that the uh, volume of wood chips uh, specified by Mr. Keating in his statement uh, for next year of licences to be issued is the same as the volume of wood chips which are being exported this year. So why not stand behind what you're doing? Why pretend? Why pretend to the public that you're doing something uh, when, in fact, uh, the, a most cursory look at the figures and a checking with uh, um, sort of appropriate authorities shows that you are not doing it? And uh, I don't know who happens to advise Mr Keating on these matters, but uh, 
I have to tell you that I think there will be considerable concern in the Australian community about the, the pretence that uh, Mr Keating has put over this uh, paper. What we needed above all from Mr Keating was some truth and frankness, and no one doubts in relation to forest policy issues there are some difficult choices uh, which have got to be made, and there are difficult balances uh, which have got to be achieved. No one pretends that it is easy, and, but is it as hard as the Labor government has made over 13 years? Uh, we've had, uh, of course, uh, occasional outbursts of uh, peace in our time. In 1988, uh, we had uh, 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 an MOU signed with the uh, Tas uh, Tasmanian government, which Senator Sherry will remember, which was meant to deliver uh, peace in our forests. Uh, in 1992, Senator Sherry, we had the National Forest Policy Statement signed on to uh, by all states, with the exception of Tas uh, Tasmania, but have since signed on now. Again, that was meant to lead to a settlement in the, in the forest industry. And, and today, of course, we have, we have had a, another uh, statement. We all know, we have, we have known it is a self-evident truth that um, the, the great growth in the forest industry and the potential we have will largely come through uh, farm forestry and plantations. Uh, that's, that is self-evident. And yet the rate of plantation establishment in, in this country is amazingly low compared with, compared with other countries. Now, um, Mr Keating and his advisers uh, would have known this for, for a long period of time. For a long period of time. Uh, so the problem is why, why haven't we had the plantation establishment in this, in this country uh, that we're seeing, for example, Senator Lees, in countries like New, uh, New Zealand. And uh, the fact of the matter is, one of the reasons certainly is, uh, the fact is that no one has any confidence in any long-term policy in, in this country uh, under a Labor uh, government. You see, Labor has brought the problem, uh, has made the problem worse by its own politics. That uh, it's seen over the years that they can use uh, the forests to uh, divide people, so the debate has become hugely politicised. Uh, as I said in, earlier in my remarks, it was always going to be difficult and because uh, choices and balances uh, have to be struck. But once you get out and you politicise it the way your Prime Minister, the way your Prime Minister uh, has uh, done it, no wonder it becomes e even more uh, difficult. So when things get too hot, you then try to pull it all back. But you see, the trouble is, Senator Sherry, uh, your Labor Party and its approach uh, has, uh, as I said, so politicised the issue that, that the problem becomes immensely difficult. So we were hoping today we were hoping today to get a very clear sign. For, we were hoping today to get a very clear sign uh, from Mr. Keating uh, that uh, on the, the general policy approach, uh, which uh, we, we hope would uh, lead to greater certainty uh, in the industry, greater certainty uh, amongst the conservationists uh, and the, then the timber interests. Uh, but I don't think we got that from the, uh, the, the policy statement today, and uh, so the debate. Unfortunately, will uh, will we'll, we'll not perhaps uh, go go in, into a uh, lower level, but will will continue as people uh, continue to look through the prime minister's statement, read between the lines, and try to interpret uh, just what he is trying to uh, say. Mr. Acting Deputy, Deputy, Deputy President, uh, Mr. Howard made an extensive um, reply to Mr. Keating's uh, speech uh, in the House today. And oh, and uh, made a number, and I, I invite uh, Senator Sherry to uh, read it, read it very, 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 very carefully, very carefully. And uh, Senator Sherry, I think that uh, uh, Mr. Howard not only told a, a few truths about the nature of forest policy under your government, but uh, clearly outlined, uh, clearly outlined the, the, the direction, the direction in which, uh, in, in the direction in which. Uh, uh, a Howard government uh, will be taking um, forest policy. Uh, I point out to you that uh, uh, this was to be an important statement today. Uh, it was clearly a very rushed statement. Uh, Mr Keating was clearly worried that he uh, wanted to attempt to end his uh, day in parliament, uh, perhaps the, the last uh, day that this uh, parliament will meet before the election, on a high note. Regrettably, as so often in the past, uh, Mr Keating uh, has once again failed. Senator Lees. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Well, having listened uh, to the Prime Minister's statement today, all I can say is that uh, 
Let's hope the detail is uh, a little bit better than what we seem to have had up front today. Uh, and I begin uh, with uh, one point uh, that uh, Senator Kemp did make, and that was that woodship uh, volumes are not going to be decreased. Uh, indeed, it looks as if it's the uh, same as ever, onwards and onwards. And uh, I also, on another point that Senator Kemp raised about why we are dragging the chain as far as uh, the volumes and the amount of plantings that we should be seeing in this country, I would suggest it's because this government continues to prop up our, our industry in their native uh, forests. And of course, uh, people are not going to invest in plantations, which, uh, despite the fact that they grow far more quickly and are far more efficient, uh, it does mean that they're not as valuable as they should be because of the undercutting of their products by products that come out of our native forests. And so, having listened to the Prime Minister's speech, I can say that none of the Democrats' worries have uh, been uh, relieved in any way. We are still more than a little concerned that it will basically be status quo with a little bit of trimming around the edges. It has not quelled our fears. And uh, while there were a lot of uh, nice media grabs and very uh, short, succinct statements, I don't think really many in the uh, conservation movement are going to be at all pleased with what has been said and what has been seen so far. Yes, the Prime Minister did talk about things like biodiversity, a national reserve system, restructuring of the industry, retention of high-quality wilderness and old-growth forests. But, of course, there was a qualifier, and this time the qualifier is as the Prime Minister said, where practicable. So until we actually see the maps, until we actually see what precisely the government is talking about, it is very difficult for us here to comment as to whether or not any of those statements he make, made about any of the issues he raised, whether or not we really do have any solutions in the long term to those difficult problems. Surely, uh, here in Australia, first world country, a very wealthy country, where most people are at least reasonably well off, we can protect our forests. Surely it is completely practicable, morally indeed, what we should be doing, morally correct. And as far as workers' jobs are concerned, the real long term jobs are in my home state, in places uh, like Mount Gambia, where the forestry industry there is well and truly established. It's been proven that most of the saw logs in this country are indeed already coming from plantation wood and that countries overseas are better at utilising our own trees, our eucalypts in plantations, than we have been from seed exported from here. It has been proven over and over that the native forest sector is declining, that its debt is increasing, and the economics of plantations mean their use will inevitably eclipse native forests. Even with all the subsidies that we have for native forests, the industry there has a limited life. And the real question is, are we going to extend that life beyond the state at which any of our old growth and uh, particularly in, uh, and here I talk of, of an area that I know very well in East Gippsland, the significant amount of rainforest that is left is largely outside any existing reserve system. Are we going to continue chipping and cutting our native forests to the point where there is simply none of that remaining? Now we agree with a number of the statements that the Prime Minister made relating to how imper imperative it is, how important it is that we have good uh, pulp and paper industry strategies here, and indeed uh, that's why we have now given the Prime Minister, I think, two copies personally of the Democrats' wood products industry policy. But still, we see no move on, uh, on, the, on the part of the government to seriously support the plantation industry. It also is looking at, a different, uh, at, at uh, value adding. And indeed, it does far, far more value adding than the native forest industry does now. The Democrats are not convinced of the need to continue to export wood chips. It makes no economic sense, it certainly makes no ecological sense. When we can see what's happening with our plantation timbers, and that is that they are already value adding and value adding significantly. At present, the financial state, as I said, of the industry isn't healthy. Consulting economist Francis Gray has identified 23 types of effective subsidy going to the native, plantation industry, native forest industry. And this includes low royalties, state government subsidies, possible tax exemptions and loopholes, road building, various infrastructure supports, port facilities, forestry commission support, non-payment of monitoring fees, etc. There are accusations of rorts and inefficiencies 
penalties are very rare, and I can speak from personal experience and from what I've seen in both East Gippsland and the Wombat Forest recently. Penalties are virtually non-existent, despite blatant breaches of licence requirements. A recent report released by Dr Andrew Drugan, Senior Lecturer in Law, Economics and Public Policy at La Trobe Uni, found that the Victorian government directly spent $90 million on logging of the native forests for a return of $40 million. In other words, the Victorian taxpayer subsidised the industry to the tune of $50 million a year. Dr Drugan goes on to say that a reasonable estimate of the annual subsidy, when all costs are taken into account, could well be in the order of $385 million. So really it's, as he said, a form of a social welfare payment. The combined debts of the forestry commissions across Australia are now over $5 billion. Now, some of those debts indeed are most welcome because they're actually helping to establish plantations. But I, I, here I point out to the successes in my home state. It's only South Australia that has very little debt. And I would argue that that is because we source 90 per cent of our saw logs from softwood plantations. According to John, John Drivel from the ANU, statistics from ABS and the Census of Population and Housing, jobs in the wood and wood products industry have declined by 20,000 over the last 20 years. At the same time, there has been a substantial increase in wood production, showing that forestry protection has not resulted in declining production or employment. While some sections of the industry claim up to 80,000 people are employed, according to the 9192 ABS manufacturing and establishment data, uh, the latest figures are available. Employment in logging and sawmill and pulp and paper manufacturing sections is approximately 35,000. Of this, 613 only were employed in wood chip plants. The National Forest Policy Statement was supported by a wide cross section of the forest industry. It was also signed by the state governments across Australia, with the exception initially of Tasmania, but they have since agreed, and contains a recognition of conservation values. It contains this quote, until the assessment, assessments are completed, forest management agencies will avoid activities that might significantly affect those areas of old growth forest or wilderness that are likely to have high conservation value. Now, Senator Faulkner last year recommended that 1,300 coops uh, from those areas were likely to have old growth or wilderness value and should be investigated. The Minister for Resources sent aside only 85 of these areas, and it was only after significant public outcry that that was eventually increased uh, by 509, which comprises approximately 5 per cent of the 1995 concession area. The National Forest Policy Statement also demonstrated the intention to put in place a comprehensive, adequate and representative reserve system by 1995. It appears there have not been any res areas reserved under this scheme so far. And indeed, it won't be until we see some of the details tomorrow that we are, able, are really able to comment on, on that area at all. Now, surely it makes good economic sense to keep our na native forests intact. Not only do they provide habitat, including for endangered species, they hold the soil together, provide organic matter and are used for ecotourism. And indeed, they are crucial to the water catchment. And here again, I move to Far East Gippsland and I say that I hope when we do see the maps tomorrow and to see the detail that included on that will be the Betka River catchment area, which is the only uh, water supply for the township of Malakuta. If that isn't included, then there is severe risk not only to the long-term population of Malakuta, but for the tourism industry there. There have been a number of Christmas seasons already where water has run dangerously, dangerously low. And if we have the catchment area logged, as it, it has already been uh, started to be logged, then we can see up to a 50 per cent reduction on scientific evidence that scientific tests have already been done to show that a considerable reduction in water volume is likely, as well as some major question marks over water quality. A hectare of old growth mountain ash clear felled may produce $270 of wood chips once, once off. A generation later, it may produce half as much because the regrowth, if anyone has uh, had a look at what happens to these forests after they're logged, is very, very sparse. According to Reed Sturgis and Associates, consulting economists commissioned by the Victorian government, if that same hectare is left unlogged, it produces more than $6,000 worth of water year after year after year. In the few moments left to me, I'll just briefly again touch 
on the softwood market and, and, the, and the plantation industry. The market for softwoods is steadily increasing, while the use of wood sourced from native forests has been declining. The time has expired. Senator Shamarek. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President, and I'm very grateful to the government for allowing the time that it has taken and given up its minutes to us um, to, to respond to the Prime Minister's statement. Now, I actually felt that his statement was full of fine words. I didn't quite agree with Senator Kemp that it was vacuous, but uh, on looking further at it, of course, I realised that, in a sense, his uh, assessment was closer to the truth than mine, because essentially the government has once again gazumped the coalition over a major policy initiative. The ALP has implemented an industry-focused forest plan. The forest protection has just lost out. And, just, and so in that sense, it is rhetoric and it is vacuous. It was very fine and moving, and I can imagine that maybe the Minister for the Environment's office contributed to the first half of the speech and, and uh, the Minister for Resources to the second half. And uh, I'm afraid if you actually look at the outcome, uh, the, the forest industry clearly has before it a plan that is going to entrench wood chipping and to actually be the uh, phasing out of our old growth and high conservation value forests rather than what all of the community of Australia had hoped, which was that there would be a genuine phase out of wood chipping from our native forests and particularly from our native forests of high conservation value. Um, so once again, uh, just like the other rational economic agenda items of enterprise bargaining, privatisation, superannuation and in international trade liberalisation, the ALP has stolen the Conservative agenda out from underneath the coalition. In fact, we're indebted to Mr Howard to, in pointing out that the Prime Minister's uh, crocodile tears over the reduction of the wood chip exports was actually not a, a substantial reduction at all. So we are indebted to the coalition for at least seeing that the government is uh, not following up with its following its rhetoric with the actions that would ensure the protection of our precious uh, forest heritage. This is uh, a disastrous result for both forest protection and the long-term interests of the industry and workers. And many will say that this is just the ongoing rhetoric of the Greens and the environment movement, but we keep saying it because the forests keep getting trashed. Nothing ever changes, just the rhetoric. And uh, I, I don't agree entirely with Senator McLeese when she says this is the status quo. I think that uh, in one sense it entrenches the status quo, which is that our forests are being wood chipped at enormous rates and are slowly disappearing. They will never be the same again. Regrowth is not the same as an old growth or a high conservation value forests. It, it becomes a monoculture. The diversity is lost. 15 per cent reserve system based on the comprehensive, adequate, representative basis will not save the precious values that the community is asking the government to protect and to show the necessary political will. What it does reveal is that the national forest policy, which it implements uh, one step further, has always been and still is an unsatisfactory strategy. It always has been, and now we can see it, about entrenching wood chipping, and it doesn't protect those precious values that the community sees being uh, shipped out on enormous uh, trucks. We see these great big logs going to the sawmill in the southwest of Western Australia, and we see the piles of wood chip at the Bunbury port. We see it in other parts of Australia, and people are horrified. It is a sacrilege to be doing it. There is no talk in the Prime Minister's statement of actually stopping wood chipping. All the talk is about in trenching wood chipping and just removing it from export to downstream processing within the country. That still ensures the utter disappearance of our high conservation value forests. We see basically that there are no restrictions on plantation-based wood chipping, and this just sets up the plantation industry to experience in 10 years' time exactly the same problems the native forest timber industry has now. There's very minimal reductions, as I've said, in the wood chip quotas for next year, while opening it up 
uh, to open slather wood chipping after the regional forest agreements are in place. And I think that's the other thing that we should note today. Mr Keating has done a Pontius Pilate. He has actually washed his hands once and for all of the federal responsibility to intervene and protect the, the precious values of our native forests. What he has done is abrogate that responsibility to the states. Not only that, he did a very mean thing in, ten, in the sense that he blamed the conservation movement for not being able to bring the states around to see the need for protection from logging. He first blamed the conservation movement for not being able to negotiate with the states, and then he said that the federal government wasn't prepared to use its powers to overrule the wrong things that the states were doing, that the environment movement should have been able to stop the states doing. And what's more, he, he now is entrenching a process called the regional uh, forest areas um, Pro agreements, regional forest agreements, whereby the states actually get the authority from now on to do even the wood chip licensing. Now that is a tragedy of mammoth proportions, and it's one that's just slowly dawning on those who are listening closer to the beyond the rhetoric of the Prime Minister's statement. The Greens are dismayed, but not surprised, that this is a bad decision, because it's been the child of a bad process. There has been a forest auction going on, and once again, it's the forests and our future that have missed out. Basically, the forests um, which uh, should be our future are really the now of the wood products industry. They've become that, of the wood chipping industry. And the government has shown today, beyond any doubt, that the National Forest Agreement is about entrenching export wood chipping in Australia meaning just transfer it to plantations and not about the protection of our magnificent forests. The way the government should have acted uh, was reflected in the bill that I put uh, as a private senator's bill earlier this week. Our bill was a benchmark and a starting point. It's a way of assessing what the Commonwealth is prepared to do in terms of its genuine commitment for the forests. It should include the clear powers of the Commonwealth. Instead of letting them go, they should be used. Um, the uh, three components of, of our bill have all been uh, uh, moved away from by the government. The first was a phase out of actual uh, wood chip exports uh, that would cease by the year 1998. Um, in fact, our, our um, quotas were four million tonnes uh, limit on the export licences uh, in 96, 2 million in 97 to the 1st of January 1998, nil export of wood chips and a protection from, in, from right now on the uh, wood chipping of forests that had old growth uh, values, wilderness values, world heritage and national estate or interim register of national estate areas, rainforest or areas containing endangered species as specified under state and federal laws. So the, the government has not uh, com committed itself to a substantial reduction of export wood chipping. It has simply said that it will allow the states to be able to keep doing it at the same level that it's happening now. It has not um, protected properly the, the qualities of the areas that have been asked for protection by the community. And its industry strategy is simply an industry strategy. It's not a transition strategy to assist those workers who will be genuinely hurt if there is an actual act of political will to save high conservation value forests. There is no doubt there is a need for a transition strategy. There's no doubt there are people that will require that assistance. But they actually won't require it on the basis of the statement the Prime Minister has put out now. And I think that is why the Minister for Environment has rejected the term transition when we, we talk about a transition strategy. The way the government could have acted, as I said, was set out in our bill. It has failed to do that. And what it's doing won't solve the problems, and its smooth rhetoric will do little to reassure the community at large, who have clearly shown where they stand. They do not want our precious old-growth forests turned into wood chips. The government stands condemned. They cannot be surprised when the consequences of their actions come home to roost.
The Keating government has told us it has been working well, at finding a in. solution for forests for the last 12 months and has spent thousands of dollars in the process. Yes. Indeed, a solution is at hand, but this government needs to take firm hold of the Native Forest Protection Bill as a model and Dr Judy Clark's plantation study in the other. Only then will it find a foothold on the first step out of the current bureaucratic morass to genuinely protect our last order, remaining order, old Senator, growth your forest time has once expired. and for all. The question is that the time has expired for the debate. The question is that the motion moved by Senator Sherry be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against no. I think the ayes have it. For speaking on other documents has expired. Senator Reid. Acting Deputy President, as to when the report listed on the red for tabling today, the Public Works Committee report, will in fact be um, brought before the Senate. The reports could be tabled now. Uh, yes, well, we might. Well, I could call a quorum and we could. Senator Jones. Hi. Mr. Senator Acting Jones. Deputy, Mr. Acting Deputy President, on behalf of Senator Reynolds, I present the report on the Select Committee on Community Standards to the Supply of Services Utilising Electronic Technology. I present the report of the committee entitled Regulation of Computer Online Services Part 2, together with submissions and Hansard Record of Proceedings, and, and move the report be printed. Question is that that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against no. I think the ayes have it. Deputy President, I seek leave to move a motion in relation to the report. Leave granted. Leave is granted. Senator Jones. Acting uh, Deputy President, I move the Senate take note of the report. Question. Uh, I, the suggestion is that you might seek leave to ha incorporate the statement and seek uh, leave to continue your remarks, I believe. Great idea, yes. Thank you, uh, Mr. Question is that that motion be agreed to. Is leave granted, sorry. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Senator Jones. Uh, thank you, Mr. Acting Deputy President. I seek leave to incorpor uh, incorporate the uh, tabling uh, notes in Hansa. And the leave is granted? Leave is granted. Senator Calvert. Thank you, Mr. Acting Deputy President. On behalf of the Joint Committee on Public Works, I present Report No. 29 of 1995 relating to the York Park North Office Construction Barton ACT, Redevelopment of Hinkler Site Barton ACT and Redevelopment of Woolshed Site Barton ACT. Mr Acting Deputy President, I seek uh, leave to move a motion relating to the reports. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Mr Acting Deputy President, I move that the Senate take note of the reports. The t time has expired for well, the discussion, so Mr. you will have to seek I did leave. Ask for when before we had the uh, debate on the forestry. Was now you tough? seek leave. I seek leave. Yeah, Is leave granted? Ten minutes, the normal time under this provision. Well, well, Minister, when I asked before about when I spoke to the whip about the half an hour that was going to be taken for the forestry statement, I said, would that affect the? Table time the, for reports. And so technically, the time had expired. So the question is. Uh, oh, right, okay. Well, I'll seek leave uh, to, to make. Do it as quick as you can, Paul. Well, this is rather a, rather a <coughs> um, touchy subject. We'll do it the report which I've just tabled concerns the proposed construction by, by Australian Estate Management of three office blocks in the Canberra suburb of Barton at a cost of $118.109 million. Now, the majority of the committee has recommended that the re redevelopment of the Hinkler building site to provide a new headquarters for the Australian Federal Police should proceed at a cost of $39.158 million. The uh, committee, a majority of the committee, also recommended that alternative options for the location of the Department of Industrial Relations, including Civic, be examined. The details of this examination should be provided to the committee for further consideration. In relation to the proposed development of the York Park uh, North, has recommended uh, 
that an office complex for the Department of the Environment, Sport and Territories be developed at either the Tuggeranong or Gungarland town centres. Details of the preferred site and proposed design should be provided to the committee for further consideration. Mr Acting Deputy President, I've got to say that this, the for the committee this was one of the most difficult inquiries of the year, and we've had 25 this year, hmm. uh, made even more difficult by the amount of interest uh, that was generated in the ACT by various groups and people, and, and of course it wasn't at, uh, what made it all, also more di difficult was the amount of lobbying that all members of the committee were subjected to. The original proposal was for three blocks to be located within the Barton area of ACT, just over the back here. Uh, the committee has rejected two of these proposals for a number of reasons. Well, hang on. <laughs> over by DFAT, wherever that is, um, from this, this area. Um, one strong argument put the committee that was that by moving a large number of public servants from civic, this would result in civic being devastated. <laughs> now, the, major the, the majority of the committee doesn't accept that this view, especially considering that 10 years ago the same, there was the same fear at civic uh, that it would be overpopulated. And the government decided that once public servants moved out, their place would not be taken by other public servants. Now, uh, this is now regarded as a conventional wisdom in Canberra, but in, in response to a question from the uh, Committee to the National Capital Planning Authority, we were advised by them that backfilling of vacated offices is permitted. The committee emphasises that there is no ban on public servants backfilling vacated offices. However, the committee is concerned at the rather combined impact of these three projects on civic, while not sharing the rather alarmist views expressed by some witnesses. The Department of Industrial Relations proposal on what is known as the Woolshed site has been rejected by the committee. The committee believes that better use could be made of this land and the proposed car park structure would be inappropriate and not in keeping with the national significance of the Barton area. The committee is of the view that the proposal should not proceed on the Woolshed site and that the Australian, that Australian Estate of Man Management should seek another site, preferably in Civic, to house the Department of Industrial Relations. A civic location would partially meet the objections to the loss of personnel from civic, outlawed by many groups, including the ACT government. The committee expects to be fully briefed on the new proposal for the Department of Industrial Relations. The committee considers that the AFP, Australian Federal Police, has put up the most persuasive case for a Barton location. The committee therefore believes, or a majority of the committee believes, that the AFP proposal should proceed as planned on the Hinkler site. However, in coming to this conclusion, uh, the committee regards it as regrettable that it will be necessary, and this was something that disturbed me, uh, to demolish the George Knowles building, which, Mr Acting Deputy President, was only refurbished three years ago at a cost of $2 million. And that's one of the reasons why we have a minority report. The third proposal concerns a new office building for the Department of Environment, Sport and Territories. The committee does not see the need for this building to be in Barton and recommends that this building be placed in either Tuggeranong or Gongarland, with an emphasis on Tuggeranong. Uh, well, Hobart would be OK. I mean, I'm sure I can't see any reason. They get a bit of swimming practice in every night they went home. Uh, the committee is conscious of the need for dispersed work opportunities in Canberra and is also concerned at parking limitations and traffic pressures in Barton. Uh, the committee was surprised at the evident lack of coordination between the National Capital Planning Authority and the ACT Planning Authority, which was displayed in these projects. And that is the reason that uh, in the uh, re final report, a dissenting report was a brief dissenting report by myself, Neil Andrew MP, Ray Braithwaite MP and Bob Halverson, OBE MP, uh, which reads, these proposals should be deferred for the following reasons. Because of the undue haste that these proposals were presented by the, uh, to the committee by Australian Estate Management because of the absence of any long-term planning for the future use of the parliamentary triangle in Barton, in view of the pending elections which may alter priorities of the government of the 38th parliament, and in view of the fact that two of these proposals will require referral back to the Public Works Committee of the 38th parliament. We were placed under a, a considerable amount of pressure, and I don't remember three important buildings coming to us as a committee in one project before. If they'd have come as individual projects and we'd had amount, an amount of time, I think uh, perhaps we may have come to a better consideration. 
One of the major concerns I have, and I think a lot of others have, is what effect three large buildings like this and the, and the, and the number of people that are going to be in them will have on the traffic flows in, in the Barton area, given the fact that in recent times we built that, the, the new DFAT building. I don't know how many people it houses, but it cost over $180 million, so it must house quite a few people. We've had the Motor Traders building. I mean, it must be evident to all of us that travel here to, to, the, uh, to the house on the hill that there's a fair amount of development going on in that Barton area. We had evidence from the ACT government themselves that they, that they are concerned and they can't, don't know whether they can provide infrastructure there. We had, we had a lot of evidence that uh, we've got two planning authorities here in Canberra, which I can never see the sense in, but we, we just don't seem to have a plan for this, for this whole precinct. And in fact, one of the recommendations made in the, uh, in the report here is, is that, uh, that uh, they get back and, and try and organise a decent plan for Canberra so that, so that when these things come up in the future, we, we, we will know whether in fact these uh, uh, movement of, of some 1,400 public servants from one area of Canberra, from Civic into another area that, uh, such as Barton, and what effect that would have on the area. So that was not a, a major concern. I know my colleague Senator Reid would like to say a few words about this matter from, from, her, from her point of view, so I, um, I will, won't continue any longer. But as I said, we, we are concerned about this. I don't know what the undue haste is. We were quite happy to look at it again next year. Um, but nevertheless, the, uh, our, committee, our committee staff worked through the night to present this report so, so it could be done and presented to the parliament today. And uh, as I said earlier, I don't know what the, why, why the haste, but nevertheless, that's where we're at. And I've presented uh, this report to the, to the Senate and I commend it to the Senate. Senator Reid. Um, I seek leave to speak on the same matter. Leave granted, being no objection. Um, Mr Acting Deputy President, I'm responding to the report that's been tabled this afternoon by the Parliamentary Standing Committee on Public Works relating to the proposed York Park North office construction in Barton, the redevelopment of Hinkler site in Barton and the redevelopment of the Woolshed site in Barton. And as Senator Calvert has indicated, it was a report that was supported by a majority of the committee, but there is also a minority report to which he has referred and which I urge the Senate to adopt. And I will be moving an amendment to the motion moved by uh, Senator Calvert in the following terms, adding at the end of his motion that the Senate take note of the report, but the Senate rejects the committee's recommendation that the proposed redevelopment of the Hinkler building site Barton should proceed and rejects any proposal for construction of public works at Barton for eventual use by hundreds of public servants, transferring from existing offices in Civic until the joint federal ACT Metropolitan Canberra Growth Strategy Review has completed its inquiry, and I move that amendment. Senator Calvert mentioned just now, and it wasn't the point I was going to start with, that they had no information before them as to the impact on traffic movements in the area of bringing in these enormous numbers of public servants, in addition to those coming into York Park, uh, which we all know is nearly completed and will be occupied quite soon. But looking through the report and making comments on, on it, it is an absolute mystery to me as to how this report could be before the parliament this afternoon when it quite clearly has been done in an enormous rush. I attended for part of both days of the hearing. Um, one of the members of the committee commented that there were more people there um, than he had ever seen at a public works committee, and Senator Calvert endorses that. There were many submissions. And the things that have been raised before the committee just haven't been answered by them. The question is, Mr Acting Deputy President, who is it that is pushing this project? I mean, presumably it's, it's one of the, or other of the ministers in the House of Representatives. Um, Mr Walker is the relevant minister for estate management. Mr Kerr is um, the police minister. I don't know whether they've been lobbying the committee. But from every indication over the last couple of weeks that there was an expectation that there was more work to be done on this and more consideration given to it, and whiz bang, here it is this afternoon wanting to go ahead immediately. Whether it's a pea and thimble trick, three buildings and we'll see which one will approve, it's a bit hard to say. 
But looking at the report in more detail, the, um, it says in paragraph 20 that the lease of the headquarters building um, is due to expire in August 1998. My understanding was that it was due to expire in 97, but a year extension has been granted. But that is not the end of the lease. There are two further periods of five years, and that is 10 years, which could be added to it. Um, and it is only five years, of course, since it was fitted out. And the significance of this building, presently occupied by the AFP, is that it is in North Avenue, a prime site in Civic, which once vacated, will very likely stay empty for a considerable period of time. Now, that may be a matter of concern for the landlords, but the important thing is, is the impact on Civic of having that building next to a small garden, a central part of Civic and an important part of Northbourne Avenue, having that building vacated when there is no need for it to be vacated, when there has been no consideration of the total impact on Civic, in addition to the space which is already empty and the places, uh, other movements out of Civic which are to take place. The committee refers on page 9 to the issues that came before it, the need for the works, the cost of the works, wider planning issues, the impact on infrastructure at Barton, the impact on Civic and, and others, but I do not believe that the committee has adequately considered all of these issues. It says that some ACT federal members of parliament express concern. Let me say three out of four of the ACT federal members of parliament express concern about these proposals. The committee, it says, recognises the concerns expressed during the inquiry regarding planning policies in the ACT, but then they seem to ignore it by going ahead as they have in this piecemeal fashion. The committee notes that the Commonwealth and the ACT governments have announced a joint review of urban planning. Well, let's at least wait till that report, which Mr Howe has instigated in conjunction with the Chief Minister for the ACT, until we go rushing ahead with these things. They have announced that this committee is to review planning, and I believe we ought to have the benefit of that information before us. The committee says, paragraph 40, However, this is an issue which for the longer term should be considered by the joint review referred to above. They refer to the fact that these three projects take 4 per cent of the workforce out of Civic. And it also says, it became clear to the committee that there is a general misconception that there is a ban on replacing Commonwealth staff moving from Civic. The committee was assured by the NCPA that no such ban exists. They might well assure the committee of that, but it is not the popular perception which has been in existence over the last five years, or four, since 1991 at least, uh, and I think that needs to be laid to rest and needs to be dealt with. It is the perception. It says the committee is concerned at the combined impact of these three projects on Civic while not sharing the alarmist views expressed by some witnesses. Why rush ahead with it on that basis? The committee also, and I still quote, shares the concern expressed by the Master Builders Association that the delivery method proposed by AEM will disadvantage the ACT construction industry. Or it, the Woolshed proposal, which isn't going ahead, of course, should have gone to the National Capital Committee before it ever went to the Public Works Committee, but that didn't happen either. Uh, the, the dissenting report, which Senator Calvert presented to the Senate, refers to these reasons because of the undue haste that the proposals were presented to the committee by AEM and other matters that ought to be taken note of by the parliament in saying enough is enough, this does not go ahead at the present time. The key office users of space in Civic, the Commonwealth Government, 310,000 square metres, the ACT government, 50,000 square metres, the private sector, 90,000 square metres, a total of 450,000 square metres. As the result of these proposals, OSAID moving out and defence would be 55,900 square metres of office space being vacated in addition to that which is already vacant in Civic. And there is another large building already being constructed 
um, in Civic at the present time, for which there are no tenants. It will be, as I have said before, a wasteland, and this parliament is colluding in that happening. Civic is an important corner of the parliamentary triangle, and it needs to be a significant part of the ACT. It needs to be in good order, and it needs to be well housed with public servants. The impact, if it's not, is the degradation of the area, the in dramatic impact on civic retailers and service providers, car parks sitting there that won't be used, the underutilisation of it, plus the cost to be put, of putting car parking and other infrastructure into Barton. Now, some will say these are magic jobs in the construction industry. Certainly there is a construction industry, and this is important. But if you looked at the evidence given to this committee, you would see that the construction industry itself wasn't even saying, jobs, 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 these must go ahead, no matter the cost to the rest of the community. Everybody recognises that. Already t tenants in Civic have lowered rents to keep tenants there, and there's a risk of institutional investment not only in Civic in the ACT um, being affected by this rash action. All I suggest is that the Parliament defers going ahead with the projects that, that's been recommended and, um, and the others as well until such time as the committee which Mr Howe has set up in conjunction with the ACT government has reported. Mr Howe recognises that there is a significant impact on civic, on the action that his colleague ministers are seeking to take at the present time, and he is seeking to do something about civic and the general planning of Canberra, Gungahlin, Tuggeranong, Belconnen and even, I'd mention, Woden as a consequence of what has occurred. And I would say to the Senate, I ask for your support for my amendment to the motion and that this project should be put on hold. Minister. Well, thank you, Mr. Deputy President. I'm not sure by which process we had uh, uh, this matter brought on at this time, and uh, and I had uh, uh, no prior notice um, of it. And it's only order. I leave. Thank you for that. I'll work that out. Um, Le leave granted. Um, the, but it uh, is only by coincidence I happen to be in here, uh, and this matter comes up about which I, of course, have a particular interest, and. Uh, there's a cause of some concern to me, but it's a bit late to be worrying about that. We find ourselves with this amendment, uh, of which, as far as I know, I wasn't aware the government had any notice, coming on, and it has significant implications that not very many people have had a chance to consider. Now, I understand we're getting towards the end of the session, and, and, the, and the committees uh, uh, and people in the uh, Senate are considering supporting it, and I understand that they have to make decisions quickly because that's the circumstance in which we find, with which we find ourselves confronted. But I'm not sure that all the implications have been conveyed. Some implications haven't been conveyed at all, and some haven't been conveyed accurately. It is complex matter, and there are competing priorities. There is a concern that there may be overdevelopment in Barton and that uh, the infrastructure facilities in Barton aren't adequate to cope with the addition of three extra buildings. But that's not the recommendation we had. That's what went to the Public Works Committee. It's not the recommendation we have before us. What we have before us is one building and it's essentially a redevelopment. So we're not talking about a massive injection of a new number of public servants in Barton, although some. Although some. Well, well, I, if you just uh, want to read the words, it says redevelopment. That's what the recommendation says, and I'm referring to the recommendation. You might like to quibble about the English, but I'm simply saying, and you know, that the Hinkler building has had people in it before, so it's not entirely new, but there will be an increased number. I accept that, and I'm not arguing that. I'm simply saying that it is much less than what was proposed in the original, what went to the committee, which was three buildings. Hmm? And we have different proposed, different recommendations with regard to uh, the Department of Industrial Relations and the Department of Environment uh, pro pro proposals. And I'm not, uh, I'm comfortable with the committee's recommendations with regard to both those options. 
I'm not sure whether, had I been on the committee, it's exactly what I would have suggested, but I can see why they've done it and I'm not uh, uncomfortable about it. In fact, I can see some very positive elements about uh, both elements of the recommendation. That is, it's an attempt to balance the competing interests, and the amendment makes no attempt to balance the competing interests. The competing interests are the concern about Civic, the concern about Barton, the concern about the decentralised development of Canberra, and the concern about jobs in the construction industry. That's the essence of the four elements. The, department, the, the committee has tried to balance those. It has got some continuation in the construction sector because of its recommendation about the Hinkler building redevelopment. It's got some concern about uh, the continuing uh, strength of civic by its recommendation about the, the DIR proposal and it's got some recognition of the need for the continuing balanced development of uh, uh, Canberra, the, the uh, dispersed development because of its recommendation with regard to the Department of Environment, Sport and Territories. All the amendment does is say let's stop. It's the easiest thing to do to say let's not do anything and pretend that there's no consequences of failing to do anything. Well, and, that's right. Wait, which means don't do anything for a while. And what we have got, what we have got, it's as if waiting has no consequences. Now, what we've been working very hard to do in Canberra is to get, instead of the surges of construction, to get a steady rolling program of construction. A steady construction. We've got Russell, we've got the redevelopment of the administrative building coming up next. And this, and these are very important, and there is no doubt, in terms of the interests of the workers in the building industry, whose representatives I've discussed this with, that they regard this as a very important part of the continuing, pro continuing generation of jobs for building workers in this town and for those who supply to it, and for all the ancillary economic activities that flow from construction. And we have in the Public Works Committee recommendation already a deferral of two of the three proposals. Now, in an employment term, that's not ideal, but we do have to balance all the competing elements. The amendment makes no attempt to do that. It just, it, it's, a, it's an eloquent testimony to the influence of the building owners on the Liberal Party, but it has nothing to do about all the other significant issues that we need to confront. As I say, I'm not sure that what the committee recommends is what I would have done if I was on the committee, but it is a balanced proposal. It seeks to adopt, seeks to deal with the differing imperatives that it has on it, and it is the only balanced proposal before us, and it should be endorsed. And the Senate, of course, it's a committee, it's a recommendation to the Senate. The Senate has the power to amend it in any way that it chooses. But if we reject this, it's not just an expression of view by the Senate. It has consequences and there are going to be people who would otherwise have jobs who won't have them because of a decision made in haste here. And I just tell you that I think that's something we shouldn't do. It's something the consequences of which will resonate beyond this Senate if we do do it, because I'll make sure of it. And it is not the appropriate decision. I know because they've been to see me. There are building owners in Civic concerned about this. I understand their concern, but that is not the only interest we need to consider. It's an interest, not the only one. And I'm just saying to the Senate, do not likely accept this recommendation. Don't do it ignorant of its consequences. The balance Don't do it without taking into account the valid recommendations of the committee with regard to Civic with regard to decentralisation into Tuggeranong or elsewhere, and with regard to maintaining some momentum of development for the Hinkler building. And for that reason, I oppose uh, this uh, precipitate and ill-considered amendment. Senator Campbell, uh, by leave, no objection. Right. Is it? Yeah. I wanted to, I think we're now debating your amendment, uh, the Senator Reid's amendment. Can I say that I have had enormous concern about the property development by the Commonwealth in Canberra for a number of years? I might say that that concern goes back to the, back to the time when on the Senate Standing Committee on Finance and Public Administration we um, 
uh, investigated an, or had an inquiry into the Department of Finance and Trade, a, a, a reference to that committee uh, successfully moved by Senator Robert Hill. At that stage, we looked into, uh, as part of our inquiry, we had a meeting with the late Peter Walensky and people from the Department of Finance, and were shown the York uh, Park proposal, I think it was, uh, which has become uh, colloquially known as Gareth's Gazebo, which uh, I think three, nearly three years since they commenced construction. Gary's Gazebo. Gary's Gazebo, is it? Um, three years since we commenced, uh, they commenced construction is still not occupied. And on my advice, it won't actually uh, be occupied for about another six, six uh, months. I pointed out when that was but a, a set of plans and drawings at that meeting with, uh, with Mr Walensky, um, using my uh, fading knowledge of property matters since I'd been in that industry before I came into this place, that on the information they provided me, that building would not house the staff that it was required to house that because the York Park project was a maximum development of the site, uh, in other words, the building took up the maximum allowable area on the site, uh, that it would, not be, it would not create any room for future expansion of that uh, DFAT building, now known as uh, Gareth's Gazebo, um, and that, quite frankly, it was a poor proposal. And I understand from uh, Senator Calvert, who is on the, uh, on the uh, Public Works Committee, that that was the recommendation, if not a, I'm a bit hazy on this, I think a minority report was put in on the York Park project, Senator Calvert nods. Um, but of course, in the dying days of the last Keating government, just before the 1993 federal election, I think in late 1992, the cabinet got together and pushed it through and uh, proceeded with the building of a building which we know, and we won't know uh, Senator Reid and Mr Acting Deputy President what a disaster the York Park project is until they actually move, start moving people into it. But from the information I'm getting back from little birdies that sort of come in to <laughs> whisper to me about what's happening there, it is clear that the message I gave to Mr Walensky and the people within DFAT who were pushing the York Park project back in 1992, I think it was, that it would be an unmitigated disaster yet another disaster of this Commonwealth Government when it comes to building uh, buildings. Okay. Now, we looked at the Castleton Place project in some detail, indeed had an Order General's report into the Castleton Place building in Melbourne where this Government pro proceeded to build a a hundred, over $100 million, in fact over $200 million worth of building. Um, and the Auditor General's report that was subsequently done after I raised the, matter, the matters in this chamber time and time again show that this Commonwealth Government had lost over $100 million on that one building in Melbourne. I mean, enormous waste of taxpayers' money uh, in, in this building in Melbourne. As a consequence of that Castleton Place inquiry, Senator Spindler successfully moved a motion that there be an Auditor General's inquiry into the Australian State Management Group, a, a business of DAS. That Auditor General's inquiry, I understand, is, is uh, virtually concluded and is currently, I understand, with AEM for comment and will be tabled in this place early in the new year. Now, I know from my own investigations through estimates committees and also through my experience on the Senate Standing Committee on Finance and Public Administration when we did a, an inquiry entitled Property Management in the Australian Public Service that AEM have a number of disasters on their hand. They uh, have not performed well and the Commonwealth's management of its real estate assets is an international and national disgrace and disaster that is potentially costing the Australian people hundreds of millions of dollars. Hundreds of millions of dollars wasted by this organisation and the Commonwealth and the Cabinet's poor decision making. And quite frankly, the members of the Public Works Committee that try to um, keep a, uh, a bit of a rein on, these, on the, this government's ad hoc decisions to build buildings around the place um, are up against it. They do a very good job, but they're up against it. And I must say that uh, when we get to the stage where this report's table in the Senate, uh, and Senator Reid, who understands the Canberra aspects of these decisions and the social and economic, economic impacts of that because uh, of her position representing the ACT in this place, um, you have to really wonder what is the Cabinet's motivation, what is the Labor government's motivation about building a new building. Can I say to the Minister that you don't create balance in these decisions by putting up a proposal to build three buildings and then say let's have some balance and some compromise and only build one. 
That is not a strategic, sensible way to go about making decisions to invest hundreds of millions of dollars in property. I suggest to you, Minister, that you ref and I refer you to pages 12 and 13 of the Finance and P Public Administration Committee's a references Committee's report on property management in the Australian Public Service, which was tabled in this place in June 1995. And I do not have time to, uh, to read into the hands of the pieces that I do need to read, but I um, suggest to anyone who takes an interest in this decision and to all other senators that you focus on one thing. And I'll just quickly try and find the, uh, the specific thing. But basically, I'll, I'll quote from the uh, submission of the ACT Planning Authority, um, which is actually quoted in the report at uh, section 3.21. And it talks about the data uh, and the information that's available to both the National Capital Planning Authority and the, and the ACT Planning Authority in relation to the uh, office, uh, office accommodation by the Commonwealth in, in Canberra. I quote, until 1989, data were available on employment, floor pace, uh, for floor space, let me correct myself, and government uh, oblique private occupancy from the National Capital Development Commission office inventory. This database is now compiled and updated by the uh, Building Owners and Managers Association, but, in no, but it no longer includes type of occupancy. Uh, the Department of Admin Services provided, uh, produces an annual survey of Commonwealth office holdings by department location, employment numbers and floor space. The last year for which this information was obtained was 1988. Uh, the Department of Finance publishes annual Australian Public Service Employment by Department, but this does not include location or floor space. Uh, 3.22 goes on. The ACTPA also pointed out that it is unclear which Commonwealth authority is responsible for coordinating office accommodation and providing information about Commonwealth office accommodation needs and strategies to NCPA and ACTPA and that it would welcome liaison with the agency responsible for Commonwealth Government office accommodation in the ACT to obtain information about Commonwealth Government office strategies and data about employment and floor space by location in the ACT. I recommend that the, senator, uh, the minister, who is a senator for the ACT up until June 30 next year, up until the federal election, reads those two sections at page 13 of the report. It shows—and I'm sorry I had to read two fairly sort of dry pieces of stuff into the handset. But it shows that the bodies responsible for it's hard to read when you I need a glass of water actually attendance. <laughs> Thank you. Um, it, it, it shows that in this crucial area, we've got, got this, this great national capital. They, they, it's probably worth saying on St Andrew's Day uh, to, to Senator Reid that uh, prior to the national capital being here, it was a very successful sheep station run by the Campbell family, and it was of course resumed. But it's worth saying that in this quite magnificent national capital. Um, we, we don't have uh, available any uh, coordinated approach, strategic approach, to the planning of the Commonwealth's office, office requirements in Canberra. And uh, that is an enormous problem. And I say to the minister, and this is why I'm supporting Senator Reid's mo motion and her amendment to the motion so wholeheartedly, that let's wait firstly to see uh, what, what happens when the Auditor General brings down its report uh, on the AEM that's been ordered by this Senate, I think, I think it is. Um, I might be incorrect there, but they're bringing down a report on the AEM within a matter of weeks. It's not, Minister, a matter of putting off the decision because it's too hard. It's a matter of recognising that there's a lack of a strategic approach, that there are social and economic problems with this uh, proposal, that it's an irreversible mistake if you make it. When you put up a great big building like Gareth's Gazebo or any other major public office building, like Castleton Place in your hometown, Senator Kemp, you have made a mistake that's virtually irreversible. Once you've made the $100 million loss on Castleton Place, you can't get the money back. You can sort of forget about it. You can make it fade into history. And if you build this building in Baden, you've made an irreversible decision. I say let's develop a strategic approach to Commonwealth office requirements uh, first. Secondly, wait for the AEM report to see what it says about Canberra's uh, office requirements and the Commonwealth government's actions in there, and, and then address, address this, uh, the problem of the accommodation for these agencies. Yeah. 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 Senator Burns. Mr Acting President. Uh, seeking leave. No objection. Leave granted. Thank you. I uh, think that the report of the committee clearly indicates that they haven't gone down one path. And it's true that the committee 
doesn't run along a path which suggests that they accept every view the minister might have on developing buildings for accommodation for various government departments. We have over time been fairly clear in our view, uh, views that have been held that have suggested alternatives to that which the minister may have had at any given time. On this particular occasion, we weren't really happy with a couple of the projects and indeed the report suggests that they be given further consideration. But I guess the way in which you might suggest this matter should be proceeded with or handled depends on where you stand. Now it's very clear that uh, those people who own office space in Civic want that office space to be kept full. They're concerned about people moving away and their profits declining or disappearing. Now there's nothing illegal about that or nothing evil about that. This is it's a normal commercial position, but it does indicate if you support that view just where you stand on the matter, as distinctly against that of the government which has a view that we should own our office buildings uh, in which the departments are, are, are situated. Now I believe that, the, as I said earlier, the committee did look at this in a fairly, a fairly in fair bit of detail and has come up with a proposition that we should build a purpose-built building for the police in Barton. I think it's a, a good place to put it because it is in an area where there are a lot of other people to deal with those matters that are legal and uh, the, the placing of the building itself is, is, is I think geographically correct and it will provide the, the federal police with a building that provides them with a very good, uh, very good area of work, that they will be happy in that area, they'll have all the facilities they need and will produce a high standard of work in that area. And I don't believe there's any need to put aside that proposition and to put it off at all, while at the same time the other two projects can be re-looked at. And the committee said, and there was no objection to the proposition, that uh, part of that reconsideration of the other two projects would be to look at the rental prices in Civic, where it was indicated to us that some of the rents that were being asked for uh, that, that accommodation in the renegotiation was on a level with the bond building in Sydney, which I can assure you most people would consider to be much more valuable for, for, a, for a tenant than the building in Civic. I believe that the, again, and I, I finish on this note, that the committee did give full consideration to it. I think their proposition is meritorious and I think it should be carried, in as, carried intact. The question is that the amendment uh, moved by Senator Reid be agreed to? Uh, uh, yes, um, uh, Minister. I'm sorry to do this, Madam Acting Deputy Friend, at this late stage, but some concerns just been raised with me about whether we can amend this recommendation at, in this way at this time. I don't have, and the background that's been given to me so far is not adequate for me to make a judgment. So I'm not, at this stage, challenging it, but I'm wondering if we can have a brief adjournment so I can just check what this concern that's been raised with me is before we carry the amendment. Uh, I'm not looking to put it off for long because I'll, I'm not going to be here for much longer anyway, but uh, I don't want us to do something. I, Se thank Senator. you for your kind concern. Uh, but uh, I, so I just move it to be deferred to a later hour, but I assure Senator Reid it's not intended to be put off for a long time. It's on that matter myself before proceeding. Yeah. As I, I it's probably okay, but I've just been raised with me short notice, so if I can move an extension to a later hour, uh, the matter be adjourned to a later hour of the day, and I assure you, as I say, it's not intended to be a long-term adjournment. It well, no, it'll take me a little more than that because this, I've, I've just got a message, so I have to go and check elsewhere. Sen there's a request for for this matter to be. Uh, the, the Until question. the minister returns, and in the meantime, we we go on to the next item of business. Um, it's been but moved. As long as, as long as it's no later than the dinner break. It's been moved by Senator Calvert that this matter be deferred until no later than uh, 7 p.m. Uh, those of that opinion uh, say aye. Again, say no. That's agreed to. Um, are there any documents to be presented by the clerk? Documents are tabled in accordance with the list circulated to honourable senators. Uh, I 
understand that I'm about to move that intervening business be postponed till after consideration of the order of the day relating to the report of the Select Committee on Aircraft Noise in Sydney. The question is that the motion moved by the Minister be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye, against say no. I think the ayes have it. Clerk. General business orders relating to committee reports. Select Committee on Aircraft Noise in Sydney adjourned debate on the motion by the Chairman of the Committee, Senator Perry, that the Senate take note of the report. Senator Forshaw. Deputy President, I just rise to uh, complete uh, the remarks that I was making uh, this morning prior to uh, uh, the adjournment at 12.45 of this matter. And all I wish to say uh, in conclusion on this uh, report is to particularly thank the staff of the Secretariat for the uh, work that they performed under what were trying circumstances over the last couple of days in, in getting um, such a uh, voluminous report uh, uh, ready in time for presentation today. So I uh, thank the staff very much for their, uh, their efforts. Senator Byrne. Senator Bourne. Thank you, Madam <laughs> Deputy President. Uh, on behalf of the Australian Democrats, I welcome this report and its findings, with the exception, one notable exception, of one area which I'll come to shortly. As the Senate will be aware, the committee was established following the opening of the third runway at Sydney's Kingston Smith Airport, and as a result, in large part, from an outraged community, outraged community totally, whose lives have been destroyed, or they feel that their lives have been destroyed, by altered air operations at KSA. I'd also like to add for the record that it was only as a result of the combined efforts of the Coalition and the Democrats in this chamber that the committee was ever established, and I feel certain now that we were justified in our decision to have these matters referred to this parliamentary inquiry. It was apparent from the outset of the committee's establishment that there was going to be a massive response to this inquiry. The community response in terms of submissions received was nothing short of remarkable, with the committee having received well over 5,000 submissions, an overwhelming number by any standard. One of the most interesting aspects of the inquiry was that for many noise-affected Sydney residents, it was the first opportunity that they had had to tell their side of this story. Having inundated the Federal Airports Corporation's noise complaints line, many Sydney residents were at the end of their tethers when the committee announced this inquiry. They felt that up to now no one had been listening to them or took any notice of what they had to say about how aircraft noise was destroying their lives. For many of them, this committee represented a release valve, an avenue through which they could finally be heard. It's probably a sad reflection on our democracy that people have to resort to parliamentary committee inquiries in order to be heard, but what it certainly does prove is the absolute failure of the environmental impact assessment process to adequately predict the impact which the new runway would have on residents. On the subject of airport privatisation, it's a matter of some considerable regret to me that despite the overwhelming evidence presented to the committee against privatisation, a recommendation has been produced in favour of it. Under the circumstances, I have dissented from this finding. It, I believe that there is practically no international precedent for the private leasing of a nation's airports. Virtually all the major airports in comparable countries to Australia are publicly owned and operated, and no consideration is being given to the private leasing option. The Democrats do not believe that private leasing would be in Australia's economic, social or environmental interests. There's, there is well-founded apprehension in the community that under a private regime, commercial objectives will overrule the public interest. One of the worst features of the EIS process in all this was the appalling way in which people appear to have been deliberately deceived and misled as to what the impact on them would be. This must never be allowed to happen again. The EIS on the third runway at KSA appears to have been nothing short of a sales and marketing job, with the aviation authorities failing totally in their duty to the public to ensure a decent standard of objectivity in assessing noise impacts. Aside from the obvious bias, the EIS seriously failed in the key indicators, such as airport moderating modes and taking into account basic factors such as long-term wind analysis. A number of academics appearing before the committee confirmed the inadequate nature of the EIS and a matter of real concern was the fact that the EIS seems to have deliberately misrepresented and misused the available scientific literature. In light of these failures, the committee has made a series of recommendations in relation to the proposed airport at Badgerys Creek and the absolute necessity of conducting a proper and thorough EIS process in relation to that one. Not surprisingly, quite a number of residents from Western Sydney and local councils have expressed the concern that important environmental considerations were going to be overlooked in the same way as they were in relation to the third runway at KSA. 
It is essential that the government allay these concerns and ensure that the correct processes are adhered to in the development of Badgerys Creek, if indeed that is to be the location of the second Sydney airport. On the whole, I welcome and support the committee's recommendations, particularly those dealing with operational and remedial measures to be considered for implementation at KSA. Inevitably, much of the focus will be on the committee's recommendation that the new airspace management plan be developed for KSA that examines the best way to use all three one runways. It's my own view that the situation in which many residents of Sydney are now living is totally unacceptable in a civilised society. The people living under the concentrated flight path feel cheated and they feel betrayed. I think I'm right when I say that no other senator here lives under, well, no other senator, at least on the committee, lives under one of the flight paths. I do. I live under the east-west flight path, and I believe that the east-west runway should be reopened. In fact, it's my view that we should go back to where we were 18 months ago. It was safe then. We were only about um, six movements an hour under what we are now. We don't expect the new uh, tower to open for I don't know how many months again, uh, and I believe that we should go back to where we were before the third runway was opened, go back to what was safe then, what was working then, what was on 55 movements an hour then, and stop right there, work the airport at what it was working at for many months before then, uh, and find another solution. And that would mean opening the east-west runway again, uh, and that would mean that I would be living under it, yes. But it would mean that those people who are living in hell, which is what they are doing, those people would not be living quite in hell anymore. And that's what I believe that we should be doing. I hope that the community will take the opportunity over the next few weeks to have a look at all this and at all the recommendations contained in the report, as well as all the evidence presented. In relation to the comments by Senator Forshaw, which he, he mentioned uh, some things that he attributed to the coalition. If some coalition members wanted to hear evidence that the east-west runway should be fully utilised, and yes, they did, some government members were equally assiduous in searching for evidence that the government is doing the right thing and the current mode of operation should be maintained. Party political sensitivity was alive and well, and it was alive and well on both sides. Having said that, though, I must also say that under the circumstances I was very impressed with the way members of the committee worked together. Any disagreements we had were polite and they were reasonable, and I thank all members of the committee for that. Senator Perra was an excellent chairman. He was fair, he was reasonable, and he was open to innovation, and we had a lot of innovation. We held uh, hearings in the areas affected. We held hearings uh, in places that I've never been to before, and it was very interesting, and it was something that we should be doing in more committees, I think. It was a pleasure to work with him. In conclusion, I'd also like to record my sincere thanks to the Secretariat of the Committee. They worked very hard throughout this inquiry, and they finally produced a thorough report in extremely tight deadlines. In particular, I'd like to commend James Warmanhoven, who as the Committee Secretary is one of the most able and competent committee officers I've ever had the good fortune to work with over the years. Both James and Trish Carling, who I've also known for a very, very long time, consistently displayed a remarkable level of patience under some very, very trying circumstances. Senator Neal. So I rise also on the uh, report of the Airport Noise Committee. And I have to say that there was agreement on a number of things in the committee. There was agreement that Kingsford Smith Airport is an essential part of the New South Wales infrastructure. That Kingsford Smith Airport is essential to tourism industry, promotes employment in the region. That the operations of the airport as a result of the noise and pollutants have made the quality of life for the residents around the airport less than it should be. The major difference between the government and the opposition is that the government wants a solution and that really the opposition doesn't. The opposition sees the ill effects and the competing interests and the conflicts of different groups of residents as a political opportunity. The committee has a responsibility to find out what went wrong and to identify ways in which the process of planning and implementing major projects such as the new runway can be managed better in the future. This, this means both in the interests of good government and a safe and healthy community. The majority report is marked not by objective assessment and analysis aimed at reaching a solution, but by an attempt to ignite and exaggerate the difficulties and conflicts in the community. The opposition would have us believe that the difficulties arising from the conflicting interests between the airport operations and the surrounding communities only sprang up with the construction of the third runway and the reduced operations of the east-west runway. The truth 
is that the problem has existed since the, since the construction of the airport. By the 70s and 80s, the airport was experiencing also congestion problems. The curfew shoulder periods were introduced to try and resolve this issue in 1988. This was to meet the overwhelming demand on the use of the airport by both in international flights bringing tourists and country domestic movements. About 17 million passengers were passing through Kingston Smith each year and the airport just couldn't cope. In fact, the log jam was getting so bad that delays in flight cancellation were costing approximately $40 million, according to the industry. The coalition during all these, their years in government did nothing about the adverse effects on residents surrounding the airport, and nor did they try to resolve the congestion issue or to plan for their future. The Labor government's initiative to construct a new runway parallel to the existing north-south runway at Kingston Smith, and at the same time approving the development of the second major airport at Sydney, Sydney West at Badgerys Creek, represented in stark contrast a fundamental approach to an extremely difficult issue. The two initiatives lead to significant increase in capacity and corresponding improvements in airport congestion. The improved capacity will go on to provide economic benefits for Sydney, New South Wales and Australia at large. The coalition advocated the new runway prior to its construction and clearly understood that a reduction in the use of the east-west was part of the new operations. Their change of policy position came about since the public response and they saw there was a political opportunity. John Howard, the leader of the opposition, has been particularly hypocritical in his position. In evidence to the inquiry on 25 July 1995, the leader of the opposition said, quote, if you are putting to me whether I knew that the contemplation in 1989 was that there would be the downgrading of the use of the east-west, the answer to that question is yes, I have never denied that. John Howard was a most enthusiastic and active proponent of the third runway. He supported the third runway and was fully aware of the planned reduction in the operation of the east-west runway. There is no record in Hansard of John Howard ever raising the issue of aircraft noise as a problem prior to the new runway being opened in November 94. The EIS document at the very outset also repeated the conditions regarding the downgrading of the east-west runway as outlined in the joint statement of the 22nd of March 1989. Not only did the opposition not criticise the original proposal to downgrade the use of the east-west, but they are on record as recognising the construction of the east-west runway would lead to, sorry, of the third runway would lead to a reduction in the number of residents affected by aircraft noise. And Charles Blunt, who was then in 1989 the Federal Opposition Spokesman for Transport, gave a fairly lengthy uh, statement in regard to that, which I won't, because of time constraints, repeat. The overwhelming evidence to committee from all expert agencies, such as the Bureau of Air Safety Investigation, the Civil Aviation Safety Authority and Air Services Australia, is that restoring the east-west runway to, in full to reinstate cross-runway operations would either reduce safety standards or the rate of aircraft movements or create a substantial additional noise burden on surrounding residents. We just cannot take the risk. The majority of the committee also gives recognition to the difficulties by backing away from their original draft recommendation, where they bluntly called for the reopening and uh, extended use of the east-west. In fact, they replaced it with, uh, frankly, fairly much a nothing recommendation, which runs roughly, that the Minister for Transport direct the responsible authorities to develop a new airspace management plan for Kingston Smith Airport and in conjunction revise the airport's noise abatement procedures. The new airspace management plan and noise abatement procedures should examine the best means of using all three runways at Kingston Smith, and it goes on. If anyone, if anyone could recognise that, uh, that convoluted recommendation as a recommendation to immediately reopen the, uh, the east-west runway, then they must have a very uh, broad uh, imagination. Frankly, this committee report, and what's important, it does not endorse the policy position of John Howard, nor does it endorse the policy position of the coalition, and that is because the members of the committee, in their honesty and in their integrity, 
could not overcome the safety. Uh, point of order. On the, um, as we all, all sort of table reports in this chamber, and uh, all of us, in order to reach compromises, uh, make changes in drafts. Uh, I have to say this is the first time I've ever heard in this chamber people referring to uh, previous drafts of, of reports, and I just really wonder what the, what the, whether there's a sort of an ethical problem that we're, we're now bumping into on um, the confidentiality of the committee. I haven't quite finished, actually. Uh, um, I just think that we've got to be very careful here. What? I'm just, I'm just seeking some guidance. I'm seeking some guidance from the from the chair because I just wonder whether whether we're not treading into um, some uh, some areas where we should be a bit careful, where uh, that uh, mem members of the committee want to indulge in, in free-flowing debate, but they don't expect that debate to uh, emerge in the Senate mm -hmm. chamber. Um, I wonder if the chair could give some guidance on this uh, rather important issue. I, on that point of order, please, yes. because there is normally I would not raise this sort of matter. Um, if it was, if it had been restricted to debate within the committee, in fact, it was not debated in the committee. Where it was debated was by a leak to the Sydney Morning Herald of a draft that none of the uh, the members of the uh, Labor Party had even seen. Uh, on That's the correct. It was on the front page of the Sydney Morning Herald last Saturday. On, on Minister, um, on the point of order. I would suggest that the uh, Honourable Senator exercise due care and proceed. Thank you, um, Madam Acting Deputy Chair. Essentially, uh, notwithstanding the previous draft or anything that was contained in them, on the face of it, the report does not endorse the position of the opposition leader. And I think that, uh, as I was stating when interrupted, this is because the uh, honesty and integrity the honesty and integrity of the uh, committee members did not allow them to see forward to be able to recommend in the face of evidence on the safety issue that the east-west uh, runway should be reopened. Now, the government has taken a number of, a number of actions in, uh, in trying to uh, deal with the problems that have arisen since the runway was opened in November 94. They include the tightening of the flight corridors, strengthening the after-hours curfew, Initiating a, initiating a major program of acquisition and uh, insulation of properties, and also speeding up the development of a near airport, Sydney West. I see that the um, time has ended, but uh, I would commend to senators the package of, uh, of reforms contained within the minority report and uh, urge uh, members to uh, give them proper consideration. Senator Childs. Deputy President, uh, I rise to speak on this uh, report too, and I'd at the outset like to point out that uh, it's the most unusual committee I've been in, not because we weren't civil to each other, but because we didn't go through the ordinary processes of discussing the report because of the highly political nature of the issue. And so long as everybody realises, and I'll use due care, that we haven't gone through the processes that every other committee that I've ever been on has gone on. So let's face the politics of it. And this is because we are in a pre-election uh, mode and the opposition in this case are desperate to, in a populist way, attract attention uh, to their cause. And I can understand that uh, Senator Perra, as a uh, shadow minister for aviation, has had to switch and change uh, as he's gone along. As the wind blows, he has a leader in Mr Howard. Uh, the leader of the opposition, who defends Benelong first, second and third, and uh, is doing everything possible uh, to uh, divert attention away uh, from the real issues. And the real issues are, uh, as the minority report points out, that there is a need to uh, uh, change uh, uh, the things that have been happening, and they're summed up by what the minority report has put forward when we've s said the current noise reduction strategies providing for sound insulation and the management of flight paths, such as restricting flight paths to the north of the airport so as to minimise the number of homes affected and prohibiting takeoffs to the north on the third runway should continue to be pursued in order to reduce the possible adverse health effects. That appears at nine under the health section of the minority report. When that is taken with the positive proposals that we have for the development of Badgerys Creek, then you can see that is the solution 
for all those people that everybody acknowledges in Sydney have been stressed by the uh, developments that have occurred because of the inadequate uh, environmental impact statement uh, that didn't represent uh, fully the problems that Sydney people would face. And then we go through in our recommendations in the minority report to make sure that the mistakes that have been made at Sydney Airport are not repeated at, in the West, uh, Sydney West Airport. And in this case, we recommend that the, we immediately pass the legislation that the opposition have not passed so that there will be delays in getting Badgerys Creek up and running. And that very delay that this opposition has caused to occur means that uh, people will suffer for longer in the flight paths at Sydney Airport. But we also propose, and I mention now about the Sydney West Airport, that we ask the state Labor government in New South Wales to repair the damage that the Liberal coalition government in New South Wales has caused at a state level by allowing estates to be built in the flight path of uh, uh, the area in the west of Sydney because they have allowed uh, uh, estates to be built over the last few years under the Fay and Griner governments so that other people in the west of Sydney might be affected by that. But in addition, uh, we have proposed that there be an improvement in the uh, environmental impact uh, system to make sure that uh, we have the, the use of a uh, uh, public uh, uh, interest uh, section and uh, regime applied to the environmental in impact so that the public interest can countervail the weaknesses that occurred at Sydney Airport. Now, because of the agreement with my whip that I won't speak for a great length of time, I then only have to refer to the uh, coalition's proposals. And my colleagues have, uh, of course, shown the hypocrisy of the opposition's proposal, but I just want to draw attention to why we say that you should prohibit the, develop, the, the uh, takeoff of planes to the north from the third one way. Because this week uh, the opposition was sprung in an article by uh, Tom Burton in the Financial Review where he pointed out. Uh, under an article headed Coalition Risks New Airport Noise Protest to the fact that under the Coalition government proposal, if they were to be in government, then you would have uh, planes taking up off to the north on the, on the existing third runway. And of course, that's the secret plan. And of course, Salo Senator Para, as the uh, Shadow Minister, is quick to try and deny it. I point out to the people of Sydney particularly, and those people who would be affected, that that's just another uh, aspect of how the opposition, if they were ever in government, would have uh, an area that has been banned uh, for, from this activity would be vastly affected. And many people in Sydney to the north of the third runway have not realised that sinister, stealthy move by the opposition. Uh, which has only been telegraphed and denied, but in a party that ha no, has no policy, and Senator Parra today has had to admit that the policy is still hidden that the opposition would have. The policy of the opposition is blown around from day to day according to the whims of the leader, and poor uh, Senator Parra, as the shadow minister, has to uh, keep picking up the pieces as the leader of the opposition blows in the wind in his popular style of trying to attract votes and protect Benelong first, second and third. Uh, Senator Pera. I claim to have been misrepresented, uh, Madam Acting Deputy. In relation to your speech? In relation to remarks made by both Senator Charles and Senator Neil. Can I sum up? Um, oh, I can sum up. You oh, can, thank you. Yes. I, I, so I, you I, I just would like to make a couple of comments, Madam Acting Deputy Chairman. And uh, I think I indicated in my initial, uh, uh, in my opening remarks, that I wanted to thank the committee for really what was um, a, a, a very good committee. And uh, I wanted to take Senator Charles to task, because Senator Charles said that this is a very unusual committee that never before had a committee come out with a report 
that hadn't been looked at carefully by every member of that committee. Now, there was a reason for that, Madam Acting Deputy uh, President, and that was that we did have a meeting of that committee, and in fact, Senator Forshaw, who came to every single meeting of that committee, took the viewpoint that rather than go through it item by item and page by page, and in view of the fact that he was going to write a minority report, it would be better if uh, he just took the draft report away and wrote his minority report. <laughs> Senator Charles, that is not correct. That wasn't the point. And in fact, I think you've indicated, as has Senator Forshaw, that there are items of agreement, particularly in regards to noise forecasts and all these sorts of things. Now, this was a request made to me by Senator Forshaw, and I was happy to accede to it. The other remark was made by Senator Neill, and she indicated that she did not have the draft, the, the chairman's draft report by last Friday. In fact, the chairman's draft report was given to the Labor members of the committee on last Thursday. Uh, we attempted to, we attempted to um, do it by Wednesday, but at that stage I personally hadn't had the opportunity to review it myself. So it was actually given to the committee, uh, to all members of the committee who wanted it last Thursday. So the remarks by Senator Neill that no Labor member of the committee had that report by last Friday were clearly incorrect. The other um, thing I'd like to point out is, oh, and Senator Charles says, well, it was, it was changed. It was changed in very minor detail. And I also gave Senator Forshaw my uh, assurance, and it, it was in keeping with the relationship we had throughout the committee, the whole committee hearings, irrespective of the fact that we certainly had differing points of view, that if there are any significant changes that I would draw it to his attention. And that was actually done. But I thought that uh, while I had the opportunity that uh, I would just quote in regards to questions of safety, and I think Senator Forshaw has made it very clear in his response that no one has ever claimed that the uh, use of, parallel, of intersecting runways is unsafe. Let me say that, that is not correct. The people who have said it is unsafe are the Prime Minister of this country who used absolutely violent language to talk about uh, uh, the, the dangers of intersecting runways, as had the Minister. And at least that has been clarified by Senator Forshaw, who has toned down the, the language used by the Prime Minister and the Minister. But it's worth uh, Madam Acting uh, Deputy President, to just quote from a, uh, from a recent article in the, uh, the Guild of Air Pilots and Air Navigators of Australia in relation to Sydney Airport, where they say the procedural changes that have followed the introduction of the third runway, meaning the closure of the east-west of Sydney Kings for Smith, are concerning Guild members throughout Australia. And former Regional Committee Chairman and Chief Pilot of Qantas, Kevin, Ken Davenport, points out the third runway is a misnomer. When the new runway was brought into service, the old cross runway became subject to stringent limitations. He then goes on to explain to readers that the original operations were conducted on two runways, that's 0725 and 1634, that is an east-west and a north-south, and a simultaneous operating system enabled both runways to be used at the same time, greatly reducing delays, even if it did on occasions cause some ex experiences for pilots and controllers. When the second runway was commissioned, the east-west was closed for political reasons. Now that came through time and time again in the evidence given to the committee. It was closed for political reasons, could only be used when the crosswind on the other runways exceeded 25 knots. The pilot could request the east-west for operational reasons, but ran the possibility of a please explain to the company, Civil Aviation Authority or the minister. He goes on to say, I contend the undue pressure was being applied to pilots not to use the east-west runway when good airmanship would dictate this runway should be used. Um, he, um, he says, all pilots of large, noisy aircraft are aware of the noise they generate and try at all times to minimise its effect on the community. And again, this came through to us in evidence given to us by pilots. They themselves feel guilty because of a, of a, a flight pass situation which has been imposed upon them by the policies of this government and this minister, and not because of their own, their own requirements. They, he talks about minimum drag approaches are flown with minimum or even no reverse thrust on landing. 
departures used downwind components and optimal climb procedures were also used. And uh, he says the pilots are doing, playing their part, but where does it all end? Pilots may, may reasonably feel that being forced into a takeoff with maximum crosswind is questionable. And he said, we have all heard of wind shear. Now, I only just quote that because that's one of a myriad of uh, uh, statements made, similar to the statements made to the committee. And it's made by people who should know, and people who have not been listened to. No, the international pilots, the domestic pilots. We even had one domestic pilot apologising to the people because of the noise he was causing, and it was not his fault, but he said he had no option. So, Madam uh, Acting Deputy President, I would just simply like to close the debate by saying that the committee addressed itself to all the issues. We've come, we've come out with the majority report, certainly with what I believe is to be a hard-hitting report. It addresses the issues front on, and it comes out with the recommendations, of course, when we come to noise and we come to pollution, that, uh, that gives a balance. In other words, what I mean is that we are suggesting that the only way to tackle this noise problem, a noise problem which will not go away and with the passage of time will just get worse unless it's addressed. Under the current <coughs> configuration, it is bound to get worse. And uh, no matter what the government or what the minister might like to feel, the problem will not go away. Those people have been subject to a, a barrage which they describe to us as being like in a war zone without bombs. And uh, the only way to address the immediate problem, uh, the development of Badgerys Creek should go ahead subject to a proper EIS, no doubt about that, but it will not address the problems of Sydney Airport. That must be confronted. The government cannot walk away from it. If it does, it will be to its detriment, uh, not just from the people who have been affected, but also when it comes to their voting intentions, and I think they should take that on board. I'd also like to pay tribute to Senator Vicky Bourne uh, as Deputy Chair. She did an excellent job and she referred to the great work done by Mr James Warmanhoven, who is the Secretary of the Committee. I had never met the Secretary James Warmanhoven before. Uh, I didn't know Patricia Carling before, but let me say that I agree entirely with Senator Bourne that I doubt that in all the years I've been here I have ever uh, been uh, privileged to, to have uh, to have had a better uh, secretary or a better committee. So on behalf of the committee, I'd like the clerks to convey that to those particular people. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, said. Uh, Madam Acting um, President, uh, before the matter is put, I'd like to raise a matter, um, a, a point of order. I'd like to raise a point of order, understanding order 37, uh, with regard to the disclosure and evidence of documents. Uh, you have previously ruled on a point of order that was raised by my colleague Senator Kemp, and this related to the matter uh, of Senator Neal. I think it is important that uh, uh, Standing Order 37, which reads, the evidence taken by a committee and documents presented to it which have not been reported to the Senate shall not, unless authorised by the Senate or the committee, be disclosed to any person other than a member or officer of the committee. I think the point taken in that I'd like to take is in debate. Senator Neal transgressed that standing order and referred to the contents of the drafts that were under consideration by the, by the committee, and as such she may have um, breached the issue that should perhaps be addressed as a matter of privilege and ought to be more properly referred by you to the president for further consideration. Um, I think uh, Senator Neal was uh, in error to go into the detail. Um, of documents considered in draft form by the committee. So, uh, yes, point of order. On the point of order, uh, I think the Charles. record will show that, uh, and Senator Neal made it clear that uh, she was referring to uh, a leak uh, which uh, had uh, the majority report uh, in the pages of the Sydney Morning Herald, and to that extent, uh, she was referring very much to uh, that situation, so that uh, uh, I uh, don't agree with uh, the point that's been made. Of course, uh, whether the matter uh, of the leak to the Sydney Morning Herald, which is a breach of privilege uh, on the face of it, 
as considered by the President and referred to the Privileges Committee is another matter, but I, didn't, uh, I don't accept the inference by the point of order uh, that reflected on Senator Neill, who wasn't in the chamber at the point uh, uh, where the point of order was taken. Senator Neill. I, I must say I think it's an incredible uh, uh, lack of courtesy not to notify me you were going to raise this when I was in my office, but I had the um, uh, thanks, uh, I'm grateful that I was actually listening to the debate on the um, television. I suppose that um, uh, courtesy is not something that's common amongst even the more senior members of the chamber. And I suppose I shouldn't expect it, but I do just want to confirm what I uh, said when the matter was raised in the first instance by Senator Kemp, and that is, in fact, I had not read the recommendation contained in the draft report. I was familiar with it from having read it on the front page of the Sydney Morning Herald on Saturday, and the fact that, the, that it's been referred to the Privileges Committee um, in any case. But uh, having, uh, having uh, used the material that's on the front uh, page of the Sydney Morning Herald, I don't think can amount to disclosure of uh, any uh, secret um, discussions um, that have gone on in the committee, because there certainly were no discussions, and it was not sourced from any document provided by or from the committee. Senator, um, Senator uh, Kemp. Um, well, I think the debate has moved on um, because I think we will have to examine uh, very carefully what was said in the in the earlier comments by you, um, Senator uh, Neil. My uh, memory was that you did refer to earlier drafts. If you if you didn't, well, in that case, uh, uh, sort of the point is well made. But I think that um, my memory, and that's why I rose as a point of order. My memory was that you you talked about earlier drafts and you then said that uh, under normal circumstances you wouldn't uh, have normally. Um, uh, followed this course. So uh, we will look um, at the earlier comments that, that were made. Um, well, it, look, the, the reality is I, I, can't, my, I, don't, I can't remember precisely what, you, what you've said, and I, I suspect that, that you can't remember precisely what you've said, but, but the Hansard will record precisely what you've said, and so um, people can look, look at that and draw the conclusion. Because I think all of us are in agreement. I mean, I think that one thing this, this very small debate has shown that all of us are in, in agreement that the uh, discussions and earlier drafts of um, committees should not be made public nor debated, and in fact that's confirmed uh, as, as my colleague um, Senator, Senator Tamling has said. So I think, we're, well, I think we are all in, in that sense in a blazing agreement. The question really is when you got up and you made those remarks. Uh, were you referring to a draft which appeared on the, the front page, uh, apparently leaked, I understand, or claimed to have been leaked, on the front page of the paper, or were you uh, sort of referring to earlier drafts which had been before the committee? But um, I think it has been useful because we have made sure that everyone understands the discussions of a, of a committee uh, are privileged and, and to be kept in confidence. And um, as I said, we will look at just to see what what you did say in the in the in the, in the early remarks, and I might say a very highly political speech as well. <laughs> Min uh, minister, thank you. Uh, what a shock that someone would make a highly political speech about aircraft noise in Sydney. This would be a stunning revelation to the people of Australia. They will be falling about with horror. Uh, on the point of order, uh, is if, as I understand it, Senator Tambling has asked you to refer this matter to the president for his consideration. It seems to me if a senator requests an acting deputy president to do that, that should take place. And so I uh, certainly agree that the matter should be referred to the president. I only stand because I want to qualify Senator Kemp's enthusiasm about the unanimity of interpretation which we have here. I will await with interest uh, the president's advice, but uh, I'm not uh, joining uh, with, nor do I accept that either Senator Neill or Senator Childs uh, uh, interpreted the, the standing order in that way. They were simply providing a fact that qualified uh, the, uh, the nature of uh, Senator Tambling's, the point Senator Tambling had raised, but uh, I don't think we need to debate any more in the chamber. I'm quite satisfied with uh, uh, what I assume will be your view that uh, Senator Tambling, having so requested, you should refer it to, to the President. Let's get on with the business. Senator um, Tambling. Madam Deputy, Acting Deputy President, I'd like to clarify one point with regard to this matter that's being considered as. Um, uh, as important. Senator Neill made the point that I had not extended to her uh, the conventions and courtesies. I think it is important to note that uh, I am the shadow minister on duty and as such was not able to leave the chamber, but convention and courtesy demands that she ought to, that she ought to stay in the chamber for the duration of the debate. And I think that uh, ought to be the clear point. 
Senator Forshaw. Madam, Madam Acting Deputy President, could I just make a couple of quick comments, given that uh, on the point of order, yes, and given that earlier Senator Parra had uh, made some comments about what transpired, and I think it's important for people to just be on the record, particularly given that it will be it will be referred to the president. All I wish to say and clarify is that the position was that the draft report, which as Senator Parra said he had even not gone through and completely read, uh, was provided to, uh, to us. The difficulty was that because of the time constraints, uh, it was being provided on a sort of a sequential basis as things were printed, and it's a very voluminous report as people have seen. We were in the process of also endeavouring to write our report and, and, and uh, having a look at the, uh, the majority, or what was to be the majority report. The problem, of course, was that what ended up appearing in the Her Sydney Morning Herald was a leak of a draft report which was not even in a final form at that stage and which nobody really had any uh, real opportunity to consider. And I think that's the point that really needs to be stressed in all of this. On the various points of order that have been raised, uh, I will refer the matter to the President as uh, indicated by the Minister if a Senator requests that. I will, uh, of course, refer the matter to the President for his, uh, his assessment and ruling. Uh, the question is that the Senate take note of the report. Those of that opinion say aye, against say no. I think the ayes have it. Senator McGibbon. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I seek leave to make a very brief statement on a matter of public interest. Is leave granted? Leave is Thank granted. The Senate. Sen Senator McGibbon. Earlier this month, the Lord Mayor of the City of Brisbane, Alderman Surley, distributed Christmas cards to veterans using lists supplied by the Department of Veterans Affairs. There has been a public outcry from many veterans who have been recipients of these cards. One of the grounds is that the Department of Veterans Affairs have no right to release their names and, secondly, they are not approached for permission to have their names passed on as is required by law. It is further alleged that the mail contractor who posted the list did not sign any contract as required to maintain confidentiality of the list, presuming, of course, that the action of releasing the names was a legitimate act by the Department of Veterans Affairs. In view of the gravity of the allegations that one or more major breaches of the Privacy Act may have occurred, particularly principles 9, 10 and 11, I am publicly calling on the Privacy Commissioner to investigate whether the Department of Veterans Affairs has breached any of the provisions of the Privacy Act and make public his findings. Thank you. Thank you. Clark. General Business Order of the Day, Public Works Committee report, adjourned debate on the motion to take note moved by Senator Calvert and on the amendment moved thereto by Senator Reid. Uh, Statement. Yes, is, is leave granted? Uh, thank leave you, is granted. Uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. On the basis that I was the one who sought the germ of this to seek further procedural advice, I thought I would just report back. Uh, while not every aspect of the procedural situation in which we find ourselves is clear, there does seem to be broad uh, consensus that uh, while there is no doubt about the capacity of the Senate to carry a resolution expressing its opinion about uh, this report, and, and in essence that's what uh, it is doing. Uh, it's, not, uh, uh, it's probably not going to be interpreted, I think, will not be as a decision of binding effect. But nevertheless, uh, provided we all accept that, of course, the Senate carry a resolution expressing its view, uh, nothing constrains it from doing that, well, then we are in order, there is no problem, and uh, while I'll still be opposed to the motion, it's not a procedural problem that we confront. The question is that the uh, amendment uh, moved by Ms. Uh, Senator Reid be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Again, say no. no. I think the ayes have it. Uh, the question now is that the motion moved by Senator Calvert to take note of the Public Works Committee report be agreed to, as amended, be agreed to. Uh, those of that opinion say aye. aye. Again, say no. I think the ayes have it. Uh, Clark? Government Business Order of the Day. Appropriation Parliamentary Departments Bill No. 2, 1995-96, and two associated bills. Second reading, adjourned debate. Senator McGurran. Um, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Seeing as the speaker's list just collapsed then, I'll uh, take the opportunity to speak on the appropriation bills to uh, approximately seven o'clock or, or thereabouts. 
uh, that the bills before the, the Senate um, are, are the government's request for, for further appropriations, further monies, to put simply. And what it really does spell out, more than anything else, it is the collapse of the government's budget strategy. We have in these appropriations a request for some uh, $1 billion extra due to the government's ex uh, um, unlisted uh, expenditure, which of course in fact now confirms that the government budget will go into deficit this year. And that's regardless of the government uh, using uh, at the last budget de declaring that they would have this budget in surplus this financial year. And of course that's just not going to be the case. In fact, they were always gilding the lily when, uh, when they declared at the last budget statement that they would in fact have, have a budget in surplus due to primarily the sale of the Commonwealth Bank. They, they had estimated a, a budget uh, surplus of some $718 billion. The likelihood now is, uh, is that it will be some $718 billion deficit, a complete turnaround, a greater than a billion dollar turnaround. So in, we, we, we've had a, uh, a, another collapse of a government strategy. In fact, the budget surplus was the only strategy left to, to the government. Madam Acting Deputy President, today we have had the government in this House and indeed the other House declare that, uh, th that we are, are uh, entering the, the, the final days of the parliament before the election. That was pretty obvious today when Senator McMullen uh, pretty well announced that uh, this was his final question time, as it was Senator Evans. And the same theme ran through the House of, of Representatives. And is it little wonder? Is it little wonder that uh, the government now really do want to close the parliament down, but before the, the real economic results come in next year? Now, no matter how much gloss that they put on the, the um, national accounts figures yesterday, they know, as well as every other commentator in, in, uh, in, in the national media, uh, reported on, they know very well that underlying those national accounts are a set of, of very bad figures. And I don't think it was put any better than in the Financial Review editorial, and I'll quote, the harsh reality is that once, uh, once the one-off bounce back in rural output and the unsustainable lift in stock levels are removed, the result is a domestic economy as flat as the proverbial pancake. And the government well know that the next set of national accounts figures, uh, the December quarter, which will be out on March the 30th next year, around about the time that the election, uh, the election date will be, will of course most likely show a further slowing in the economy, if not a, a, a negative growth in the economy. Now, this of course reflects poorly on, on on the government's uh, employment strategy. We know now that unemployment is on the rise, that it, it is, uh, has shot up from, from its uh, best level of 8 per cent. It is now at 8.5 per cent. Now, that best level of 8, 8 per cent is no better, as it is today, it is no better than, that, than the beginning of uh, the so-called uh, recovery. The unemployment figures have not improved at all. In fact, the, uh, the uh, youth unemployment figures are at, at a, at a, a trending up also at some 29 per cent. Now, this, this uh, really puts the economy in a mess. Now, the, the, there are certain economic indicators that the government cannot run away from, that they cannot gild the lily, in, and in fact, that really are starting to bite now. In, in the community, in every household, in every family. Now, one of the, the most uh, potent indicators of the standard of living is the, uh, the GNP per capita. Now, in comparison, some 10 years ago or more now, in 1983, Australia, according to World Bank data, ranked ninth in the world in terms of gross national product per capita. Now, this, per ca this gross national product per capita is recognised universally as a nation's standard of, of living. Now, according to the most recent data, some re uh, released in 
1993, Australia has slid to 21st in the world, so we're down 12 places in the term of this government. Or the current account deficit, which we all know now is some 6 per cent of GDP, which is the worst in the world. Now, we, we used to come into this parliament and say that we were only second to Mexico, we're, that our current account was fast approaching the disastrous state of the Mexican economy. Now, it turns out, it, and ironically, it uh, prompted the Mexican ambassador to complain to the parliament uh, for um, deriding his country. And he was quite right, because it wasn't long before Australia, Australia's uh, gross uh, current account to, um, as a percentage of GDP became worse than the, than the, Mexican, uh, uh, the Mexican, Mexican statistic. Now that's a very embarrassing state of affairs, and of course it, it now places our, uh, Australia as the worst current account deficit in the OEDC countries. Uh, and the Economist quite uh, laughingly mocks Australia as saying, guess who's, what, what, what the Economist has uh, pointed out in mocking terms in relation, to, there, here it is, that the, uh, when they say, guess who's looking like Mexico? Who would have thought Australia would ever be compared to the third world country of Mexico in such mocking terms by such a leading, leading uh, economic magazine as the, as the Economist. That is read by, uh, by the international community and that is now how Australia is seen in the, in the international community. And the figures get worse. Of course, with, with, a, with a deteriorating current account, you get an increasing foreign debt. And Australia has a record uh, foreign debt of $180 billion, which again ranks as one of the world's worst. And as, as far as our interest rates go, Australia ranks, as, uh, in, as re in regards to its prime rates, as the equal highest amongst the developed countries of the world. And I come back to unemployment because all these statistics cascade down to what is the most basic effect upon the households and families of Australia. You may well talk about foreign debt, current accounts, G G GNP per capita, which often seem like lofty economic terms. Indeed, they are lofty economic terms to, to the uh, ordinary Australian uh, family and households. But what it does, it cascades to an effect that they all know about, and that's the unemployment rate. There's very few families or, or people in Australia who have not been affected by the unemployment rate, rate in, this, in this country. We have an increasing unemployment rate where there are some 800,000 Australians unemployed. 29% of of, uh, of, uh, is the unemployment rate of the, teen, of the teenagers. And of course that has an effect on uh, a, a, not only an economic effect but a grave social effect up upon those teenagers. So Madam Acting Deputy President, it really is incumbent upon the government to take note of, uh, economic, uh, of these economic statistics and the economic critics, such as the economics, Economists, the Business Council of, of Australia, and their very own, their, their very own uh, advise, economic advisory body, the uh, Bureau of Industry Economics, which uh, declare that the government have been too slow in uh, progressing the microeconomic reform policies, that they have reached a stage of uh, uh, microeconomic fatigue. Now, this this uh, is uh, borne out in, in the most stark, um, stark way in a, in a paper published by the Bureau of Economics uh, in August 1995 called International Benchmarking uh, Waterfront. Now, of course, if you can't get your waterfront right, you're never going to get your exports right. If you can't get them off the wharfs in the most efficient and competitive manner or get them off at all, then, of course, you're never going to be able to compete internationally and your business is handicapped from the start and it is just another additive cost up upon business. Now, referring to, to that uh, report, it has some very telling statistics which really does reflect upon all other failures of the government in microeconomic reform. For example, in the area of containers, 
The waterfront charges for containers in Australia are considerably higher than most of the, those surveyed overseas ports in New Zealand, Asia and Europe. The greatest concern with Australia's performance must lie with stevedoring uh, productivity where crane rates, that is container moves per hour per crane, declined during 94 and fell back in 92, 91-92 levels. That's recession levels. Crane rates at the very best performing Australian container terminals was 18.5 moves per hour at Fremantle is equivalent to some of the poorest performers in Europe. So where we are performing at our best, it is seen to be equivalent to Europe's worst. And the BIA survey of ship operators indicate that timeless and, uh, timeliness and reliability are more important than price. Moreover, the survey indicated that timeliness and reliability for the waterfront services in the Australian ports lag well behind the overseas ports. So we've still got the same old problems on our waterfront, which, uh, of course, you can relate back to, to the union movement, the Maritime Workers' Union, that have had more strikes on the waterfront than any other union in this country. In the past 18 uh, months, they've had some half dozen or more very costly strikes on, um, in this country. So, some of them pathetic and useless. Some of them are utterly, most of them utterly unwarranted, as we saw uh, only some weeks ago when they all went out in sympathy in, in, for their CR, CRA uh, um, co uh, comrades. Now that cost the country some $100 million. Madam Acting Deputy President, it being seven o'clock, uh, I'll, I'll conclude my remarks. But I think it's worthy, worthy to say that uh, the, the government's economic statistics and indicators have not improved, and that as we head off Order. into this election, I, I think the people will uh, answer Order. them in their ballot box. Order. Sen Thank you, Senator McGowan. It being 7 p.m., the sitting of the Senate is suspended till 8 p.m. Call Senator Bourne. No, no. Senator Crichton Brown. We are talking to, we are talking to the Parliamentary Department's appropriation bill, aren't we? Uh, yes. Uh, Mr. Acting Deputy President, um, not that it's of profound significance to you, but I, I'll, be, I'll be brief. Um, but I, I want to revisit the matter that I've spoken about each year for about the last five years, and that is the 
level of funding provided to the Department of the Senate, the arrangements which have been entered into, the resolution which was passed some years ago when Senator Richardson was the chairman of the appropriate um, um, estimates committee, and the lack of resolve to do anything about it except to say that successive uh, finance ministers uh, seem to utterly ignore the resolution and utterly ignore the appropriations and staffing uh, uh, committee of the Senate and, uh, on this occasion, ignore the recommendations and proposals adopted uh, for funding which arose from a review of the committee's resources and which was conducted jointly by the Department of the Senate and the Department of the Finance. The Department of Finance, Mr Acting Deputy President, there's a view being put to the committee by the clerk of the Senate and accepted by the committee and, in fact, confirmed, uh, as I recall, by the president that with the present level of funding there can be no guarantees and no certainty that, um, that the committee system will be able to function um, in an adequate and appropriate way. Um, it, it seems that in this coming period, for the first time, at least in my 13 or 15 years or however long I've been here, that the committee's work and the references they take will be, will be subject to the level of funding. In other words, for the first time, the committees will not be able automatically to accept references given to them by the parliament, given to them by the Senate, uh, without uh, considering uh, w whether or not they can be funded. In other words, the funding will dictate the level of activity and the contribution that the, city si the uh, committee system makes in the, uh, makes, uh, in the Senate. And I've, I've said for some time something, something obscene about the capacity of a parliament to function to, uh, to depend upon the funding provided to it by the executive government. And while one expects that the parliamentary departments have some recognition of uniform and universal um, funding uh, constrictions and restrictions, in my view it's, it's, um, it's utterly wrong that the capacity of the parliament, the capacity of the chambers, and the capacity of the committees to monitor, to examine, uh, to consider or to contemplate the activities or the conduct of the executive government is controlled by the executive government through the purse strings. And I well remember some years ago Senator Walsh threatening in respect to a certain committee that he would ensure that the committee didn't didn't fulfil um, the wishes of the parliament because he'd ensure, as the Minister for Finance, that the funding wouldn't be made available. And uh, there is an excellent argument to be had that, that appropriations for parliamentary departments be creatures of the parliament and not creatures of the executive government. Because, uh, as, it presently is, as it presently is, we are we're going back to uh, was it Charles I that restricted the funding uh, to the parliament uh, and uh, said he would, he would have a capacity to close the parliament down because he wouldn't give it any funding? Well, well he, he lost his head. <laughs> he lost his head. Um, and, uh, and we're in a situation now where, if it be the view or the wish or the commitment of the Senate, to examine the functioning and the activities and the expenditure of the executive government, it can be prevented from doing so by the executive government. In other words, there's no separation in terms of autonomy uh, between the two. And I have always thought that, that, that um, separation of powers 
was essential, an essential ingredient, an ingredient to the democratic um, process. Now, on this, on this occasion, um, the, uh, the, the president of the Senate, following in the well-trodden footsteps of his predecessors, wrote to the Minister for Finance expressing his concern that, that the considerations and contemplations of the uh, Appropriations and Staffing Committee of the Senate had again been ignored, except to say on this occasion a joint committee of review was ignored. And the President says in his letter, the committee expressed its concern and disappointment at your failure this is a letter to the Honourable Kim Beasley MP, so far to adopt fully the recommendations and funding proposals arising from the review of committee resources conducted jointly by the Department of the Senate and the Department of the Finance, which recommended which recommendations and proposals were adopted by the committee on the 21st of November of, on the 21st of June of 1995? The letter observed the Department of the Senate made several concessions in the course of the joint review. The interest, of, <coughs> me, the interest of reaching an agreed outcome with your department, that's the Department of Finance. The recommendations and funding proposals in the report thus represent a compromise on which the department considered was warranted. It was expected that, the review having been thoroughly conducted and its report accepted by the finance officers, there would be no difficulty in adopting it. I urge your consideration of its remaining recommendations and funding proposals when the matter next comes up during consideration of the 1996-97 budget. I have to say, with the greatest respect, that is a vain hope. That is a vain hope. Nothing, nothing has changed. There is no indication that things will change. As I recall, the, 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 uh, the uh, Joint Committee review was as a result of a meeting uh, uh, by, I think it was the President um, and the Minister of Finance, and it was intended that be a mechanism to ensure proper consultation between the Department of Finance and the Department of the Senate in good and healthy time prior to the construction of the budget. Because in past years, in past years, Funding figures have been set and put in place before the Senate was given an opportunity, the Department or the Appropriations Staffing Committee were given a, an opportunity to make a, uh, a contribution. And so, but we've advanced at least to having the facade of, of a committee to examine, to, to examine uh, the funding uh, arrangements. Our, uh, the, uh, the 23rd report of the Senate Standing Committee on Appropriations and Staffing observes that the committee has now received a letter from the Minister for Finance confirming that the government is prepared to offer funding of just over a million dollars, 500,000 to standing committees and, and 581,000 to continue permanent funding for secretariats for two select committees without adjustments for the 1 per cent absorption term in the budget. Now, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President, it's, it's clear from from the President's correspondence, it's clear from the committee's report that, that notwithstanding uh, this next year being an election year, uh, that there will be adequate funding to allow the various committees to fulfil uh, their obligations and their responsibilities. For the first time in living memory, committees can find themselves in a circumstance where they'll be given by the Senate a term of reference and will not be able to fulfil their obligations because of funding constraints. In other words, the obligations and responsibilities of the committees will be suspended because of, of lack of uh, financial resources. I find that, as I say, uh, grossly obscene, uh, to say the least. The, the, question, the rhetorical question I put before the Senate is, what do they propose to do about it in the future? If the present process continues, if the present process continues, the committee system will be utterly neutered. The committee system will be restricted to a level of inquiry and investigation that the executive government judges appropriate. And whenever we have a body that controls directly or indirectly, the monitoring of its activities and conduct by an external, ex external body, then, then you can guarantee 
that there won't be proper and uh, free ventilation of, uh, of uh, facts and circumstances uh, which flow from the conduct of the, of the monitored body. And in this case, it simply means that the, that the government will no longer be accountable to the Senate. And I don't need to make the obvious point that committees are simply no more and no less than creatures of the Senate. They're a reflection of the Senate. They articulate, when their reports are adopted, the views and the commitments and the determinations and the resolutions of the Senate. And uh, if they're unable to, to function, it simply means that the Senate as a whole, this chamber, the, this chamber set up to review, to contemplate as a second deliberation of legislation and activities of government, will no longer be able to fulfil its, its obligations. And once we arrive at that circumstance, the, the, purpose, of the, uh, the purpose of the Senate in many respects, uh, save for rubber stamping legislation or rejecting it uh, without, without, without proper, um, proper, a proper capacity to make uh, um, proper determinations, uh, will fall to the ground. Uh, Mr Acting Deputy President, I do hope that the Senate ad, ad, starts to, uh, to address this question as to how they're going to uh, ensure that they've got appropriate funding and that they are divorced and they are removed uh, in some way from the outcomes um, of the government. But as, as it presently stands, we go in year on year out with the committee, uh, through the president, writing to the Minister of Finance, expressing their disapproval and dissatisfaction with not only the funding but the process of the determination of that funding, and yet um, nothing, uh, nothing changes except that it stays the same. And, uh, Mr Acting Deputy Chairman, the time it seems to me to have come where the Senate, through a committee of its own, ought to review the process of funding, not the level of funding, not the need for funding, not the need for resources, but the committee ought to start to examine the process used and the methods um, used to, uh, to determine funding uh, for the parliament itself. Because until such time as there is some autonomy, whatever the, whatever the constraints, until such, such time as there is some autonomy on the part of the Senate in its deliberations, the determinations, the level of funding, um, the Senate will, will not be able to function in the way it's, uh, it was uh, intended by our forefathers and by those contemporary serving within it. Senator <coughs> Bourne. Well, Mr Acting Deputy President. <laughs> um, and let me say, just before I start what I was going to talk about, that uh, something that I don't often say very often, which is that I very substantially agree with what uh, Senator Crichton Brown has just said about uh, Senate committees and Senate committee funding. Uh, and then, <laughs> yes, thank you, Senator Grodin. Uh, the, uh, the thing, though, that I did want to speak about is uh, one of the appropriations in uh, number f bill, appropriation bill number four, which is the seven million dollars uh, that is in this bill, which is going to go to uh, the, uh, in respect of the upgrading of New South Wales showground facilities, in order that they be handed over to uh, Mr. Rupert Murdoch. When $7 million could do an awful lot more, including helping Senate committee systems, I must say, but do an awful lot more to improve hospitals, roads, schools, it's almost beyond comprehension why the government wants to effectively give that money to an ex-Australian, not even a current Australian billionaire, to help him construct a profitable theme park, profitable for himself, on what should be, and still will remain, although it's leased, public land. The Democrats wrote to the government asking 15 very specific questions on why and how the money for the showground site would be spent. The reply we received gave none of the detailed explanation that we sought. We asked the same very specific questions in the Estimates Committee hearings. Neither the minister nor the department head were able to provide satisfactory detailed responses to those questions. We've asked additional questions of the Estimates Committee about the expenditure. But the committee staff, with the best will in the world, and they do have that, will not be able to furnish answers before mid-December. We're left with the government request to approve the expenditure of a large amount of taxpayers' money without adequate justification for doing so. 
And there are other good reasons why the money should not be appropriated, at least until the answers to our concerns and the public's concerns are fully answered. The details of the proposed studios raise serious concerns for the impact of the studio complex on the showground site and the surrounding area. Over a thousand cars will be introduced into an area which is already one of the most congested in Sydney. The studio complex will take over most of what is now public land in one of Sydney's most densely populated areas, indeed one of the most densely populated areas in Australia. The complex will attract hundreds of people to the site on a regular basis, creating as yet untested impacts on the local environment. The showground also contains important heritage structures and we still don't know what the fate of those is. Until the government has fully assessed all of the impacts of the studio complex on the area, we cannot, in conscience, support this appropriation. There are also concerns with the process as followed. The whole tender process for the showground site is now being investigated by the New South Wales Independent Commission Against Corruption. Further, a legal challenge against the New South Wales government also questions whether the allocation of the showground site was tainted by a conflict of interest by one of the Royal Agricultural Society's directors, as well as the legal right of the RAS to sign a lease with Fox Studios. The case also questions the legality of the New South Wales government's decision to use the state environmental planning policy process to rezone the showground site so it can be used for a studio complex. It would be totally wrong to appropriate that money until the concerns raised both by the ICAC inquiry and the legal action are resolved and the allocation processes are found to have been appropriate. There are also now real doubts as to the benefits of the Fox Studio complex. Premier Carr's promise of up to 6,000 jobs for the state is also looking a bit shaky in light of the statement by the Fox Studio's chief executive officer that the complex would create between 1,000 and 1,500 jobs, and of those, only between 550 and 700 jobs will actually be for the film industry. Indeed, if the Gold Coast film complex is any guide, the studios in the Gold Coast complex have yet to generate a profit. The theme park in the complex, however, is doing very nicely, thank you. And perhaps more tellingly, 70 to 80 per cent of the studio users at the Gold Coast operation is from overseas. So the promises of huge benefits the Fox Studio complex will deliver for the Australian film and television industry must be seriously questioned. In short, this $7 million appropriation amounts to a government request for money with no detailed list of expenditure after processes which are being questioned to undertake work which has neither been listed nor costed with potentially severe impacts on the site and the surrounding area which have not been assessed. I am very disappointed that the government would make such a request, and I am equally disappointed that the opposition intends to vote for it. Senator Alston was present at the estimates hearing and was as anxious as the Democrats to obtain detailed answers on why and how the $7 million would be spent. I can only ask why the opposition's concerns disappeared at some point between estimates hearings and this debate to the point where they support the appropriation, but are asking the government not to hand over the money until ICAC has reported positively. I can tell Senator Calvert, whose second reading amendment I'm speaking to, that the government will hand over the money. It doesn't matter what we tell them, they will hand over that money. As soon as it's appropriated, it's the government's to do with as they will. So the Democrats will not be voting for Senator Calvert's amendment. We agree with Part A and we agree with Part B, but we think the way that we can stop the government dispersing these monies until such time as all of this is resolved, is not to give it to them until that time. Senator Calvert. Thank you, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President. Well, I think it's rather fortuitous that I'm here to speak on this particular matter and the appropriations debate when I have, because I just follow on from what Senator Vaughan says, and it leads me into the, uh, to the uh, amendment that I'm moving on behalf of the opposition. And, um, as uh, Senator Bourne said, the Appropriation Bill No. 4 provides for a $7 million payment to the New South Wales Government for infrastructure costs uh, with the establishment of the Fox. He's supporting me, Senator Balthus. I mean, he's, just, he's just adding a bit of light and thunder to my, my otherwise dull speech. <laughs> uh, with the establishment of the Fox Film f uh, Studios at the Sydney showground site. And I can tell Senator Bourne and, and other senators here that. Uh, 
that I know is at Sydney Showground site, reads me well. Uh, as a former member of the uh, former president of the Royal Agricultural Society of Tasmania, I've spent a fair amount of time at the Sydney Showgrounds, uh, in some areas more than others, but, uh, mm. uh, <coughs> but I do know the difficulties, difficulties that were being experienced by, by uh, <coughs> uh, the showground, and, and, and you quite rightly pointed out the parking situation. But nevertheless, uh, over the years, one of the, it's, it's one of the biggest events, if not the biggest event in Sydney, over, the, over, over a continuing amount of time, the Sydney show, the Royal Easter Sydney show. Um, and uh, uh, that uh, facility has provided uh, great entertainment for the people of New South Wales and particularly the country people for many, many years. And I, I know for a fact that uh, many of the old show people, uh, exhibitors and, and, and grazers and, and, the, and the like, are very sad to be leaving that particular area. But it's something that's been around for a long time and I must say I'm very pleased to see that, uh, that, the, that the government is making available $25 million to, to help that happen uh, because the alternative was to upgrade the old facilities which were in some areas becoming past the stage of doing anything with. And, um, so I don't think anybody's got any argument with the fact that the show people in the showground is moving out to Homebush. I don't think the Democrats have got any problem with that. Certainly the Coalition haven't. And, and therefore we, we, we uh, support the appropriation of the $25 million to, towards the Royal Agricultural Society at Homebush Bay. And my very good friend Trevor Smith, who was the former, well I think he still is the President of the Royal Show Society of New South Wales and, and Jim Davison, who put so much of his life into the uh, um, into that showground. Colin Sanders, the director. I'm sure they'd all welcome the fact that they're moving out because they, what they can do now is is set up a show facility that that, that will take the Royal Agriculture, Agricultural Society of New South Wales into the year 2000 with facilities that will be second to none in Australia. And they can and it can custom build everything they want because at the present time there are certainly deficiencies in uh, a lot of areas out there. I had a feeling listening to uh, Senator Bourne that she may have been briefed by Clover Moore on this particular uh, yeah right on, on this particular matter because I know that it's a local issue that uh, because of some of the heritage buildings that they believe are on the showgrounds and uh, and uh, the facility it provides that. It is a matter of local concern, but given that, I mean, with all the changes that have been made because of the Olympic Games, and um, I think, you know, I don't think there's any doubt that it's generally supported the move eventually out to the Homebush Bay. The area of contention, of course, is the seven million dollar payment uh, for infra infrastructure costs associated with the establishment of the Fox Film Studios, and. Uh, I must say from the outset the Coalition has welcomed the decision by Rupert Murdoch to, to develop a film studio in Australia. In fact, the Leader of the Opposition said on the 9th of, uh, John Howard said on the 9th of um, November 1995 that the Coalition welcomes the fact that Mr Murdoch has decided to make such a major investment in Australia, not least because of the potential opportunities it's likely to open up for the independent production sector. But the reason that I'm moving this amendment um, is to draw attention to the fact that uh, there is an inquiry, and I will move it before uh, before I continue before I uh, finish my short speech. Uh, we know that the uh, uh, that the New South Wales Independent Commission Against Corruption is investigating certain aspects of the New South Wales car government's uh, dealings with Fox Studio. Uh, and they are concerned with certain matters in respect of the tender process, and Senator Bourne has already raised that matter. Um, and that's why that's the reason that we are moving this amendment. We don't believe that the federal government should disperse seven million dollars um, of taxpayers' money until the ICAT Commission has publicly confirmed that all processes associated with the, the dealings. Uh, between the New South Wales government and the Fox Studios uh, are found to be legal and correct. So um, I, I, I think uh, at this particular point in time, Mr Acting Deputy President, I, I would formally move the amendment in my name on behalf of the Coalition. 
Um, I, look, I look forward with great anticipation to visiting the new Agricultural Society headquarters at Homebush Bay. Um, I look forward to seeing some of the innovations that are planned. Uh, one of the things, and I had representatives of the Australian Showman's Guild in my office today, and, and I've had representatives from the Royal Cambridge Show Society in my office uh, uh, today also, talking about uh, where the showman's industry is going in the, in the late 1990s and in the year 2000. I mean, um, I believe that this, this opportunity that only happens once very rarely to custom build or custom build a an agricultural society complex where where you can um, provide all the facilities that you normally have for a showground plus you can custom build the entertainment areas and, and I, I happen to have been briefed on the way the Sydney Show Society or the Royal Agricultural Society in New South Wales are going to uh, are going to uh, promote the entertainment area of their showgrounds, the sideshow areas, the, the rides and all the rest of it. And, they, uh, and It's quite fascinating to see the way they are actually going to stipulate uh, the way they do this um, th and they're going to um, designate the types of rides they want, um, the quality of the rides they want, the quality of the, uh, of the eating house, the, 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 the joints as they're called so that the public will have the best facilities and the best uh, entertainment facilities. Now, uh, I believe they're going to put these into what they call precincts, so you'll be able to walk into a, an adrenaline where, where you, you go on the gravitons and, the, and, and all those things that make you feel sick in one area, and then you'll be able to go on to, uh, and into other areas where you can go on the, the milder rides, and then you can go into other areas. And, I mean, and it's going to set a trend for the rest of Australia in, in the next century. So I'll be looking with great interest at what happens at Homebush Bay, and I think the money that's being spent by the federal government on promoting that and helping that facility to move is, a, is, is very significant. But we do have concerns, as the Democrats do, about the $7 million, and that's why we're moving this amendment. So uh, for those few words, I formally move that amendment. Thank you. The question is, Senator Calvert's amendment be agreed to? Those in favour say... Oh, Minister. Sorry. Minister. Excuse me, just uh, waiting for my colleague Senator Cook to see if he would like to respond, but uh, as far as I'm concerned, Mr uh, Acting Deputy President, uh, I think we could probably put this to a vote unless Senator Cook uh, really wants to get into it. Mr Acting Deputy President, uh, the Parliament is debating appropriation bills uh, for, for this session. Uh, and that is to authorise the Minister for Finance to issue an additional of 5,760,570,000 dollars from the Consolidated Revenue Fund in addition to the funds allocated under the appropriations. Well, my notes haven't been updated. Oh, that, that, that would be right, in fact. Uh, yeah. uh, under the Appropriation Act No. 2, 1995-6, for the purpose of for proposed expenditure on capital works and services, payments to the states and territories and other services. And as been remarked, the, uh, these bills contain two matters, at least I understand, in fact, three matters now, that have attracted the attention of the senators uh, in an unusual way for appropriation bills. Usually at this point of the proceedings, it remains for me to congratulate all of the speakers in the debate, thank them for their contribution and, uh, and propose that the uh, Senate vote on the bills. Uh, at this stage, though, there appears to be amendments to uh, the bills forthcoming from senators relating to the Sydney showgrounds Fox Film Studios. The, uh, uh, issue of uh, Dr Carmen Lawrence's legal costs in relation to the Marks Royal Commission and, uh, as I heard but I'm not yet able to confirm, an amendment uh, possibly about uh, uh, Papua New Guinea. Mr President, uh, Acting Deputy President, appropriations debates are debates in which uh, it is not unusual for senators to 
talk in a wide-ranging manner about a whole range of issues. What's happened here today is no different from what has happened on a number of appropriation bills. That has been the nature of, an, of a number of the contributions. I don't propose to uh, deal with those now. I look forward to dealing with the amendments that uh, are foreshadowed, but I do commend to the Senate the appropriation bills and trust that the uh, Senate will pass them. Thank you. The question is, Senator Calvert's amendments on behalf of the coalition be agreed to. Those Senator Spindler. Sorry about that. Thank you, Mr. Acting Deputy President. The Democrats will not be supporting this uh, second reading amendment. Uh, we note the concerns that Senator Calvert has expressed about the expenditure of $7 million, but the amendment starts while supporting the appropriation in respect of the upgrading of the New South Wales showground facilities. Uh, and then expresses some concerns about uh, that it shouldn't be paid until ICAC uh, uh, has publicly confirmed that due process was observed. Uh, on, on this basis, we don't see much purpose in this particular second reading amendment, and the Democrats will be opposing it. I, I put uh, Senator Calvert's amendment. Those in favour say aye. Aye. Those against say no. Then the noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells.
Lock the doors. <clears throat> the question is that the amendment moved by Senator Calvert to the second reading of the Appropriation Bill No. 4 be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Calvert teller for the ayes and Senator Jones teller for the noes. There being 28 ayes and 30 noes, the question is resolved in the negative. The question now is that the bill be read a second time. Those that opinion say aye. Those against no. I think the ayes have it. The clerk. Appropriation Parliamentary Departments Bill No. 2, 1995-96. Appropriation Bill No. 3, 1995-96. Appropriation Bill No. 4, 1995-96. Would honourable senators please resume your seats or leave the chamber? Bill number four is at the wish of the committee that the bill be taken as a whole. There being no objection, it is so ordered. The question is that the bill stand as printed. Senator Spindler. Acting Deputy President. Sorry, Madam Chair. Um, I move amendment uh, standing in my name and numbered uh, 4098-2 uh, to appropriations bill number four. Uh, Madam Chair, that uh, amendment seeks to reduce the payment to Dr. Lawrence uh, for legal fees, first of all, to $495,095, then after deduction of $236,000, which is the expected payment from the West Australian Government, to the final amount of, of 259 thousand dollars two hundred and fifty nine thousand ninety five dollars uh, it will be necessary to make some comments on how the Democrats have arrived at this position uh, in the first instance uh, madam chair uh, we are adopting a somewhat different view from the opposition on the issue of dr. Lawrence's legal expenses we start from the premise that the Marx Royal Commission was an inappropriate use of executive power and that, in fact, 
it devalued the status of a royal commission uh, by using it solely for the purpose of discrediting a political opponent. Uh, I note that this position is also supported uh, by the uh, opinion provided by the clerk of the Senate uh, that uh, it is inappropriate for an executive uh, uh, in this way to create a situation where parliamentary privilege is attacked. We need to ask what wrongdoing was exposed by the Commission? What laws were exposed? What corruption was brought to the surface? What misuse of public funds was established? What recommendations for future development of public policy arose uh, out of the proceedings? These are the usual content of a report of a Royal Commission, but that was not why the Marx Royal Commission was established. In short, the $8 million spent by the West Australian Government on holding this commission uh, were a waste of taxpayers' money, of taxpayers in Western Australia, that is. The only, fun funding, the only finding of the commission was that the evidence appeared to suggest that Carmen Lawrence lied. But from the very minute that former Health Minister Keith Wilson first suggested her recollection as wrong, that imputation was already public, and it should have been left up to the public to decide if she lied or not. Although I must say that the Australian Democrats have always taken the view that it would, sa would have saved uh, a lot of uh, difficulty, a lot of expense, a lot of toing and froing, including the time of this chamber, uh, if Dr. Lawrence had said, well, I've made a mistake, uh, I'm sorry I did, uh, but there it is. Uh, and since she didn't, uh, it is also open to, to us to suggest, and we have taken the view, that it might have been better if Dr. Lawrence had resigned and if the political prestige and power of the Prime Minister had not been put uh, behind Dr. Lawrence to the extent of keeping her in her office uh, when all the evidence points to the uh, position that she did lie to Parliament, the State Parliament of WA, and carefully avoided to place herself in exactly the same position as far as Federal Parliament was concerned. The failure to do that, uh, we believe, has devalued uh, the uh, standards of parliamentary behaviour uh, and of ministerial probity. Whatever that, uh, uh, however that may finally be judged, Madam Chair, it does not affect the Australian Democrats' position uh, on the funding of Dr. Lawrence's legal expenses. We have taken the view, uh, previously set out in detail, uh, that Cabinet was in fact entitled to make the decision uh, to fund her legal costs. We extend that judgment also uh, to the challenges uh, that Dr. Lawrence undertook to the validity of the uh, inquiry. And we do that on the basis that uh, any citizen who finds herself or himself before a tribunal or a court is perfectly entitled, has the legal right, uh, to challenge the uh, constitutionality of the law and the jurisdiction of the, uh, the body, the court or tribunal, before which the citizen finds herself or himself. Uh, and to that extent, our position also differs from that uh, of the opposition. However, where we differ markedly from the government's position on this one is in the quantum uh, of the legal fees that is being uh, claimed, that was charged in the first place and is now being claimed by the government in these bills so that the uh, uh, expenses can be paid. Uh, we believe that uh, there is no evidence whatsoever that in its decision uh, Cabinet took any precautions to uh, set limits to the expenditure, uh, to in any way put a, a monitoring process in place, 
uh, to in any way control strategic decisions which inevitably had a result uh, as far as costs were concerned and were reflected in increased costs. And it is this somewhat uh, slipshot and cavalier treatment of expenditure out of the public purse for Dr. Carmen Lawrence that leads us to the position that we believe the Australian taxpayer, the Australian public, should not be expected to pay legal costs at these levels. We believe that any payment should be based on the West Australian Supreme Court scales, reduced further by 20% to arrive at the uh, level of expenditure which would be funded by legal aid if any Australian citizen found herself or himself before a tribunal and was seeking public assistance. I note in passing that the uh, fees that were charged uh, and uh, I'll take as an example uh, Mr. Giles QC, are at the very top of the range, $500 per hour up to $5,000 per day. These are not the sort of levels that would be available to citizens that were asking for public assistance through legal aid. And we believe, the Democrats believe, that uh, uh, the minister should not be in any different position than an ordinary citizen would be in this particular situation. On that basis then, Madam Chair, we have uh, first of all deducted $68,000 claimed for travel and accommodation expenses for the interstate legal team on the assumption that uh, there would have been plenty of legal talent to choose from in WA, which also happens, of course, to be the home state of Dr. Lawrence's. Uh, we have left in an amount that could be apportioned to the travel associated with the challenges because of necessity they uh, require travelling to Sydney. But after doing that, we have then measured the expenses and uh, we would have liked a little more detail, but uh, on the basis of the figures supplied, we have then applied, as I said, the West Australian Supreme Court scale rates and have for council fees, solicitors fees, uh, and agents fees and have deducted the further 20% to arrive at the legal aid levels. Um, we have then deducted 20% uh, only from the disbursements uh, to make a proportionate deduction. That uh, arrives at a figure of $495,095, uh, less the 236000 to be paid by the West Australian Government, and uh, thus we arrive at the figure of 259095 which uh, the Australian Democrats believe is a fair, just and reasonable figure. This is the figure that this particular amendment uh, is putting forward as a substitute figure in the relevant uh, places in the Appropriation Bill No. 4, and I commend this amendment to the Senate. Senator Spindler, have you spoken to all three of the amendments? You're dealing with them as a package. All, all three amendments uh, on the sheet, which is marked uh, 4098-2. Thank you. Senator Ellison. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I understand that um, uh, from what Senator Spindler said uh, just then, that we're only dealing with uh, uh, one, two, and three, uh, which is uh, dealing with Amendment 4098. Okay. Uh, might I just say that at the outset that um, the coalition uh, opposes this amendment and does so on the basis that it has itself an amendment to put forward in relation to the. Uh, the amount of or the sum in question. And uh, I'll just touch on what the coalition proposes. It proposes that um, the sum stay the same as mentioned in the bill, but that there be a definition in clause 3 capital A of the bill so that 
it's made quite clear that this money is only to be used for uh, any costs associated with Dr Lawrence's appearances before the Marks Royal Commission. Now, the coalition has taken the stand that uh, it uh, will support uh, the funding of uh, Dr Lawrence's fees in that regard, but only in that regard. Uh, Senator Spindler has gone into the, the minutiae, so to speak, of the actual funding itself and dealing with the figures at hand. Although this decision was very much uh, one which was ad hoc, on the run, and uh, I would submit without sufficient uh, consideration or legal advice, nonetheless it has been handed to the Senate as a fait accompli. And it does deal with uh, Dr Lawrence's representation before the Marks Royal Commission, which the WA government itself saw uh, was important enough to be uh, funded for it before or to have uh, Dr Lawrence legally assisted in that regard. Um, so that the, uh, the situation is that is very different to the challenges. The Commonwealth guidelines even allow for the funding of a minister who is acting as a defendant, but they make a distinction where the, per where the defendant is in fact a, a plaintiff. There is a difference between defending an action and initiating an, a an action. And uh, in this regard, that principle uh, has application because uh, Dr Lawrence was, uh, as it were, the, the defendant or the, uh, the, not the initiator of the Royal Commission, but certainly was the instigator of the, uh, the challenges in the Supreme and High Courts. Now, the, the detail that Senator Spindler has gone into really uh, puts us in the position of being a, somewhat like a taxing master, and that is where we have the bills before us. Uh, if you go to the Supreme Court or most courts, you, you can have your, uh, your bills taxed. In, in, this case, um, in this case, the Attorney General's Department has given evidence and estimates that it has uh, scrutinised these bills and that it has gone through the, the bills to make sure that they are fair and reasonable. Now, I am not happy about the situation that we are faced with that we're having this handed to us as a fait accompli, but nonetheless uh, bills have been incurred in the course of representation of a minister before a royal commission, and that at this stage it really is uh, unsatisfactory to be going through bills with a fine-tooth comb. Now, I previously said that we should have this degree of scrutiny, we should have this degree of, um, of thoroughness, but it is the responsibility for that lies squarely with the government. It is the government who has made this decision. It is the government who, who runs the Attorney General's department, not the Democrats, not the coalition. And, and it is our, our responsibility to, to ensure that uh, these fees are paid only for the purposes that we have agreed to. And we have agreed that the uh, funding go to representation before the Royal Commission. And that is why our amendment specifies that legal costs should be only in relation to uh, the Royal Commission and that it does not relate to any actions taken in any court uh, in relation to the Marks Royal Commission. So what I am saying is that to go through the bills individually at this stage um, is really too late and the, the responsibility for that lies with the government. I mean, The fact is this, that the solicitors concerned could well substantiate their bill to the, uh, to the amount in question. They could well co want to come before the Senate and justify their costs. By cutting the amount, I'm afraid we're doing that uh, without any, any recourse to the solicitor's concern to, uh, what, or to allow them any justification of their bill. Now, I think in the ordinary course of events, what should have happened is that there should have been clearer guidelines in place, and there's a Senate committee looking at that, as Senator Spindler knows, and I think that the guidelines that uh, the Commonwealth uh, has in place are insufficient. And I think there's lack of clar clarity and uh, uh, there's lack of transparency as to how uh, a minister's costs are met. But nonetheless, uh, we're faced with a situation where on the second last day of sitting, we have this put before us. And uh, it has been the coalition's view that uh, w there really is no alternative but to meet the costs for the representation before the, uh, the Marks Royal Commission. Now, in relation to 
uh, Senator Spindler's Amendment 4101, which deals with an amendment to Clause 3, capital A, I think there is merit in subsection 1, where, uh, in principle, Senator Spindler has set out that the payment um, should relate to uh, the legal costs of Dr Lawrence in relation to the Marks Royal Commission, remaining after deduction from those costs of any amount paid or payable by the Western Australian Government. And I think that that is, a, uh, in principle, a good amendment, because it makes it quite clear that there's no chance of any double dipping, there's no chance of any overlapping of costs, so that you have two governments paying for the, the same item of work. Um, with respect to the uh, subsections two and three, I believe the, the coalition uh, amendment, standing in my name, is to be preferred, to be preferred because I think that um, the uh, uh, subsection two and three are expressed perhaps uh, in a, in a way that is, uh, has a degree of e efficacy about it, in particular subsection 3. It says that uh, in this Act any reference, however expressed, to legal costs of Dr Lawrence in relation to the Marks Royal Commission does not include legal costs, however constituted. And I think that that, uh, that proviso really does make it clearer, however constituted, of Dr Lar Lawrence for uh, in relation to proceedings in a court in relation to the Marks Royal Commission. Well, proceedings in a court would relate to the two challenges in the Supreme Court and the one challenge in the High Court. Um, Senator Spindler's subsection 3 simply says that um, the reference to legal costs, and it's in, uh, emboldened there in relation to the Marks Royal Commission, and that's taken from that part of the bill which refers to the payment of Dr Lawrence's fees, um, does not include reference to legal costs of Dr Lawrence for or in relation to proceedings in a court in relation to the Marks Royal Commission. It's very close, but I don't think that it's expressed quite as widely as the coalition amendment. And uh, I think that um, the expression, however constituted, is to be preferred. That really leaves nothing uh, available which can slip under the, the door, so to speak, or. Uh, that can slip through, and so that I think that uh, really there could be a combination uh, here. And what I'm suggesting, perhaps, is that uh, should this amendment of uh, Senator Spindler's fail, that we move on to uh, the amendments standing in Sen Senator Spindler's name and mine. Um, I would suggest that mine be moved in parts, and that uh, we move them discreetly, so that you have. Uh, 3 capital A 1 uh, debated and dealt with then 3 A 2 and 3 accordingly. Um, and that, that is a, a suggestion I would make uh, to the chair in relation to the progress of this matter. But um, in relation to Senator Spindler's amendment, which is currently before the chair, the coalition is not minded to, uh, to support the amendment for the reasons I've mentioned. Senator Shamarit. Oh, sorry, I defer to Senator Spindler. Senator Spindler. If I could just uh, immediately respond. Um, uh, I'm, I'm open to the suggestion that was made about uh, our, our second amendment. Uh, I do think that uh, uh, my first subsection is better, uh, and I'm prepared to accept the, the argument on the other. So if we can use that procedure, uh, I'll, I'll be, be happy to go along with that. Um, I think it achieves the, the basic purpose of ensuring that there is no double dipping. Um, I uh, find uh, Senator Ellison's arguments, however, on uh, my amendment somewhat strange. He's trying to have it a bit uh, both ways. He's saying there is a responsibility on the part of the Senate to, uh, to scrutinize expenditure before it is paid uh, out of the public purse. But it is not our job to carefully look uh, at what we are, are being asked to pay. Now, uh, either we have that responsibility and we discharge it, and we look carefully at the, uh, the reasons that are being put forward, uh, and we look carefully at the rates. Now, while I said we might like to have a little bit further detail, uh, in actual fact, what we have here is adequate for the purpose to which we've put it, and that is that the bills have shown the actual rates charged, the rates per hour, the rates per day. 
And the rates per hour and the rates per day are, as I said, at the very top uh, of the range. And that is not uh, the sort of uh, scale that can be expected uh, to be paid for an ordinary Australian citizen. And the question simply is whether the minister should be in a different position. And uh, I, would, I would ask the uh, coalition to very seriously reconsider the position uh, that they appear to be adopting on that amendment because uh, it is soundly based, it is logical, uh, it is just and fair. It simply says that the rates that uh, have been charged are far too high, do not correspond with what an Australian, ordinary Australian citizen would uh, be able to obtain. Uh, we have two people here asking support uh, from the public for legal costs. I believe they should be treated equally. Senator Chamaret. Um, thank you, uh, Madam Chairman. I uh, um, indicate that I don't uh, support Senator Spindler's amendment uh, for obvious reasons because there's an amendment that has been circulated in my name that uh, rests on the principle that the payment hasn't been valid in any event. I, I won't speak to that until my amendment circulated, but I do want to ask the minister to clarify uh, the figures involved because uh, I, I've done several sums and I keep getting different totals all the time. And so my question to the minister is, uh, how much uh, was the total legal bill uh, to which the cabinet committed themselves for uh, Dr Lawrence's funding and what were the breakdown in terms of the defence cost, the challenge cost and the contribution of the West Australian government and has that West Australian contribution been paid already or has it been left out of the calculations on the basis that it will be paid or is it somehow included in that amount? So I'm actually asking for uh, four figures. Uh, one is the total cost of Dr Lawrence's legal funding uh, with the sub-items uh, of the defence cost, the challenge to the Commission cost and the contribution to the WA government and the information as to whether that's been provided or not. Senator Cook. Uh, Madam uh, Chairman. We are uh, embarking here, uh, first of all, on a procedure which is uh, unique and unusual. I think it is unique that we are modifying a, uh, an appropriations bill in a specific case because of legal costs incurred and, dare I say it, because of uh, uh, political points of view about the actual action rather than uh, so much about the costs. Now, Madam. Uh, Chairman, these legal costs are high and the, the, the amount of these legal costs have been brandished around in the media as being high in order to attract spectacular attention in the community on the basis that, uh, uh, that somehow uh, this is a bad thing that Carmen Lawrence is doing, incurring these legal costs. Look at the amounts. Aren't they high? Well, the amount of the legal costs is not a comment on Dr Lawrence. Dr Lawrence was doing nothing more than wanting to defend her interests before a Royal Commission that uh, set out to put her in the position of a defendant and to, uh, to destabilise, undermine and discredit her as a public figure. That's what happened. The costs of doing that are high. That's a reflection on the legal system and the level of legal costs, not on Dr Lawrence. Yet somehow or other, Dr Lawrence seem, seemingly is being held to be in disrepute for incurring such an amount. I think what the Senate ought to direct its attention to is where is the wrong in the first place? In the first place, the wrong is with those who visited this Royal Commission on her. And in that, in, that, in that respect, in that respect I, I acknowledge uh, what Senator Spindler has said about this Royal Commission. 
And he has canvassed its merits, its canvassed it, or its lack of merits, the processes that it uh, undertook, its findings. He has expressed his perceptions of what proper conduct might be ethically and politically. And, uh, and he's gone on to, to question the legal costs. What he has told us, as the mover of this amendment, is that the Democrats effectively, uh, in large part, support the government's position about this. The Democrats demur on some elements of Dr Lawrence's conduct in terms of whether she should have stood down or not since she was under a challenge of some sort, and uh, they seem to assume that she had something to clear up. And if she'd cleared that up at the beginning of this process, well, maybe the process wouldn't have gone on. Well, they are presumptions. They're not presumptions that the government has. They're presumptions that the, Democrat has, the Democrats have. But I note and do welcome the, uh, the views of the Australian Democrats about the pernicious nature of this Royal Commission, the manner of its conduct and its treatment of Dr Lawrence. However, uh, given those sentiments expressed by the Australian Democrats, I think this amendment then sits quite oddly. And uh, this amendment uh, goes on to argue that the amount is too high and that the amount should be at the level of legal aid. I submit that that's a superficial argument. It's not true uh, in, in the eyes of even the Western Australian government, the Western Australian government who mounted this Royal Commission against Dr Lawrence. They have not applied this test in the settling of their fees to the extent that they have reimbursed her. So it's not a test, if you like, that those that set out to get her political scalp applied when it came to assessing legal fees. And there is at least uh, a reason for that, and that is that uh, ministers of the Crown, in their accountability to the Australian community, bear, I believe, a far greater responsibility and a far deeper accountability than ordinary citizens do. They are entrusted with high office, they're reposed with uh, major responsibilities, they are in the public spotlight, their conduct is and expected to be at an elevated level. And when they're under challenge, uh, it is reasonable to say that they ought to attract the, uh, the uh, best legal defence that they can, they can have. And that legal defence comes at commercial rates. What we know of this legal defence and its costs is that uh, evidence has been given to a committee of this parliament that these legal costs are fair, that these legal costs represent the true costs incurred, that le these legal costs are uh, within the commercial rates that apply. And that's the true measure of what the level of costs should be. Now, when you apply that measure, sure, you come up with a stunningly large figure. But again, I, I point to this fact. Here is Dr Lawrence defending herself against a Royal Commission, attacking her and set up for that purpose. And she is entitled to a quality defence. That's a basic right here. And given the higher uh, responsibility she bears, it's an important right that she be properly defended. And uh, the level of the amount of cost is not her fault. It is the cost of, uh, of uh, justice, uh, if that be the description, uh, uh, in a case like this. So to the first point that the Australian Democrats have raised about comparing it to legal aid, can I say that I don't think it's true in terms of the public responsibility and accountability that goes to a minister. And indeed, even the Western Australian government have not applied that level. And I would suggest, Senator Spindler, that might be a compelling argument to rethink. But more importantly, uh, perhaps than that, uh, Senator Spindler has raised a second uh, argument in this case. And that is that uh, uh, the choice of an argument that goes to choice of counsel, or at least geographical location of counsel, that Dr Lawrence should have found a lawyer in Perth to defend her in a proceeding being conducted in Perth. Well, let's look at that uh, proposition for a minute. Commissioner Marks is a resident of Melbourne and was, recu was recru recruited by the Western Australian Government to conduct this Royal Commission after a national survey to find someone whom they could uh, co-opt in order to do that job. They looked nationally and, and obtained what they thought was the best person in Commissioner Marks, and they got him not from Perth, but they got him from Melbourne. Moreover, when they looked for uh, a person to be the counsel assisting the Commission, 
they uh, recruited, uh, I, I must say, I forget her Christian name, but uh, Vanstone QC. I apologise for omitting her Christian name. And she is not a resident of Perth. She is a resident of Adelaide. And they obviously looked nationally in order to find a fitting person to be council assisting, and they chose a resident of Adelaide. Now, in the face of these facts, uh, what's, what Senator Spindler is saying, notwithstanding that, that uh, Dr Lawrence should have found a lawyer from Perth. Well, I'm also a resident of Perth when I'm not uh, living in Canberra. And might I say that uh, uh, most lawyers in Perth, at one time or another, have been associated with uh, Royal Commissions in the first instance mounted by Dr Lawrence into what is styled WA Inc. and, uh, and subsequent events. I think it's entirely appropriate that fresh blood should be considered uh, in order that someone could appear before this commission to defend Dr Lawrence's legitimate interests. And uh, you wouldn't find fresh blood among the legal fraternity in Perth with the greatest of respect to them, and I admire several of the practitioners uh, in that community. All of them have had their hands on this sort of case at some time or other. So uh, to the second argument, that she should have uh, picked up someone on the local scene, I think that the circumstances, with greatest respect to Senator Spindler, uh, aren't appropriate here either. And that's another reason for perhaps uh, inviting you to reconsider. Now, the, uh, the uh, final point I make, uh, uh, Madam Chairman, is this. Uh, Senator uh, Allison, uh, has uh, posted an amendment, and uh, understandably and quite reasonably, and I don't, uh, I don't criticise it, when he was speaking to your amendment, uh, Senator Spindler, he uh, did so by promoting his own and sought across the chamber to uh, invite you into uh, a joint effort by him and uh, to prefer what he would call the greater merit of his to yours in uh, achieving an outcome. Well. Uh, I don't think the uh, Senator Ellison amendment is an appropriate amendment either, and nor do I think it goes to the actual point that you wish to raise here. For I understand that point to be uh, your conception of a, of a principle about legal aid being the ruling determinant as to the level of payment, and uh, secondly, an insistence and a reasonable insistence in my view, and one that I don't uh, disagree with you about, that there should be no double dipping. I think what, uh, the quality of uh, what Senator Ellison is going to is another matter again. Uh, so I don't see, to me at least, speaking on behalf of the government, and I of course have a vested interest in this, but on the plain facts of the circumstance, it doesn't seem that you have a coincidence of, in of interests uh, with the, uh, with the uh, coalition either. But uh, Senator Ellison, in, um, in expressing his views, which he did in a uh, quite persuasive manner, as he normally does, uh, let slip let slip uh, an observation which I think is indeed revealing. And that observation was uh, to say that in, the, in the, these sorts of proceedings that, uh, that Carmen Lawrence had to face up to, uh, she was in the nature of a defendant. And I think the Hansard would show that the words defendant were used. Well, of course, in a Royal Commission there is no such thing as a defendant. It's been the government's uh, uh, argument that uh, Carmen Lawrence has been cast in the role of a defendant, and I think Senator Ellison is quite right in calling her a defendant, because that was indeed the nature of the proceedings. She was made to be a defendant. When a Royal Commission is supposed to be there to discover the facts, she was put in the dock as uh, someone on trial about her probity. And uh, the proceedings, to the government's mind, did not follow the processes of inquiry, but rather they followed the processes of a prosecutorial a process as if there were a trial. I, uh, I don't know whether Senator Ellison reflects the views of the coalition in this, because this is the point the government has been making all along. But it is revealing uh, that uh, he should use that term in relation to this matter. Madam Chairman, this is a sorry story. This whole story is a sorry story. The government believes it should never have occurred. The uh, eight, eight million dollars or so that it's cost Western Australian taxpayers for this Royal Commission is a travesty and an outrage, and it should never have occurred. But because it did, there are costs of justice and costs of justice for uh, significant public figures in terms of their national accountability too. 
The Western Australian government doesn't argue that that should be at commercial rates because that's the level that they've tested this in. But uh, these figures are high. But let us not fall into the populist trap of saying these figures are high, it's outrageous that they should be paid. What is outrageous is that this matter occurred at all. That's what's outrageous. And in the, and in the government's submission, Order. Uh, in, Order. The, in the government's submission, Order, uh, Madam Chairman, uh, I would have to say, uh, Senator, uh, Senator, Senator, Spin well, can I just say that the interjection? We've debated that whole issue. I don't intend to debate it tonight again. But, uh, but uh, just to simply stick with a statement of our uh, of our position. Uh, I think that you ought to give pause and consider withdrawing your amendment, but if you don't, uh, my position will be to vote against it. Senator Spindler. Thank you, Madam Chair. Could I ask the minister whether the government uh, or cabinet, in making the decision to fund the costs, uh, considered the levels uh, at which the, uh, uh, the charges for legal costs should be made? Uh, was the government consulted about the, uh, uh, where the council uh, was coming from or who it should be? Did the government put into place uh, any monitoring devices as to costs? And was the government at any stage during the proceedings of the, case of the, uh, the proceedings before the commission uh, consulted about strategic decisions? which inevitably would result in a variation in costs. In other words, how close a control did the government keep on the costs of this case? Senator Cook. Well, this raises a, an important consideration for the government. The government wasn't uh, on trial here. Uh, Dr Lawrence was. And the government made a determination to uh, meet the reasonable legal costs for her defence. Uh, but they left the selection of counsel to the person who was the subject of the Royal Commission, that is Dr Lawrence. Uh, we didn't uh, intervene and decide on behalf of Dr Lawrence what we believed to be her best interest. We thought the appropriate thing was that Dr Lawrence, as the victim of these proceedings, should decide that, and she made the selection of counsel, not the government. And, uh, and of course, uh, it, it was for her to decide uh, on instructions to her counsel how her defence was best to be mounted. It wasn't for us to uh, intervene in choosing how best to defend uh, her interests. And indeed, um, uh, it may well be, on, on at least one view, that we're not in a position to have made those choices anyway had we been of a mind to, because uh, the corporate knowledge of this, these circumstances were, was knowledge uh, peculiar to Dr Lawrence and her experience. So to answer those questions, no, we didn't, we didn't cap off these fees. We didn't say, we're prepared to support you in order to uh, protect your interest and ensure that you are justly treated, but only to the level of X. And if it costs more, well, then we depart from the principle. We didn't say that. We didn't say, uh, Dr Lawrence, uh, you will only have this council or that council. We said, Dr Lawrence, you're uh, under attack. You select the best person that you feel confidence in protecting your interest. And in terms of monitoring that, uh, we didn't put uh, restraints and conditions upon, upon it. What we would have liked to have done, I might say, but we weren't in a position to do, is put restraints and limits on the actual Royal Commission itself. Senator Shamrat. Uh, could I just... Could I just ask uh, Senator Reid, so I understand, how you are judging who you call next? I, don't, I ask that quite frankly on the basis that I don't seem to get a very good call when you're in the chair. That's unfortunate, but I was going to call Senator Shamaret now and then you next. Senator Shamaret. Thank you. And uh, Senator Crichton Brown, I should explain that I rose at the same time as Senator Spindler. I got the call and I deferred to Senator Spindler. And so I am assuming that the chair has been quite fair in giving me the call ahead of you. You weren't in the chamber when that happened. She, she, okay, that's fine. But I, I thank the chair, uh, Madam Chairman, for, for giving me the uh, call because I, I rose at the same time as Senator Spindler rose because the minister hasn't answered the question I asked him, and I'm just wondering whether he's planning to do that um, because uh, if. Uh, um, 
I just want to reiterate, and perhaps in a more logical fashion, I would like to know what has the West Australian government given to date, and I'm trying to work out in that way the uh, the three amounts that I asked for in my previous question. Senator Cook. Thank you, uh, Madam Chairman. Yes, I, I did hear your question, uh, Senator Shamaret, and I haven't uh, avoided it. Uh, I just can't find the document in which, in which no, I, well, I didn't answer it because I couldn't answer it uh, truthfully because I didn't have the document in front of me in which, the, in which the information is contained. And I, I can't find it among my papers now, but uh, it's my understanding that uh, uh, in answer to an inquiry, I think from Senator Spindler to the Minister for Finance, some details of this matter was given, and uh, it was that document that I was going to table. But I've just sent for it, and I'll table it at the earliest convenience as soon as we can get hold of it, which I hope will only be a minute or two. Senator Crichton Brown. Thank you, Senator Reid. Uh, could I um, just say that I, uh, much as I'm very fond of most of those on this side of the chamber. I find something vaguely bizarre about what they accept as, as public funds to be provided to, to uh, Mrs Lawrence and those uh, which they, they don't. But before I get on to that, can I say this in terms of this commission? And uh, Senator Cook has had something to say about the commission as well as the funding for it in terms uh, of relevance. I have to say that I, I thought the Commission was, was totally and utterly justified. I do believe that uh, the Minister for Health, the then Premier, indulged herself in a petition which Mr Halden was in large part the architect of for the purpose of deflecting from her own difficulties, including a police investigation into her use of public funds, uh, uh, um, allegedly for travel, but for a trip she didn't take, but the funds of which rested comfortably in her account for a very long time and were only refunded when the police brought it to her attention. Uh, but I have to say that I've got no time for Mr Haldon, uh, and um, it gives me it, <clears throat> it, it's no shock to me that he's involved in this matter, because he tabled in the State Upper House a document which claimed that I was anti-Semitic. It was a document which was a fabrication and a creation of somebody sitting behind a computer, uh, which I thought was perhaps the most despicable sort of, a, sort of uh, concoction one could have. But then Mr Haldon promptly tabled it in the, in the State Parliament with my name and initials at the bottom of it. I do believe um, many uh, my, uh, many uh, may disagree. I do believe, and uh, anybody that's uh, read uh, Penny Easton's suicide note will understand why I say this, that she did ultimately commit suicide or she was led to a death as a result of circumstances surrounding the, um, the petition and the way it was dealt with. Can I say that I, I find the, the, the coalition's attitude um, at odds with my own for these reasons, when I say slightly bizarre. Recently, Mr Ian Cameron, the member for Stirling, published, or had published in the West Australian newspaper at least, that he was seeking from Mr Walker, the Minister, the Minister for Administrative Services, part of the cost of his legal fees, which he claims amounted to $5,000, when he was inquired into by the Australian Federal Police as a result of a complaint that came from me stemming from blackmail which was being received by me. The Australian Federal Police found that, in fact, the blackmail had been transmitted from the facsimile machine provided to Mr Cameron by the, by the taxpayer of Australia in his electorate office. They also found a dirt sheet on his computer. They also established that two copies of those dirt sheets were faxed from his office to the President of the Senate, Senator Behan, and to the Minister for Primary Industry, Senator Collins. They also found large quantities of an unprocessed restraining order from my wife in vivid colours, which was reproduced and redistributed by Mr Cameron, provided to him, provided to him 
by Mr Viner QC, whom my wife had consulted as a lawyer. A friendly lawyer, she thought. Now, I won't go into the detail as to how he improperly acquired that or the fact that the person who, who gave it to him is now subject to a charge under the Public Service Act of WA or the fact that Mr Viner then rummaged through the file when the clerk uh, left the file accidentally or by design on the desk and then provided further information, which was the construction of a dirt sheet subsequently, subsequently typed up in the computer of Mr Cameron. But I find it odd that, that the Liberal Party has not disowned itself from Mr Cameron's suggestion that the taxpayers owe him a large part of his $5,000 as a result of activities which led them to execute a search warrant on his office. And when I first made the complaint, I must say I didn't make a complaint about Mr Cameron because he wasn't my first choice. I must say that the Australian Federal Police made it quite clear to me, and I think I almost used exact words when I, when I say it this way, Senator Crichton Brown, these days to get a search warrant, not the least on a federal member of parliament, re almost requires, almost requires the, uh, the grounds which will lead, lead to a conviction. Now they, they obtained, in the most stringent circumstances, a search warrant of his premises. And the federal police do not seek these search warrants easily, and nor are they granted easily by those who have to sign off on them. And the fact that the Australian Federal Police then sent up a brief to the, to the DPP looking for a prosecution, which couldn't succeed because it couldn't ultimately establish who pressed the button, although I suppose it's not unreasonable to suggest that a burglar broke in and pressed the button and sent it off and uh, nobody in Mr Cameron's office would know about it. But I, I find no, no suggestion by the opposition that they have any objection to Mr Cameron seeking taxpayers' funds to, to uh, reimburse him because he suddenly decided he needed legal advice. Now, I've got to say uh, that uh, if, for instance, the Federal Police visited my office for, the warrant, uh, for a warrant to, of search because it had been suggested, for instance, that I had been sending black veil to Senator Cook, I'd hand them my keys, go down the pub and say, ring me when you're finished. The last thing I'd do is waste money ringing up and engaging a lawyer. Unless, of course, I was visited by some anxiety and some doubt as to what they might find. Then I'd be ringing up Malcolm McCusker QC. But we have a circumstance here where, where a Royal Commission is set up, as I say in my view, very legitimately, and yet, as I understand it, the funding that has been severed was funding that goes to the question of, for instance, privilege. Now, I remember an occasion following the—and I haven't had time to research this—but my memory is that following, following the what was known, I think, as the euphemistically described, at least, as the Murphy Committee, of which Senator Tate, the, subsequently the Minister for Justice and now the Ambassador Hay, chaired, certain, certain evidence provided to that committee was raised and allowed as admissible evidence, in, I think, in the New South Wales Supreme Court. The then President, Senator Sybra, joined the action and, on behalf of the Senate, made certain representations in respect to privilege. Now, I could uh, get into some dispute, I suppose, as to whether or not it's a question for the Hon. Clive Griffiths, MLC, the President of the Legislative Council of Western Australia, or Senator Behan, the President of the Senate, or, perhaps more particularly, the Speaker of the House of Representatives. But I've held the view, long held the view, that when matters of privilege and, and, and matters of similar nature are raised in jurisdictions, the, presiding, the appropriate presiding officers have an obligation and responsibility to ensure that the proper interests 
of the parliament are represented. And if it's the view of the parliament, as articulated and reflected through the presiding officers, there should be council engaged. Now, if you were going to argue about what funding you provided to, to uh, the present Minister for Health, I would have thought you might have had some dispute about the level of funding for her legal fees before, before the Royal Commission, not the question of justicability or jurisdiction or the, question, the general question of privilege. But for some quaint reason, of course, of which I'm not likely to be informed, the coalition has taken the view that we just chop off certain funding, and I think they've chopped off, they've chopped off the wrong funding. If, you, if we were having a debate tonight about, about other funding, I'd find myself probably in a different circumstance. And I have to say, I, it's, it's, it's my view, if we're going to argue about the level of funding, that given the seriousness of the matter, the political, moral and personal circumstances which will be visited upon Senator, uh, um, um, uh, Mrs Lawrence, she's entitled to seek, at the very least, quality representation. And in my future litigation, I've got to tell you that I won't be getting the poorest or the cheapest counsel. I'll be getting counsel that can represent me in a way which provides me with the best opportunity of prosecuting my case. And I think it's not unreasonable in the circumstances that the same opportunity be, be allowed of, of um, the, minister, uh, the Minister for, um, for Health. And so uh, I find, my, find myself, as one of my colleagues says, in a dilemma um, uh, about, this, uh, about the uh, approach that the coalition has taken uh, uh, to this matter. Uh, but I, I would have felt much more comfortable if I'd heard the coalition say, we disassociate ourselves from Mr Cameron because he's asking for taxpayers' funds as a result of an investigation over very serious criminal matters, including Section 28 of the Commonwealth Crimes Act, which with, I think, Section 85Z carries a jail term of three years, a very serious criminal matter. If they'd said, that's his bag, that's his lot, and if he's, been, if he's got had a warrant executed upon him, presumably the Commonwealth Police are conducting themselves in a way which they're expected to, and the public are entitled to have them so do, then I would, I would have more sympathy to the view being put. But it's not an argument uh, that I've, uh, I've heard put, and to my knowledge, um, to my knowledge, and I might be wrong, he might have uh, locked himself in the loo as, as want from time to time of those who don't have the courage to make a decision, Mr Cameron uh, might well have voted against the proposal that the funding not proceed. My understanding is that Mr Cameron's attitude is that he should get the money that Dr Lawrence shouldn't. And I find, that, I, find that, I find the logic and the morality and the integrity that uh, uh, kind of quaint in my own sort of humble, inarticulate uh, way. Uh, but um, I have to say, more importantly, I, I believe that the presiding officers, to the extent that this matter visits them and visits the parliament and members of it, ought to be looking at this whole question of privilege. And when, when members of parliament's rights or the public's rights or the responsibilities of the chamber are before the courts, there's something to be said for making sure that the parliament has representation there to articulate and argue the views of the chamber. We, as I understand it, are being asked to support a proposal that makes sure that we don't provide funding for that very reason. And I must say uh, uh, that I find that, for my part at least, uh, Madam Chairman, uh, uh, vaguely curious. We deal with amendments to the Appropriations Bill No. 4, moved by Senator Spindler. Um, Senator Ellison? Just briefly, uh, Madam Deputy Chair, I just want to reply to the comments made by uh, the Minister in relation to my description of uh, Dr Lawrence before the Royal Commission. The, the law as it stands has plaintiffs and defendants. 
uh, and it has. Uh, you'll notice I didn't use the the uh, the word accused or in the nature of an accused. But when one is in a, involved in a royal commission or a coroner's inquest or any administrative inquiry, you're not in the you're not in the role of a plaintiff, certainly, but you are more in the role of a defendant. Defendant is a clumsy term in, in, uh, in relation to that, but nonetheless it is the nearest that the law can get in describing the person's position. I suppose you could say that Dr Lawrence is a person who is affected by the Royal Commission. The Premier of Western Australia, Richard Court, is a person who could be said to be affected by the Royal Commission and, of course, uh, entitled to representation before the Royal Commission. Similarly, in the Royal Commission into WA Inc., people who appeared without charges laid against them or without, uh, without wearing the tag defendant were given represent representation because of the possibility of an adverse inference. And you do that in a very general sense. And so that my description in the nature of a defendant, I believe, is, is the best that the law can offer in describing a person who has to front up or is involved in a royal commission. And certainly I was using that to distinguish uh, Dr Lawrence from being in the role of a plaintiff. And that was taken in the context of the Commonwealth's guidelines, which say you fund a minister if they're a defendant, but you don't if they're a plaintiff. Senator Cook. Thank you, uh, Madam Chairman. Uh, Senator, uh, Marge, uh, sorry, Senator Chamaret uh, asked me a question earlier in, uh, in the committee stages. Uh, what I have here, and uh, uh, I've only got one copy of it, but I'm happy to table it, uh, is a letter from the Attorney General to Senator Barney Cooney as Chair of the Senate Legal and Constitutional Legislation Committee, uh, headed uh, Additional Estimates dash Details of Dr Lawrence's Legal Bills. And did I say from the Attorney General? I correct that. It isn't from the Attorney General, it is from the Attorney General's department, and it is from the Secretary of that department, uh, Mr Steve Skihill, and it's signed. Uh, for him. Attached to that letter is a document headed Western Australian Royal Commission into Eastern Petition, details of the Honourable Dr Carmen Lawrence MP's legal costs to the 20th of October 1995. Those words are familiar to me because I just saw them on a document that Senator Shamaret and I were discussing a moment ago. And this document, uh, might I say, appears in every respect to be the same as the document we were both looking at jointly, uh, Senator Chamaret. Uh, I'll table this so it'll be uh, available uh, in the records of this debate, but uh, if I can quote from it for the, for the moment, uh, it starts with uh, paragraph numbered one. The Commonwealth has received six bills from Dr Lawrence's solicitors, in brackets, Dunhill, Madden, Butler, close of brackets, for work both in relation to the Royal Commission and in relation to Dr Lawrence's challenges to the Royal Commission. That's to the Commission and the challenges to it. The total of the bills is $856,000.21 for work up to the 20th of October 1995. This figure includes, the word includes is underlined to emphasise it, this figure includes the amount of $236,020 claimed by Dr Lawrence from the Western Australian Government in relation to the Royal Commission. Thus, the net amount claimed from the government to date is $619,980,021, and, and then it, then it encloses a table. The breakdown of the six bills is as follows. Now, Madam Chairman, the uh, one other comment I make about uh, these figures is referring to the amount of 236000 and $20 claimed by Dr Lawrence from the Western Australian Government in relation to the Royal Commission. Uh, I am not aware of whether or not the West, Western Australian Government has acknowledged that and is committed to paying it. Uh, at, but that, all I can say to the Senate is that is what uh, Dr Lawrence is claiming from them, as I understand it, given the indications of what they will meet as legal costs that they have already offered. But at this stage, I'm not able to advise anyone because I don't know uh, what, the, what the outcome of that 
uh, and whether it's been accepted by the Western Australian Government or not is. The question is that the amendments moved by Senator Spindler be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. I think the noes have it. Um, amendments to be moved by Senator Shamaret. Um, do you wish them to be moved together? Yes, I seek leave to uh, move the, uh, my amendments, the, the three amendments Senate, together. The three amendments be dealt with together. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Shamaret. I'm uh, actually doing this amendment in honour of St Jude, who's the patron saint of lost causes. Um, only to put on the record a matter of principle, and I, I know in advance that there isn't support for this in the chamber, but I do think it's important to exert a principle. The Greens have consistently, maybe the Greens should adopt St Jude as our patron saint. We live in hope, though. The Greens have consistently opposed the payment of Dr Lawrence's legal costs because we believe there's no precedent, legislative basis, and arguably no constitutional grounds for making such a payment. We have never criticised Dr Lawrence uh, on that account because we have acknowledged, and, and I've acknowledged it before in this place, that we believe the Marx Royal Commission was a disgraceful political exercise. We believe it was a misuse of executive power by the state government, relying upon information provided by Dr Lawrence's own adversaries within her own party. Nevertheless, we also believe that the federal government's plan to use public funds to defend this political attack is a further wrong which doesn't make a right. If we make this payment, where does it end? We are throwing the coffers of the Commonwealth open to parliamentarians for their unfettered use, or ministers perhaps. I feel it would be hard to argue that this is the intention of the Constitution. The Coalition was initially very concerned about the payments of these costs, and I believe the Democrats also, and I think Senator Spindler has referred to it. It appears that their resolve has weakened, and uh, an arrangement has now been made, or a deal been done, if you want to put it in harder terms, in the other place, to pay the defence portion of the legal costs. And I'm, I would be interested to hear the reasons for that position, and no doubt this will occur um, later on when the opposition support the amount that they are prepared to contribute towards Dr Lawrence's legal costs. The Democrats have put forward a proposition that costs should only be paid at the level of legal aid. If we believed that the payment of the costs were valid in the first place, then possibly we would, be, would have been supportive of such a move. Although it's interesting to note that there has been no attempt to cap Mr Griffith's costs to the legal aid level in Appropriations Bill No. 3. The Democrats' amendment helps us to see the level of privilege that's operating in this case, and it shows that there's one law for the wealthy and powerful uh, and one for all other Australians who must rely on legal aid funding or their own resources. It hasn't been easy to maintain a firm stance on what the Greens see as a very important principle that has to do with Cabinet and executive decision-making being imposed upon the parliament, being regarded as a fait accompli, and uh, various attempts being made to force uh, uh, political parties perhaps in fear of uh, some kind of political repercussions, to actually uh, support the expenditure. And uh, again, as I said, it hasn't been easy because uh, personally I haven't wished to identify myself with the kind of slurs and attacks that have been made on Dr Lawrence. Uh, I uh, have on times been uh, cast in the role of as a West Australian woman uh, against a West Australian woman, and I find it offensive. Um, it has also been reported that we have no sympathy for the financial burden Dr Lawrence may have to bear if these costs are not covered, and this is unfair. The arguments have been rolled out in an attempt to obscure the questions that lie at the heart of this matter, which is the reasons why we are placing this amendment. Should the parliament establish a precedent that the Commonwealth purse, the taxpayers' purse, fund the constant slanging match between the political parties? Should we perpetuate the adversarial nature of the political culture? 
Should we ignore that these sleazy episodes in our political history are a product of a valueless and self-serving system? Should we ignore the warnings about the very constitutionality of making such a payment? Once again, the self-serving interests of all involved have been glossed over. For the Coalition's part, the establishment of the Commission and the harassment of Dr Lawrence in the Parliament and the media furthered their agenda to damage the government in the lead-up to an election. The government, in turn, has sought to cast the Coalition as the evil villains conducting a hate campaign against the Minister in the skirmish to gain the political advantage both truth and justice have been eclipsed. But throughout this sordid process, it remains clear that there is still no basis for the parliament to make this payment. I firmly believe that the Labor Party, and in particular the cabinet, have a responsibility in this matter. The Labor Party cannot be surprised that its own avidly used political tactics have come home to roost. And so long as the adversarial two-party system is maintained, these incidents will continue. The Cabinet, for their part, did a grave disservice to Dr Lawrence by leading her to believe that she would have a blank cheque for her legal costs. This is in spite of the fact that they had no authority to make such a commitment and repeatedly refused to produce any evidence that they had sought legal advice as to whether she would li be likely to be successful legal advice as to the constitutionality of the allocation or even any uh, legitimisation of this appropriation amount. They weren't even going to have it as a one-line item in an appropriations account uh, until the findings of the committee that's been looking at this matter uh, brought it to very sharp relief that they had no possibility of gaining anything if they didn't at least submit to the parliament for the use of taxpayers' money. It has almost passed from memory now, but the Senate Legal and Constitutional Affairs Committee are still considering what guidelines and conditions should exist to ensure the legality and propriety of any use of public funds to pay the legal costs of members of parliament and ministers. And I hope that this at least will be a positive outcome to this disgraceful affair. These guidelines will hopefully prevent this from happening again. And it may then be that the com community can have some measure of faith that the purse of the Commonwealth, the taxpayers' purse, will not be thrown open to parliamentarians for their unfettered use. And it is for that reason that I move the amendments that have been circulated in my name. Senator Ellison. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, the Coalition, for reasons I think I've outlined previously, uh, will oppose this amendment. Uh, and uh, prefer the other amendments that I've mentioned previously. I might just say that I do note Senator Shamaret's comment that, uh, that the way the government went about this was questionable in, in a constitutional and legal sense, and that the Senate Legal and Constitutional References Committee indeed recommended that there be a single line of appropri appropriation. And uh, I think that that was the uh, correct method to uh, employ in this instance. And uh, uh, on that basis, uh, the manner that the government has adopted is legitimate. Uh, I might just say to uh, Senator Shamaret, uh, who said that she ought to pray to St Jude for lost causes, my mother always said, if you lost something, pray to St Anthony. Senator Spindler. Thank you, Madam Chair. There are a couple of things I need to say in response to the statements made by Senator Shamaret. Uh, in a number of cases, she seemed to be bracketing the Democrats together with the coalition as having changed their minds. Uh, we have never changed our minds. We have uh, from the very outset said uh, that it is our view uh, that uh, a cabinet was in principle entitled and correct uh, in making a commitment to legal costs on the, ba on the very simple basis that uh, Dr. Lawrence, had she been Dr. Lawrence's private citizen, uh, would not have had the uh, Royal Commission, the Marx Royal Commission established, and that uh, in substance uh, it is open to, uh, it was open to the Cabinet uh, to extend the definition of, uh, in the course of her duties to this particular situation. That is on, on record, has always been on record from, uh, from the beginning, as has uh, our criticism of the government's. Uh, manner in which the decision was made and the lack of uh, uh, uh,
care in uh, uh, containing the quantum of costs uh, in this particular situation. Senator Cook. The uh, government opposes this amendment uh, quite obviously. I, uh, I've always been mystified as to why the Greens would uh, want to move this amendment. They've uh, canvassed their views publicly uh, a lot, but I've never actually uh, seen them set out very clearly what they uh, argue are the grounds for not for a government not defending one of its ministers uh, by way of uh, meeting their legal costs when that minister is uh, under attack and the victim of a royal commission as pernicious as this one. But uh, I've been enlightened tonight by Senator Chamaret, who has presented this uh, amendment uh, clothed as uh, defence of a principle. And uh, if I took your remarks uh, correctly uh, through you, Madam Chairman, to Senator Chamaret <laughs> accurately, uh, you describe the principle as there is no precedent, there is no legal basis and there are no constitutional grounds. Well, we are the Parliament of Australia and this is the Senate of that Parliament. We set precedents all of the time. That's part of our job, in fact. So an argument about no precedent doesn't seem to hold water. We are the Senate uh, of the Parliament of Australia and we approve the appropriation bills. The, uh, the uh, Cabinet decided that this would appear as a one-line <laughs> item in the appropriation bills and be submitted to the Parliament. We can clothe that with legality. The, and we thirdly have the constitutional grounds to do so. So I do not uh, understand uh, what this is what this thing called a principle is. And I am aware that uh, often the word principle is used to dignify an act or to clothe an act with, uh, with some sort of air of idealism when in fact what is described as a principle is an expedient political position. And that uh, a, an expedient political position uh, this indeed seems to me to be. But one that defies my understanding as to uh, motive, I must say. I find the, uh, the uh, uh, other comments of Senator Chamaret interesting. Uh, she described this as sordid politics. I agree with that. This uh, whole Royal Commission was an exercise in sordid politics. It was not, uh, not one launched by this government, but it was launched by another government against one of our ministers. We have a duty, we have a duty and obligation to see justice is done. And justice would not be done if we were to leave Dr Lawrence uh, with an inability to defend herself or an inability to defend herself without bankrupting herself. I mean, if the outcome was that she put herself in hot to pay her legal expenses and if the outcome of the Royal Commission was as it was, she would suffer double jeopardy. She would become a bankrupt as well as having an adverse finding recorded against her and suffer a double punishment. And it seems to me that uh, while, while, of course, we would never accept the findings of this Royal Commission, we think it's uh, entirely inappropriate. And I personally don't believe uh, the findings of the Royal Commission because of my personal knowledge uh, of Dr Lawrence. It would seem, and I'm not, I must say I'm not familiar, that personal knowledge of Dr Lawrence doesn't extend to any detailed knowledge of her personal financial affairs, but this is a very large bill. And uh, one of the principles I thought we've always stood on is that uh, there ought to be an ability uh, to fund the cost of justice so that justice can be done. And if you don't fund it, justice is not done. And in this case, uh, you would uh, indeed push a, an individual of reasonable means close to the brink of bankruptcy, and it would seem to me if this was carried, that, that's what would happen. I oppose the amendment. Senator Chamaret. I'd like to respond to the minister, and I appreciate that, as he said, uh, he's been left to uh, look after this matter while Senator Evans is away and uh, uh, he hasn't uh, actually heard me repeat this argument on many occasions. I gave it in a very abbreviated form because I have repeated it on many occasions to Senator Evans and in this chamber. I did it in August and I did it in... Anyway, never mind, I've done it several times and I'm not going to burden the rest of my colleagues with a repeat of it. Um, but I, I just want to ask the Minister uh, was legal advice uh, sought as to the efficacy or success of the challenge that, uh, sen uh, that was put up to uh, the Royal Commission? And if so, would the Minister table that advice 
uh, also was, as is the usual case when such uh, an endeavour is uh, embarked upon, was there ever any opportunity to seek from the solicitor some kind of uh, uh, payment on the success of, of the case uh, rather than simply payment whether or not it succeeded? Uh, because if what you are arguing, which is that it's legitimate for the entire amount to be provided by this parliament, uh, that it has got precedent, that it has got legal basis and constitutionality, then you should also be able to make uh, a, a, a justification or a rationale to the, the people of Australia via this parliament for how well you stewarded that money and how well you uh, ensured that it would be used in a particular way. So I'd be very grateful, Minister, if you could uh, give us the kind of uh, security that having decided it was perfectly legitimate to uh, ask for this money uh, from the taxpayer's uh, purse uh, via this parliament, what uh, accountability you have to ensure that it was used properly and was the minimum amount used um, and that you had some chance of success, because that is where your position leaves you. Now, what I'd like to also respond to is some other uh, remarks you made. Um, my reason for saying there's no precedent is that the precedents that have always been raised to justify it were uh, the legal costs of ministers who were actually engaged uh, at the time uh, in the uh, same post at which this affair arose, whereas what we're dealing with is a federal minister being charged in a state uh, under a state jurisdiction over a matter that occurred prior to her becoming a federal minister. We haven't got a precedent for that. Okay, we set precedents. We are setting a precedent, but it's quite a dangerous one. Uh, but that is why there's been no precedent. The no legal basis that I uh, am speaking to is the one that Senator Spindler raised as, uh, as the Democrats' belief that it is a legitimate uh, use uh, or allocation of the money uh, because after eight weeks the government finally produced a, a, a justification for the payment uh, which referred to the ministerial entitlements and um, I've got it somewhere but I can't find it but I know it off by heart. It's 4.4b and it says that any other amount, this amount is not limited in, in ministerial entitlements uh, to but can be expended on anything in the course of the minister's functions. And what that clearly relates to is the minister's role as Minister for Health. It's, uh, it, and that's also the basis for questioning the constitutionality. It's an allowance that can be provided for the carrying out of her duties or functions as Minister for Health. It's not an amount that's allocated to ensure her political survival. And uh, Senator Spindler, I never meant to imply that the Democrats had changed their position. Um, but I, um, I do uh, say that there is a disagreement between us in that you regard 4.4b as a, a rationale that's uh, sufficient for you to believe that payment should be made. And in my view, if we take the particular interpretation that has been made of that section, then uh, we have all kinds of uh, possibilities arising as to expenditure that ministers are entitled to have covered that don't actually occur in the course of their duties or role as minister. And it's a very dangerous ground, because I could, if, if I were a minister, which I never anticipate being, uh, thank goodness, um, I could ask for a, a house or a, uh, any manner of, of thing that would, uh, or if I was sued, uh, in defamation, I could ask for things on the basis that I was a minister and that I wouldn't be able to politically survive if I wasn't able to pay these costs or fees. So, um, in my view, there isn't a basis there. Uh, you also said that uh, somehow we were operating on an expediency principle uh, which defies your understanding as to motive, and maybe it's because it isn't expediency at all, and that there's no particular gain, as I said, to uh, standing up for something uh, that isn't supported in a popular sense. But I think it is something we want to make, and that's the reason why we've put this amendment, to put it on the record, that there is a view that the taxpayers' money should not have been allocated in this way. It should certainly not have been guaranteed up front, and for those who believe that it was a legitimate 
use of taxpayers' funds, there is an onus to show how that's being spent and what endeavour was made to ensure that it would be spent properly and uh, with due protection. Senator Spindler. Thank you, Madam Chair. It's rather unfortunate that we are forced to, to rerun the arguments that were uh, run and reported in the uh, Legal and Constitutional Committee report on this matter. And uh, in that, uh, we stated quite clearly our position that uh, uh, we do not suggest that the position we adopt uh, would give carte blanche for uh, a minister to have uh, uh, any activity for which he or she uh, was investigated on or charged with uh, providing a the basis for a call for pub the expenditure of public funds, uh, but that we draw, drew uh, in this particular case a very, uh, I think, cogent uh, parallel between actions uh, committed or, or said to have been committed in one parliament uh, when uh, uh, the uh, reason why the inquiry was being established and the minister was being charged uh, with uh, certain matters and uh, brought before the inquiry was due to her presence in another parliament uh, and uh, uh, while survival uh, as a minister is certainly not uh, uh, a matter that should be taken into account. Uh, being able to continue her duties uh, as a Commonwealth Minister is one of the factors that the Cabinet was able to take into account. Uh, question is that the amendment moved by Senator Shamaret be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. I think the noes have it. Uh, amendments to be moved by Senator Ellison. No. Oh, sorry. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. These are 4101. Uh, this is 4101. Uh, right. and Senator uh, Spindler. I, I move uh, amendment numbered 4101 standing in my name. Oh, there were three capital A and then there were three parts. Uh, I move three capital A. Uh, as well as subsections two and three, or amendments two and three, um, and uh, for the uh, uh, assistance to the, uh, the chamber, I advise that in discussions with uh, Senator Ellison, uh, we have decided that the most uh, efficient means of dealing with that is uh, for me to move this amendment and for Senator Ellison to uh, seek to amend my uh, subsection three or amendment number three and substitute uh, the opposition's number three. Uh, I'm prepared to accept that. I believe that 3A is the more appropriate one. Uh, two is virtually similar and three, uh, the formulation uh, that Senator Ellison is offering is uh, marginally better. Uh, the final result we'll obtain is uh, to ensure that there is no double dipping, uh, so called, uh, in uh, any payment given to Dr. Lawrence. I commend the amendment to the Senate. Senator Ellison. Uh, thank you, De Madam Deputy Chair. I can confirm that position on behalf of the Coalition uh, and uh, say that uh, uh, subsection uh, 1 and 2 are, uh, are agreed to, and I would foreshadow. An amend and I would suggest perhaps those two could be put uh, uh, in a cognate way and leave subsection 3 as a separate item and I would foreshadow amending that by deleting the uh, subsection 3 mentioned or for moved by Senator Spindler and replacing it with that in uh, the uh, amendment standing in my name. Senator Ellison's amendment, Senator Spindler's amendment, amendment, um, amendment be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Senator Spindler's amendment as amended. I put the question that that amendment be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. 
Um, there's a further Democrat amendment. To the State of the House, ma'am. Quorum not present. Ring the bells. Mm -hmm. Quorum present. Uh, Senator Cook. Thank you, uh, Madam Chairman. Uh, can I seek leave of the Chamber, given the last call for the last question put, uh, to uh, seek a division on that matter? Is leave granted? I'll put the question again that Senator Spindler's motion as amended be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against say no. Aye. I think the ayes have it. Aye. Division required. Ring the bells. Sandblast won't work now. Oh, wait, 40. Sandblast. Fixed. This is really hot. Mm -hmm. I've got this on. Yeah, that's okay. That's okay. Um, yeah. Excuse me. That was the report. Julian. Julian. Division. Yep. Division.
Well, lock the doors. The question is that Senator Spindler's amendment as amended be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator O'Chee, teller for the ayes. Senator Jones, teller for the noes. Okay, Madam Chairman. 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 Okay, Senator Spindler. Mm.
It was 38. 24. Sorry? 24. The result of the division there being 38 ayes and 24 noes, the matter is resolved in the affirmative. We now come to Appropriations Bill No. 4, Schedule 2, page 16, Division 814, Item 1. The question is that that item be agreed to. Senator Byrne, Bourne. Um, Chair. Would senators move out of the chamber quietly, please, so we can proceed? Senator Bourne. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I, uh I move uh, Senator Kernow's uh, amendments to no, it's this not schedule. A, it's not an amendment. We're first of all dealing with the schedule, which is being affirmed, and you may oppose it. Ah. The question is that the item be agreed to. If I had the amendment in front of me, I'd know. You're not moving an amendment to this, that schedule. Right. In that case, I think I'll wait till the one we are. Thank no. you. I understood you wish, wish to oppose it. Some of it. Oh, got it. <laughs> thank you. Yes, thank you, Alan. Yes, Madam Chair, thank you. I have the amendment of uh, my uh, Senator Kernow's amendments in front of me now, and I see Schedule 2, uh, page 16, Division 814. Uh, we do wish to oppose, along with another two parts. Let me say that I. Order, um, please. There's far too much noise in the chamber. 